Yo, my, my, don't you look familiar. Have we perhaps met before? Maybe upon an extremely deep scuba diving expedition? Maybe not. Maybe it's just my imagination. Either way, I'm glad you're here with me. Because today we're going to be taking a look at a, another iceberg. But not just any mere iceberg, no no no. Rather, the ultimate creepypasta iceberg by reddit user the one and only fried pickle boy. I'm sure I don't have to tell you what an iceberg is by now. You all know it's a tier list of any given topic from the tip of the iceberg to the deepest layers of inky black topics that almost no one knows about, or at the very least no one wants to talk about anyway. This iceberg will cover everything from good creepypasta classics to overrated trash to obscure gems to everything in between. Please bear in mind that we will not just be summarizing random creepypastas either. I mean, we will be doing that. But additionally, we will also be looking into the lore of the pasta, possibly who wrote it, its history, its evolutions over time, what impact it made upon the medium, as well as any remakes, sequels, or what have you that is often associated with said pasta. Or in other words, this ain't your mama's creepypasta iceberg video. All the same though, I will be honest with you, after that six hour deep dive into the ocean last time, I think I'd like a bit of a change of scenery myself. So today, I've made an executive decision. This iceberg is no longer an iceberg. It is now an island. With all that being said, please take my hand, traveler of the net, and let us see what stories lay ahead of us. Ah, uh, here we are. It's quite a sight, is it not? Down here by the shores, we have crystal clear waters, lovely clean beaches full of blood-soaked, hedgy teenagers, tall men in black suits, a dead squid apparently, and at least one guy drowning in the shallow water. Yes, indeed. And this is the area where the most popular creepypasta characters and stories can be found. The ones that you might say have influenced the majority of the others. True celebrities amongst the beasts, serial killers, cursed objects, and such other oddities that lay around and beyond them. But enough talk. Why don't we, uh, take a closer look at some of them, shall we? Slenderman. What better way to start off this journey than to marvel at what is the most iconic and popular creepypasta ever created. The Slender Man is a fictional supernatural character that originated as a creepypasta internet meme created by Something Awful forum user Eric Knudsen, also known as Victor Surge in 2009. He is depicted as a thin, unnaturally tall humanoid with a featureless head and face, wearing a black suit as seen in these photos that it started at all. Now you see, unlike many other entries on this iceberg, Slenderman is less known for one singular creepypasta that popularized it, and more like a collection of pasta, video series, and even video games that helped him popularizing and making this well put together monster into the thing that it is today. Though it should be noted that some general rules typically follow the Slenderman across different versions, such as him having 
having tentacle-like appendages, his mere presence seemingly breaking down and messing up video slash electrical equipment, as well as reality itself, a primary target of his being children, and in a few cases, he also has the ability to turn people into his mindless zombies, or proxies to do his bidding. The first notable piece of media the Slender Man appeared in was a YouTube video series by the name of Marble Hornets, in which the Slender Man went by the name The Operator, which is a pretty cool name change, I must say. I'd say this video series was instrumental in getting uh, the word of the Slender Man out there, as well as inspiring many others to utilize the character themselves, which would eventually lead to the famous Slender the Eight Pages video game, which let me tell you, if you weren't there when this thing hit the scene, it's fair to say this game blew up across all YouTube in the same way Five Nights at Freddy's or Among Us did, with entire YouTubers careers exploding from simply playing the game, including the ever popular PewDiePie. I'd also say that many games, even to this day, owe their core concept back to this free simple indie game about collecting 8 pages while Slenderman pursues you in a forest. One such example would be Baldi's Basics, a free indie horror game that got extremely popular across YouTube, which essentially was Slender Man, but set in a school setting. There was, of course, a million other Slender Man games after that, like an exorbitant amount of other games. And eventually, there were even Slender Man movies, like at least three of them, including one that made it all the way to theaters. <laughs> now, they're all complete and other dog shit, but hey, Hey, not many creepy bosses can say that they have a full feature length film made about them. Beyond that though, Slenderman is one of those creatures that managed to capture the attention of many internet goers, there being a clear Lovecraftian essence to the being, its motives unclear, its powers truly unknowable. Even the way it dresses, like it were trying to fit in or mirror us in some way, is one of the most interesting angles I find about the creature. A godlike being taken the form of something that we can recognize with our own human eyes. Yet we also can't seem to stare at it for too long before we start to recognize that what we are looking at is not exactly human. Before reality, our free will, our life is all eventually stripped away from us by its featureless gaze. Almost as if the uncanny reality that what we are looking at isn't truly human, a mere shadow of something more real is enough to break us down completely. It's good stuff. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise, even if the character is far too oversaturated and sort of ruined for most people in that regard. Harrowbrine. Harrowbrine is an interesting case, as it's a creepypasta entirely centered around Minecraft, which means you either find this super interesting or you are already laughing at this point. But it's important to remember that this story goes far back, before Minecraft was anywhere near as big as it is today. Though, like most of these stories, the original place this urban legend came from was none other than 4chan's X-Board, specifically sometime around 2010. But the original post came with this screenshot and essentially described a strange figure that mirrored his own player character that seemed to stalk him, just barely hiding in the fog of the render distance. He also notes that any time they happen to catch a glimpse of this figure, they also notice that trees and other such things around said figure seem to be broken down, as if there were another player quietly existing in this world before hiding back away when it was noticed. The user also noted that he was so desperate to find out if anyone else had come across this figure, himself believing it to be some sort of easter egg or secret in the game that no one had discovered yet, that he posted this screenshot and parts of this story on several gaming forums and the like, only to eventually get an email from someone who went by the username of Harrowbrine, simply writing, stop. To him. Later, others would come to have similar experiences in seeing this strange figure in the game, many unsure of what to make of it. Eventually, the story evolves into the character of Herobrine being Notch's brother, otherwise known as the creator of Minecraft's brother, which is where things get pretty fucking dumb if I'm being honest. 
is a shame because the story itself seems rather innocuous in that it feels like something random and slightly creepy in a brand new game that was always being updated. It wasn't out of the question that such a thing could exist within the game, but once you start including stuff like it was Notch's dead brother and what have you, the whole idea falls apart and becomes extremely dumb. On that note though, the urban legend would soon spread around everywhere, with many reports their own, albeit fake, sightings of the ghostly figure. The story itself also attracted the attention of several YouTubers and streamers who decided to make content around finding Herobrine or summoning him or what have you, which only made this whole thing more popular. It even got to the point where the creators of Minecraft themselves would often put at the bottom of their patch notes that they had finally removed Herobrine, leading some to wonder if he had in fact ever actually been in the game, even as a joke at some point. Well, I don't find the actual character and mythos of Herobrine very scary, I will say that some of these early screenshots feel very much like the more recently popular liminal spaces photos that have been making the rounds. It's that feeling that comes from a game that, especially in the beginning, was so empty and without purpose. I'd also say the idea is a little more scary than the actual character, as it taps into that feeling of being completely isolated, which Minecraft does notably well, and yet, you get that tinge on the back of your neck that maybe you're not alone, that someone or something else is with you, silently watching you. Too bad it's just the fucking Minecraft guy with white eyes and not a cool monster or something. Dead Bart. Dead Bart is one of those early creepypastas that would come to be a defining piece of one of creepypastas genres. Now before I go any further, for those who are not aware or don't remember, creepypastas at some point became so diverse that entire genres spawned off of different stories. One of the most pervasive of which was the Lost Episode Creepypasta, uh, which as it implies, focuses around a lost episode of a TV show, cartoon, etc. The core idea is pretty cool. It taps into that lost media part of my brain that makes me want to see and know everything that there is to know about pieces of media that have long since disappeared for a one reason or another. However, unfortunately, a most lost episode creepypastas tend to follow certain tropes that make them sound extra silly and uh, unbelievable and um, badly written. Take Dead Bart for example. The creepypasta tells the story of a lost episode of The Simpsons in which Bart dies after falling from an airplane. Uh, the author of the creepypasta claims he was able to find and watch this lost episode uh, by confronting the creator of The Simpsons, uh, Matt Groening, about the lost episode that everybody affiliated with the show refuses to acknowledge. Groening gives him a website address and begs him to never speak about the episode again. Uh, when the writer visits the website, he finds nothing but a download link, which contains the lost episode. In the episode, while Bart is messing about in an airplane, he breaks a window and is then sucked out. The writer is keen to note how, quote, at the beginning of the series, Matt had an idea that the animated style of The Simpsons world represented life, and that death turned things more realistic. This was used in this episode. The picture of Bart's corpse was barely recognizable. They took full advantage of not having to move and made an almost photorealistic drawing of this dead body." Unquote. Notice how he said photorealistic, not hyperrealistic. We're, we're not quite there yet, folks. The writer goes on to describe how the second act of the episode just showed the whole Simpsons family crying at the kitchen table for an entire year of in-universe time, I suppose, uh, before going to visit Bart's grave. At the cemetery, Bark's corpse is laying on top of his grave, and all the other graves bear the names of the Simpson guest stars, even those who had not appeared on the show at the time the episode would have been written. Which is a pretty cool final dun 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 moment for the story, I will admit. 
It's strange, the actual description of the episode is pretty tame and genuinely creepy sounding. The cemetery thing in particular is quite interesting, especially as it plays into the whole idea of the Simpsons having quote unquote predicted things. It's a clever ending. The problem the story has is the really dumb way the author manages to get a hold of the episode uh, by simply asking Matt Groening for it. It just seems like the author didn't know how he was supposed to get the episode so he just kind of made up the most awkwardly direct way he could have possibly gotten it. I do still appreciate the effort as it is still far better than having no real explanation for how one got the lost episode at all, but it's still quite ridiculous. I should note also that for anyone who ever gets confused by my commentary with these creepypastas, the thing is, back when they were first written, there was almost always a clear intent to blend fiction with reality, to make these stories sound at least plausible. It's why lost episode creepypastas struggle a little bit, as they can be well done, but the question of why they didn't share the episode with everyone else online becomes a real sticky question along with how they managed to find it. Uh, breaking the illusion of any of this having even some iota chance of being real. While stories like Herobrine, for example, at least has some pictures and the like to help in making it feel a little bit more real. Even if we all know that none of it is actually real. It just adds to the immersion, I suppose. But I digress. Lavender Town Syndrome. This one is a classic, and a short one too, that reads as follows. Quote, the Lavender Town Syndrome, also known as the Lavender Town Tone or Lavender Town Sniazus, was a peak in Sniazus, an illness of children between the ages of 7 and 12, shortly after the release of Pokemon Red and Green in Japan back in February 27th of 1996. Rumors say that these snazus and illness only occurred after the children playing the game reached Lavender Town, whose theme music had extremely high frequencies. The studies showed that only children and young teens could hear since their ears were more sensitive. Due to the lavender tone, at least 200 children supposedly committed snazus and many more developed illnesses and afflictions. The children who committed Zeus usually did so by hanging or jumping from heights. Those who did not acted irrationally and complained of severe headaches after listening to Lavender Town's theme. Although Lavender Town now sounds differently, depending on the game, this mass hysteria was caused by the first Pokemon game released. After the Lavender Tone incident, the programmers had fixed Lavender Town's theme music to be at a lower frequency, and ever since, children were no longer affected by it. One video appeared in 2010 using special software to analyze the audio of Lavender Town's music. When played, the software created images of the unknown near the end of the audio. This raised a controversy since the unknown didn't appear until Generation 2 games Silver, Gold, and Crystal. The unknown translates to leave now. There is also the said beta version of Lavender Town. It is said that the beta version of Pocket Monsters was released to some kids to test the games. This is the video of the beta version of Lavender Town. Unquote. You've been listening to the song in the background this whole time, so if you're all still alive and well by this point, I will say that the core idea of this one is super creepy. The core concept of binaural beats uh, type of thing affecting children's minds through a video game sounds quite interesting and creepy until that whole 200 children dying part. This is where the pasta fails because you could just look it up and see that it's all fake. I feel as though basing it around maybe one or two children having extreme adverse effects to the story would have instantly made it more believable since, you, you know, 200 children committing seppuku over some Pokemon music would 
probably make big news headlines. It would also probably mean the end for Nintendo more than likely, and yeah, just really brings the whole story down as a whole. But all well, I still do like the idea of putting an extra creepy story or a context to an already unnerving or uncomfortable song though. Makes you think of it, if nothing else, every time you listen to it afterward. Jeff the Killer. So, Jeff the Killer. While I said Slenderman is probably the most iconic creepypasta character of all time, I'd be lying if I didn't note that this one is right up there, if not even more popular in some circles and some sects of time. Hell, I'll be even more honest. While Slenderman may be more enduring of a creature that many like to associate with creepypastas, the cold hard truth is that Jeff the Killer this image represents creepypastas on a base level that I think most would understand. It's a creepy image. What's there to know, really? You can see it, and that's it. I guess what I'm saying is, if there was a flag that represented the country of creepypastas, this image would surely be on it. Now, I won't go into the origins of this said image, as it's still pretty much a mystery. There used to be a rumor it came from an edit of this picture with people on 4chan making fun of this uh, girl because she was overweight and eventually these edits of the picture were spread around to mock her until eventually she committed no longer existing. Uh, but that's all been proven false by now. A creepy pasta in of itself, really. But again, I digress. Grass. But if it were just this image, then we wouldn't be here talking about it today. Uh, no, like most creepypasta images, it had a story that was connected to it to somewhat give backstory or justify the creepy image itself. And thus, we have the story of Jeff the Killer. Jeff the Killer's story starts with a supposed excerpt from a local newspaper, which details a creepy looking guy with a pale face and wide smile that tried to kill some kid, and just as he's about to, uh, he says his titular catchphrase, a go to sleep, before being stopped by said kid's dad and running away. After this prologue of sorts, we then follow the story of Jeff, his little brother Louie, and his family moving into a new neighborhood. On Jeff and Louie's first day at this new school, they get accosted by three bullies named Randy, Keith, and Troy, who Jeff then brutally beats up after they threaten them with knives, citing that he had a, quote, feeling inside of him that made him snap, unquote. Something that if you watched my stream reading this story, you probably came away understanding quite well. Anyway, the police want to arrest the kids that beat up those bullies, and so Louie takes the blame for doing it. And then the police just take him away, I guess, without trial or anything, or even much of a fight back from the parents. It's, well, kind of... Fucked up, but also really stupid, because that's not how it works in real life. So, Louis taking the blame goes to Juvie, which leaves Jeff feeling guilty and depressed. But his parents decide to have him go over to some kid's party, because according to his mom, it will make things feel like they're back to normal, I guess. Which again, I guess the author really wanted the parents to feel extra fucking mean-spirited. Uh, but yeah, that's a pretty weird thing to say and do. So anyway, they go to the party, and then the three bullies from before that Jeff beat up invade the party and pull out fucking guns. And now, they have these guns pointed at all the children and everybody and try to shoot Jeff. Which, by the way, no one even attempts to try and stop from happening. Not even Jeff's parents try to break up the situation or save their child or anything. They just all watch a bunch of 13-year-olds wrestle and fight and mess up the house while fucking stabbing each other and shit. So anyway, Jeff eventually kills one of the bullies and then gets a bucket of bleach poured all over his head, as well as some gasoline, I guess, and then gets lit on fire by one of the bullies and goes running down the stairs <laughs> screaming before 
before collapsing. Now, somehow instead of like burning his skin off and torching his hair away, he instead turns pearly white and his hair turns an inky black because you all know that's just how it works. You want to dye your hair black, guys? Just light it on fire. Does the trick every time, of course. Anyway, between being burned alive and seeing his pretty new mug, Jeff kind of snaps and decides to cut a big smile on his face, Joker style. He then burns his eyelids off as well. His mom and dad see this and in response, pulls out a fucking shotgun on him, which I gotta say is a pretty crazy reaction. I mean, I know your kid is kind of fucked beyond belief, but you just gonna shoot him now? So Jeff then kills both of his parents and for some reason then kills his brother Louie as well, even though he has shown that he is loving towards his brother before and felt bad about him being blamed for taking the fall for him and was happy when Louie came back home. He still kills his brother though, so yeah. He of course says his iconic line again before killing Louie, and that's pretty much it. Go to fucking sleep. That is the story of Jeff the Killer, one of the most iconic creepypasta stories ever written, which let me tell you, was not exactly something a lot of creepypasta writers and readers were happy about at the time. You see, you may see this ugly face and think, that's kind of creepy, but to teenage boys and girls? <laughs> Let me tell you, this boy was a fucking hotcake. Now to be fair, slowly over time as Jeff the Killer gained in popularity, his depiction went from this potato-headed freak to basically L from Death Note but with a Joker smile and a hoodie. It would be this version of Jeff the Killer that I'm sure would be in the hearts and minds of many creepypasta writers that either wrote what amounted to various sequels and fan fictions surrounding Jeff the Killer or in some cases would write their own version of Jeff the Killer uh, that was a moody, misunderstood teenager with a dark past slash childhood of abusive parents that eventually would be murdered when said teenager has enough and goes fucking nuts and goes on to become one of the most powerful and cool serial killers this side of the net. If you can't tell, there's a fair bit of fantasy fulfillment in these stories that makes reading them both ironically unnerving, but mostly kind of funny. They are quite the guilty pleasure of mine, I must admit. I poke fun, but I love Jeff the Killer. Uh, not because it's well written, and not because it's scary, but because it's a fucking great read. It's very funny, very interesting, and just has a lot of elements that unintentionally make it a masterpiece. But bear in mind, many were getting very tired of the trend as insert name the killer stories were completely flooding every website that was accepting creepypastas, notably the creepypasta wiki. To the point that at some point, any story with insert name the killer in them would be immediately banned from the creepypasta wiki. And hell, Jeff the Killer itself was actually taken down off the website after about a year of its creation for it not meeting the standard the community was going for. And let's be real, even if it really did meet the standard, I think the main problem is they probably wanted it to be a clear message that they don't want a million more of these types of stories to have to sift through every single day. But anyway, I don't want to harp on too much more about the story, but it is also notable that due to the popularity of the story, the Creepypasta Wiki would eventually have a writing competition back in 2015 to try and write the same basic story of Jeff the Killer, but make it better, even good perhaps which would be voted on by the community at large. The winner of which was written by K. Banning Killam, one of the admins of the wiki and sort of well renowned for his work and can still be read on the wiki to this day. In case you're wondering, the K. Banning Kellum version of the story follows many of the same events, but is written far, far more competently, with Jeff's face getting fucked up and burned by a flare gun as one of the differences. Actually, burning off his skin and hair on one side of his face, making it more of a two-face type killer versus the Joker type killer that the original had. 
And while the core foundation isn't exactly good, again, mainly due to the story being rooted in this weird, edgy, fantasy-like scenario, I will commend the author for making what is probably the best version of this bad story that one could possibly make. Oh, and also, there's apparently a rather popular novella uh, based around Jeff the Killer titled Insanity, Jeff the Killer by Nisha Nicholson. I've never read it myself, uh, mainly because I have to buy it. Uh, but if any of you are interested in me covering it in a future video, then let me know in the comments down below and I will spend that five dollars, however irresponsible it may be. The Russian Sleep Experiment The Russian Sleep Experiment is one of the most popular and well-loved of nearly all early creepypastas. The story recounts an experiment set in the late 1940s at a covert Soviet test facility. In the story, a military-sanctioned scientific experiment is done on five political prisoners who are being kept in a sealed gas chamber with an airborne stimulant continually administered in order to keep the subjects awake for 30 consecutive days. The prisoners were falsely promised that they would be set free from the prison if they were to complete this experiment. The story then proceeds to showcase what happened to the prisoners. After nine days, one subject began screaming uncontrollably for hours, while the others had no reaction to his outburst. The man screamed for so long that he tore his vocal cords and was rendered mute as a result. Later, other subjects prevented the researchers from looking inside by pasting torn book pages with their own feces on the porthole windows. By the 15th day, the researchers decided to turn off the stimulating gas and reopen the chamber. The subjects did not want the gas to turn off for fear that they would fall asleep. Upon looking inside, they discovered that the four surviving subjects had performed lethal and severe mutilation and disembowelment on themselves during the past days, including tearing off flesh and muscles, removing multiple abdominal internal organs, practicing self-cannibalism on themselves, as well as cannibalism on the second subject, and allowing 10 centimeters or 4 inches of blood and water to accumulate on the floor by jamming pieces of flesh from the second subject into the drain, who was also found dead on the floor as soon as the chamber was opened. After being somewhat treated for their severe injuries, the surviving three subjects were prepared to return to the gas chamber with the stimulant by the orders of the military officials, though against the will of the researchers, with EEG monitors showing short recurring moments of brain death. Before the chamber was sealed, one of the subjects fell asleep and died, and the only subject that could speak screamed to be immediately sealed within the chamber. A military commander would later order for three other researchers to be closed inside the chamber alongside the two remaining subjects. One researcher immediately drew his gun and killed the commander and the mute subject by shooting them both in the head, causing the other person to flee the room. With only one surviving subject, Subject, the terrified researcher explained that he would not allow himself to be locked in a room with monsters that could no longer be called people. He desperately asked what the subject was, to which the subject smiled and identified himself and the other fallen subjects as an inherent evil inside the human mind that is kept in check with the act of sleeping. Quote, we are you, we are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go into the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread." Unquote. The story ends with the researcher shooting the last prisoner in the heart, and with his dying breath on the floor, the subject muttered his final words. So, nearly free.
This is a popular creepypasta that I actually agree with being so popular. It's fairly well written, and it's very engaging seeing how these prisoners will break down step by step. The tone feels very much like an SCP story. It just replaced the unknown entity with, well, whatever you interpret the sleepless men to be. It also has a slight hint of reality, as communist Russia did all sorts of fucked up and weird things back in this time frame to political prisoners and people in general. And while this whole story is obviously fiction, there is a tinge of dark reality that the story mirrors that stems from the experiments of the Cold War. Eilish Jack. On June 7th, 2010, this photograph was posted to 4chan by a user named Arnon. The title of the post was Nightmare Fuel, which contained images of disturbing creatures from video games, and one of the images featuring the original photo of Jack. Originally, this photo was all there was to this. In a similar fashion to Jeff the Killer, originally, before the infamous story, was just this iconic image. However, on February 25th of 2012, a creepypasta wiki user by the name of Azelf5000 wrote this, um, tale of the scary. Quote, Hello, my name is Mitch. I'm here to tell you guys about an experience I had. I don't know if it was paranormal or whatever stupid words people use to describe supernatural phenomena, but after that thing visited me, I believe in that paranormal trash now. A week after I moved in with my brother Edwin, after my house was foreclosed, I finished unpacking. Edwin liked the idea of me moving in since we had not seen each other for 10 years, so I was excited. Too. I soon fell asleep after I moved in. After that week, I heard rustling noises coming from outside at about 1 in the morning. I thought it was a raccoon, so I ignored it and tried to fall asleep. The next morning, I told Edwin about it, and he agreed. The next night, however, I thought I heard my window opening and a loud thump as if something entered my room. I darted up and looked around my room, but I saw nothing. The next morning, Edwin dropped his coffee cup when he saw me. He held up the nearby mirror, and I saw myself. There was a large gash in my left cheek. After I was rushed to the hospital, my doctor told me that I must have been sleepwalking, but then he showed me something that made my blood turn cold. He lifted up my shirt to reveal a sewn-up incision where my kidneys were. I stared into his eyes, mine widening. You somehow lost your left kidney last night, my doctor told me. We don't know how though, sorry Mitch. The next night was my breaking point. Around midnight, I woke up to see a truly horrifying sight. I was staring face to face with a creature with a black hoodie and dark blue mask with no nose or mouth staring down at me. The thing that scared me the most was that it had no eyes, just empty black sockets. The creature almost had some black substance dripping from its sockets. I grabbed a camera from the nearby mantle and took a picture. Immediately after taking the shot, the creature lunged at me and tried to claw open my chest to get my lungs. I stopped it by kicking it in the face. As I ran out of my room, I grabbed my wallet. I would need the money. I ran out of my brother's house into the night. I eventually ended up in the woods near Edwin's house and tripped on a rock. I fell unconscious and woke up in the hospital. My doctor, the same one who treated me before, entered the room. I have some good news and bad news, Mitch, the doctor started. The good news is that you have minor injuries and your parents are gonna come pick you up. I sighed with relief. The bad news is is your brother has been killed by some thing. Sorry. My parents took me back to Edwin's house to collect my remaining belongings, which I did. Upon entering my room, I was scared, but remained calm. I grabbed my camera and then stopped dead in my tracks. In the hallway leading to my room, I saw Edwin's body and something small lying next to it. I retrieved it up and entered my parents' car, not mentioning Edwin's corpse. I looked at the thing. I had picked up and nearly vomited. I was holding my stolen half-eaten kidney with some black substance on it. The end!
As my friend Lucid said, this story reads like a bulletin point list. No details, no depth. Just a constant stream of, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, the end. I especially love the detail of his brother's corpse being in his house, and him telling no one. And that also there was a black substance, an item, right next to his brother's corpse like some fucking rpg character he fucking looted it picked it up and then didn't even realize what it was until he got into the car it's uh, it's quite special but all the same this story would inspire a surprisingly similar reaction to that of jeff the killer and by that i mean he became a magnet for some interesting fan art turning him from this kind of, I guess, creepy image into this emo boy who wears a mask. Though while I can at least understand why people would get this from the edgy fanfiction writing and characters of Jeff the Killer, Alice Jack's story seemed extra strange that it would create this kind of reaction and fanbase. That is until I remembered that this creepypasta creature had a very popular unofficial origin story made about them simply titled The Origin of Eyeless Jack by author Sally Williams. The origin story follows Jack Nicholas, a college student. Through a chain of events, Jack finds a sort of friendship with one of his peers, Jenny, and a small group of her friends. Jack later on discovers that the group is a fucking cult worshipping a demon named Chernobog. Jack involuntarily is made to be a sacrifice for the cult, to be the son of Chernobog or something like that. Jenny and her friends proceed to blind Jack by pouring a hot tar-like substance into his eyes, killing him in the process. His body is then possessed by the demon and he then proceeds to butcher Jenny and the others, ripping off their masks, slashing their throats and disemboweling them. He took their kidneys afterward as well, uh, tying it back into the original story. So in other words, Jack has a tragic backstory like Jeff the Killer, but instead of, you know, bullies with guns, we have cults and demon possessions, which I mean, I'll admit is at least a little bit more cool. But the story is still nothing to write home about, at least not to me. All the same, both of these have an extremely popular creepypasta legacy to their name, Mr. Widemouth. Mr. Widemouth by author Perfect Circle 35 was actually one of the first creepypastas I ever came into contact with back in the day. I remember the term creepypasta was something I had heard of once or twice around this time, and ultimately, I came to look it up on YouTube and found a YouTuber called Mr. Creepypasta and thus I dove right in. The story is our narrator's recollection of a strange creature he remembers meeting back when he was only five years old, uh, diagnosed with monoculosis, bedridden, and housebound. The narrator meets a small creature that looks similar to a Furby, but with an exceptionally large mouth shortly after being diagnosed. The creature goes by Mr. Widemouth, and at first seems like a friend and someone to play with in his incapacitated state. Mr. Widemouth would hide under the narrator's bed, saying that he didn't want the narrator's parents to see him because he was afraid they wouldn't allow them to play with him anymore. Shortly after meeting Mr. Widemouth, and spending a few days with him, the creature instructs our narrator to come with him to a small room at the end of the house's hallway. The narrator declined the offer, but soon agreed due to Mr. Widemouth's eager persisting. Once at the room, Mr. Widemouth opens a large window that was opposite of the doorway, and he beckoned the narrator to look at the ground below. <laughs> I like to play pretend up here, Mr. Widemouth exclaimed. I pretend there's a big soft trampoline below this window and, and I jump. If you pretend hard enough, you bounce back up like a feather. I want you to try. I was five years old with a fever. So only a hint of skepticism darted through my thoughts as I looked down and considered the possibility. That's a long drop, I said. Uh, but it's all part of the fun. It wouldn't be fun if it was only a short drop. 
If it were that way, you may as well just bounce on a real trampoline. I toyed with the idea, picturing myself falling through thin air only to bounce back to the window on something unseen by human eyes. But the realist in me prevailed. Maybe some other time, I said. I don't know if I have enough imagination. I could get hurt. If you say so. Events like this keep on happening, like Mr. Widemouth trying to convince him again late into the night that he really put a trampoline outside the window now, or that the narrator should try juggling knives because it was lots of fun, etc. Eventually, the narrator gets well enough that he's allowed to go outside, and when he does, Mr. Widemouth is once again waiting for him. The creature ends up showing the narrator this trail away from the house, he says that he has had many friends go down this trail, and one day, he would love to take the narrator down it as well whenever he is ready. Soon the narrator and their family gathered up all their stuff into the moving truck since they have been waiting for our protagonist to get better first before finally moving to what was hopefully going to be their permanent home. As they drive away, our narrator sees Mr. Widemouth staring through his old bedroom window at him, waving him away, steak knife in hand. In the short epilogue of the story, the narrator returns to where the old house was, back at that place where he encountered the beast. However, the house was nowhere to be seen as it had been burned down years after the narrator had left. The narrator decided to walk down that trail that Mr. Widemouth told him that he was going to take him down when he was ready so long ago. As he reaches the end of the path, he realizes where the path leads. It's a memorial cemetery where most of the tombstones belong to young children. That's the story of Mr. Widemouth. I have a lot of nostalgia for this one, especially since back in the day, on very old YouTube channel, I had actually recorded this as my first major video, which was me reading Mr. Widemouth in an overly dramatic tone. I think I even had an intro where I was dressed up in all black with goth makeup and what have you. Fun times, also pretty cringy, but fun all the same. The actual story is pretty decent though. I really like the subtlety of the creature trying to convince the five-year-old to commit not alive. The ending sequence could have been slightly longer. It's got the perfect twist slash reveal moment with the cemetery, but the way it's written sort of undersells it a bit. Anyway, still a pretty good little short story all the same. Sand. It's so coarse and rough. And it gets all over the place. Unlike this transition into a commercial break, which is by comparison, smooth and silky. Let's take in a few rays from the sun before we take a peek at some of the other fellows here on this beachfront. Just be careful not to fall asleep, despite what some of these MCR groupies might tell you to do otherwise. Smile.jpg. So, this image, this is Smile.jpg, or sometimes called Smile.dog from time to time. In a similar fashion to Jeff the Killer, we don't actually know where this image came from exactly, though it is suspected it was from 4chan's X board, probably. The story that is often connected with this picture expands on what witnessing it will do to one's psyche. Those who see the picture are said to begin having vivid dreams about the dog in the picture. The dog itself is said to be a supernatural entity of sorts that takes the form of a demonic husky and forces people into spreading his image all over the internet. Thusly, he can then haunt those people's dreams and get them to spread the word as well. The longer someone goes without spreading the word, the more the dog deforms within their dreams until it finally reveals to the dreamer his true form before taking their life. That's the urban legend, while the story itself tells the story of a college student looking to get more info about the urban legend, and trying to interview someone who supposedly saw the image and is haunted at night by its visage, a woman by the name of Mary E. 
The actual creepypasta is pretty decent. The urban legend and picture that comes with it, I think, are the strongest aspects of the story, however, as the characters and overall pacing of the creepypasta is a little bit slow. While at the same time, kind of just ends with the narrator finally having seen the picture and spreading the word via this creepypasta. A very cool and meta thing to do, but I would have liked to have seen what sort of nightmares and psychological effects the picture had over our narrator, since we only get a glimpse of that through Mary E. But oh well, if nothing else, Similar to the Jeff the Killer situation, this picture is probably the strongest aspect of this overall. In particular, I did remember it making me feel rather uncomfortable back in the day. So I suppose it did its job effectively, at the very least in that regard. Siren Head so for our first bonus entry, I figured it was worth bringing up a slightly more recent creepypasta character that had gotten very popular. Siren Head is a fictional being created by the Canadian artist Trevor Henderson. Fun fact, Trevor is also well known for several other creepy characters, such as Cartoon Cat, Bridgeworm, among many others. The Trevor Henderson wiki describes Siren Head as, quote, a 12 meter tall humanoid creature with a heavily emaciated, near skeletal frame covered in dried mummified flesh with a color similar to rusted metal. An emaciated being with a pair of sirens capable of emitting various noises both natural and man-made, including sirens, radio broadcasts, white noise, and human voices." Unquote. Now, those are the basics. Siren Head was first introduced in 2018 via Trevor's Twitter and Tumblr pages, respectively. And while the images themselves certainly got around and were very popular, in much the same way Slenderman became famous through others making video games and videos about him, well, the same thing happened here. Quote, On October 31st, 2018, a group of game developers, which are known as Modus Interactive released a horror game for Siren Head, a boosting its popularity even further. And on December 7th, 2019, a developer known as, holy shit, I'm gonna fucking mess this one up, Thu Lin Panton created his own Siren Head horror game too, unquote. Now obviously, these would end up getting pretty popular, as they were played by the big Let's Players and well, let's just say, while the internet may always be changing, some things always stay the same, and horror content always gets way more popular when someone puts it into a video game. I also remember Siren Head being one of the few monsters in the Fallout 4 Silent Hill mod, which funnily enough, as kind of obscure as that is compared to everything else I've already listed, was actually the first place I'd ever heard of the monster and had, for a short time, assumed everyone knew the monster from that place as well. Then, later, quote, On April 30th, 2020, a film creator and a TikTok persona known as Alex Howard created a video of Siren Head moving around in the background, while at the same time police and gunfires can be heard. The video got popular very quickly, gaining over 20 million views in one week. Unquote. And here is said video. And yeah, there are actually a lot, and I mean a lot more games about Siren Head as well, in addition to several other creepy pastas internet series, and yeah, he pretty much became an iconic internet monster in no time flat. I will say that there is definitely something there in this monster conceptually that I think really connects with people on a guttural level. No one likes hearing emergency sirens, no matter how big or small the emergency, or even if it's just a test. We have sort of collectively been conditioned to go into fight or flight mode when we hear this sort of thing. Especially if you were a kid who lived in a tornado-heavy area, like I did. 
Or hell, just someone who remembers watching your cartoons and then suddenly an emergency message or even just a test message would start playing on the screen with those loud beeps or sirens like sounds encapsulating whichever room you happen to be in. For that reason, along with its design, it's a pretty damn scary monster. Even if it did sort of have that overexposure effect after a while like so many other uh, creepypastas and scary characters in general. The Rake The Rake originated on 4chan slash bboard within late 2005. A thread was started by an anonymous user who stated, quote, Hey B, let's make a new monster. Naturally, there were many ideas, but one stood out, and another user created a new thread based on this idea. The thread started with this post, quote, All right, this is for the people who like the three eyes, no apparent mouth, pale skin one. Here's what we've got so far. Humanoid, about six feet tall when standing, but usually crouches and walks on all fours. It has very pale skin. The face is blank, as in no nose, no mouth. However, it has three solid green eyes, one in the middle of its forehead and the other two on either side of its head towards the back. Usually seen in front of yards or suburban areas. Usually just watches the observer, but will stand up and attack if approached. When it attacks, a mouth opens up as if a hinged skull that opens at the chin reveals many tiny but dull teeth. Unquote. This creature eventually formed into what we now know as the Rake, although its appearance was tweaked a little bit. Um, it still remained six feet tall and had no nose, but it also had grayish skin and two slightly larger than human eyes instead of the three. The mouth became smaller than that of a human, but when provoked or attacked, opens freely at a hinge down at the neckline, showing hundreds of dull but not blunt teeth, which I think is the version of the monster more people are familiar with at this point. Notably being the general description of the beast from several creepypastas that were written and shared around 4chan, LiveJournal, and the Something Awful forums at the time. The main creepypasta most, and I'm sure this iceberg is referring to, is the one written around 2006 and showcases several people's writings about the beast as far back as 1691, meaning this creature would be hundreds of years old, adding to its mythos and mystery. Quote, A Mariner's Log, 1691. He came to me in my sleep. From the foot of my bed I felt a sensation. He took everything. We must return to England. We shall not return here again at the request of the rank." Unquote. Another piece of writing comes from 1964 in the form of a commit no longer exists note which reads as follows. Quote, As I prepare to take my life, I feel it necessary to assuage any guilt or pain I have introduced through this act. It is not the fault of anyone other than him, for once I awoke and felt his presence, and once I awoke and saw his form, and once again I awoke and heard his voice and looked into his eyes. I cannot sleep without fear of what I might next awake to experience. I cannot ever wake. Goodbye. Found in the same wooden box were two empty envelopes addressed to William and Rose and on one loose personal letter with no envelope. Dearest Lenny, I have prayed for you. He spoke your name." Unquote. Uh, the meat of the story also recounts of the story of someone from 2006 who witnessed the creature sit at the end of her and her husband's bed staring at them before rushing down their bedroom hallway and mortally wounding their daughter. Her last words being that he was the rake. 
The father dies in a car crash later that same night in an attempt to rush his daughter to the hospital. The mother, grief-stricken and in fear, both for her and her own son's life, now tapes footage from her bedroom every night, waiting for the day when the rake may return. The story's great. Uh, the mythos is great. The rake is a fucking cool monster that I feel has a similar appeal to that of Slenderman. It seems to like to stalk its victims, slowly haunting their very existence, mentally torturing them before killing them. However, I also think it's more animalistic, like a sadistic ape playing with his food than a Lovecraftian god expressing its influence and a knowable will. I think that's why I also like the rake a little bit more, as it feels like a strange sort of vampire tale, and it leaves you wanting to know more. The name The Rake also gives this image of a grim reaper type thing, raking people's lives away, perhaps even souls into its maw. I also think it's pretty cool that the whole monster was generated from a bunch of people coming together to create some sort of cool monster or what have you. It's always very cool to see. Uh, I should also note that this one picture often associated with The Rake is actually a teaser from the game called Resistance 3 by Insomniac games in case you didn't know. It was not an original thing for it. It was for this game. Squidward Sussy Wussy. I can't talk about this one. If you know why, you know why. It sucks eggs anyway, so moving on. Sonic.exe. So first of all, I just want to say hi Luigi Kid. Thanks for watching the video. Anyway, so Sonic.exe is one of my favorite creepypastas ever written. For all the wrong reasons though. In fact, I made a 40 minute video talking about this creepypasta. It's often forgotten official sequel and it's mad lad of an author. So yeah, I'd go check that video out for a much more detailed approach to this tale from me personally. But again, the basics are as follows. The original Sonic.exe story centers around Tom, a young man who was a big fan of Sonic the Hedgehog, especially the older games, who receives a CD-ROM in the mail from his friend Kyle. An accompanying letter also begs him to destroy this disc before it's a too late, and to not play the game no matter what. Instead of calling his friend to find out if he's okay or what the fuck is up with that, Tom instead does the exact opposite and plays the game. We then watch as Tails, Knuckles, and Dr. Robotnik are stalked and eventually brutally murdered in the game by this black and red-eyed Sonic with, as the author puts it, hyper-realistic blood and hyper-realistic fur and hyper-realistic sharp teeth etc. All while the narrator cries like a little bitch over his favorite video game characters dying in this game. By the end, Sonic.exe or X speaks directly to Tom, toying with him and declaring that he, Sonic.exe, is God. The story ends with Tom turning his computer off and finding a bloody Sonic plush in his room. The story is pretty bad. The narration is melodramatic and bizarrely precise with things such as how long a screen turned black or how long an image appeared or what have you. And the author taking careful measures to let the reader know precisely how many seconds each event occurred for some odd reason. It's also not really scary, nor is it particularly clever, but I love it all the same. For all these reasons and more, it's like the room of creepy bosses. You just can't emulate its exact flavor of incompetence. Add that with the knowledge that the author is 10 feet up his own ass about the whole affair, and still is to this day, and you have the perfect recipe for an all-time classic. Though obviously, not everyone thinks it's bad. Otherwise, there wouldn't be hundreds of fan games, and fan animations, and fan fiction, and fan art, etc. made about it even to this day. And for what it's worth, I think a lot of the fan games and the fan art and the fan animations are a lot of fun and I can see a lot of skill and passion in all of them. So no hate towards anyone that loves Sonic.exe and makes stuff about it. As much as I like to make fun of it, I really like to make fun of it and I've been talking about it for years at this point. 
which, by the way, I still have a plan to review the Sont.exe remake at some point, and yes, if you didn't know, there is an officially made Sont.exe remake by the original author. It is also probably one of the most influential video game face creepy bosses ever written, one that came to define the genre and probably a good portion of all creepy bosses to come for better or for worse. However, there is another video game creepypasta that predates Sonic.exe that equally influenced the genre and is, to this day, one of the best ones out there. Ben Drowned Ben Drowned, originally published as Haunted Majora's Mask Cartridge, is a three-part multimedia alternate reality game, or ARG, web serial created by Alexander D. Jostable Hall. Now, I'll be honest, in the research for this topic, I had no idea that Ben Drowned had actually gone on as long as it had, starting in 2010 and ending on Halloween Day of 2020. The first arc of the series, titled Haunted Cartridge was released in 2010. It follows college sophomore Jostable, who after acquiring a haunted N64 video game cartridge of Majora's Mask, is plagued over the course of a single week by the presence of an omniscient being called Ben. The second arc, titled Moon Children and taking place from late 2010 to early 2011, follows the public emergence of a mysterious cult who worship the moon by way of human sacrifice, or in their words, Ascension. The third arc, titled Awakening, began in March of 2020, following the new and returning characters who have been involved in multiple events of the current year. This arc introduced new scenarios detailing the aftermath of an in-universe event in 2018 that caused the collapse of civilized society, as well as continuing stories established in the previous arcs with the intent of tying them together. In other words, there is a lot of story here, and it might be difficult to relay it all here for you in a digestible format, but I'm going to try my best, at least with the first and second arc. So consider this entry as multiple entries as I break it down for you all. Ben Drown was first published as an online serial and web series with chapters released daily between September 7th and September 15th of 2010 on 4chan's X board. This first arc came to be known as the Haunted Cartridge arc. The second arc, The Moon Children, began from September 17th that same year until July 15th of 2011. Hall used a method of transmedia storytelling through a combination of YouTube videos, written chapters, and audience input to weave a story about a character named Ben, who is, supposedly, a malevolent spirit of a dead child who haunts the author, referred to in the story as Jostable, in a copy of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. The first arc is told in first person, as the author comes to the audience, in this case an online forum, for help figuring out this strange game he bought. This was incredibly innovative and interesting, as not only was there the scary story layer to this, but these videos showcasing exactly what the author is describing in the posts breaks away from that troublesome problem so many video game creepypastas have of the author not showing the readers what they are talking about, with it being so easy nowadays. Not to mention, it being focused around a game that many consider to be a rather dark, oppressive, and macabre entry in the Legend of Zelda series, and you have what would become the story that inspired video game-based creepypastas as a whole. Now as for the story contents of the original Haunted Cartridge arc, which is fair to say what most people are familiar with if they've heard of the story, it can be summarized as follows. In September of 2010, Jostable, a college student bought a suspicious Nintendo 64 cartridge labeled simply Majora. The cartridge came from a disturbing old man at a garage sale. When Jostable plunked the cartridge into his N64, the save data of what he assumed was the former owner of the cartridge, Ben, was still on it. As Jostable plays the game, little irregularities begin to pop up that aren't at all normal for the game. Eventually, these inconsistencies turn into outright glitches, leading Jostable to go online, in particular, 4chan, 
to post about his playing of the game as it unfolds. Over the course of several sessions, over a series of days, Josta will write some painstaking detail about each bizarre scenario he finds himself in, including spontaneously bursting into flames and lying unconscious or dead as the Majora possessed Skull Kid looks on in silence, as well as him attempting the fourth day glitch, a well known glitch in the Majora's Mask community where you skip the third day's ending with the ability to explore the in game world as depicted in the credits section, which leads to several bizarre scenarios involving this Link statue. Eventually, Jostable tries to give the characters back to the old man, but is informed that the old man moved away. Jostable, after hearing from the neighbor as to what happened in the house uh, that the old man lived in, comes to the conclusion that the a cartridge is possessed by the spirit of its previous owner, a 12 year old by the name of Ben who had drowned almost 8 years prior. Subsequently, a figure calling themselves Ben seemingly begins contacting him in and beyond the game itself, including changing his computer's screen wallpaper to depict the LG of emptiness as seen here, and speaking through the online artificial intelligence Cleverbot. Using the LG statue as its physical form, Ben seems to take pride in being able to manipulate Jostable, who subsequently describes a series of dreams about the moon children depicted in the game's finale, including himself physically transforming into the LG, and how he believes he saw the old man who sold him the cartridge on his street looking into his window. Eventually, Ben is revealed to have been hijacking Jostable's computer and providing a false account of the story's narrative and resolution to 4chan and YouTube, using it to escape the cartridge onto the internet, declaring, Now I am everywhere. A secret note from Jostable after an apparent epilogue from his roommate Tyler, who accompanied Jostable to the old man's former house after the first time he played the game, offers the true telling of the events and references videos that were never published, seemingly because Ben had deleted them. After publishing his final account of the past few weeks, called The Truth. RTF, Jostable is never seen again. This is the main story most people are aware of and as it stands works fairly well as its own story outside of the sequels and further developments in the story. This is one of those creepy creepypastas that despite it being clearly very well edited clips from Majora's Mask mixed with a scary story, it is written well enough that you could find yourself getting wrapped up in the story and forgetting that it's all fake. There's a couple cliches here and there like getting the game from a creepy old man, but it's important to remember that this story was one of the first of its kind, so to me, while some of these may be kind of cliches, they are more than acceptable here. Plus, there's nothing wrong with cliches so long as the rest of it is at least interesting, which it more than is. The continuation of this story, known as the Moon Children arc, could be read by, at the time, decoding a secret hidden cipher in Hall's YouTube account where he posted the video evidence of his story. Investigative readers gained access to a website that led to the story's second arc, despite it taking the appearance of an ordinary mid-2000s website as similar to that of Angel Fire, readers were able to find hidden URLs and secret conversations between the website's users, depicting a narrative that the website was the home of a doomsday cult that was stuck in a time loop similar to the one serving as the main mechanic of Majora's Mask, with the website reselling itself every three days. Very clever. Information found on the website on the third day could then be used by readers either through through online methods such as emails or by submitting videos of users playing specific songs from both The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask to unlock an alternate path on the first day after the website is reset. This was an extremely interesting and innovative idea yet again, extremely ahead of its time. This alternate reality game of sorts added a lot of extra depth to the universe of Ben Drowned, uh, with some of the details being that the original Ben was apparently a member of said cult who had been sacrificed alongside several other individuals under the pretense of achieving what they call ascension, 
as well as that another member of the Doomsday Cult named Alex had recently betrayed them, and that he had their own prophecy of end times revolving around the moon, destroying the Earth, a la Majora's Mask, provided to them by their deceased prophet, Kelbris, in 1998. Kilbris, who similarly died under uncertain circumstances, is now seen within the cult as evidence of his own successful ascension. There's a bunch of other lore like that, but ultimately this cult wants to achieve ascension. Uh, they hold several parallels to the in-game world of Majora's Mask, you kind of get the point. Ultimately, this website ended with a cliffhanger with Hall announced 15th of 2011, ending the Moon Children arc. And that was the story, the entire story of Ben Drowned for years up until 2020 when Hall came back to finish the tale once and for all with the third and final arc, Awakening. Which I'm gonna be honest, would take like two more hours to fully explain in any way that would make sense. If any of this sounds really interesting to you and you'd like to know the conclusion to what ascension means and where all these story ties are ultimately going, then I would highly recommend you go watching a video that explains it all in better detail than I can in this iceberg video. In particular, I'd like to recommend YouTuber Ryan Geever's retrospective slash analysis slash general explanation of the story from the haunted cartridge arc all the way up to the finale of the awakening arc. He's a small YouTuber and it's very clear that he put hours upon hours compiling all the necessary footage and research and analysis to make sense of the story by the end, so I'd recommend you go check it out. It's a several hour journey, but hey, so are my videos, so what's the harm really? With that said, Ben Drowned is one of those premier creepypasta stories that has stood the test of time and stands as one of the most creative and detailed creepypasta stories slash ARGs ever created. Laughing Jack Laughing Jack was created by Steve Akins or Snuffbomb and actually consists of two stories, uh, that being Laughing Jack and the origin of Laughing Jack. The original tale of Laughing Jack follows the story of a mother and her five-year-old son James in a suburban neighborhood. Told through the perspective of the mother, her son is visited by a Laughing Jack out in their garden, uh, the mom assuming that this Laughing Jack must be some sort of imaginary friend that their son has made up. Some sort of phase is what she accounts it to. One night, the mom has a nightmare, witnessing the souls of Laughing Jack's past victims in an abandoned fairground. The song Pop Goes the Weasel playing throughout the place. The next day, Laughing Jack places James' action figures on top of his mother's nightstand, presumably as a way to taunt her. She questions James, but he simply tells her the truth, that Laughing Jack put those action figures on your nightstand, and much to her disbelief and oddly placed anger and overreaction that a couple of toys were in her room, I guess. Later, James receives a handful of candy from Laughing Jack in the garden. His mother notices this and demands him to tell how he got the candy. James again tells the truth, but she assumes that one of the next door neighbors gave him the candy. Later, Laughing Jack kills their family dog Fido, a very original name by the way, hanging the poor thing by its entrails on the kitchen light fixtures. Belly stuffed with candy, and the rest of the kitchen absolutely trashed. The mother witnesses this and takes her son next door, where she then proceeds to call the police. The police dismiss it as a robbery, but the mother refutes their assertions, claiming that all the doors were locked and none of the windows were open during the incident. She presumes that whoever did this was already inside her house prior to the incident. Not that any of these details actually matter, because I'm pretty sure the police would look into it further considering maybe shooting the dog or something while robbing the place. Yeah, that could happen, you know, maybe getting rid of the dog while you're stealing stuff, but gutting it and hanging it by its guts on the walls? Not exactly robbery material there. Anyway, they both return home and the mother decides to check on her son via a baby monitor instead of, you know, 
having him sleep in the same room as her or fucking sleeping someplace else. Something besides a worthless fucking baby monitor. So the inevitable happens and the mother awakes to a soft moan coming from James' room where she then sees her son nailed to the wall, disemboweled and his eyes gouged out and tongue and teeth removed. She also sees Laughing Jack in his true monstrous form who sadistically cackles at the sight of his work. Having enough, the mother grabs a knife and tries to kill Laughing Jack, but he simply vanishes into a black cloud. This distracts the mother, causing her to accidentally plunge her knife into James' still beating heart instead, killing him instantly. Of course, that means that the police arrive just on time to arrest her and send her to the nuthouse. She claims that being institutionalized is not that bad though. Despite noting that somebody, presumably Laughing Jack, keeps playing Pop Goes the Weasel outside of her room. That's the original story, and really, it's not the worst thing out there. It has a lot of dumb leaps in logic though, and I think its worst crime is being super predictable and cliche to the point that even back in 2013 or so, when the story was first released, I could tell everything that was going to happen before it actually happens. Also, Laughing Jack sort of reminds me of Pennywise from Stephen King's It, although with perhaps a slightly better backstory than being a giant spider, kind of. The origin of Laughing Jack is, like so many of these creepypasta villain stories, the major meat and cheese of where all the story and writing went. In fact, it's more than double the length. The story follows a lonely boy named Isaac Grossman in the 1800s of London who has an alcoholic father, an abusive mother, and is generally not living his best life. One Christmas night, Isaac finds a colorful box and when opened, a colorful jack-in-the-box clown named Laughing Jack pops out, declaring that he is Isaac's best friend. Laughing Jack was created by a guardian angel looking out for poor old Isaac, and the colorful clown's personality reflects that of the personality of his owner as it changes. Thus, if Isaac likes ice cream, then Jack likes ice cream, and so on and so forth. They had some fun times for a while until Isaac ends up killing the neighbor's cat in a game he was playing with Laughing Jack. Laughing Jack seems a little concerned, but Isaac seems to have rather enjoyed killing the cats. But all the same, this gets him in trouble with his parents and they end up sending him off to boarding school, forcing him to have to abandon Laughing Jack in the box that he first came out of. As a result, Laughing Jack would have to wait years and years before he would ever get out of the box again, forcing him to learn what isolation truly is inside that lonely little box. The only sounds he ever hears for years on end are both of Isaac's parents violently arguing with one another, which eventually changes his once colorful and happy suit into a monochrome, emotionless one instead. Eventually, Isaac's father kills his wife, and that in turn gets him hung out at the gallows, making Isaac the sole heir of the house he once lived in. He has long since forgotten about Laughing Jack though, and has turned into a cold and wicked man. Isaac grew up to become a cold-hearted serial killer who kidnaps, tortures, and murders several innocent neighborhood residents right there in his childhood home, even making furniture out of some of them once he's done. He brutally kills women of all ages, and at one point, tortures a young boy as slowly as he possibly can. Laughing Jack sees all of this from the confines of his box. Although horrified at first, Laughing Jack's personality soon emulates that of Isaac's evil tendencies. The killings begin giving him great pleasure, much like they do Isaac. One day, Isaac accidentally once more unleashes Laughing Jack when he actually remembers his colorful imaginary friend. Laughing Jack is now taller, darker, and a demonic version of his former self. Resentful of his traitorous owner, as well as perfectly emulating his vindictive personality, Laughing Jack proceeds to torture Isaac slowly until he dies a terrible death. 
using all the same weapons Isaac once used on all of his victims. Laughing Jack then goes on to torture children all across England. The end. So there's parts of the story that I like and parts that I very much dislike. I think the guardian angel type character reflecting the personality of its owner is a kind of cool idea. I like the idea that as Isaac grows more disillusioned with the world and more actively cruel, Laughing Jack grows more and more without meaning and contorts into the monster it eventually becomes. And I like the idea of the guardian angel, or at least the creation of the guardian angel, turning on its master because it's emulated his personality, which by that point he was pretty much a reprehensible monster. It's a unique enough premise for a monster, like you can clearly tell the most thought was put into that aspect of it. Honestly though, my one change would be to not have the other story exist whatsoever, and to just have this story, and possibly have Laughing Jack disappear once he kills his master, as if his purpose on this earth has been fulfilled. But maybe that's just me. Candle Cove. For our last entry this year, and the final stop on this iconic character filled beach, is none other than the famous Candle Cove. Written by web cartoonist and author Chris Straub from 2009, who you might also be familiar with with being the creator of the ARG channel Local 58. Chris has a good habit of catching the attention of the internet, and somehow always standing out in the crowd of works through themes of childhood, brainwashing, and memories slash false memories that make up our most vivid of dreams and nightmares. Playing into that, Candle Cove is told via an archive thread of forum posts from a website called Net Nostalgia Forums, where a group of users discuss an unusual low-budget children's TV show called Candle Cove that they all remember watching on Channel 58 back when they were children. The show is about a young girl named Janice who imagines herself to be friends with pirates. The pirate characters are said to be portrayed by string marionettes. As the users continue to reminisce, they begin to recall more disturbing details about the show, such as the character known as the Skin Taker, a skeleton pirate who wears clothing made out of children's skin, and an episode that consisted entirely of the puppets flailing and screaming while Janice cries. Much like a post on Reddit or 4chan, the sort regarding a piece of media from one's childhood that gave them a chill that others have vague memories of, the hunt begins with the users trying desperately to find out what that thing was, to see it once more, or perhaps to prove that it ever existed at all, to see what the thing that they saw from their childhood actually was, instead of the distorted memory where it now resides, it existing as one of the last remnants, the last reminders of that unyielding fear something could have over you that only your childhood innocence could have felt to its full extent. Something that we lose as we grow older, as that innocence itself distorts into bitterness that comes with the ever-present taste of reality. Yet, like so many of those same stories, proof of this show, Candle Cove's existence, proves difficult to find. In fact, there is absolutely no external evidence of it ever having existed at all, despite the user's best efforts to find anything out about it. The story closes with a user stating that he recently asked his mother if he remembered the show. She responded that he had such an imagination back then that every time Candle Cove came on, there was only static on the TV screen. That ending is the perfect way to end this little tale of false memories and lost media, as without a doubt it is one of the best creepypastas ever written for its simplicity yet instant relatability. We all have that one show, commercial, game, 
place, person, event that we remember from our childhood that seems impossible to find or fully re-experience. Some of us find it again after some sleuthing, some of us never do, and some of us find that those memories were but figments of our imagination, and that all those emotions and thoughts we had were all fiction. It sends a chill up one's spine because the scary part isn't the creepy lost show anymore, it's the fact that our minds were so easily able to create it. It makes one take pause and think about how much we can depend upon our memories. These moments that might have defined parts of our personalities, goals, and worldviews could all be but mere fabrications weaved by our unconscious minds. Perhaps they are shadows of something even more real, but then, what is real in the land of memories? Oh, and I'd also be amiss if I didn't bring up the sci-fi show Channel Zero, which is first season focused entirely around Candle Cove. I've not personally seen it myself, but it's gotten nothing but good reviews, so perhaps I'll give it a watch sometime. All the same, it is a, another example of a creepypasta that stepped beyond the internet mythos and into a different medium entirely. The Back Rooms Starting with one that caught on more recently, The Back Rooms is more so an idea than an exact pasta, though there have been several made about it. The most basic idea of The Back Rooms are these photos of what seems to be a windowless business space with no furniture, piss yellow lighting, and this strange aura that seems to suggest to many people that they may have been in a place like this before sometime in the past. As these images spread, the idea of why so many people seem to feel a strange ominous familiarity with the place was expanded upon to this place being the zone you enter when you no clip out of reality. Now if you're not familiar with the term no clipping, it's used for when you basically fall through the floor or geometry in a video game as seen here, usually falling into a great abyss of sorts. And actually before I go too far into that idea, I also wanted to point out that these pictures are also part of a larger phenomenon and idea that many refer to as liminal spaces. Which, according to inaliminalspace.org, is described as the following. The word liminal comes from the Latin word limen, meaning threshold, any point or place of entering or beginning. A liminal space is the time between the what was and the next. It is a place of transition, a season of waiting and not knowing. Liminal space is where all transformation takes place, if we learn to wait and let it form us. This can be taken as either the transition between two locations, like a hallway or a room that leads to other rooms, or in a more state of being, more metaphysical idea of it being the space in between one reality or childhood to adulthood. I mean, you can really get into this. There's a lot to it, but I think you get the idea. The idea comes more from a feeling that people have looking at these sorts of photos, which are typically abandoned or oftentimes empty spaces. A house with no people in it. A school during summertime. A mall, late at night and without a soul within it. It's a very interesting idea. Anyway, there are a lot of dedicated fans surrounding the back runes conceptually, in particular the no clip out of reality version of it, that has since further expanded into its own universe, that reads a bit like a creepypasta, or perhaps an SCP Foundation story even, or even just a general setting for other creepypastas to reside within. In fact, if you go to the Backrooms wiki, you can find a whole 
plethora of lore and info about the universe of the backrooms that is genuinely some of the most fun I have had reading something of this kind in some time. Well, I can't go through everything here since it really could be its own iceberg if I'm being honest. I'll show you some of the basic lore about the backrooms as if it were a creepypasta. To start, there are eight canon levels in the backrooms lore. Level zero, the lobby. Level one, lurking danger. Level two, pipe dreams. Level three, electrical station. Level four, office. Level five, terror hotel. Level six, lights out. Level seven, the flooded house. And level eight, the cave system. Each of these levels have their own rules, environments, sounds, means of survival, and entities that skulk around them. For example, level zero, which is the one that most of the original photos are based around, reads as follows, quote, level zero is a non-linear space, resembling the back room rooms of a retail outlet. All rooms in level zero appear uniform and share superficial features such as yellowed wallpaper, damp carpet, and inconsistently placed fluorescent lighting. However, no two rooms within level zero are identical. The installed lighting flickers inconsistently and hums at a constant frequency. This buzzing is notably louder and more obtrusive than ordinary fluorescent humming. An examination of the fixtures to determine the source has been inconclusive. The substance saturating the carpet cannot be consistently identified. It is not water, nor is it safe to consume. Linear space in level zero is altered drastically. It is possible to walk in a straight line and return to the starting point and end up in a completely different set of rooms than the ones previously passed through. Due to this and the visual similarity between rooms, consistent navigation is extremely difficult. Devices such as compasses and GPS locators fail to function within level zero and radio communication are distorted and unreliable. Level zero is accessed by an accidental no clip out of bounds in the wrong area in normal reality, unquote. This is all just lore based around one level of this world. And there are not just the eight levels, but sub levels, fake levels, negative levels. There are groups and communities living in some of these levels with their own culture and means of getting around this dreamscape. And then you have the entities, such as facelings which are described as quote humanoid entities that appear as ordinary humans with smooth featureless patches of skin where their face should be they dress in mundane clothes and are generally friendly and harmless wandering aimlessly around the various levels of the back rooms both adults and child facelings have been cited with children being more mischievous and prone to pranks and theft some theorize that they were once ordinary humans who got lost in the back room and lost their sanity. They are often preyed upon by other, more hostile entities, unquote. Or how about the hounds? Quotes, hounds are naked humanoid entities with shaggy black hair on their head and oversized mouths full of sharp, jagged teeth. They have long, bony limbs and sharp claws, and crawl around on all fours like a dog, hence their name. They are some of the most common hostile entities found all throughout the back rooms. They are less common on the deeper levels though. They will hunt down and attack anyone on sight, but can be easily avoided if one is quick and clever. Hounds are not very smart and can be easily given the slip, or even momentarily intimidated into backing down if one stares them straight in the eyes. Unquote. I could literally go on for hours here about all the dangerous entities that lay within the gauntlet of the back rooms. It's seriously some very creative stuff. If any of this has fascinated you or caught your attention, I would highly suggest you go check out the Backrooms fandom wiki to jump into a deep dive that sort of reminds me of the SCP Foundation, if you're familiar with that. Also, if you would like me to make a separate video going way more in depth of the Backrooms as well, maybe going through all the levels and describing as many creatures and stuff as I can, maybe even in the form of an iceberg, because why not, then let me know as the more I researched this topic, the more fascinating it became. A new scary rabbit hole that is more than worth a look.
Have you seen this man? So this one's pretty short, so I'll read it in full. Quote, In January 2006, in New York, the patient of a well-known psychiatrist draws the face of a man that has been repeatedly appearing in her dreams. In more than one occasion, that man has given her advice on her private life, yet the woman swears that she has never met the man in her life. That portrait lies forgotten on the psychiatrist's desk for a few days, until one day, another patient recognizes the face and says that that man has often visited him in his dreams. He also claims that he has never seen the man in his waking life. The psychiatrist decides to send the portrait to some of his colleagues that have patients with recurrent dreams. Within a few months, four patients recognize the man as a frequent presence in their own dreams. All the patients refer to him as this man. From January 2006 until today, at least 2,000 people have claimed they have seen this man in their dreams. In many cities all over the world, Los Angeles, Berlin, Sao Paulo, Tehran, Beijing, Rome, Barcelona, Stockholm, Paris, New Delhi, Moscow, etc. At the moment, there is no ascertained relation or common trait among the people that have dreamed of seeing this man. Moreover, no living man has ever been recognized as resembling the man in the portrait by the people who have seen this man in their dreams." Unquote. This story apparently goes all the way back to 2008 on a website titled Ever Dream This Man, where this story and the accompanying picture were first shown off. It was apparently supposed to be a publicity stunt to promote a film directed by Brian Bertino, also known as the dude who directed The Strangers and its sequel. Did anyone else realize those films were separated by 10 years? Well anyway, it didn't go anywhere and so now we're just kind of left with this fugly dude and the somewhat creepy or maybe more interesting story that accompanies it. Polybius. Odds are, you are probably very familiar with the video game related urban legend. It's been told, spread, referenced, and parodied to death and back by this point. But with that being said, you know I'm going to talk about it anyway. Polybius is far less a creepypasta and more of an urban legend from back in the early 2000s. Though to be fair, those two terms, creepypasta and urban legend, could very well be argued are just different words for what is essentially the same thing. They're scary stories spread through word of mouth or through the internet and are usually told as if they were a true story even if they're almost always never actually a true story. Tangent aside, the story goes that a mysterious arcade cabinet with bizarre gameplay called Polybius appeared suddenly in arcades in a few select locations in the early 80s. Polybius was supposedly a government-run crowdsourced psychology experiment based in Portland, Oregon. Oregon, during 1981. The game is reported to have strange effects on anyone who happens to play it, with many being extremely addicted to the simple gameplay, as well as producing other strange psychological effects on its players. The actual gameplay of the game is unknown, but is said to have graphics that was far ahead of its time, and was thus very impressive and caught the attention of anyone daring enough to play it. Men in black suits would periodically come to check on the cabinets, fidgeting with it, until the day came when those same men in black came to take the machines out of the arcades, never to be seen again, which left everyone asking what the true purpose of the game was. If it was a test, what exactly was it testing? That's the basic gist of the urban legend, and since then it's evolved, been retold, etc., and continues to persist as one of the most interesting legends of its kind. It's of course all fake, but given how simple the story is and how much mystery is left to the reader, like exactly how far did this experiment go, what was its true purpose, how deep does this rabbit hole go sort of stuff are the questions that keep it fresh and relevant to this day. Username 666. So I covered this one before on my YouTube content iceberg. It's essentially this video made by Nana82576. 
63 that showcases someone looking up 666 in the YouTube search bar and then refreshing the page over and over and over again until YouTube becomes this hellscape that hosts one channel with extremely disturbing content. It's less a written thing and more of a scary video that has more than made its rounds by this point. It's nonetheless one of my favorite creepypasta related videos and one that I'll never forget. But there's not really much else I can really add to it besides once again recommending that you go check out Nana's channel. He makes very cool stuff. Tails doll. So I have a lot of background on this particular creepypasta. For those unfamiliar, Tails doll is this kind of creepy looking character from the Sega Saturn game Sonic R. Now besides having a fucking banger soundtrack, most people know about this game for being kind of a racing game that was one of the only Sonic games that came out on the Sega Saturn when there wasn't a mainline Sonic game on the console and yeah yeah yada yada. But the other thing almost everyone knows about this game is this titular Tails doppelganger. In the game, it's just a random character that you can play as and race alongside the other characters. But at some point, it's unknown where it all exactly first started, and trust me, I really tried to look it up. People began writing about how creepy the doll from this game is, and eventually, a story came about known as the Tails Doll Curse. This, in a similar fashion to Bloody Mary, was sort of a summoning ritual for the doll. You had to sit alone in your bathroom with the lights out and play Do You Feel the Sunshine backwards for an extended period of time, which would eventually summon the doll and then curse your soul to hell or whatever was supposed to happen next, I guess. This wasn't even the only story or version of that curse either. Like some said you needed to beat all of Sonic R first and then beat the Tag Urit minigame in Sonic R as Tails Doll, which would be quite difficult by this point since you're going to have to capture Super Sonic at this point, and then you go to the bathroom ritual. And sometimes it'd be do you feel the sunshine backwards? or it would be living in the city backwards, which does make a little more sense since that's actually the level you unlock Tails Doll in, but somehow Do You Feel the Sunshine kind of became the more canon version, I guess. This was fairly widespread in the same way Santa EXE was and is now. There were tons of video on YouTube talking about it and trying to summon the Tails doll. There were fan art, fan games, and even entire websites dedicated to thank accounts about people who have witnessed the beasts, as well as other random scary stories related to the doll. I distinctly remember visiting these websites and watching these videos all the time back in the day. I even remember that there were attempts at creating a backstory for the doll, since in the game, there really isn't any. Uh, the story goes that someone at Sega had committed some kind of act or curse to infect the game with his or a demon spirit or what have you. It usually involves someone at Sega that did something bad that ended up transferring a soul into the game. In the end, it was all just fun and games, but I distinctly remember me and my brother and eventually even my sister getting really into it, scaring ourselves shitless to go into the bathroom trying to summon the Tails doll on multiple occasions. And we had a reason that this particular story connected with us at first so much, which involves me actually having to share a creepypasta of my own that is associated with the Tails doll. You see, one of the versions of the curse noted that after you completely beat the game, if you had did the summoning correctly, you would see a picture of the Tails doll at the end credits. In particular, this super creepy official render of the character. Yes, this ultra ominous picture is actually the official render picture for this character. This single detail is actually something that genuinely scared the shit out of me and my brother because, and I swear to god that I'm not lying about this, the first time we ever beat Sonic R back on the Sonic Gems collection on the GameCube, we both remember seeing this official render of the Tails doll show up before the cutaway to the credits. In fact, my brother said at the time that 
quote, this is all I get for beating this dumb game, a picture of a Tails toy, unquote. Which bear in mind, this was a good year before we had ever heard of the Tails doll curse, and we didn't even have ready access to the internet, at least not our own personal computers or anything at that point in time. And what's even more spooky is we have never been able to get this official render of the Tails doll to appear at the end of the game credits again since. We've tried so many times. So yeah, as if this render wasn't ominous enough, now I associate it with the real life video game creepypasta moment that I only realized was fucking strange after the fact. Like, there's no reason this official render would show up in the game, especially not there. But I swear it did. But maybe it's just the Mandela effect? I, I, I'm not even going to get into that. But all the same, I figured I'd at least share the story. Tails Doll will always hold a special place in my heart due to this personal connection. Bonus, where the bad kids go. So I want to include a few creepy bosses that aren't included in this iceberg, but are either very short and I think are worth setting the mood a little bit more, or just popular ones that I am either fond of or were absent from the iceberg that I felt should be added. Because you know, this isn't enough of an undertaking as it is. But anyway, this is where the bad kids go. Quote, I must have been six or seven when I lived in Lebanon. The country was ravaged by war at the time, and murders were common and frequent. I remember during a particularly vicious era, when the bombings rarely stopped, I would stay at home, sitting in front of my television, watching a very, very strange show. It was a kid's show that lasted about 30 minutes and contained strange and sinister images. To this day, I believe it was a thinly veiled attempt on the part of the media to use scare tactics to keep kids in their place. Because the moral of every episode revolved around very uptight ideologies. Stuff like, bad kids stay up late, bad kids have their hands under the covers when they sleep, and bad kids steal food from the fridge at night. It was very weird, and in Arabic to top it off. I didn't understand much of it, but for the most part, the images were very graphic and comprehensive. The thing that stuck with me the most, however, was the closing scene. It remained much the same in every episode. The camera would zoom in on an old, rusted closed door. As it got closer to the door, strange and sometimes even agonizing screams would become more audible. It was extremely frightening, especially for children's programming. Then, a text would appear on the screen in Arabic reading, that's where bad kids go. Eventually both the image and the sound would fade out, and that would be the end of the episode. About 15 or 16 years later, I became a journalistic photographer. That show had been in my mind all my life, popping up in my thoughts sporadically. Eventually, I had enough and decided to do some research. I finally managed to uncover the location of the studio where much of the channel's programming had been recorded. Upon further research and eventually traveling on site, I found out it was now desolate and had been abandoned after the big war had ended. I entered the building with my camera. It was burnt from the inside. Either a fire had broken out or someone had wanted to incinerate all of the wooden furniture. After a few hours of cautiously making my way into the studio and snapping pictures, I found an isolated and out of the way room. After having to break through a few old locks and managing to break the heavy door open, I remained frozen in the doorway for several long minutes. Traces of blood, feces, and tiny bone fragments lay scattered across the floor. It was a small room and an extremely morbid scene. What truly really frightened me though, what made me turn away and never want to look back, was the bolted, caged microphone hanging from the ceiling in the middle of the room." Unquote. And that's where the bad kids go. 
It's a short and sweet little creepypasta. I wanted to add this one in because I remember it being quite popular at the time and it stuck out in my brain as one of the ones that visually was the most creepy and direct to the point. There are a few parts that could be rewritten a little bit better, but overall this one's a lesser known classic. Word I can't say, mouse.avi. This is the Lost Episode creepypasta that came before all others. The granddaddy of Lost Episodes. And it's a fairly short one at that. It's basically about an old, lost, black and white episode of Mickey Mouse from way back in the day. The description of the episode is just Mickey on a looping walk cycle that slowly distorts, showing weird effects and colors. The background warping, Mickey's face contorting, and the sound of gurgled screaming resonating through the whole film. The last few seconds of the film are apparently a mystery as one of the only people who have seen it, a security guard, after having seen it, repeated the line, real suffering is not known seven times before, thus leaving it a mystery no one wanted to see themselves. The boss then goes on to say that many employees have tried to get the episode online that apparently has been uploaded online under the name of this creepy pasta that I cannot say. There's of course the famous video which I showcased in my YouTube Iceberg series before as well as various other versions that have since been made. But yeah, that's about it. For the granddaddy of lost episode creepy pastas, it's not too bad. It's fairly short and straight to the point but yeah that's about it i hate you so i hate you is an interesting creepypasta for a few reasons and number one it's the first of our super mario variety of creepypasta and second it's written by the prolific slime beast which if you were in the creepypastas back in the day you already know who this guy is but if you don't he's the author behind some of the most popular and generally well regarded creepypastas he's also the guy who runs the official creepypasta reddit page and has since gone on to write several books and creepy story anthologies in general. All of this to say, he's gonna come up quite a few more times on this iceberg. That being said, this is definitely a strange one to introduce him with, as this is actually a troll pasta. Another term that vets would know about very well. Troll pastas are badly written creepypastas that were badly written on purpose. It's either meant to be a joke, to be super extreme, or or to poke fun at other popular creepypastas or tropes, etc. However, this is an interesting troll pasta because it's written to troll people into thinking it was a serious attempt at writing a video game creepypasta. The story sees our narrator describe how important Super Mario World is to him in a similar way to Sonic EXE, as well as his background of the game. How he played it off of the same Super Nintendo ROM for years. How he played it dozens of times and even used Game Genie codes to mess with the game and experience it in new ways. Well, one day when he's playing his favorite game, he comes across an eyeless boo, something which he provides ample screenshots of. And from there, the author describes a whole plethora of strange events that happen one after the other, including finding a hidden level of the game that can only be gone through with a cheat code. He has Mario go through this macabre gauntlet going from one thing to the other until he finally gets to the end of the level and ends up meeting with Luigi who apparently wants to kill Mario because according to the narrator he's always played second banana to Mario and that the reason Princess Peach always gets captured so fucking fast and so often is because it was all an inside job by Luigi working with Bowser. And after that revelation, Luigi attempts to kill Mario. Mario doesn't fucking die. And he then dunks Luigi into a pit of lava, cries as Luigi screams to the lava, and then we get this final end screen. Now a few of you might be familiar with this creepypasta, it might be surprised for me to say that it's a troll pasta, as again, many read this creepypasta as if it were just a serious attempt. Including myself, I always took the creepypasta at face value back when I heard a few people read it back in the day. But upon reflection, there definitely are some context clues throughout the entire thing. 
For example, the whole creepypasta, the narrator is self-aware that he is writing a creepypasta and that it's not like those other video game creepypastas where the game is haunted or is summoning Satan, etc. No, instead it's a hidden level in Mario that reveals the true story of the game and is honestly taking the piss the rest of the way. The story's narrator is so overdramatic while being self-aware, it's actually kind of genius at making fun of not only the tropes of, say, Santa EXE, but also those that came after that tried to tell the same sort of story, but be sure to tell you that they were very different, that they weren't like Santa EXE, but still had that very dramatic tone to them. The type of creepypastas that lets you know that they know you read lots of video game based creepypastas, and that this one is not like those ones. Almost as if to try to one-up everything else that you've read before this point, only to then basically be the same thing that you've read up to this point. And again, it was actually so good at emulating that exact style of creepypasta that most people just assumed it was totally a real take on writing one of those types of stories. But upon rereading it for this video, I could tell you it just felt too much like something satirizing the genre to be a serious attempt. And sure enough, through some research, Slime Beast has actually said that it was always intended to be a troll basta. And just to be sure that he wasn't rewriting history with that a little bit, I did make double sure, and yes, the forum he originally posted it to, one of the very first responses to his story right after was that it was a troll basta. Slime Beast has done this before as well, like the time that he wrote a creepypasta that was impossible for narrators to read without giving away the twist ending called Sad Kitten. But yeah, it's a badly written creepypasta on purpose to poke fun at the tropes at the time, which is funny because again, a lot of people unironically like this story in the same way people unironically liked Sonic.exe. There are even fan games surrounding this story the same way there are Sonic.exe. I even remember back when some ordinary gamers read creepypastas that he considered it to be a pretty good creepypasta, that it seemed a little bit better than some of the other video game creepypastas he read. I remember that this story for a time was considered one of the better video game creepypastas, even though it was always meant to be a shitty one. Nineteen ninety nine. So this one is a classic written by Camden Lamont, originally posted on his website Slack Lalane, and opens on the following paragraph Quote the year is 1999. That sentence brings me back to my senior kindergarten class when I was five years old, where we used to read out the date on the blackboard every single day. The year 1999 exists as a stain in my mind, however, as a memory that will not go away, no matter how I try to forget it. 1999 marked the year I lost my first tooth, my first time on a plane, and unfortunately, the early loss of my childhood innocence." Unquote. The story goes on to see our narrator account how, when his father got tired of hearing his son whine about not being able to watch Pokemon on the days that he was watching football on the family TV, so he ended up getting his son a small boob tube TV with bunny ear antennas and everything to boot. It only had a select number of channels, but the narrator was at least somewhat happy to just have something of their own to watch things on. Eventually, after mostly sticking to Channel 2, TVO Kids, he ends up discovering Channel 21, which seems like a strange kids show channel that the narrator proceeds to describe in detail, including a show about a guy in a bear costume who went by Mr. Bear and usually had some sort of guest on. But the guest was always a kid. What unfolds is a tale of a man using a local broadcasting station to lure children into his house so he can use them for his show and do other things that are quite dark and awful and 
evil. The story is written as if it were a blog, with each new chapter being a new post to the blog. I suppose I have a bit of a soft spot for stories that recount bad or scary memories from childhood and reflecting upon it with an adult mind. And the opening blog post, or chapter I suppose I should say, to this entire thing is so well written and put together, it just captures me immediately with the concept and the story and all the dark things that then proceed. My only real gripe with the story is that it does meander quite a bit in the middle. And I think it also sort of blows its pesto sauce a little early for my liking. And by that I mean the chapters that follow the first one have little inklings and bits of interesting stuff, but a lot of it is sort of waiting for the interesting stuff to come back up and getting reintroduced to the narrator and what he's doing. And yeah, I mean, it's somewhat interesting, but it does definitely leave you wondering where the fuck this is all going. And spoilers, not really anywhere. I, I mean, once you find out that Mr. Bear is killing kids and throwing them into a pit of fire for some sort of ritual of some sorts, I mean, you can't, it doesn't really, the story never really tops that. Okay, it just doesn't. And the closest it comes to it is in the later chapters, which is the part that kept me invested when Mr. Bear supposedly gets in contact with our main character. As in the original story, the original blog post, he was going to appear on Mr. Bear's show at some point. But... It didn't end up happening, but the later blog posts make it seem as though Mr. Bear is somewhat obsessed with the one that got away, maybe. But that doesn't end up going anywhere, so it kind of feels like a red herring, but it was a really interesting red herring, and I kind of wish the story would have gone in that direction. But all well, the stuff it does do well, it does very well, and I'd still highly recommend it. Jane the Killer. So this one was more than a rabbit hole than I originally thought it was going to be jumping into this. So, Jane the Killer. The one that I'd say most are more familiar with is titled Jane the Killer, The True Story, and follows our protagonist, Jane Arkansas, who is a 14-year-old girl and neighbor to Jeff the Killer and his family before they die and what have you. The first half or so of the story is basically a retelling of Jeff the Killer's story through Jane's perspective, as she just so happens to always be around for all the major events. Jane's commentary is next level edge with a dash of nonsensical logic and words being misused used for just a little bit of mwah, spice. She seems suspicious of Jeff from the start, even though she really has no reason to since Jeff is really only defending himself up to the very end of the original story from a bunch of bullies. And see, I think the intention here was to have Jane be or seem more clever and intelligent because she was able to see the signs that Jeff was going to be a killer ahead of time. But it actually just makes her seem like a total bitch and dumbass because there's no reason she should ever get those signs at all. She seems to base the entire idea that Jeff is a bad kid off of the fact that three bullies hassled him and his brother and he stood up for himself there and maybe beat them up a little bit too hard, sure, but at the very least he wasn't starting the fight anyway. However, what's actually very interesting as well is she seems obsessed with this new kid, Jeff for no real good reason, since she seems to think he's weird and not good to be around, yet she also keeps following him around and his brother's every move. One particularly funny scene is when Jeff and the bullies are fighting at the house, you know, when the teenagers have guns and no one is doing anything to stop them. Jane was apparently at that party and manages to run outside of the house, call the cops, and run back in with a fire extinguisher when she sees Jeff screaming on the ground on fire. However, just in case you think it was going to be that Jane saved Jeff the killer here, no, she doesn't actually use the fire extinguisher to save Jeff. She instead screams at his screaming, fiery self, faints, and manages to knock herself the fuck out by banging her head against the fire extinguisher. 
Anyway, after she wakes up in the hospital, she gets hassled by a nurse for some fucking reason. And from there, the nurse, her friends, and basically everyone keeps asking her if Jeff is her boyfriend, or if she has a crush on him, or if she's gonna hook up with him, all of which she denies. But, Baka, no, I don't like J Jeff. No, but actually, this comes out of nowhere since the only time she is ever within contact with Jeff, like physically, is when she sees him on fire and she faints. I guess he was a little too hot for her, uh huh? Actually, she faints like two other times during the course of the story. Story, each time having to do with seeing Jeff, so uh, it might not be too far off with that joke actually. But yeah, it's really weird tongue wise, especially when we get to the third act where Jeff's family and Jane's family were originally going to have a dinner party. Um, I guess because Jane was nice to Jeff because she was going to put him out, you know, of his misery with the fire extinguisher, um, but still didn't. But oh well. But of course, Jeff. Jeff ends up killing his entire family just like in the original story and then he ends up killing Jane's whole family and sorting them all around a dinner table for her. We of course get a pseudo Texas Chainsaw Massacre family dinner scene but not cool or scary in the slightest actually. And then Jeff after taunting Jane for a little bit because he wants to make her beautiful just like he is, he lights her house on fire and herself on fire. She then wakes up in the hospital later, all burnt up and very upset. Though not about her parents and friends being dead mind you, but that she has been lit on fire and didn't turn into a big titty goth girlfriend. No, she's just a plain old burn victim now. She is then medically induced to faint and then she eventually gets a present delivered to her hospital room from none other than Jeff the killer himself. The gift he gives her is a totally emo makeup mask so that she can look cool and stuff and be his girlfriend. So then she dons the mask he gave her for some reason and then swears her revenge on Jeff the killer, making it her life's mission to kill him. I sped up a bit here near the end, but I think you get the point, that's basically all that happened. This is the version of Jane the killer that would later be thrown in the spin-offs, have new stories and fan fan fiction and fan art made around her, and of course have plenty of Jane x Jeff fan art made between them even though it should make no sense and she wants to kill him, I guess we gotta have those OTP creepypasta pairings anyway, huh? It's not a well written story, but as a weird pseudo sequel to Jeff the Killer, it's fucking fun enough though. I mean, it does match the tone and issues of the original Jeff the Killer so well that it might as well well be the official sequel. They go together so perfectly. So in other words, it's a stupid awful story, but I love it all the same. It's a great read. However, as I said, this is the one everyone knows about but it's actually not the original story. See, with a name like Jane the Killer, the true story, as well as the opening of said story talking about how she's gonna set the record straight about her character, it's no shock that this famous pasta fan work is in fact a fan work of another fan work written by author Fear the Black Wolf or Mr. Angry Dog. The original Jane the Killer story was titled Born of Science, Jane the Killer. Now, the thing is, the original story is actually worse in my opinion though. The story follows Jane Richardson this time, who had her parents killed by Jeff the Killer and works at IHOP. So she's hopping along and eventually she sees a brochure that says they'll pay her 150 bucks for giving her blood away to them. So after saying about a million times that it'll really help me pay my rent off if I go there, she goes there. There being a shady blood bank. She has her blood taken and then leaves. Then later, she ends up doing the same thing again for $10,000 this time, which yeah, that's, that's quite a jump. 
She doesn't find anything suspect about this though, or really anything shady about this situation at all. Now, the direction I thought this story was going to be going into was they weren't just taking her blood, but they're also maybe injecting something into her, like a little bit. That was like a test that was eventually gonna turn her into Jane the Killer or some stupid shit like that. Uh, but no, actually, through a contrived chain of events, she ends up being under the knife of the blood bank after she was already paid at least twice by this point. But not just under the knife of the blood bank, but also the sheriff's office, the government, and by that I mean like several branches and chains of the government just all fucking there. All of which want to drain her of all her blood and replace it with a serum called, and I'm not making this up, liquid hate. She of course is more than happy to do this because... Uh, um, because... I have no fucking idea. So Jane has all the blood drained from her body and for like a moment she dies and sees her parents and blah 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 blah. And then the liquid hate revitalizes her. And as it turns out, the liquid hate turns her into a fucking super soldier who can heal instantly, has a murderous bloodlust, and that the government has no way of controlling. This was all apparently part of the plan though, so that they can now have a super soldier that can go after after Jeff the killer because the government isn't capable of stopping an edgy emo kid with a knife. Okay, and so Jane the killer goes off into the night, nude, something the author takes careful measure to have us know at least five times in the last couple paragraphs of the story. And she goes on to don some black clothes and other such shit that it goes into too much detail over. And then she goes on to hunt for Jeff the Killer. And that is the end of the story. So yeah, that's the story of the original Jane the Killer. Except, the author behind this work also wrote a secondary piece to go along with the story titled Jane's Letter, which is Jane writing a letter to Jeff the Killer, in which she left at the scene of a crime she just committed where she killed a whole fucking family. Now, you see, in this version of Jane the Killer, she kills innocent people because she hates serial killers and wants to kill them before Jeff gets to them first. Excuse me, what? Now, if you're having a hard time making sense of that, then don't worry. I will happily explain it to you. You see, Jane the Killer is a stupid bitch. But anyway, that's enough of Jane the Killer for now. Boy, there are some weirdos out in this jungle. Shh, shh. You hear that? I think we may fare better holding out here for a second. We have a long journey ahead of us after all. And I cannot afford for it to come to a bloody end. So soon. Pin Pal. Pin Pal is a masterpiece. Plain and simple. If you haven't read the story, or at the very least heard Mr. Creepypasta read it in full, then you are missing out on one of the most engaging, disturbing, and emotional roller coaster rides that I've ever read in a Creepypasta format, that is. And actually, more than just a creepypasta, it's just a great story that I cannot speak highly enough of. But with that being said, what the hell is it about after all this build-up? Well, the original story is broken up into five chapters. Footsteps, balloons, boxes, screens, and friends. Originally posted by Reddit user 1000Vultures, or Dathan Arabach on the r slash no sleep sub, the story is told through the non-linear memories of our protagonist that relates to several odd and scary incidents that all start interconnecting with one another, all having to do with an obsessed stalker who tracks him throughout his childhood. It all 
starts with an incident when our narrator wakes up outside of his bedroom, and instead, out inside of a forest. A strange place that he's never been, even as someone who explored the woods when he was young, he'd never been to this odd clearing. There, there's also a shark blow-up floaty, an odd but perhaps metaphorical detail. Moreover, the narrator not only recounts these strange incidents, but how the stalking only got worse, as he seemed to want him and his mother to know that he was stalking them, that he is seeing their every move. The story eventually moves on the present day as the mystery around these events finally divulge themselves and a dark truth is revealed. Which I would go into, but it's a long story and I kind of don't want to ruin it for someone who's never experienced it by giving away the spoiler. Uh, plus, it's one of those types of spoilers that would need like a ton of context from the entire story and yeah, I don't want to be here for another 30 or 20 minutes going over every single chapter. What I will say is our boss has a way of words that really hooks me in. From the relatable yet insightful narrator, to the realistic tone woven through dialogue, to the twists after twists after twists, and moments of pure dread grounded in realistic reactions that truly makes this one of my all-time favorites. Now, the only negative I will say about the story is during parts of the middle leading up to the end, it does sag a little bit but the ending more than makes up for it. That's all I'll say about that. Auerbach would later publish his story into a full-on novel, adding some extra details and what have you, but overall telling the same basic story. He's also since written another novel, which I haven't read yet personally, but I might give it a go sometime soon. But anyway, in a sea of good, bad, and ugly creepypastas, Pen Pal certainly sits above many of them. Especially the second chapter, Balloons. Like, if you only were gonna read one part of this whole story, at the very least, read that one. Because that one's enough to make you stick through the rest of it, if you so wish. But it also works exceptionally well as just his own little short story. Bonus entry. Short story time. The Portraits. There was a hunter in the woods who, after a long day hunting, was in the middle of an immense forest. It was getting dark, and having lost his bearings, he decided to head in one direction until he was clear of the increasingly oppressive foliage. After what seemed like hours, he came across a cabin in a small clearing. Realizing how dark it had grown, he decided to see if he could stay there for the night. He approached and found the door ajar. Nobody was inside. The hunter flopped down on the single bed, deciding to explain himself to the owner in the morning. As he looked around, he was surprised to see the walls adorned by many portraits, all painted in incredible detail. Without exception, they appeared to be staring down at him, their features twisted into looks of hatred. Staring back, he grew increasingly uncomfortable. Making a concerted effort to ignore the many hateful faces, he turned to face the wall, and exhausted, he fell into a restless sleep. Face down in an unfamiliar bed, he turned blinking in unexpected sunlight. Looking up, he discovered that the cabin had no portraits only windows. Charlie the Killer. You thought we were done with killer stories, huh? <laughs> what, what if I told you? We're just getting started. This is one of the most infamously bad creepypastas around. In fact, it's so bad and so cringe that I genuinely spent half an hour after reading this trying to find out who wrote it or where it was first posted to so I could know if it was a troll pasta or if it was like the most blatant example of a self-insert OC Jeff the Killer fanfiction that I've ever read. In the end, I came up kind of short of that answer, but I feel as though I can't really do this one justice without reading it in full. So without further ado, this is Charlie the Killer. Jeff is nearly 18 now, and meeting Jane the Killer was a big thrill for him, as she died a tragic death from falling down the stairs. 
But this didn't stop his psychopathic ways. Charlie was going through a rough bullying stage of school and was beginning to get depressed and hearing voices on her head. They were telling her to do stuff. She just put them in the back of her mind and carried on with getting shoved into lockers and <laughs> beat up in the girls' bathroom. She heard the voices screaming at her until one day she snapped and listened to the voices in her head and pulled out the copper piping from the wall and stabbed her bully to death then licked the blood off of the pipe. She leaned near the bully's body and whispered, Now you know how I felt when you called me ugly and said I was too fat to meet anyone who'd like me and that I was a whore who should myself. After she realized what she'd done, ran away. She didn't feel bad about this. Actually, she felt quite glad. She wanted to do more. So Charlie went out. She killed more people just because she liked the feeling of knowing she wasn't in fear anymore. Charlie was never a mean girl. She always just sit there and take the crap. She had beautiful eyes with brunette hair, but she started wearing really dark makeup and dyed her hair black. She'd read the Jeff the Killer stories and looked further into this as Jeff was her inspiration. She went on and started doing what Jeff did. She used to say, Don't go to sleep. I want you to feel the pain I went through. Then she would pull out their guts and burn them in their own stomach acid, washing his blood would fly everywhere. Charlie became the talk of the town. One day, she went on a search for Jeff the Killer. She looked everywhere, hoping that one day they'll meet. Charlie finally met Jeff. Jeff looked at her. He didn't say a thing. His eyes were locked onto hers. He walked up to her and brushed her hair behind her ear and kissed her on the cheek. Charlie blushed and questioned Jeff. Why do you like someone like me? I'm just a fat, ugly whore. Jeff looked down at the floor and then looked up at Charlie again. You're the most beautiful person I've ever met, and you're not fat, ugly, or a whore, Jeff spoke. I think that we should be together, as I've heard a lot about you and I was fascinated. Charlie started blushing as Jeff grabbed her cheek and brought his lips close to hers. She pushed away. Why did you push me away? Don't be scared of me, please. Jeff said as they were stood down an alley in the rain. Jeff, you don't know what I've been through. All I do is push people away. Charlie whimpered as tears started streaming down her face. I will always love you, no matter what happens. Jeff said, wrapping his arms around Charlie. I have the urge to kiss you, but I feel as though... If I do, that you'll just leave me. My father left me after violently beating me and my mother. I don't want to fall in love with you, as then I'll have to trust you, and I don't want to end up myself like my mother. Charlie began to explain. I will never hurt you. You're the most precious thing to me. I've been waiting to meet you as soon as I heard about you. After being with each other for two years, Jeff decided it was time that Charlie and him should get married. Charlie, Jeff leant down on one knee. Will you do me the honors of becoming my wife? Jeff opened up a case to see a gorgeous ring with little diamonds going around the edge. Yes! Charlie squealed in joy. Yes, I will marry you! As tears of joy streamed down both of their face. They went back home. A week before the wedding, Charlie sits down at the bottom of the bed and begins to cry. What's wrong? Jeff curiously asks. I'm... I'm pregnant! Charlie cries. What? Jeff says surprisingly. I'm 13 weeks pregnant. I was going to tell you before, but I didn't want to make a big fuss and then we lose it. Charlie! This is great news! The end. So, um, yeah, this is either a very well put together troll pasta, or this is an extremely edgy emo's creepy pasta about Jeff the Killer falling in love with them instantly and marrying them and having a baby. So, uh, I think this one speaks for itself, really. Because it fucking sucks! Because it fucking Because it fucking Because it fucking sucks! Annie96 is typing.
This one's written as though it were two people instant messaging or DMing each other, David and Annie. David and Annie start off having a normal conversation before Annie notices that there's someone out in her backyard, messing up the garden, digging a hole. David tells Annie to call the cops, but then she notices that the man looks exactly like David, despite David clearly being there typing the whole time, trying to help her through this situation as it gets worse. Emotions get higher as the strange doppelganger then breaks into Annie's house, David trying anything he can to help her. Annie is convinced that this has something to do with David and that he has to try to find a way to stop it. David doesn't know how, but he admits that he always thinks about Annie all the time and tries his best to think the doppelganger away. Eventually the strange man is gone and Annie says that whatever David did made the man disappear and that she didn't know that he felt that way about her. The conversation begins to end before David suddenly stops and realizes something. He then asks Annie how he knows that this is her typing to him right now and not the man that was breaking into her home. To which Annie signs off. Pet scop. I mentioned this before in my YouTube content iceberg video, but this is basically an elaborate ARG that uses this original fake PS1 game to tell a complex story through the series of Let's Plays that is acting as if it were a real lost PS1 game. Beyond that premise though, I can't really begin to do it justice here. There are several channels that have long in-depth videos slash video series talking about every twist and turn in this developing tale, so if this premise sounds interesting to you at all, I'd highly recommend you go check some of those out right now. It's a fun rabbit hole to dive into, but I wouldn't know where to start or stop if I were to get into it here. Needless to say though, if you like the Ben Drown ARG, then this sort of reminds me of that quite a bit, but with a completely original game, which is pretty damn cool. Abandoned by Disney. This is one of the most popular creepypastas of all time, and a pasta that was written by the aforementioned Slime Beast and the one that he's most well known for writing. Many of you might be familiar with this famous pasta, but by the same token, you probably aren't aware that it's actually the first part of a three part series. Kinda almost four, but we'll get to that. So why don't we have a look at the whole story and see what's up with it, shall we? The original story, titled Abandoned by Disney, that started it all, and is the main standalone piece that most have read, reviewed, discussed, etc., follows our narrator as he talks about the history of a Disney amusement park that was built out on an island called Mowgli's Palace. The pasta describes what the place was like, as well as the troubled history around its very inception and general creation, notably with the natives of the area. Eventually, the island park was completely abandoned, thus the title Abandoned by Disney. Our narrator notes how any memory or official record of this place existing seems to have been completely written off or erased from the internet, or anywhere else for that matter, and this gets his curiosity going. And eventually we see our narrator make his way to the deserted park, which is a total wreck by this point. Most of the goods or stuff there is completely stolen or broken, graffiti and general decay is everywhere. The story goes on for a little while like this as our narrator explores the place, up until he reaches a locked door for characters or mascots only. Luckily, the mechanism around the lock and door is so rusted over that our protagonist is able to make his way inside by simply busting it off, at which point he sees several mascot suits, including a photo-negative Mickey Mouse costume. Shortly after, he sees a human skull on the ground as well, and just as he's taking a picture of the skull, the photonegative mouse stands up on its own, turns to him, and asks him if he wants to see his head come off, which the mascot then does, and a stream of chunky yellow putrid blood starts bursting out of the mascot's costume body. This causes our narrator to nope the fuck out of there, noting that unlike the rest of the park which had abandoned by Disney, spray painted all over the walls and doors, that mascot room said something else. It said, abandoned 
by God. That's the general story, and while it's not perfect, I actually quite like this one, especially upon revisiting it for this video. The tone throughout most of it makes the whole thing feel like someone wanting to document lost media, or in this case, a lost theme park. And while the whole story is obviously made up, there are nuggets of reality in there. Like the fact that there actually are resort parks that Disney has straight up abandoned in real life, uh, one such example being Disney's Discovery Island. And the whole story really captures the imagination, or at least it does for me, due to this fact. Now most people will tell you that they like every aspect of the story up until the final bit about the Disney mascot pulling off his head. For many people, this ruins the rest of the story. It's a sudden shift to the paranormal and feels totally jarring from the rest of the work. And while I agree it is very jarring, and not the scariest thing in the world, at least to me, upon rereading it, and especially reading the other parts after it, I actually don't mind it at all. And I don't think it takes away from the rest of the story like many people have said before. Notably because the story ends shortly after this incident, and to me it leaves me asking questions and keeps just enough mystery as to what the fuck just happened that I think it complements the work in the end. Again, maybe it would have been more haunting or scary to just see a room full of dead bodies and decayed mascot suits, and maybe there can be a gun in the middle of the room, strange symbols on the walls and what have you. This would leave the exact same effect with you asking questions as to what the fuck just happened, as well as there being something scary enough for the guy to nope the fuck out of there without the sudden shift to the paranormal. The sequel to the story, which I'd say isn't as well known, but is still pretty up there as far as somewhat popular creepypastas go, is titled Room Zero. And I'd argue that this is actually an even better story than the first one. I say this because it's sort of a collection of stories. We have the same narrator as before, but they are now relating others' stories with Disney, their secrets, what places seem to be abandoned by them, as well as notably subtle but strange paranormal activity at some of their other parks. Of these stories includes a water slide that many children have gotten stuck in before for extended periods of time, and that on certain occasions you'll see like three or four kids go down the slide, but the last one to go down the water slide will come out first, while the others seem to come out in nonsensical orders to the order in which they entered without any explanation. There's also a notable detail at the start of the pasta about how our narrator thinks that he's being followed by Disney or some when working for Disney as he's noticed strange people following him from time to time, as well as the iconic Mickey Mouse symbol, this silhouette, seemingly everywhere he looks and goes, in places where it could make sense, but also notably in places that it simply shouldn't be in. The way this is written, it's not actually clear if the author is going crazy or if there actually is someone stalking them. The story then talks about some of the hidden areas at Disney World, such as the club made for executives and other exclusive members hidden in plain sight in a nondescript building, or the hidden hotels, bars, and other such areas of the park meant for adults or at the very least just not kid-friendly areas, which is based somewhat in reality as this Disney Park actually does have areas like that. The story then talks about the underground tunnel system for mascots and workers to use at Disney World, for getting to one place or another without appearing in areas where they don't belong. Now throughout the pasta, there are also several occasions of people wandering the parks that employees like to refer to as gas cots, because they wear strange Mickey Mouse themed gas masks. This eventually gets a payoff when an employee finds a strange, completely empty room down in the tunnel system, and begins wondering what such a large place is used for. When he asks around, no one seems to really know, none of the employees or anyone he seems to ask, up until someone suggests that the oldest of the employees still at the park, named Ida, might know what he's talking about. When he approaches her and asks her what that room was used for, she proceeds to tell him in a hushed and somewhat ashamed tone that that place is called Room Zero. It was meant to be a bomb shelter that could accommodate the entirety of the park's attendees and employees should the worst happen, and a nuke is being launched in that area. It was built during 
into the time when tensions were at their highest with the Cold War, and some interesting design elements went into its creation. The most notable of which being that they designed specially made Mickey Mouse and Goofy themed gas masks, as they thought the normal made gas mask would scare children even more in an already scary situation, and that perhaps seeing some recognizable characters might ease their mind even if just a little bit. However, that room was completely empty. There was no equipment, no gas masks, nothing. So impressed, Ida reveals that the current room zero is empty because anyone who goes in there is actually standing on it. Quote, someone or something sounded the alarm one day when the park was at full capacity. The warning was clear. It was supposedly an air attack. Security ushered everyone down, down, down into the tremendous shelter. There they were ordered to put on their masks and hunker down for the duration of the assault. Everything was quiet for about 30 minutes, save for the crying children and the frightened whispers. No one wanted to die, and so they were thankful in a way for the strange measure of safety. Then the first scream rang out. Hey! A man shouted. Quit pinching! Waves of shrieks and yelps rippled through the crowd from one wall to the other, back and forth. Who's running around? Settle down, someone hollered. Who's laughing? This isn't funny. Ow, who stepped on my foot? Despite security guards urging to calm down and keep their cool, the crowd became more and more agitated until finally, after nearly an hour of madness, the lights flickered, then died. What followed could only be described as utter chaos. In the dark, only the wails of the young and the anguished cries of the adults could be heard in a massive, swelling din that bloodied the ears of all within that black echo chamber. A group of staff members and a select few patrons made it out of the door, ready to face the war above rather than the insanity below. What they found, of course, was a desolate, yet untouched theme park. The music continued to play, echoing through silent storybook towns. Upon returning to room zero, the few who stood at the top of the steel staircase that led down into the pitch blackness heard no sign of the previous fray. There was only silence. Ida herself descended that staircase despite the begging of those she left above. She reached the reinforced doors herself now awash in darkness and hearing only the buzzing in her ears. A single voice came out of the darkness. The echo made it impossible to tell whether the mocking, raspy voice was at the back of the bomb shelter or if it was right in front of her face. Shut the door, dear. You're letting out the cold. Gripped by terror, she did just that. Within days, the entire thing, shelter, staircase, all of it, was covered with feet upon feet of cement. Air systems and generators above its ceiling were removed, creating a large, empty space. They're still down there, Ida told Hammer, down there with whoever that was, unquote. The story ends noting that Ida passed away soon after telling this story. Quote, accidental fall, supposedly, after getting out of bed to turn on the light. Such a company devotee, the paper reported, that her entire bedroom was covered with Mickey silhouettes, Unquote. This story, while dealing with a lot of the same themes and ideas as Abandoned by Disney, is ultimately the better work in my opinion. There's that same through line of reality mixed with fiction, and that ending, again, leaves you asking questions, but is also far more creepy to me personally. Also, reading these stories back to back actually makes the first one's jarring twist make way more sense, and flows into this next one so nicely that I actually feel the best experience is just reading these back to back. They really do work as a double feature. Now, as far as I knew, that was it for the Abandoned by Disney saga. But upon revisiting the story, I actually found that a third part had been written since then. One that tries to make sense of the mystery surrounding its universe of Disney, as well as a bookend for it all. 
Corrupt Us is the title of the third story in this trilogy. It starts off with the author noting that he has avoided Disney or whoever they hired to get rid of him for quite some time now, but that he believes that his time is more than likely limited, as he's not sure how much longer he can keep that up. He talks about his past posts, how people felt about them, as well as sort of going meta by addressing the critics and people who took issue with his stories as well as sharing a few more from people who have kept up with him, including a document that he was given by someone in an email titled Corrupt Us, which leads into him attempting to tie all these paranormal stories together. Corrupt Us is a file that outlines the various incidents and entities surrounding Disney, including the inverted Mickey character, the mass hysteria found in Room Zero, as well as various other incidents that hold a status of either being resolved, contained, pending, or abandoned, which most of them happen to be the latter. Our narrator combs over the various incidents, noting how this file is apparently an official leak from Disney themselves, which then leaves him asking, what does it all mean? Why do Disney call these incidents corrupt us? What exactly are they corrupting? Quote, corruption of what? Dreams? Ideas? Desires? I've never been a religious man, but I was dragged to Sunday school more than enough times to know about golden cows, false gods created by man, icons, graven images, characters, mascots. If you believe in the Bible at all, and I'm not sure that I do, especially not after what I've seen, then maybe God wasn't angry because people worshipped other things. Maybe he was afraid. Maybe if enough people believe in something hard enough, there's a chance it will come to be. Since we're naturally flawed beings, that means that there's a very good chance such a thing would become corrupted. If you think about it, Disney's animated films have always had one overriding message. Clap your hands and believe hard enough and Tinkerbell will live. When you wish upon a star, anything your heart desires. People like to say Disney has some connection to Satanism, but I never bought into that. I still don't. I think they've been trying to create that golden calf, a god idol that everyone believes in, one that everyone loves. It's almost as if any dream or idea that is shared by enough human hearts and minds has a real chance of being born into the world. The creatures, if any exists beyond what I saw of my own eyes, I think they're the deformed half-starts, random manifestations of some dark, unquantifiable non-life that seeped into our state of being. Their mistakes of reality, cosmic abortions, the corrupted. Did everyone in Emerald Isle harbor such a negative impression of Mowgli's palace? How potent was the fear of nuclear war on the day Room Zero became full. If you want to find Gascots and mystery voices, does that search bring about the very thing you're looking for? How many children have been disappointed, confused, or scarred for life when they saw Mickey without his head? These are questions I'm never going to be able to answer. I don't know if anyone can, unquote. The narrator then says his goodbyes, knowing that this is most likely the last time he will ever write to everyone like this again, and that's pretty much it. Well, this story isn't really much of a creepy story as it is world building for this universe Slime Beast has created. I nonetheless didn't expect to see Jungian ideas being thrown around and concepts that while obviously are meant to be applied to this story's universe, is also a bit of a conspiracy theory about the real life Disney company itself. A really crazy one mind you but one that's totally enthralling and again has just a couple bits of truth sprinkled in to pull it all together <laughs> not gonna lie it kind of sounds like the plot the persona 5 at any rate, reading all three of these stories together though makes for a pretty interesting narrative that while not perfect, certainly kept me interested and engaged the entire time and seems to capture the spirit of what I love about creepypastas so much. Beyond them being these short little scary stories, it's a short scary story that almost has you jumping to Google to find out if it's based on something real. 
but I think that's more than enough with Abandoned by Disney. There was one more story connected with the pasta that's written completely through suggestion box notes at a Disney theme park that's pretty good, but I feel like it's less of a continuation of this story and more of a quick one-shot within its universe. Bonus Entry A Mother's Call A young girl is playing in her bedroom when she suddenly hears her mother calling to her from the kitchen. So, she runs downstairs to meet with her. As she's running through the hallway, the door to the cupboard under the stairs opens, and a hand reaches out and pulls her in. It's her mother. She whispers to her child, Don't go into the kitchen. I heard it too. No End House so this is yet another multi-part saga creepypasta story. This whole second tier is full of those if you haven't noticed. But I do feel like I can sort of summarize this one a bit quicker. The original story is about our protagonist David entering the No End House, a haunted house challenge of sorts that pays its visitors 500 bucks if they can make it all the way through. He gets warned by a friend of his, Peter, that he shouldn't go in there, that no one has made it to the end. David of course goes anyway and is at first met with fairly stereotypical haunted house fare with Halloween decorations, jack-o'-lanterns, candy, all that sort of stuff. This, however, is a front as the nine rooms that follow spiral David into a non-stop abyss of terror, nightmares, danger, and general physical and psychological torture. One of these includes a room that is full of invisible bugs that constantly bite and gnaw at David's skin. Another sees him in a room with a little girl whose form is shared with that of a strange goat-like demon. He sees both at the same time, the girl and the demon, and the walls, all the doors, seem to be disappearing on him. The entire story is intriguing as it leaves you wondering what will happen next. What horrors or mind games await within the next room? Now I will admit that by the ending, I thought that pretty much everything you could do with the story had pretty much been done. And I say that mainly due to the fact that outside of just having more creative room scenarios, which would be very cool, of the surprise, the twist of the story is kind of been finished. However, the sequel to No End House finds David's girlfriend Maggie entering the No End House to save him. And while it's slightly different, up until the end, this one feels like it's almost a retread of the first story. We don't even have that many differences or creative new rooms for Maggie to go through, which made reading the sequel pretty disappointing and even a little boring in parts. The third story introduces some extra lore, a new character, and reveals who truly owns the house. However, as far as I know, it ends on a cliffhanger, and I don't think there's actually an official part four, though there is a fan-made part four, which I wasn't a fan of, so I won't even go into it. However, this story was also adapted by the Channel Zero series for its second season, though the show was cancelled shortly after that. I said before that when I was talking about the Candle Cove entry that the show got fairly high ratings, but I had never personally seen it and I still haven't, but I actually failed to take into account the fan reactions, which apparently were a little bit more mixed on the show in general. It was originally going to adapt way more creepypastas, sort of doing a new one each season, but was short-lived due to low viewer count apparently. You know, thinking back upon it, a show about adapting creepypastas into a series seems like it really should have been an anthology series, and by that I don't mean a new story each season since most of these stories are way too short to adapt into a full-on six or so episode series, but instead have every episode be a new creepypasta that's being adapted, with maybe an occasional two or three parter if it's something that's really in depth, but I can't even think of that many creepypastas that would justify that. Obviously the show's cancelled, so I mean, what's it matter anyway, but still, I feel like it could have been so much more. 
But anyway, no end house is a simple concept, but definitely a fun one. I will admit that I'm not so sure I'm as hyped about it now as I might have been back then. I may even say that this story is a little bit overrated in my opinion. I mean, the first story was perfectly fine by itself, not one of my absolute favorites. However, the more the story progressed with each new sequel, the more the story seemed to run dry on ideas and just sort of felt like an extended rehash of the original. Which, I won't lie, might have soured me to the original a little bit as well. If you decide to read it, I'd recommend just the first part personally. Play with me. So this one, this one's rather infamous. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure how much of it I can really go over here. The meat of the story is about a little girl named Sally, who has curly hair and green eyes. It's summertime, and her uncle comes over to visit, and almost the rest of the story is the uncle, um, doing bad things with Sally. Really, really bad things, if you catch my drift. The story is uncomfortable and genuinely gross. The bad things are thankfully never described in detail, but all the same, this one just isn't fun to read at all. The ending is also pretty weird and kind of stupid. See, eventually Sally died due to her uncle's bad things, and we have a time skip to a new family moving into her house. Well, the teenage girl that moved into the house sees the ghost of Sally, who asks if she wants to play with her. Which, might I add, is the exact same thing the uncle would say before doing the bad things. Which is really fucked up and I don't really see what the message is here. I'll be honest, this one is kind of trash. It feels like the whole thing is meant to be shocking with no real story or substance to it. I should note that topics of this nature I believe can be done well. When it comes to horror and storytelling in general, I believe nothing should be off limits. But with that being said, this story sort of feels like it was written by an edgy teenager who was using abuse of that kind for cheap shock value, especially with the ending. It all just leaves a bad taste in my mouth and yeah, it's just kind of dog shit. Clockwork, your time is up. Written by Soft Boys, this one is, um, well, also rather infamous. So, do you remember before when I said there was a strange sort of fantasy fulfillment from creepypastas like Jeff the Killer, or even Charlie the Killer, maybe even Shane the Killer? Or at least that's what it reads like, is fantasy fulfillment? Well, Clockwork Your Time Is Up is like the ultimate version of that. It's also straight up one of the worst written creepypastas that I've ever read. That was meant to be taken seriously anyway. From grammatical errors everywhere you look, a terrible Mary Sue-like protagonist, being a Jeff the Killer ripoff, and also it being extremely distasteful and cartoonishly mean-spirited in a similar fashion to our last story. It's almost universally hated and seems to be a bit of a breaking point for many with these dumb stories about teenagers who go through some tough times, suddenly get super powerful through the power of going crazy and killing their whole family and becoming an unstoppable serial killer because, b because they went crazy. And we all know if you go crazy, then you are suddenly immune to all known human hazards including bullets. But enough build up, what do the details of this story actually entail? Well, the story starts with our protagonist, Natalie Allette's father, yelling about how much he hates children and that there is no use for them, and then he beats his own daughter, Natalie. Cut away from that, and then later, Natalie's brother, um, invites her to his room and, um, does bad things to her that I can't say on YouTube. Then, she tells her friends at school about said bad things. Keep in mind that she is 9 years old by this point. And those friends then put that info out all over Facebook, I guess, and other social media sites, and people start calling Natalie, the 9 year old, a whore. And the parents never hear about this, or if they did, they literally do nothing about their son or the situation. Just, 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 just nothing. Nothing. Then, after those two moments of terrible, terrible trauma, we jump ahead to when Natalie is 16. Natalie is, of course, traumatized by those events. Oh, and her mother randomly doesn't seem to like her and acts pissy with her, so, you know, great family overall. 
Oh, and later when she gets to school, her teacher is mean to her and, and she forgot to bring her homework and so the teacher hassles her, you know, typical teenager drama and stuff, you know, it, it really sucks. Um, but also, what the fuck? You wanna talk about Whiplash here? The story has literally started with two utterly awful events, things that would be the breaking point in any other story, and then, uh-oh, Natalie's mom and teacher are rude to her? Um, okay? It just feels like the story is trying to build things to make this character of Natalie into as sympathetic a character as they can possibly muster in as short a time span as humanly possible, and it's quite jarring. Especially since the events beforehand are so cart Unishly evil and awful while also showcasing a real life event that can actually happen to people and it's used for cheap shock value right from the start of the story. It's either they wanted the character to come off as sympathetic as possible or they want it to be as extreme as possible, maybe both at the same time. Not to mention, why are a bunch of 9 year olds on Facebook? Why would people react that way to a 9 year old? having bad things happen to her in that manner. Why the fuck did no one call the police? You combine all these things and right off the get-go, this just isn't set in the realm of reality. This is sort of Rob Zombie movie universe logic. You know, the kind of universe where everyone's just terrible and awful and irredeemable. I'd say almost everyone in the story other than Natalie so far would fit into that. But just wait. Anyway, back to the rest of the story. Natalie likes drawing pictures where people are dying or being stabbed or just plain out drawing gore, which the teachers think is awful and her classmates think is gross and no one understands poor Natalie. Well, no one except for her boyfriend. But uh-oh, her boyfriend decides he's had enough of Natalie's sad life bullshit and can't take her drawing stuff anymore, I guess, and breaks up with her on the fucking spot. Again, yeah, and this is what I was talking about. We were introduced to this boyfriend specifically so we could have the scene where he breaks up with her literally a paragraph after that. Natalie has a father? Well, he must like the beater. Natalie has a mother? Well, she must hate her. Natalie has a brother? Well, he must do unspeakable things to her. Natalie goes to school? Well, everyone must hate her. Natalie has a boyfriend? Well, he must want to break up with her on the spot. Well, in response to her boyfriend leaving her, Natalie decides to stitch a big smile into her face. You know, sort of like a certain other creepypasta guy I know. Well, unfortunately, her mom sees this and decides to send her ass to therapy. Then, while in therapy, the therapist, Deborah, asks Natalie about what's been going on with her life recently, to which Natalie responds, Time. When pride, Natalie then says the following, quote, It makes you live through it, slowly progressing through life, being controlled by society, only to be tortured to seemingly no end, until you find you no longer have a purpose. It's a vicious cycle. Time does not end. It does not slow down. It does not speed up. It is violent. It makes you live through the torture over and over again, unable to fast forward through any of it. Natalie really had no idea what she had just said. She felt like she wasn't herself anymore. Could this be because all of these things she had kept contained? No, that was impossible. But for some strange reason, she liked it." Unquote. <laughs> My favorite part of this villain speech is when right after the author notes how Natalie had no fucking idea what she just said, it's just too perfect. Then, after Deborah asks Natalie what's really going on, Natalie says, Natalie isn't here anymore. This was apparently enough for the therapist to call her parents and have them sign over her rights and have her institutionalized and drugged the fuck up to fix her mind. I like how even the therapist, who seemed to be nice enough at first, doesn't actually give a shit and throws this girl to the wolves to be a guinea pig for drugs almost immediately upon the sign of her being fucked up. This of course was the expected response since things are just never looking up for poor old Natalie. 
Well, anyway, she wakes up later and is strapped down to a bed, and the doctor is like, Yo, bitch, we gonna give you mental drugs. And yes, they do actually call them that, just mental drugs. Well then, they put her to sleep with sleeping gas, and then she wakes up in the middle of their surgery, which I'm really confused what precisely they are doing here. I thought they were drugging her up, not putting her under the knife. What the fuck is going on? I can't tell if there is meant to be something shadier going on here, or if the author legit just doesn't know you don't need to put someone under to give them drugs. And that surgery isn't involved with giving them mental drugs? <laughs> well anyway, this acts as sort of an awakening. Something that has been vaguely hinted at in the story up to this point. Similar to that oh-so-famous feeling Jeff had. Natalie has had this voice trying to wake her up in her head about time or some shit. Well anyway, Natalie wakes up again after the surgery or whatever, and then goes ape shit and kills the doctor and some nurses and some cops that are there and basically anyone that's in her way, because no one can stand up to her invincible strength. She stabs into their bellies and their organs all slosh out. There's even a moment when a cop has a gun pointed at her, but can't shoot because he's just that scared of her. What are you, retarded? Well, anyway, I'm sure you all have it figured out where this story is going next. That's right, Natalie makes a trip back to her home and then slowly kills each member of her family in vicious ways, saying her catchphrase, your time is up stupidly after each kill. And then when she has successfully killed all the family members, which by the way, they're terrible people, so I guess there really is no stake at this point, she then cuts out one of her eyes and inserts a stopwatch clock in the empty socket and renames herself Clockwork and goes on to be a violent serial killer. The end. And that is the story of Clockwork, Your Time Is Up. Another one of those stories that seriously make me wonder if Rob Zombie's Halloween had more pull on the horror genre than I ever gave it credit for. If you're not familiar, Rob Zombie's Halloween tells the backstory of Michael Myers, a serial killer, the Boogeyman, that originally had no motivation for his crimes back in the original film. When Rob Zombie decided to make a remake of it, besides being just a worse version and loose retelling of the classic original film, it mostly focuses on how it was Michael Myers' upbringing that turned him into the monster that he is today. And at some point, the kid goes nuts and kills almost his whole family, though he did at least love his mom and baby sister, so he left them be. Michael also has a cartoonishly evil dad, an awful school bully, and an okay but sort of mean older sister, I guess. So we as the audience are meant to feel bad for him, the same way that with these edgy teen stories like Clockwork, we're meant to feel bad for this serial killer. Thus, strangely, the tone almost seems intent on just the becoming a serial killer. The universe is so full of awful, ugly, evil, or dumb people that you genuinely don't care if Natalie goes on to kill all of these people. Or at least, I don't. But that also means my investment in the story sort of goes out the window with it. It's just sort of some guy or gal's OC going on a power trip and then it ends. No drama, no tension, not even real horror. Just a cartoonishly tragic backstory, revenge killings, and scene. Like, these stories are trying so damn hard to have you feel bad for these characters, which I might consider feeling bad for them if they didn't, you know, go on to be serial killers. Also, as a random side note, did you know almost all readings of this story specifically cut out the brother-sister scene? Starting with Mr. Creepypasta because he didn't feel comfortable narrating that part of the story. Which is also kind of funny because it makes the scene where she kills her brother really confusing at first because we literally do not see him in that version of the story until she kills him. Mr. Creepypasta has since apparently taken that story down from his channel though. I'm unsure for what reason why he took it down, but given this story's reputation, I might have a few good guesses. But anyway, this one's a real stinker. But it does have one very significant cool thing that no one else has noticed. Clockwork is also the name of the badass villain from Sly Cooper, a giant 
fucking mecha owl. And I mean, can you get much cooler than that? But then, upon further examination, let's take a look at the original name of Clockwork. Natalie Owlet. <laughs> Yeah, I caught you red fucking handed. No super secret Alpun that you would only get if you played Sly Cooper and read this story for some fucking stupid reason got past me. Who do you think you're messing with, bitch? NES Godzilla. And for our final entry this tier, in stark contrast to our last entry, we have one of the most well-loved and praised creepypastas ever created, titled NES or NES Godzilla. It's a video game based creepypasta, and one that many consider to be the absolute best of them all. And I would generally agree, with a bit of an addendum. NES Godzilla follows our protagonist to, reliving some of his childhood, get some NES games from his friend, including a copy of Godzilla on the NES. Something which he actually remembered fondly playing as a child, especially being a big Godzilla fan. Which is kind of funny since most people consider that game to be pretty bad. From there, the game starts off fairly normal. And slowly but surely, our narrator realizes that this game isn't the same one that he played all those years ago. It's different. It starts off with the addition of new Godzilla monsters to fight in the game that were never there before, and slowly spirals into a world of madness as our protagonist explores a bizarre dream slash nightmare landscapes full of unique creatures, monsters, scenarios, and above all else, trying to avoid this strange red creature that can kill Godzilla and the other monsters instantly. There are also these strange levels where the aptly named face asks our narrator questions relating to the game, life, philosophy, and eventually much more personal questions about himself. Now, what really makes this pasta so great is how thoroughly interesting it is. Not only does it play out like a let's play of sorts, but has screenshots for every single encounter in the story, making so as he describes some of these creatures, you can actually look at them right next to the text. Now normally I would say that this makes the pasta more grounded in reality, as most people would probably screenshot or screen capture themselves if they were somehow playing a creepypasta game of this kind. But that's not really true. I mean, it is in a sense, but fairly quickly after the first First bit of the story, this pasta delves into the realm of the paranormal as the game seems to be connected to a protagonist's past of some kind and communicates directly to him on several occasions, the monstrous red even facing our narrator's direction when he insults the monster. Normally I would say that this takes away from the overall story, but I don't mind it here, as honestly grounding it in reality is only necessary if you're trying to make the story more disturbing or creepy. And despite it being a creepy pasta, I don't really find any aspect of the story scary, at least personally. I do find it extremely fascinating and fucking awesome looking though, seeing Godzilla walk through these bizarre hellscapes with these crazy monsters, or these interesting locations that tell a story through visuals alone, it more so makes me want to play this game rather than me getting scared by it at all. Upon my first reading of the creepypasta, I remember being sort of disappointed in the direction that it goes. That is, basically the game is connected to some sort of demon or entity that caused our protagonist this girlfriend to and now the demon is using this game as a sort of means of communication for taunting him and to pull him into the same hellhole he pulled his girlfriend into and in the end the demon is defeated and all is well our protagonist even being able to say his final goodbyes to his girlfriend before the game is over. I guess I don't know what I was expecting, but I remember liking everything up to that point. Now, upon rereading it, I think it's just a good story full of cool concepts and an overall interesting and well-written narrative. It's actually very good, but as a scary story, it's a bit lacking for me personally. But that's okay. Honestly, as a man who loves seeing cool monsters and kaiju, this story has so many cool and unique monsters and designs and art that just jump off of the screen. I wouldn't be surprised if the author just loved making 
cool monsters and sprite art and found a clever way to show them off through the story. That was kind of the impression I got, especially of some of the deep cut Godzilla lore that this guy integrated into the plot. Overall though, it's one that I still highly recommend giving a read or a listen. Apparently there has been a sequel in the works for some time as well. Well, actually five chapters of it exist and it seems like the story is even less focused on it being a creepypasta and is more of an exploration of the game in the hands of another player since the big twist at the end is the original story is that the protagonist sold off the cartridge onto eBay. The only problem is, the sequel hasn't been updated since 2013 unfortunately, so I don't think we're going to be seeing it finished anytime soon. Which is a real shame, because what he had so far with the sequel was certainly getting interesting, but all well. <sighs> it's getting dark now. There's something strange about this jungle. Something malevolent, almost. I can feel it flowing through the air. Why? It's almost starting to get cold in here. We better stop and set up a camp for now. If only to shed some light on the enveloping shadows. Ted the Caver. Let's start this tier with an all-time classic. Ted the Caver is often cited as the very first creepypasta ever written, which is something I'd like to expand upon in a moment. Ted the Caver was originally posted back on March 23rd of 2001 on Angel Fire, which if you were online back during that time frame, you'd be quite familiar with the site Angel Fire, it being an internet service that offered users the ability to create their own websites. The actual story of Ted the Caver is told through a series of blog posts written by a spelunker named Ted, recounting his experiences exploring the Mystery Cave. The blog posts detail a chain of events that occurred in December of 2000, when Ted and his good buddy Brad, who is often referred to simply as B, went exploring through a cave not too far away from their homes. The two eventually find a small hole that seems like it leads into a larger and unexplored part of the cave, which inspires the duo to start drilling and digging away at the hole to explore it to explore where no man has ever explored before, or at least so they hope. The two are avid cavers, and so the very thought of exploring a virgin part of the cave was just about as exciting a thing as the two could possibly think of. At some point, the two hear a strange movement and crashing of rocks on the other side of the hole, as well as the sound of flowing water or wind that seems to suddenly go dead silent when the two of them have been in the cave for an extended period of time. At one point, they take their Jack Russell dog, who loves exploring caves with them, to find that he is absolutely terrified of that hole that they are digging into, something which on one hand freaks the two of them out, but also only feeds into their hunger to know what exactly is on the other side of this hole even more. And what they ultimately find on the other side of that hole changes their lives forever after. But perhaps it's best I keep that secret for you to find out yourself. But needless to say, the two of them are not exactly alone. Ted the Caver takes careful detail to note the general structure of the cave system as well as the long process it takes to go exploring caves and as well as work from inside them. In fact, this tale, much like exploring deep inside a tight-fitted cave, slowly and carefully pushes you ever further into the disturbing reality of what they come to find on the other side of that cave hole. In particular, I can say as someone who has a terrible case of claustrophobia, this creepypasta hits me 
pretty hard. In particular, the description of Articular Ted climbing into the extremely tight hole once they had opened it up just enough for him to get through to either side, a hole that they named Floyd's Tomb by the way, is one of the most uncomfortable reads I've come across from a creepypasta. But regardless of that, this creepypasta is an all-time classic for a reason, because it's excellently written. It has the perfect atmosphere, build-up, and payoff. In short, I cannot recommend you read it or listen to it enough. Now, what's interesting about this creepypasta in particular is that at the time when it came out, a lot of people thought that it was actually real, that Ted and B had actually come across something in that cave, and that this story was a true story being recounted for all to read online. Now I know some of you, having grown up alongside the internet and using it since day one pretty much, might scoff at the idea of people actually believing something like that. But remember that this was really a story ahead of its time, and to top it all off, it actually does have some basis in reality. You see, the story was first discussed on the National Speleological Society message board, which was a forum of the time dedicated to advancing the study, conversation, exploration, and knowledge of caves to those online, uh, back in November of 2004. In the thread, a poster named Ralph Powers noted that he knew B in real life, and had been in the cave described within the story. Later, in January of 2006, a poster named Caverdale noted that the actual cave in the story, which is never named within it, is actually named Interstate Cave, and is located in Utah. It's named as such because the caves went under an interstate. Later, all through 2006 to 2011, Ted's Angel Fire story was shared across the internet in message boards such as Snopes, uh, to Straight Dope, Major Geeks, Bodybuilding, Face Punch, and Unexplained Mysteries to name a few. However, back in 2005, Ted himself would clear everything up for everyone, debating if the story was real or not, stating that Ted the Caver's page was his original work. He simply elaborated upon a real-life experience with supernatural elements. Ted actually was a caver, so the story was sort of his way of writing about something that he was genuinely passionate about, something that did actually scare him, but also one that he ultimately added to for a better overall story, blending reality with fiction. There would later be an independent film by David Hunt made about the story titled Living Dark, the story of Ted the Caver, which I've never personally seen, but it is definitely on my to watch soon list now. Now before we move on to the next entry of this tier, I'd like to expand upon something mentioned earlier, Ted the Caver being the first ever creepypasta. This is true to a certain point, it was the first of its kind to be spread around, at least that we know of, but it's also not exactly true either, especially depending on what your terminology of creepypasta actually is. Before creepypastas were creepypastas, that being a copy and paste job of a story that you then share online, I'd argue that urban legends were really the origin point for scary stories of this kind. An urban legend is a sort of folk tale that is circulated around under the premise that it's a true story. Back before the age of the internet, these types of stories, like the famous dog-licking story, of the hook slash killer on Lover's Lane, of the Bloody Mary ritual, etc., were told orally. These types of stories were also known as campfire stories, the sort that you heard from someone else and then go and share with your own friend group, and then some of them go and share it with a different group, and so on and so forth. So you can see the only difference between urban legend and creepypasta is really the method by which the story is relayed. In creepypasta's case, instead of being told orally, it is told through sharing the story on message boards, which then gets shared by others on said message boards to other message boards, etc. It is also technically told orally a little bit because of YouTube videos. Most early creepypastas were told under the premise of them being true. The only real problem the problem with that is also its greatest strength, however. Creepypastas, and by extension all urban legends, can spread far faster through the internet, thus the story can get really far. But then, it is a fake story after all. 
So due to how much exposure it's bound to get, it also means that people can debunk it just as easily and far quicker using the same tool that you use to spread it from the start. Now, not all creepypastas are meant to fool you into thinking that they are real, mind you. In fact, we sort of live in the meta era of everything at the current moment. So I wager most of you watching this video or reading scary stories of nearly any kind online are going in knowing that it's fake. It's why in this extremely meta, post post, whatever, modern time we live in, storytelling methods such as unfiction and ARGs are so popular because they allow one's mind to suspend their disbelief for a moment and see what is meant to be taken as real under the premise that it is real in an alternate reality, one that you are currently engaging in. I think the way a story that is meant to fool you into thinking that it's real is also the best way of telling these types of stories. And again, since we live in the age of information, when people want to read the information anyway, as a would-be urban legend writer or internet legend writer I suppose is more fitting at this point, you'll need to up the ante. Provide more evidence, give more detail, maybe insert some more reality into it, and immerse the reader or listener into your version of reality that you've spun for them to sink into. That's what makes a perfect creepypasta slash urban legend slash ARG or what the fuck ever you want to call it in my eyes, and what makes them as a medium of storytelling so very interesting. But that's enough of that lesson slash tangent for the day. Let's move on to the next entry now, which is White with Red. So what's going on my dedicated pros and brunettes? It's me, Luigi Kid, and maybe some of you have already seen my content. I'm a huge creepypasta fan myself, and I've gotta say, I feel very honored being part of this creepypasta iceberg video by Dylan the Night Owl. Yo, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe to Dylan's YouTube channel, like this dude really deserves it, and he really needs to get to the 100k subscribers as soon as possible. If you love creepypasta stuff, horror content, iceberg videos in general, yo, this dude got you covered, okay? And and also, while we're at it, make sure to smash the like button, you know, a little bit of engagement has never killed nobody. No, thank you so much, Dylan. I would say, without that further ado, let's get straight into the creepypastas. Let's go! White with Red A man went to a hotel and walked up to the front desk to check in. The woman at the desk gave him his key and told him that on the way to his room, there was a door with no number that was locked and no one was allowed in there. Especially no one should look inside the room under any circumstances. So he followed the instructions of the woman at the front desk, going straight to his room and going to bed. The next night, his curiosity would not leave him alone about the room with no number on the door. He walked down the hall to the door and tried the handle. Sure enough, it was locked. He bent down and looked for the white keyhole. Cold air passed through it, chilling his eye. What he saw was a hotel bathroom, like his, and in the corner was a woman whose skin was completely white. She was leaning her head against the wall, facing away from the door. He stared in confusion for a while. He almost knocked on the door out of curiosity, but decided not to. This disinclination saved his life. He crept away from the door and walked back to his room. The next day, he returned to the door and looked for the white keyhole. This time, all he saw was redness. He couldn't make anything out besides a distinct red color, unmoving. Perhaps the inhabitants of the room knew he was spying the night before. He had blocked the keyhole with something red. At this point, he decided to consult the woman at the front desk for more information. She sighed and said, did you look for the keyhole? The man told her that he had, and she said, Well, I might as well tell you the story. A long time ago, a man murdered his wife in that room, and her ghost haunts it. But these people were not ordinary. They were white all over. Except for their eyes, which were red. Obey the Walrus 
I cover this creepypasta before on my YouTube uh, iceberg series, but to be extremely brief, it's this video that's on screen right now, and it's rumored to be a tape made by a cult called La Morza in order to indoctrinate people to join their cult. It's not. It's just a highly edited clip of Sadie Crisp, who unfortunately passed away recently. Uh, may she rest in peace. But yeah, there's not a whole lot more to it. It's an old internet creepy video that has had rumors connected to it that weren't true. That's it. Mario. So this is one of the most interesting creepypastas of its kind. Mario is a Super Mario World ROM hack by SMW Central user Adam. SMW Central is a hacking resource for Super Mario World and many ROM hacks would frequently be created and posted on there. A ROM hack is when you alter a ROM or a game file and add new stuff to it. This can be minor or silly little changes to basically creating an entirely new game based on the foundation of said game. The story goes that Mario was a patch made by SMW Central user, well, Mario, whose avatar is an SMW Mario without a face. He was once a semi-frequent user of the website, but usually when he did post it was something rather mysterious or off-putting to many on the board. At any rate, Adam, a frequent user of the site, posted a thread on the board on December 28th of 2010, which opens as follows. Quote, Note this is a true story, and sums up what was going through my mind as I was playing this, and I had no idea I was about to be bullshitted the way I was when I played this, and I can say it is by far the creepiest hack that I've played. If you were on IRC, you would have heard me talking about it as well. But anyways, it's late at night, and I don't have a lot of time, and I need to get to sleep. So this is all I have time for." Unquote. What follows is a detailed account posted across a few posts of what this innocently named Mario ROM hack posted on the board by the strange user actually contained. Firstly, the ROM hack came with a TXT file, uh, like most would, usually with some instructions and info about the hack. But this one was simply a jungle of text. But something catches Adam off guard. The phrase, find me, find me, find me, seems to be hidden and strewn all throughout the otherwise unintelligible TXT file. From the very beginning, the title screen in this ROM hack is changed from the usual Super Mario world to just simply Mario, which the author notes was rather strange and ominous given the context of the situation. The messages that usually act as tutorial slash story are now replaced with these messages that seem to relay a tale of how Mario caused death and destruction upon the land of uh, Dinosaur Island and that now he's at it again. Something which confuses our narrator slash playtester. Other text boxes display such threatening messages as I hate you or this is the selfish way out. The lack of music, strangely designed levels, and an overall sense of oblivion adds to the chilling nature of this hack. Later, when Mario defeats the first boss, Iggy, this message is displayed. Quote, victim one, eyeballs were unable to be found. The victim was found lying on their carpet. Causes of death unknown. Hand marks with unidentifiable fingerprints were found all over the corpse. Unquote. This all eventually culminates into a final level where Mario runs through a long hallway with a series of doors too small for him to fit through before he eventually no clips out of a wall. Once in this area, there is nowhere to go but down a large pit before the screen cuts to black. And that's it. The hack's over. Adam is left feeling the narrative of the hack was Mario had brought suffering to the land and that this hack represents Mario's journey to amend his sins uh, by seppukuing himself down a cliff. 
Once this whole recount of the story was told, many users began to play the ROM hack for themselves, something which you can actually do right now if you wanted to. Eventually, after some discussion on the boards about the hack, with many freaking out, some calling bullshit, and others getting rather interested. Otherwise, with something of this kind never having been posted in this place before, the founder and administrator of the site, Kieran Maynard, would take interest in a particular part of the story. Remember that TXT file? Well, Kieran immediately recognized the TXT file to be none other than a JPEG file uh, due to its header. Kieran then proceeded to mess around with the file until they managed to uncover an image from it, albeit corrupted. And this was the image that they found. This image sparked a new sense of fear and intrigue in the story. And within a week of the story unfolding, it will be posted officially to the Creepypasta Wiki, thus spreading the word of this tale and this image all the more. What's fascinating about the tale, however, is that Adam, to this day, claims that his experience was genuine and that he had no hand in creating this ROM hack. He simply told his story, being the first one to playtest it for curation on the board. Adam eventually got into contact with the mysterious person who did make the ROM hack to begin with, whom after uploading this hack was never seen again on the boards. According to Adam, they seemed like a normal fellow, despite him claiming through playing the hack that it seemed like it was made by a sick individual in the original story. As for the origin of this image, well, as far as I could tell, there are several stories about where its origin comes from, including it possibly being used as a promotional piece for a band to promote their music on 4chan, although this is unverified, all the way to it being used in some Japanese forums before then. It is without a doubt the thing that makes this creepy boss to stick out in my mind. I mean, the other aspects are interesting, don't get me wrong, but this image just elevates it to a different level. All the same though, this series of events and the hack itself is without a doubt one of the more interesting internet spooky stories that you can come across, and was really one of the first of its kind as well. I will say that some of the commentary by Adam is a little bit hammy here and there in the actual description of the ROM hack, uh, but besides that, this is one of the first and best video game flavored creepypastas alone just for the sheer unfolding of these events to a perfect eerie finale. Bonus entry. Normal for normal people. I had this pasta because I remember at the time that it was quite popular. It is also one of my personal favorites as well. The story starts with our narrator getting a weird chain mail email that stated simply, Hi there. Found this site is very nice. Thought you might like. Normal for normal people .com. Pass it on for the good of mankind. Because our narrator had nothing better to do, he decides to make sure his antivirus is up and working and then click the link, only to find a strange and unprofessional looking website with a long and incoherent rant from the center on the page. The site also had an intriguing tagline, Normal for Normal People, a website dedicated to the eradication of abnormal sexuality, which only fascinates our narrator more. Eventually, he comes to find that every single word of the long rant on that page is a separate link that leads to pages of even more chains of links, and of which some lead to video files. Our pro tag ends up finding a video titled peanut.avi, which he describes as follows. Quote, it was a 30 minute video of a man and a woman and a dog in a kitchen. The woman would make a peanut butter sandwich and the man would set it down for the dog to eat. This was all that happened for 30 minutes. It was obvious that the cameraman had to stop filming and wait until the dog was ready to eat again. And the dog seemed rather sick by the end of it. I know what you're thinking. What the hell does this have to do with, I have no clue. I've seen a little over two dozen videos from this site, and the majority of them have no sexuality at all." Unquote. 
After having seen this video, our pro tag goes to share his findings of this video and the strange website on an image board he frequents. However, he finds that there is already a thread on the site about this strange place by a user that received the exact same chain mail as him. The users begin going through as much of the site as they possibly can, searching through miles and miles of links that lead to other links, and from this search came several interesting videos, which I will now read off in full with our narrator's descriptions. Quote, Licked clean. .avi. A 10 minute video filmed by a hidden camera in which we see a repairman working on a washing machine for the first two minutes. When it's fixed, the repairman talks to the owner briefly and then leaves. The owner checks to make sure the repairman is gone and he then begins to lick all over the top of the washing machine. This goes on for seven minutes. Jimbo.avi, a five minute video of an obese mime performing his act. It was actually pretty funny, particularly one part where he pretends to pull up a chair and then pretends that it breaks because of his weight. In the last 30 seconds of the video, the camera cuts to static briefly and cuts back to the man sobbing quietly, still wearing mime outfit and makeup. Perhaps it's some kind of obscure fetish? Diana.avi, four minute video in which the cameraman talks to a woman in a room different from the interview room. This room looks like one you'd find in a normal person's house, exactly where they are is never specified. As Diana only talks about her violin playing, she obviously plays her violin, but she keeps getting distracted by something. I didn't notice this until someone on the image board thread pointed out, but if you look at the mirror in the background, you can see a fat man in a chicken mask playing with himself. Jessica.avi Another 4 minute cameraman video. This time he's outside a house talking to another young woman. They talk about canoe rides. The camera zooms out to reveal the city streets behind them on occasion. The strange thing is, no one so far has been able to identify where this street is. Guesses have ranged from everywhere from Europe to Australia to the Philippines, but there's yet to be a match for the street shown in the video. Tongue-tied.avi A 10 minute video. The first 5 minutes consists of an elderly woman making out with a mannequin. The video cuts out like it did on the Jimbo.avi halfway through, and the scene is now a group of mannequins huddled together in a circle around the camera. The lights have been dimmed and the elderly woman is nowhere to be seen. From this point on, there is no sound. Stumps.avi Five minute long video where a man with no legs is attempting to break dance on a DDR mat in what looks like the kitchen from Peanut.avi, but much dirtier. There's a radio playing music unseen in the background, but it stops at the four minute mark when the man collapses on the mat in exhaustion. He breathes heavily and pleads with someone off screen to let him rest. This off screen person becomes terrifyingly enraged and yells at the man to keep dancing, which he then does. You can hear this off-screen person begin to scream as the video ends abruptly. Privacy.avi The woman from Diana.avi is now playing with themselves on the mattress in the interview room, while the man from Stumps.avi walks around on his hands while wearing some kind of goblin mask. The door in this room was always closed in other videos, but it's now open. In this video, the only light is in the room. The hallway is dark. Near the end of the video, you can see an animal quickly run through the hallway. And then finally, the last video we uncovered, useless.avi. In this 18 minute video, a blonde woman from one of the previous interview videos is tied down to a mattress. She attempts to scream, but her mouth is taped over. After seven minutes, a man in a black suit and mask opens the door, but does not enter. He holds the door open for the animal that was running in the hallway in the previous video. It's revealed to be an adult chimpanzee, its hair shaved 
and its entire body painted red. When the chimp enters the room, the masked man closes the door behind it. The chimpanzee sniffs the air for a moment, it may have been blind, and then notices the woman tied to the mattress. It goes into a frenzy and begins to maul her. The assault goes on for a grueling seven minutes until the woman finally dies. The chimp eats flesh from her corpse for four minutes as the video ends. Our pro tag then goes on to note how the thread was closed shortly after the discovery of this video, and since then, he has seen these videos, notably useless.avi, coming up on other websites since then, but they usually never stay up for long. He tried to find out more about the site and the man behind it, but comes up short, thus leaving us readers with a rabbit hole of a mystery that's depths are seemingly immeasurable. That's normal for normal people. A rather short but effective creepypasta that almost sounds like an ARG or snuff ring type thing depending on how you look at the story. It feels grounded but just creepy enough to have stuck out in my brain all these years later and ultimately leaves the reader wondering if they had kept searching for the site what else might they have found. Psych dot exe2. So, like before, I must point to my dedicated video on the subject of sonic.exe, where I cover sonic.exe and exe2 in detail, as well as the general drama centered around its creator, JC the Hyena, who has been also in quite a bout of controversy lately, by the way. I won't personally be going into that, today, but there are plenty of videos out here on YouTube discussing it, so I'd look to those. That being said, Sonic.exe2 follows a detective and his sister, who is also kind of a detective I guess, as they try to find out the root cause behind a series of murders slash mysterious deaths involving people's computers blowing up and um, them being mangled and what have you, as well as a single CD of Sonic.exe sitting alongside it. Eventually, they they find out that the evil Sonic.exe is actually an eldritch god of sorts called X that is worshipped by a cult called the Cult of X that eventually kill both our detective protagonists and yeah that's pretty much it. It's a much longer read than the first one or at least it feels that way anyway. And I think part of that is because it feels as though it's taking itself far more seriously, but upping the ante in the crazy shit by 11. I suppose it still has that clinge charm that the first one has, and it has grown on me over the years for that very reason. Uh, but I have no doubt in my mind that this is actually worse than the first story, especially in the jumps of logic that are here throughout it. It's a bad creepypasta, but an entertaining bad one at the very least. And again, if you want more details about what exactly it entails in its history, then go check out my video on it. Kill Switch. Ah, so here's one that I actually had never heard of up until I went about making this video. According to the Carvina Files wiki, a wiki dedicated to this game, quote, Kill Switch is an urban legend revolving around a supposed 1989 game in which the player had the choice of playing either Ghast or Porto. It was nearly impossible to play as Ghast as he was invisible, which meant that that pretty much everyone chose Porto. A single enemy has been spotted, an undead worker who Porto knew when she was alive, though it is assumed that there's more. Ghast could attack, but Porto could not. It is assumed that Porto's gameplay was akin to a, a point-and-click puzzle game, while for Ghast, there would be more combat. The game supposedly deleted itself after you finished it and could not be copied. Only 50 50,000 or so copies of the game were ever created, and so it fell into obscurity. 
Any supposed buying links are false, as no copies have made it onto the web, save for several encrypted password protected copies." Unquote. From there, an actual story can be unfolded about what this game looked like, deep gameplay and story details, and of course, some gameplay footage, supposedly captured by one of the sons of a game developer at the elusive Carvina Corporation. All of this is fake, of course, a sort of ARG slash unfiction story, I suppose. It's a fairly short read and dive, but it's creative all the same. It's not one of the more interesting ones, I will admit. I tried going into the wiki and the YouTube channel and the story, and it's alright. I did kind of feel like there was something I was missing, uh, but I suppose it's just really a urban legend about a game that doesn't really exist, and that's pretty much it. Rugrats Theory. Ah, we get to our first theory pasta. A theory pasta slash theory creepypasta is basically a genre in of itself, where a dark, crazy, or at times even perfectly logical but unthought of theory is proposed about a series, film, video game, etc. I'm actually a particular fan of these ones, even if most of them are cliche as hell, uh, usually only being one of the following theories. Uh, the whole story is happening inside a character's head, uh, maybe while they're in a coma for bonus points. They are all actually dead and or in the afterlife slash purgatory, or these characters all represent something evil or whatever. Though the representation thing can be expanded upon to a much greater result, so I usually like those a little bit more. That being said, I still find this to be one of the more interesting offshoots of creepypastas all the same. But at any rate, the Rugrats theory is about as dark as they come, and goes as follows. Quote, the Rugrats really were a figment of Angelica's imagination. Chucky died a long time ago, along with his mother. That's why Chaz is a nervous wreck all the time. Tommy was a stillborn. That's why Stu is constantly in the basement making toys for the son who never had a chance to live. And the DeVilles had an abortion. Angelica couldn't figure out whether it would be a boy or a girl, thus creating the twins. As for the show All Grown Up, Angelica was a bipolar schizophrenic who as a teenager became addicted to various narcotics, bringing her back to her childhood, thus creating a world in her mind that she obsessed over. Because of the time lapse between the present and the last time she interacted with her imaginary world, she made them older. Angelica was constantly taking hits of acid, so she would never have to live without her creations. To her, her creations were her only company in a judgmental world. Angelica's mom actually died of a heroin overdose. Angelica was schizophrenic and bipolar because she was a crack baby. Additionally, Drew, in his depression, married a gold-digging whore that Angelica idolized because she fooled herself into thinking it was her real mom. However, she always had a concept of her mom, Cynthia. She used used a Barbie doll to mirror her birth mother's image, wearing an unwashed orange dress and jacked up hair, which is why she was so attached to it. Later in life, she followed in her mother's footsteps, dying of an overdose at age 13 when All Grown Up was cancelled. The only Rugrat not to be fictional, however, was the unborn Tommy's brother, Dill. However, Angelica didn't know the difference between Dill and her creations. Dill didn't follow her commands, and after endless crying and a refusal to disappear like the others did when Angelica was angry at them, she hit him. After she hit him, he screamed a screeching tune, and Stu ran in and pulled his niece off of his only child, but it was too late. Dill had a brain hemorrhage, which resulted in a deformation. As he grew up, his damage only became more evident, and by the time he was nine and all grown up, he lived as an outcast. 
being ridiculed for his weirdness. The immense guilt over this is what caused Angelica to start using drugs and to uncreate the Rugrats briefly until her experience with hallucinogenics. Chaz lost his mind after the death of his first wife and was in denial that she was ever a prostitute. On a trip to Paris to find love, Chaz fell in love with a hooker named Kira. He was originally going to marry a different hooker, but she just wanted him for his money. Kira once had a daughter named Kimmy, but the baby was torn from her by law due to her cocaine addiction. Angelica imagined Kimmy from Kira's stories. Upon return to America, Chaz and Kira married and got her a green card. It was a surprisingly happy and romantic story. Kira continually struggled with addiction, but was relatively happy with her new life with Chaz. Susie was Angelica's only friend who entertained the thought of Angelica's creations because they seemed to make her happy. She later became a psychologist and teamed up with Nickelodeon to make the Rugrats. When Angelica died of an overdose, Susie helped arrange her funeral. Because of her addictions and her mental state, Angelica was expelled from society, which led to a break with reality and her eventual death. She spent the last days of her life in the back of the school cafeteria, imagining friends around her and playing with the lives of her creations, unquote. So yeah, pretty um messed up, right? Also pretty dumb, gonna be honest, pretty fucking stupid. I mean, I will admit, from a purely creative standpoint and from a dark comedy standpoint, how this story manages to make every single aspect of that show sound impossibly depressing is impressive, I suppose. But it is of course not very convincing since it reads more like a Um, actually the Rugrats was a pretty fucked up show guys And yeah, uh, they're dead actually And um, that's a He married a hooker and also she was on drugs And um, uh, uh yeah, bad stuff happened Also the part about Susie teaming up with Nickelodeon to make the Rugrats was So stupid I literally cringe every time I read that part. Like, okay, let's imagine for a second that was actually a real thing. So you're telling me you made a show, a cartoon show for kids based around the crazy fantasies of a drugged up 13 year old. What the fuck is wrong with you? That sounds like the craziest shit I've ever heard. But of course it's not real and jumps outside the realm of reality. It's not very convincing. But all the same, it is also one of the first of its kind and certainly got the ball rolling on stories of this nature. And plus, I personally like to read it more as a dark shit post than a serious theory. But speaking of theories that were making the rounds back at the time, Ed, Ed, and Eddie theory. So I just had to include this one because I also remember it being pretty popular at the time. It goes as follows. Quote, according to the theory, the children of the cul-de-sac each hail from different eras spanning the early 1900s to the early 2000s. This would explain why the year for the show is so very hard to pinpoint, with multiple anachronisms present, and also why there aren't any adults in the show, although you do catch a glimpse of one every now and then. Rolf arrived first from the 1900s, the theory goes. His family had moved to Peach Creek in order to establish a farm on its land. Rolf died around 1903 when his family's farm animal stampeded and trampled him. This was the supposed reason why he only has one cow, one goat, and a few pigs, and a few chickens. Not enough animals to cause a fatal stampede in the afterlife. Johnny 2x4 came to the cul-de-sac not too long after Rolf's death. Having no friends, Johnny took a marker and drew a face on a piece of wood and dubbed it Plank. He died in 1922 after fighting a long battle with tuberculosis. Six years before the discovery of penicillin, he took his friend Plank with him to the afterlife, since he was the last thing he saw in life before he died. Purgatory would also explain Plank's occasional sentient behavior, which is most notably demonstrated in the movie. Eddie came next. 
He was born in New York, but eventually moved to Peach Creek during the Great Depression era. Always trying to make a quick buck, he always sets up scams to get money from the cul-de-sac kids in an effort to escape the poverty he spent his whole life in. Eddie didn't have a proper father figure since his real father abandoned him and his mother shortly after he was born. With this came the big bro he adored and idolized so very much, despite the latter's abusive nature. After one of his scams went awry, Eddie was chased by the swindled children of the cul-de-sac and ran to the lake and jumped into it. Eddie ended up drowning in that lake and he soon joined the other deceased children in the afterlife. Even though he was no longer alive, Eddie still tried to chase after the almighty dollar by continuing his swindling nature in the afterlife. Ed and Sarah were the next to arrive in the cul-de-sac. Their father had died fighting in World War II, and as a result, their mother became distant and disconnected. To cope, Sarah developed her bossy attitude, trying to fill the role uh, their parents used to fill before their father died and their mother stopped caring. Conversely, Ed shut the world out and delved into the fantasy world of comic books and monster movies, which exploded in popularity during and after World War II. In order to to escape his unhappy life. They both died in a freak car accident in 1953, thus joining the past kids in death. Naz was born in the 1960s era to hippie parents. Described as a flower child, she was a rather flirtatious young girl who would always act that way towards the male children of the neighborhood. In the summer of 79, a serial killer escaped a local asylum, made his way to her house, and then, mmm, and murdered her along with her entire family. Ed slash Double D was born in the 1970s when preparing to attend college from a young age became the societal norm expectation and was raised by a very strict, controlling, emotionally distant parents. They pushed him to succeed academically and to be perfectly clean and neat. He is believed to have died as a result of a gas leak causing an explosion with the Busain burner from his chemistry set. Kevin was born around the early 1980s. He was born to a broken down house and he also had an abusive father who was poorly educated, and his mother had passed away when he was a year old. Because of his situation at home, Kevin would act his frustration out on the other children of the cul-de-sac, becoming a bully to cope with his repressed anger. His fascination with his bike fits right in with the birth of the popular X Games in 1995. One night in the winter of 99, his father fatally beat him in a fit of drunken rage, and he died while he was on his way to the hospital. His father was then convicted of his murder and was sentenced to life in prison. When Kevin entered into the afterlife, he reimagined his father as loving and that he would shower him with gifts. He still kept his bullying ways in the afterlife, however. Jimmy was the last child to enter into the cul-de-sac. He was born in the early 1990s and was diagnosed with leukemia. He never associated with the the other cul-de-sac children because his parents believed he was too frail to be around the other kids and he remained bedridden for the remainder of his life because of this fact. After fighting a difficult battle with his leukemia, Jimmy eventually succumbed to his illness and soon the cul-de-sac purgatory was complete. The Kangers were different from the other neighborhood children. It is believed that they are actually demons that were sent to the cul-de-sac to torment the souls of the remaining children who didn't cross over to heaven. The Kankers are the only characters with normal colored tongues, which would seem to indicate that they are not dead and that therefore they must be something different. Surprisingly, the Kankers are attached to the Eds for unknown reasons. However, one common guess is that they are the weakest willed children of the cul-de-sac or because they each symbolize a certain deadly sin, unquote. That's the theory. And while it's obviously fake, and also definitely 
does a lot of the Rugrats theory thing where it's just like grim, dark, awful shit constantly throughout the entire thing. I actually do really love the idea that each kid comes from a different period of time and died of different causes. It makes this one of the more interesting ones to read all the way through at the very least. Mind you, these theories are just for fun. It's taking something innocent or innocuous and turning it on its head. So while I could go into detail as to why both of these theories are wrong, I think you all sort of know that by now. There will be more theory pastas to cover in the future, but for now, let's dive back into a Familiar Faces catalog. Funny Mouth. So this is another story written by the famous Slime Beast. The story follows a protagonist who goes by Lemon Lime Skull online, recounting his strange experience when him and his online buddy were simply chatting in a chat room that they had, uh, selling certain illegal things, when a strange user who had the username of Funny Mouth made their entrance. Quote, Hello everyone tonight. I like to lick the blood out of in the person. I see your handsome face. Don't be so sad about it. Come on, smiley face. Unquote. After this, Funny Mouth leaves the chat. After some goading from Skull's friend, Ghost George, Skull follows Funny Mouth into a separate chat room and recounts his strange interactions with the individual. And notably, this staring emote that was used by the user quite a bit. However, Skull eventually tires of the person's one-show act and heads to bed, where he then proceeds to have some of the worst nightmares he's ever had in his life. The next morning, he received an email from Funny Mouth, of which he had no way of knowing his email since Skull was an extremely private person online and never gave out his email or other personal information to people. Then he and his friend's website they were using to chat suddenly goes completely down. Well, at least it was for George. For Skull, on the other hand, the site is redirected into a new one, with this awaiting him. A disgusting face made up entirely of blocks of text, of which all repeated the same word, Funny Mouth, Funny Mouth, Funny Mouth. Skull tries to contact Funny Mouth again to fix the problem rationally, but it's no dice. Funny Mouth instead taunts Skull, saying that he can see him, he can see his handsome face, causing Skull to eventually go into a fit of rage. That same night, he would again have a dream, a nightmare, but this one being in the woods, and at first, feeling at peace before four slimy fingers that felt like earthworms slid into his mouth and crushed his lower jaw. When Skull awoke from his nightmare and saw his face in his bathroom mirror, his tongue was hanging out of his mouth like a limp slug, his lower jaw broken around his neck. He starts to laugh. What a funny mouth he has, he remarks, cackling. The story ends with Skull saying the same bizarre things to George now, implying that he will be the next to have a funny mouth. That's the story of Funny Mouth, and I've got to admit upon rereading it, it's probably one of Slime Beast's lesser works. Like, it's alright, it's not bad, but it doesn't personally grab me as much as his other stories tend to do. Which I know can be a bit of a nebulous criticism, but all the same, it's just how I personally feel. Again, it's not a bad pasta, but there is one major flaw, and that being that the narrator is speaking in first person um, to the reader. And since we know that this is like past events, it begs the question why he's writing like a normal person instead of writing the story as if he were a weird funny mouth monster thing. If that was just an act that they do for people or what exactly that is, it is it is left to some mystery, but it feels a little bit like a plot hole for the sake of maintaining the twist at the end, which is especially apparent upon rereading. Uh, but all well. Barbie.avi 
funnily enough, I covered this one back on my YouTube iceberg video series as well. So I'm mostly going to repeat what I said before. Barbie.avi is a creepypasta connected to this old video of an amputee woman answering questions for an interview. The creepypasta itself is about a guy who finds a video on an old laptop titled Barbie.avi that depicts a woman being interviewed who grows increasingly distressed before cutting to a shot of train tracks that are nearby our protagonist's house. He then goes to said train tracks only to find an abandoned house, which after he enters, he then suddenly hears a moan from the inside, and he nopes the fuck out of that place, never to return. The video itself, as I detailed in my YouTube Iceberg series, is nothing actually scary, but it did take a fair bit of time for the internet to find its exact origin, which is simply footage of a woman named Sharon, an amputee who lost her arm in a washing machine incident, giving an interview about it. And it has no real connection to the creepypasta. The creepypasta, on the other hand, I do think is decent. It's not perfect, and I think it could have been expanded upon a lot more. It leaves a lot to the morbid imagination, and while the ending is rather anticlimactic, uh, something about the guy hearing a moan from the house of what might be the kidnappers or their victim or and him running the fuck out of there it's kind of more believable i guess it does give me chills thinking about that exact scenario although him never attempting to call the police or anything is also a pretty big plot hole and also a missed opportunity for the police actually showing up there and there being nothing to be found maybe say except one little thing or something um who knows i guess what i'm saying is is that there are some good bones to this pasta uh, but the meat is sufficiently undercooked sadly the harbinger experiments this is yet another one that i had never read or even heard of up until doing this video this story in particular is sort of tapping into what you might call a genre in the creepypasta space, that being experiments on people, in a similar fashion to the Russian sleep experiment. The story goes is a man who we only know as Dr. Zimmerman, who is interested in the occult and the metaphysical world, goes about setting up an experiment called the Harbinger Experiment, where three subjects would be served up as bait for a possession, possession by something beyond the veil of our world, although this is never clarified as to what exactly that is. This tale is told through the perspective of our narrator, who is one of the team members hired for this secret experiment, alongside a few others. He details how freaky and enigmatic Zimmerman is, as well as his followers freakish dedication and the creepy maze-like structure of the underground facility this experiment would be held in. Zimmerman was scoffed at and rejected by the larger scientific community for his focus on the metaphysical and the occult. So he wanted to use this experiment as a means of having people to bear witness to his theories so that he could prove that they were true. Ultimately, the experiment is actually a success, but to a dangerous degree, as the people who were once offered as bait are now simply husks full of demons completely being taken over. One in particular has their entire body shape change and morph into something unnatural, a smooth skin, long-limbed abomination, and of which seems to emit Tiny Tim's Living in the Sunlight song. This all ends with uh, the monster breaking out of its cage after they had kind of fiddled with it and looked at it for a while, and everyone dying, except for our narrator, of course, who just managed to escape the brutal slaughter, but is now hearing that song near his house yet again, that haunting tune of the demons nearby. In the last few days, it's been getting closer and so now he writes this story and exposes this government experiment and these secrets before he is killed that's the basic abridged version of the story it's a lot longer than I make it sound here 
but all the same, it's a pretty decent one. Though, it does seem to take a lot from other stories slash movies as a basis for its own, which isn't really a bad thing, mind you. But I guess this one just doesn't really stick out in my mind as much personally. For example, the Tiny Tim music quirk is cool, but it's also definitely an insidious thing where the demon of that film had Tiny Tim music playing in the background anytime there was a major scene with it. But hey, it's competently written and it kept my interest, so not too bad. Bonus entry, Home Alone. You're home alone and you hear on the news about the profile of a murderer who is on the loose. You look out the sliding glass doors to your backyard and you notice a man standing out in the snow. He fits the profile of the murderer exactly and he is smiling right at you. You gulp, picking up the phone to your right and dialing 911. You look back out to the glass as you press the phone to your ear. It's then that you notice he is much closer now. You then drop the phone in shock when you notice there are no footprints in the snow. It's his reflection. And now it's time for what I'd like to call the Pokemon Creepypasta Corner. This tier has a ton of Pokemon related creepypastas, so I thought we might as well marathon them back to back. Starting with Pokemon Lost Silver. So this is one of the most famous Pokemon related creepypastas, though almost all the Pokemon related ones are pretty popular. Pokemon Lost Silver is a creepypasta story about a disturbing Game Boy Color cartridge for the game Pokemon Silver. The story was first written, where else but 4chan, on a thread created on June 6th of 2010. The story goes that a dedicated Pokemon fan wanted to relive some nostalgia, so he buys a used copy of Pokemon Silver at GameStop while he waited for the new Pokemon game to come out in a week. But once he loaded the game onto his Game Boy, he immediately noticed that the saved game left behind by the cart's previous owner was highly unusual. Whoever had owned the game simply named their trainer Ellipses, had maxed out their Pokedex with all 251 entries, including legendary Pokemons like Celebri and Mew, and had also maxed out their money and levels. Our narrator wonders if this guy either used Game Shark or something of the sort, or was just once a super dedicated Pokemon fan that just sold their cart back as is. However, the oddities don't stop there. In the active party, the past user had only contained a Cyndaquil and five unknown, which while I'm not a huge Pokemon fan, I can tell you they're basically alien-like Pokemon with letter-shaped bodies. The unknown spelled out the word leave, and the Cyndaquil was named hurry. Our narrator then starts exploring the game where the user left off that being the Bellsprout Tower, but with no NPCs in it. He then heads into the next room, which is masked in complete darkness. He uses his Pokemon Cyndaquil's ability Flash to illuminate the areas, only for a red, narrow hallway to be revealed. A strange theme plays on the in-game radio, the Unknown's theme playing in this eerie place. He then ventures down a long hallway, the screen growing darker and darker until he reaches the hallway's end and comes up to a sign. It reads, turn back now. Suddenly he is then asked the question of yes or no, and the narrator, confused, answered yes. The theme changed now to the polka flute radio music, and he was once again in a dark room. And so he used Flash again, only to have the game say Hurry has fainted. He goes and checks his Pokemon only to find that Cyndaquil was no longer in his active party. And now there were five new unknowns, which now spelled out, I died. 
After this revelation, the narrator then found his character in a small room, only four spaces large, surrounded by dozens of dotted graves. He tries his best to get out of this place, but to no avail. He then checked the status of his character, only to find that the Pokemon trainer Sprite had changed from its usual confident self to somber looking, and was now missing both of his arms. Then suddenly, our narrator's character is spun downwards. The music stops. He was now completely white and was in another totally red area. He checked his status once more, and now, now blood leaked from his eyes like tears, and his legs, like his arms, were now missing as well. He then checked his active party again, only to find more unknowns, this time spelling out dying. There was also now randomly a syllabary Pokemon in his party, but missing one arm, one leg, and one eye. Speeding things up a bit, our narrator has his character move forward through the area. There are now some NPCs, but none of them are saying anything when interacted with. He then finds a transparent red NPC, or uh, the trainer slash protagonist from the Pokemon Red and Blue games. The two engage in a Pokemon duel between their broken syllabary and a rather sad looking Pikachu, which ends in both Pokemon killing one another simultaneously. After the fight, the narrator's character was now completely transparent and back inside his room. The profile was now only a head, and the usual unknowns now spelt out no more. He tries to interact with anything in the house, but nothing works. So he ends up walking outside his house, only to be greeted with an endless gray void. He walks south for a very long time into this void, until eventually he finds his character fully colored body before him. And when he tried to talk to it, it simply said, goodbye forever, and then vanished. Then suddenly the game says, question mark, question mark, question mark, use nightmare. And then he was returned to that four block trap from before, except this time there was no sprite. When he checked the trainer's status, there was nothing. The trainer's badges were now replaced with skulls. He then checked his Pokemon one last time, only to find the unknown has given him one last message to read. I'm dead. After that, the final text on screen read simply, R.I.P., and the narrator could do nothing more in the game, even if he reset his Game Boy. As the narrator puts it, despite his enormous success as a Pokemon trainer in life, death still came for the gold and silver protagonist in the end, and he was forgotten with the next generation. And that's the story of Lost Silver. If you notice with this one, I had footage to play alongside the events due to it being popular enough to have a full game version for you to play. While it's not super scary to me by any means, I do appreciate that it's not a haunted cartridge or something or full of hyper-realistic blood or what have you. It's just a hack Game Boy cart made by someone. For what purpose though, I'm not sure. It's something I always wish these stories touched on a little bit more. The only real comment this story gives about it is that the narrator at one point says they must have been a sick individual. And Maybe, maybe they just wanted to share this thing as a prank, but either way, it would be kind of interesting to get into the mind of someone who made this thing and then put it into stores, only to be found by one select person. I also like the ending being just a grave that there is no escape from, and it has one of the more clever lines from a video game creepypasta that I've ever personally read. It's how the protagonist has been forgotten by the next generation, which is both a sad and scary reality that many of us living may face from time to time. I mean, and we all will eventually face it in the end, I suppose. The fear and sadness that comes with the idea of being forgotten with generations that come is interesting and realistic. I mean, after all, all of us die twice, really. The first time is when we actually die, and the second death is the last time our names are ever uttered. And then, as for Pokemon, with each Pokemon generation comes a new batch of characters and Pokemon, etc. So in a sense, they actually are forgotten, which I thought was a pretty cool and maybe even philosophical idea when applied to real life. It's clever for it being an actual thing in the Pokemon series, but also a legitimate fear in real life, which is 
pretty cool. Pokemon Easter Egg, Snow on Mount Silver. So this one's clearly inspired off of the last one we read and Sonic.exe as well, but it definitely has its own flavor. See, the first near half of the story is actually slow. Uh, the narrator recounts how she and her brother used to love playing Pokemon, and because their mom loves spoiling them, she would always buy them one edition of the game and the other the other edition, like Pokemon Red and Blue, Gold and Silver, etc. And if there was ever a third edition, she would give them both one as well. It then goes on to say, quote, This is going to sound, at first, like a bittersweet story about two siblings who grow up with a couple of games that eventually take them down two different roads. Well, it's a little more than that. The years rolled by, we kept collecting. Game Boys got old, we replaced them. Cartridges finally gave out, we picked up new copies. But we started down two completely different roads before Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald came out. See, around then, my brother got a Game Shark. We had heard all the hacks and cheats you could do with them, even if we were kind of late to the party, and they sounded awfully cool. Our first guinea pig cartridge was my brother's old blue version. We just dicked around with it a little bit, nothing major. But whatever we did, fucked the cartridge up. After just a couple of code entries, it glitched out completely and became unplayable. Naturally, we were upset at first. My brother mourned the loss of his hours of work. And I am sympathetic to him, I told him. It's okay. We can replace it, I guess. Stupid Shark was a waste of money, unquote. This eventually leads the brother to always wanting to hack his games for some reason. Even though it broke his other one, he gets ultra interested in it for some reason. It's described like this, quote, After seeing the mess it had turned blue version into, I had become opposed to the idea of hacking or cheating any of my games. What can I say? I'm a chick. I feel feelings for the little pixel creatures. Before we go on, can I just note that it was at this exact point that I knew that the writer was in fact not a, uh, a, a chick. <laughs> at least with that game shark, but my brother had taken this game's destruction as a personal challenger something. I don't think he ever played a game after that which wasn't hacked somehow, unquote. Which is a really weird thing to do, I must point out yet again, uh, considering how much it fucked up his stuff the first time. But, uh, whatever. This eventually leads to an incident when her brother slices up all of his Pokemon Game Boy carts and smashes his Game Boy to pieces. Quote, it was awful. I remember him rasping, and the way his voice rattled made my knees weak. Oh god, whites everywhere, and then black, unquote. His sister is obviously shocked at this random act of destruction, as well as her brother's strange ramblings about something that happened, uh, but when she goes to comfort him, he feels her Game Boy in her pocket and proceeds to grab it out and toss it across the fucking room. She screams, but luckily her Game Boy Advance was just fine. But then he starts running after her to break the Game Boy, with a hammer no less. Now you might be wondering, where is this all going? Well, I'll tell you where. Straight to the fucking psych ward. Like literally, they send the brother to the psych ward because something in one of the games he hacked scared him so much he went fucking bonkers. Which I love this line pertaining to that in particular. Quote, he ended up in the psych ward of the hospital for two days. When we went to visit him, I left my GBA at home, unquote. Now I know that this line is probably showing that she didn't want to scare him again with the Game Boy, but I like to think that it was because she didn't want him to break it, and that was what was foremost in her mind while her brother was in the psych ward. Something about that is just a lot more funny to me, even if it wasn't the intention. Anyway, he eventually asks his sister if she will go to his room and get rid of the Game Shark and Pokemon Silver Card. It's the only thing left, and that he never wants to play with them again. Which is kind of a weird plot hole, because if he really, like, whatever affected him to such a degree came from the Game Shark in the Pokemon Silver Cart, wouldn't he break those first rather than all the other ones? Even if he did break all the other ones, wouldn't that one be on his high priority list? 
kind of weird, but okay. But I do have to give the pasta kudos thus far for building up this fucking hack to such an insane degree. I mean, it put a kid in the psych ward. What could possibly be so damn scary that it did that? Well, it's supposed to be an Easter egg on Mount Silver where it snows and the snow looks like static on screen and you, you traverse a mountain and you fight a, a bunch of zombie looking Pokemon and um and then it seems to leave a virus on your Game Boy or if you put in other Pokemon games um it's uh it's this smiling zombie Pikachu uh and, and it screams at you <laughs> the end okay okay i know i skipped a lot there maybe you know undersold it slightly but it's not a necessarily a terrible story but man after all that build up i guess almost nothing could have actually been an interesting payoff but it basically is just another creepypasta game and not much else. It really makes the brother seem like a little bitch and the sister too, honestly, because she cries for an entire hour after playing the scary Easter egg hack game or whatever. Like, I can kind of get being upset that all your Game Boy games just got hacked and are, you know, have a virus. Basically, you bricked your Game Boy games. That's upsetting. I could understand them getting upset and crying since, you know, it's so important to them. Um, breaking all of them and uh, going to a psych ward, though, um, seems a little intense uh, for that, though, I gotta say. It's a shame because I sort of like how the story started out. It seems sort of genuine, and the actual storytelling up to that point isn't too bad. But by the time the scary stuff starts happening, it's just way too dramatic. But all oh well, similar to the other Pokemon and Sonic related creepypastas like this, there is a video game version of the events in it, so I guess at least it was descriptive enough for someone to be inspired to do that, so that's pretty cool. Strangled Red. This Pokepasta starts with the following paragraph, quote, There are tons of stories out there about hacked Pokemon games, some of them really quite neat, such as the one about a version where you get a ghost as a starter. Some are ridiculous. Silly stories about individuals dying after playing a game, or the game talking to them. God, don't these writers know less is more when it comes to these stories? Huh, well, I digress, unquote. For God's sake, never, ever do this. When you acknowledge other creepypastas of this sort being written, while it may seem meta and cool to do it and that you're in the know, all it really does is it calls extra attention to your own story. And especially if it's as just as silly and overdramatic as the other stories, it's actually even worse because A, you've made it very clear that you're aware of all the cliches and yet chose to do them anyway, and B, you have virtued to your readers right away that you think your story is better than those other creepypastas. I'm not like those other guys, okay? My story is all about less being more. It really makes it easy to root against you, even if the story is pretty decent, you know? You, 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 you catch my drift? But anyway, the story follows our narrator as he ends up finding the cursed creepypasta Pokemon cartridge in where else but the dumpster. Yes, he finds it in the fucking dumpster. And after asking the trash man if he can have it, which, by the way, why the fuck would he care? And also, by the way, by the way, does this narrator just go dumpster diving often? How did he even see the Pokemon cart in the trash bag anyway, if he wasn't specifically opening up other people's trash to go through them? He's, he's going through the neighbor's fucking trash to find Game Boy games! Fucking weirdo! Well anyway, he boots up the game to find immediately that the game is titled Strangled Red version. Which of course is no worry to this guy, being that he's used to reading about these hacked Pokemon carts by now. The game has a pre-made trainer named Steven and a Pokemon already in his party, a Charmander named Mickey. Oh, and in this game, his rival is named Mike, 
In addition to them being rivals, the two of them are also brothers in this story. Anyway, after our narrator goes through the whole game like normal, he ends up beating his rival slash brother in the game, Mike, and then the screen fades to black and Mike is asking Steven if he can trade Mickey, his prize Charmander, with him so he can complete his Pokédex which gives the player a yes or no option. But despite clicking no over and over and over again, our narrator is basically forced into trading Mickey as the only option to let the game proceed on with its ending. However, as the trade screen was going up between them, a loud snap is then heard and again cuts to black before the text one year later appears. Well, I guess Mickey in that trade died or something, or maybe Mike killed the Charmander? I guess that's what's implied? Uh, but at any rate, Steven is now mourning the loss of his beloved Charizard Pokemon, and his sprite looks all messed up and depressed. Well, Steven goes all pet cemetery and uses the Pokemon Missing No to try and resurrect his beloved Pokemon. This works out, but now both he and his Pokemon are all red-eyed and creepy looking and corrupted. And then they proceed to go and get revenge on their brother, who I assume was the one that killed Mickey, like I said to begin with, and they snap his neck. All while our narrator, despite knowing full well this is just a spooky fan hat game, is described as literally bawling their eyes out. Just like every other Weenie Hut Jr. ass gaming creepypasta pro tag. And that's how it ends. I did sort of skim through this one, I will admit, but I wanted to add it since it was requested a fair bit and it remains to be one of the more uh, popular Pokemon creepypastas that I forgot to add in addition to all the others in this section. On its own, the basic story inside the Pokemon game is okay but I think we've showcased several that are much better than it. But this pasta's main pro tag or narrator is pretty silly. Pokemon Buried Alive Model. So this one's pretty short, so I'll read it in full real quick. Often referred to as its code, the Berry Man script, the Buried Alive model was to be found on the final story of the Pokemon Tower, in what has now been replaced with the Marowak Ghost. According to the scripts assigned to it, the Buried Alive model was intended to be the boss of the tower. Once reaching the top floor, the following conversation would have taken place with the model. You're here, I'm trapped, and I'm lonely. So very lonely. Won't you join me? After this, the battle would be initiated. Once in battle view, the buried alive model appeared to be a decaying corpse attempting to crawl out from the ground. It had been programmed to have two white hands, a Gengar and a Muk. Strangely enough, a protocol for the buried alive actions after it was defeated were not written. In the case of the player defeating him, the game would freeze. However, a specific ending was written by an unknown programmer upon losing the battle. In this ending, the Buried Alive model was to have stated, Finally, fresh meat followed by several lines of gibberish, he was to have then dragged the player's character into the ground, surrounding him. The scene would finish with the typical game over screen. However, in the background, an image of the buried alive character devouring the player was to have been shown. Especially peculiar were the protocols for after this scene. The cartridge was to download this image to the small eternal memory contained in the Game Boy, overriding the title screen that normally accompany the Game Boy turning on. Instead, whenever it was started, the player would view this image as a sound file, static.mesh, was played. The intended purpose for this effect, unlike many of the other factors leading towards Lavender Town Syndrome, is unknown. And that's the story. This one's okay. It's got a cool visual, you know, it's a pretty creepy visual to go along with it. It's a creepy idea, uh, but ultimately, it's also 
kind of nonsensical, like, why would Nintendo program this? Why would this ever even be a thing that that would happen? It doesn't really add up in that regard. Uh, but then again, it does remind me of many urban legends surrounding video games. They usually have something to do with what was originally going to be in the game, but then it was cut out for unknown reasons. But maybe there's some code or some sort of way of having it reappear again, etc. That sort of thing can be cool, and again, the actual idea is pretty creepy. It's just like Lavender Town Syndrome, it's just not very convincing. And finally, our last Pokemon pasta of this marathon is Misfortune GB. Now, this isn't actually a Pokemon pasta fully, as you will soon see, but it does connect with it in an interesting way. So, let's have a look. Misfortune.gb Misfortune is an obscure game for the original Game Boy. Since no known hard copies or ROMs exist, all information about the game is derived from personal accounts and a scanned assemblage of screenshots. The game does not contain any credits and whoever created it is still unknown to this day. A few people who have experienced it consider it to be one of the scariest video games ever made. Given its age and cult following among rare horror game enthusiasts, it's entirely possible that authors of widely known creepypastas such as Sonic.exe and Lavender Town Syndrome drew inspiration from misfortune. Story, concept, the player controls what appears to be a young boy in a strange gothic building. After brief exploring, the player is confronted by a malevolent being. Despite the character never identifying itself, some people, citing notable similarities, claim that it may be a representation of Baphomet, Beelzebub or even the Devil. Upon meeting the mysterious creature, a dialogue box will appear with the text, I exist within the very fabric of reality, do you want to challenge me? This is followed by a yes or no choice. Should the player choose yes, the being replies, then let's begin. The player is then transported to a series of maze-like rooms, each filled with pit drops, locked doors, keys and traps. The objective for the player is to progress through each room by either reaching the stairs to the next level or solving another kind of puzzle. This can include answering riddles or choosing correct doors or pathways. The most well-known example is in a level where four small cabins are shown on screen. A dialogue box will appear that reads, Choose wrong and misfortune will befall your loved ones. Are you ready to play? Should the player ever make a mistake throughout the game, the screen will cut black before showing a more detailed image of the demon along with a dialogue box reading, I am God here, in what appears to be blood-styled writing. Rumors pertaining to the game's alleged harmful effects began to surface on the internet around the late 1990s. Players claimed to have begun experiencing ongoing depression and dread shortly after losing and seeing the game over screen. Once prominent members of online forums who told such claims are thought to have died or disappeared when they suddenly became inactive without warning. Heated discussions soon dominated these forums for some time, but the mystery never seemed to be getting any closer to being solved. Some wrote the whole thing off as a tasteless practical joke. Others believe that viewing the image of the evil character after losing a game can really cause the player to experience misfortune as the game's antagonist promised. Soon people began to speculate that the eerie soundtrack of the game was the cause. The music in the game consisted of deep, buzzy tones, off-key melodies. The game had a remarkably unsettling soundtrack despite composition being limited to the 8-bit Game Boy sound bank. The game over screen had especially erratic, almost no seating music with a very high frequency that accompanied it. Rumor has it that this very track could somehow influence moods and thought patterns. Of all the tracks in the game, only the theme that plays when first meeting the demonic entity can be found on the internet today. Searching for playable roams or cartridges online is futile because none exist. In fact, most of those who have played it directly hadn't sought out looking for it, but rather stumbled upon it by accident. According to a first-hand accounts, certain copies of various Game Boy titles contain misfortune in its entirety. The means for accessing it through these games vary, but typically involve exploiting glitches or using cheating devices. Although some had detailed 
what they had done to trigger misfortune to start, attempts by others using the same methods had always failed. Another common observation was that many of the sprites in misfortune had been copied from its host games. Misfortune is known to be integrated in the following. Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, Pokemon Red, Spots Adventure, Pucci Karat, and Atelier Marie. Once again, thank you so much Dylan for having me, I really had a lot of fun making this and if you my dedicated bros and brodettes watching this, don't forget to subscribe to Dylan the Night Owl, cause this dude really really deserves it. Best of luck in the future bro. And that's the story. There's also a secondary piece in which the author recounts his experience uh, knowing a friend who's played the game, who died an awful death shortly after having played the game in what looked like a seppuku incident. But the author being sure it was the game that caused it. I personally really like this one because it has a ton of screenshots and footage that go alongside it and the game itself causing misfortune as well as being a part of other games is an interesting idea. It's a cool urban legend, though again it's not very scary to me, it's just more interesting conceptually. But then again I think that's more than enough with most of the video game based ones. Which my goodness there has been a lot of this tier. Perhaps we ought to take a break from those and look at one a bit different. I mean, we are out in a dark tropical jungle. I don't know a lot of creepypastas that take place here, but I do know a story that takes place in a dark forest. Anansi's Goat Man Story. So I always heard about this one back in the day, but I'd never taken the time to read it for myself. Which is a shame, because it's one of the best new ones that I've read from this tier. It's pretty simple. It starts off as a green text story like this. Quote, B16, be black and have family down in Alabama. They farm and own a huge amount of land down in Huntsville. Uncle owns a big house and a bunch of trailers they put out in the woods for hunting or camping. Down South Cousin suggests that we go out there to camp. No, I'm a city kid from Chicago, so they tease the fuck out of me, collect food, kill a pig and some chickens, and bring necessities to camp out for a few days. We get to the camp and it's obvious something is weird. We think nothing of it and unpack and go down to the little creek to swim for a few hours. All of a sudden, some older white guy and a white teenager come out of the bushes. He has a shotgun in the crook of his arm and says hello and asks us what we're doing this far back in the woods. Tell him about my uncle, who he knows, and say we're camping out. He tells us we need to be real careful out here and stick together. There was a big animal in the woods. His son, who is my age, asks if he can stay and hang out with us. He says, okay, unquote. The story then turns into normal prose when the author notes it's more difficult to write the story in the green text format. So our narrator, five of his cousins, four of their friends, and a white kid named Tanner, all ranging from ages 15 to 17, end up camping next to one of the trailers. What then proceeds to happen are various strange events surrounding the intense smell of copper filling the air and then suddenly going away, before a few of them trail off into the woods, only to run back to the rest of the camp immediately after in a cold sweat, piling everyone inside the trailer. Rooster, one of the cousins, explains that they had seen something out there rushing towards them, something Tanner had apparently also seen before a few days back, which they assumed was perhaps a big cat or something. Another cousin, JR, starts going on about how he went to school with a native kid that was telling him about the goat man, and based on their description, that's what he thinks they saw, uh, but no one takes him seriously though. The story then goes on, quote, Nothing else weird happens that night, and we stay another night, and for the main part of the night nothing happens. At about one in the morning, we're outside getting drunk and telling ghost stories, as someone is finishing some too spooky story, I don't remember what it's about, the smell comes back. It's so fucking strong that one of the girls literally starts vomiting. I stand up and you can actually feel how clammy the air is. I say we should get inside and this isn't right. We should have just fucking left. 
We all go back inside and we're standing around. My cousin just keeps going on about how it's the goat man, it's the goat man. And my cousin Rooster tries to shut him the fuck up. And all the while I'm just feeling like something is wrong and I can't figure out what the fuck it is, unquote. Well, that feeling wasn't unwarranted because shortly after making a batch of 12 hot dogs so everyone can have one, one of the cousins remarks how it's not fair that our protagonist gets two of them, which he then argues with them about for a little bit and about how everyone got one. And that's when he and a few others realize something and immediately have everyone rush out of the trailer. They then count how many people there are, 11. They then start asking how many people were in that trailer. And that's when they realize everyone remembers 12 people being in that trailer the whole time. Panic then ensues as they realize how crazy this situation is. Who was the 12th person? Skipping ahead a bit, several more incidents occur involving the group splitting off to go and get a rifle and this thing, which they are now calling the Goat Man, starts taking the form of others in their group, stalking them, watching them, acting strangely. This all eventually leads to a face-off when they do finally get a rifle and fire into the woods, challenging it. Ungodly screams that sound like multiple animals blaring all at once echo through their now locked trailer until it all eventually goes quiet, and all of them, after a while, start to nod off, hoping that this is all over. But Tanner had been watching the whole time with his rifle in hand, only pretending to be asleep when he saw it happen. Someone walked out of the trailer bathroom and then proceeded to lay down in the middle of the trailer. He watched to get up a few times and laughed quietly before laying back down. He didn't dare alert anyone or dare to shoot at it for fear that it would then instantly go mad and start killing everyone in the trailer all at once. At least for now, though terrifying, it only laid and stood there. Tanner only let them know this detail, what he saw when they all left the trailer that morning, one member of their party trailing behind them, before eventually slipping back into the woods. And that's the story. The way this tale is told really makes it feel like a buddy relaying a real life scary occurrence him and some lads went through. The use of language and the general tone is realistic and engaging. I absolutely love the story and it didn't need half of the people dying or meeting bloody ends or for anyone long term trauma afterward to be effective. Just a very creepy and mysterious occurrence with something no one could quite understand. Understands. There are a couple leaps in logic and some unfortunate pitfalls the story falls into on occasion, but overall I would recommend it. It's a pretty good story. Tiki Toby. So we obviously couldn't go a tear without at least one cringy Jeff the Killer ripoff. I mean, come on now. And this is without a doubt one of the most popular ones of its time, and believed by many to be a far superior version of the Jeff the Killer formula. So is it? Well, let's dive in and find out, shall we? So our story starts off with a rather long description of Toby's mom for some reason before so we then shift focus to Toby, the titular killer teen of this feature. You see, Toby is pretty upset because he was recently in a car crash with his older sister. He survived, but she unfortunately did not. But also, you see, he's different. Toby has a condition where he is completely numb to pain. Never before has he felt himself get hurt. He could have lost an arm and felt nothing according to this story, which is pretty crazy. But then things get worse for Toby because it turns out he also has Tourette syndrome, which caused him to tick and twitch in ways that he couldn't control. So that's pretty bad, but wait, it gets worse because Toby has Tourette's syndrome, he is also bullied at school. In fact, he was bullied so often and consistently they had to be homeschooled instead. But triple wait, it gets worse. Toby also lives with his somewhat understanding mother and, you guessed it, his drunk abusive father who physically, mentally, and emotionally hurts them and who didn't even go to his own daughter's funeral because he was too drunk that day. So yeah. 
things are pretty- Oh shit, son, did you think I was fucking done? On top of everything else, Toby is also now seeing visions of the Slender Man outside his bedroom window, and this has been causing him to hear voices in his head and go into states of complete lack of control and blackouts. Now, I present all of this to you because it's presented in much the same way Clockwork Your Time is Up did. Fast, furious, and front-loaded to the point that the story is practically screaming at you to feel bad for this tragic backstory. Fella, who you just know is gonna kill his dad later and then become a proxy for Slender Man. Oops, I spoiled the next 25 minutes of the story. But if this exact chain of events is at all a surprise to you, then you haven't been paying attention very much. Tiki Toby is just as formulaic and silly as the other stories of this ilk are. Although I will give some kudos, I sort of like that it's Slender Man turning him into a proxy by feeding into his natural anger for his father. It makes it much more believable when he ends up being a serial killer that can't be stopped. Because he feels no pain and is being used by Slender Man as a tool essentially. Though that does make him a rather apparent Mary Sue or Gary Stu I suppose doesn't it? But hey at least it's better than they went crazy and that means that they can now take hundreds of boys Bullets. Anyway, in the same fashion as Jeff the Killer and many others I've shown here on this iceberg, uh, Tiki Toby ended up being a cute emo boy for all to love and adore. Although to be fair, he kind of always was designed to be at least sort of cool emo boy looking. Which, by the way, I'm not like hating on the emo boy look. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that was clearly the style all these uh, serial killers were going for. Anyway, many also enjoyed pairing him up with uh, the clockwork character as well, as since their stories are so similar, which Fuck me if that isn't one of the worst things you could say about a story. But beyond that, I actually remember a fair amount of people liking Tiki Toby, who also didn't like Jeff or Clockwork, which is so weird to me, because having read them all at this point, they are all sort of just variations of the same story. Personally, I'd say I enjoy all of them in a sort of ironic sense. They are very fun reads, but just not very well written stories. Sort of the same way that I like a lot of slasher films. Um, there are some very well written and very interesting slasher films, but there's also a ton of just horror movie junk food that is really trashy and stupid, but I love it all the same. Uh, so I guess my problem is, is I've yet to find a really interesting and well written Jeff the Killer type story. They're all just sort of trash, but hey, at the very least, I would not say they're boring, so they got that going for them. And what's interesting is the creator of Tiki Toby, Wade Castaway, has since sort of retaken his character and asked that people stop making fan art of him, that he plans on doing something more with the character, and that it's no longer at all creepypasta related. Which I can sympathize with, especially if he isn't proud of the story these days. But hey, I will actually compliment this, the character design for Tiki Toby has always been one of the better parts of the story and character. With that mask that looks like it's always smiling, the goggles, the muted colors, it does look pretty cool. So maybe Wade plans on doing something more interesting with the character in the future. At any rate, I would go into more detail like I did the others, but that really is all there is to the story. Tiki Toby has a tragic backstory, he ends up going crazy through Slender Man prodding him, he kills his dad, and then he bends up becoming a crazy serial killer under Slender Man's control, and that's pretty much all there is to it. Tiki Toby isn't the worst of its kind, it may even be a little bit better than some, uh, but not much in my opinion. Mr. Mix so I actually remember this one being one of the very few first ones that I listened to uh, during my first dipping into creepypasta years and years and years ago. <sighs> God, does that make me feel old to say that. The story starts like this, quote, Does anyone remember an old PC game from the early 1990s called Mr. Mix? It's mainly a typing game, similar to Mario Teaches Typing, where you have to type words in a box to make a chef, the titular uh, Mr. Mix, put ingredients into a bowl.
goal. Unlike most typing games, however, this game is notorious for having an insane difficulty curve. The game has a words per minute requirement for each level, being as low as 10 on level 1 and as high as 85 by the third. By level 5, the requirement reaches over 500, effectively making it impossible to proceed any further." Unquote. The story then goes on to describe how there are low growls that grow progressively louder as each level went on, or how the second and third level have an extremely low quality recording of a hairdryer playing in the backgrounds. The story then goes on to describe how, quote, most children who played the game reported having vivid nightmares of Mr. Mix, speaking to them in a quiet, raspy voice and threatening them to keep quiet about something. However, none of them could remember exactly what it was. One psychologist who saw many of these children reported being disturbed by the sheer amount of terror on their faces as they recounted the details of the nightmare. Many children broke down the tears in the process, begging for their parents to save them. However, no direct relationship to the game itself could be determined by these few cases, as not all children suffered the same adverse effects." Unquote. The game apparently fell into relative obscurity, until, as the story describes, a few PC hackers got a hold of a ROM of the game and started digging through it. Using a hacking software, they managed to bypass the game's code on the impossible fifth level, and what they found, apparently, was extremely disturbing and caused many of them to quit the expedition altogether. Apparently, if the fifth level is bypassed, the game will then crash, and then will write a bunch of files to the user's System32 directory, to the point that one's RAM is almost completely filled. And these files are apparently pictures of people with horribly deformed faces appearing to scream in pain and agony, with their eyes bleeding and their outer layers of skin torn clear off in multiple places. If you try to delete any of these files, then the computer will crash and blue screen, causing permanent and irreparable damage to one's user's hard drive. However, eventually some hackers found out that a lone byte apparently made the ROM trigger this, and if you took out the one byte, then you could actually see what the final level of the game looked like, which the story then goes on to say, quote, Unfortunately, all the original hackers declined to discuss what they saw in the final level. All of them became extremely paranoid and reclusive, refusing to talk about anything related to the game, and showing astonishingly extreme symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Most of them ceased to be able to form coherent sentences within a week, and within a month, all of them went missing. All remaining copies of the game were destroyed. To this day, no one knows what was in that game that caused them so much psychological damage. Maybe it's better that way. Two years after this incident, a man was arrested after trying to kidnap an eight-year-old girl from a grocery store. Through DNA and fingerprint analysis, the man was identified as one of the original hackers who viewed the final level of the game. He was wearing a white chef's hat and had a look of unspeakable malice and insanity on his face. When interrogated, the man would only say one thing, I'm Mr. Mix. <laughs> Unquote. So, yeah, it's not the best. In fact, it lines up with a lot of random video game creepypastas, especially the dramatic ending with the hackers all having a PTSD over playing the sixth level. Like, any time one of these pastas does this, I can't help but laugh. Like, imagine you're playing Silent Hill and then you suddenly turn into a serial killer with PTSD because you saw some blood and spooky stuff. It's just so dramatic and dumb. I can understand it messing someone up if there was some dark illegal stuff in the last level or something like that, but it almost implies that they got possessed by the game's character, Mr. Mix, I guess, so it's clearly not that. Still, I do have some major nostalgia for this one. I think that's because it was uh, the first one like this that I had ever come across, and it opened my mind up to what other stories could be told through scary video games like that. And I won't lie, at the time I seriously wondered if the story I was listening to was a little bit real. 
I know. Maybe I was a little dumb in the moment, but I didn't know what a video game creepypasta really even was at that point. But hey, at least it's an original game. I gotta give it some credit for that, I suppose. And finally, for our last story this tier, we have one of the more highly regarded creepypasta. I'm a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service. Quote, I'm a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service, and I have some stories to tell. Unquote. That pretty much sums up this not one, not two, but entire collection of creepypastas about a search and rescue officer or a SAR relating the many bizarre, creepy, or just sad or slightly off-putting findings he had come across in his time working this job. It's all together eight parts and written by Carrie Hammond and was published on Reddit under the username Search and Rescue Wood. Woods, originally being posted to the No Sleep subreddit in August of 2015, with its final update being in December of that year. It really is an assorted collection of creepy stories, all tapping into something more deeply mysterious or eerie. And now when I say eight parts, each part contains several short to more extended stories. So all together, you're getting a ton of of creepy, sad, or disturbing stories all having to do with being a search and rescue officer out in the woods. The very first one opens like this. Quote, I have a pretty good track record for finding missing people. Most of the time, they just wander off the path or slip down a small cliff and they can't find their way back. The majority of them have heard the old stay where you are thing and they don't wander far. But I've had two cases where this didn't happen. Uh, both bothered me a lot, and I used them as motivation to search even harder on the missing persons cases I get called on. The first was a little boy who was out berry picking with his parents. He and his sister were together, and both of them went missing around the same time. Their parents lost sight of them for a few seconds, and in that time, both the kids apparently wandered off. When their parents couldn't find them, they called us, and we came out to search the area. We found the daughter pretty quickly, and when we asked where her brother was, she told us he'd been taken away by the bear man. She said he gave her berries and told her to stay quiet, that he wanted to play with her brother for a while. The last she saw of her brother, he was riding on the shoulders of the bear man and seemed calm. Of course, our first thought was abduction, but we never found a trace of another human being in that area. The little girl was so insistent that he wasn't a normal man, but that he was tall and covered in hair, like a bear, and that he had a weird face. We searched the area for weeks. It was one of the longest calls I've ever been on, but we never found a single trace of that kid. The other was a young woman who was out hiking with her mom and grandpa. According to the mother, her daughter had climbed up a tree to get a better view of the forest, and she never came back down. They waited at the base of the tree for hours, calling her name before they called for help. Again, we searched everywhere, and we never found a trace of her. I have no idea where she could possibly have gone, because neither her or her grandpa saw her come down." Unquote. Every post is filled with stories like these, of missing people being found in strange places in the woods, children being abducted, so living to talk of a mysterious person talking to them, others not being so lucky. And then there are the staircases. Quote, on just about every case where we're really far out into the wilderness, I'm talking 30 or 40 miles, at some point we'll find a staircase in the middle of the woods. It's almost like if you took the stairs in your home, cut them out and put them just right there in the forest. I asked about it the first time I saw some, and the other officer just told me not to worry about it, that it was normal. Everyone I asked said the same thing. I wanted to go check them out, but I was told very emphatically that I should never go near any of them. I sort of ignore them now when I run into them, but because, well, because it just happens so frequently, unquote. As the parts go on, the tales grow darker. The tales 
tales of strangers, of men who can scream like a cougar and reverberate in the air, a body horror, a consistent theme of bad shit happening to kids, eldritch abominations amongst so much more. All of this is delivered by an officer who is fairly jaded at this due to his overexposure to it. It doesn't get any easier and it still haunts him, but the engaging, yeah, this is yet another day on the job, sadly, tones make it an extremely entertaining read. The descriptions of the torment of some of the people he meets or the things he hears or sees is crafted masterfully and never ceases to tease the imagination with some truly terrifying images and ideas. I would go on, but honestly, it would take at least 30 minutes to go over it all. And again, I think you guys ought to check it out for yourself. In a way, it's almost an iceberg of its own. I mean, I guess it's not that much, but it's still a lot. Enough so that there's bound to be something that unnerves you amongst all these stories. Wake up, pal. Something strange happened while you were asleep. I didn't get a wink of sleep last night with it going on. Actually, I don't know how the hell you did either. The island, it's changed. It started snowing. It's frigid cold, as a matter of fact. It would seem the island itself may be a bit of a creepypasta or entity of some sort. Though given the instant change from sunny hot beach island to snowy mountains. I believe its end goal may indeed be to make us permanent residents through one means or another. Strange people and shadows have been lurking about as well. We need to find the center of the island quickly before it changes again. God knows where it is now. The pit itself may change forms too. Scary thought. But we must persist, my companion. At the risk of sounding like an EXE author, uh, my curiosity is getting the better of me. Zalgo. So before we go into the main entries of this tier, it's time we talk about one of the most famous and influential creepypastas slash pasta concepts that uh, really should have been brought up on this iceberg by now. Zalgo, more of a horror-based meme than an actual story of any kind, is, as the Creepypasta Files wiki puts it, quote, Zalgo is the brainchild of Dave Kelly, aka Schmorky a flash animator and something awful goon. It was first mentioned but not seen in parodies of syndicated newspaper comics on a semi-secret page on his official site. Zalgo spread rapidly from there, with people making their edits of supposedly Zalgo-fied comics, writing creepypasta stories about him, and continuing the lore. According to Schmorky, Zalgo's abilities only affect comics, cartoons, and illustrations, and not reality itself, though this idea has drifted out of favor with the more recent stories uh, portraying Zalgo as a more powerful demonic being." Unquote. Now, while I could go into a lot of detail about this meme's creator, Schmorky, as it's kind of a tale all of its own with how interesting they are, it might be going a little too off topic for this video right now. However, these edits, both photo, comic, cartoon and video game related edits of Zalgo-fied characters became one of the most prominent visual styles of the creepypasta scene. And it's kind of easy to see why. I mean, it's just giving a character black and red eyes, maybe some fake gore or tentacles or just something creepy going on with their mouth. And there you go, Zalgo-fied. In most creepypastas that were written about the mysterious Zalgo, it usually 
played out something like a Lovecraft sort of inspired story stylistically, but honestly, it's these images that are really Zalgo's lasting effect. <laughs> Nice of the princess to invite us over for a picnic, eh, Luigi? I hope she made lots of spaghetti! Luigi, look! particularly with how many pastas would be inspired by it, such as some My Little Pony pastas that are coming up very soon, many lost episode creepypastas. Even if Zalgo wasn't directly in the story itself, you would often see the images that accompany these stories as Zalgo-like in appearance. And then of course you have Sonic.exe, perhaps the most popular of them all, which again looks like a Zalgo edit, something which the original author tried very much to get away from with his shitty sequel and remake, but many of the .exe game makers noticed this connection as well, and there are many that have even tried to make Zalgo more important to the Sonic.exe story and even other .exe games, him being the reason all these otherwise innocent or fun games are turning so dark and gruesome. They are basically being corrupted by him, and thus .exe games are essentially an evolution of the Zalgo edits. There's not much more to say about Zalgo other than that, but understanding its influence on creepypasta and its aesthetics and the like, I think is pretty cool. But now, on to our first official entry, The Showers. Starting out, we have what is without a doubt one of the best creepypastas ever written, and another personal favorite of mine, maybe even in my top 5 favorites of all time. Written by Dylan Sindelaire, and later released altogether as a novella, The Showers is one of those creepypasta stories that marked a bunch of acclaim at the time, originally being two parts before Dylan would later expand upon the story and complete his horror master. Masterpiece. The pasta opens with the following set of paragraphs, which set the mood for the long journey ahead. Quote, Every area in all parts of the world has those area-specific urban legends that just refuse to die. Whether the stories are about a haunted asylum on the outskirts of the city, or a creature that lives in the nearby woods, or a ghost that haunts a lonely stretch of road outside of town, there is always a common thread within the tales. No one has ever been to these places, seen the creatures, or witnessed any hauntings with their own eyes. There are members of every generation who will proclaim that they know someone whose brother's best friend's sister went to that haunted house with 13 floors that used real blood and snakes and spiders, and it's so scary that no one has ever made it all the way through. Those same people will swear by these stories without ever being able to provide a shred of evidence or a name of someone who could provide proof of the claims simply because everyone around here knows that it's a true story. The storytellers eventually pass the tales on to their children, who modify them just enough to keep up with the changing times, and so the cycle continues. I'm as skeptical as anyone when it comes to these stories, seeing as I was like a junkie when I was younger, constantly searching for more terrifying stories about whatever area of the country I was living in at the time. I made up and spread stories about about haunted pizza parlors in New York, my cousin's encounter with the Jersey Devil, or how my grandfather encountered a feral, human-like demon creature in the woods of Colorado. I even broke the one rule of these stories by putting myself in them. This took guts in hindsight, because I had to make sure that I always told them the same way. Surprisingly, no one ever called my bluff. 
I like to think that I've made some wonderful contributions to various urban legends around the Midwest and Northeastern states. I, I moved around a lot. There's always a surge of joy whenever I would wander the halls at school and hear one of my classmates retelling my stories to another one of their friends, adding little bits here and there like a massive game of telephone. I knew, of course, that the stories were complete fiction, but I stood my ground whenever someone asked me about them. I would even manage to act a little bit, speaking with a shaky voice or looking scared when I would recount a situation that I supposedly experienced myself. I suppose this aspect of my childhood has led me to my current predicament which I will recount in full for the internet to take from what they will. I have laid this little introduction out as sort of a, a disclaimer, even particularly at those who will call my story into question. I've been like the boy who cried wolf for years, but I assure you, with every ounce of honesty and integrity that I have, that this time, this time the wolf is real." Unquote. The way this pasta opens up is plain and simply perfect, from not only building up the disturbing story to follow, but also tying the narrative metatextually through urban legends and the passing of this story onto us, the readers. From here the tale sees our narrator talk about his social studies teacher from one of the many schools he went to throughout his life. Mr. Mays is his name, and how he was different from other teachers. He never talked down to the kids, the freshman class, and would often be in the know with modern pop culture references and the like. Then comes Halloween time, and Mr. Mays has turned off all the lights in his classroom. The place is now lit up by just a few stray candles and a lone jack-o'-lantern in the front of the room. He tells them that their assignment has been delayed to next Tuesday, and then proceeds to say, quote, Today is probably my favorite day of the year, class, he said in a, a monotonous voice. Halloween is my favorite holiday, and I want to share with you exactly why I love it so much." Unquote. What follows is a detailed description of the time Mr. Mays and his friends set out on a road trip around the country after graduating from college, and they eventually need to make a stop in a little nowhere town in Nebraska, and one of his friends seems to think his grandfather's old farm is someplace close near here. So they set out towards it, and after some time, Mr. Mays warns all of his students that if they wish to leave the class now, now, they can because what comes next is truly horrifying and graphic. Some of course do to get some free time off, but for everyone else, our narrator included, they are completely hooked in. What proceeds is an account of what they found in that old farmhouse. And while I don't want to spoil it for you, if you've never read the story, uh, let's just say it's pretty disturbing, involves showers, and at the same time is extremely mysterious, so much so that no one quite knows how to fully process the story that Mr. Mays has just told them. Mr. Mays seems to be either an extremely good actor or is genuinely scared to talk about the last few events of this tale, something which brought a cold shiver to our narrator. Our narrator, having so much appreciation for this tale and the way Mr. Mays presented it, later asked him personally if there was more to this tale. Uh, what else happened? To which Mr. May simply winks and tells him that him and his friends were on some drugs, so who knows what exactly happened. The story, however, sticks with our narrator, and he would share it around for a long time after, embellishing details here and there depending on who he was telling the story to, and sometime later, while our narrator is nearing the end of his college days, he finds the time to reach out to Mr. May as he realized that his story and the way he captured the attention of everyone in the room was what led him down the path that he finds himself in now, wanting to be a writer. He wants to thank Mr. Mays, but what he finds is an old man, drunk as he can be, at a bar, very different from the image that he had in his head about him. The two catch up, both being adults now, and then the topic of the shower story comes up. 
The story that he told to him so many years ago. And then Mr. Mays reveals the truth about that story. That it was more than real. That the place that they went to was real. And what's more, his friend, his friend that he went with, died that night. Never made it out of that living hell. Our narrator is shocked to see the hurt in Mr. Mays eyes. That this was more than some urban legend. It was all so much darker, gruesome, sadder than he had realized. Mr. Mays would die not long after that. In peace at last it would seem, but now it's our narrator's turn to find out what really is in that old farmhouse, to go to the place that inspired him so long ago, along with his own friend, the place that haunted his teacher all those years, the showers. Now, all that I just went over was basically the first part of the story, and sort of flows into the second and eventual final part of the tale. The second part, of course, finds our narrator actually exploring the old farmhouse, and again, I won't be spoiling what happens there. And the final part of our story is kind of an aftermath of what happened after the first two parts, as well as a more definitive conclusion to this tale. Though, I will say that nowhere during any of the story is the mystery ever laid out flatly, instead existing as something to be interpreted and pondered upon after reading. And like Pen Pal, this story left a heavy feeling on me after reading it all for the first time. Something which for me personally says something about the writing and storytelling at hand to get me so emotionally invested. It's one of the greatest creepy creepypastas of all time. And while I would go into more of the creepy details, I genuinely want you to go read it or listen to a reading of it if you've never experienced it. It's a perfect urban legend, a meta urban legend or creepypasta, if you will. The dawn is your enemy. This entry is one part real and one part pasta. The dawn is your enemy was a sign off bumper that was shown on Adult Swim between 2005 and 2010, uh, which is the following. <laughs> The point of this bumper was apparently to scare children from watching the block, especially those who stay up too late, hence why it would appear early on in the mornings. Which is, you know, pretty fucked up, but also very in line with Adult Swim humor of the time. A lot of the stuff on Adult Swim had that vibe that when you were a kid, the TV was really clearly telling you, you're not supposed to be watching this shit. Go to bed, you little dork. While at the same time, for someone who, like me, grew up with it, it just sort of has a vibe to it that after a while, late into the night, he just kind of gets cozy, you know what I mean? Does anyone else have good memories staying up late watching Adult Swim while you were playing video games or drawing some shit or just kind of laying there not falling asleep for hours on end? Well anyway, that's the true story of The Dawn is Your Enemy. It was sort of a creepypasta in itself, it sounds like something that was fake, like a creepypasta. But it was just a TV bumper, though again, one meant to traumatize children on the same channel that children watched. So, you know, it's pretty fucking funny, I'm not even gonna lie. But what about the creepypasta version? Well, it kind of goes over what I just went over right now, and then proceeds to tell a story about how the ad went on for longer one night, and that was the last time it was ever shown on Adult Swim, and that when you get past the metal and the rumbling and the metal scraping against metal noises found in the original The Dawn Is Your Enemy audio, what proceeds is the sound of someone screaming in a terrifying plight for their life. Before the metal starts 
scraping and tearing against what sounds like flesh and bone and gushing blood and the guttural death rattles of people dying underneath it. This was being broadcast to millions of children and adults across America before it was then cut manually by the Adult Swim slash Cartoon Network employees that were there. The question now being is how did the Cartoon Network cover this up and where did they get the audio and what have you. So the creepypasta is just sort of an expansion upon the original idea. It's not really all that bad, but this is one of those cases where I think the truth is far more interesting and creepy than fiction. String theory. So from this tier onward, we're going to start getting into some more high concept with these stories. Starting with this one, which is about a protagonist waking up one morning to see a bunch of braided strings attached around his bedroom. When he heads to school, he notices objects, people, everything is covered and tied in the strings, some more than others. No one seems to notice them though, and for that matter, no one notices him either. That is until he unties all the strings off of his friend Lucy, who then finally notices him and all the strings as well. The pasta then goes on for a little bit with the two of them not being noticed by anyone anymore. And then they watch as the strings seemingly tell what's going to happen in the near future. They see how people are connected to other people in their actions. And it's at this point, the true horror starts to set in as our narrator begins to wonder if anyone has control over any aspect of their life, of any of their actions. Does anyone have free will, or is it all just determined already by the strings, thus rendering all actions meaningless, devoid of choice? They then come across a little imp type creature that seems to be more scared of them than they are of it, and they notice that it has a bunch of string and little nails and tools for putting up the string. He asks if his kind are the ones responsible for the strings, to which he replies yes. Our narrator then asks if they or anyone has any free will, something which only seems to sadden the creature. All of this terrifies Lucy to no end and the two of them are eventually left speechless to what they have discovered. However, once the two of them fall asleep and awoke the next morning, it seemed as though that our narrator was the only one who remembered this experience, but he no longer could see the strings anymore. The story ending with, quote, Over breakfast, Lucy asked me why I looked so pale and, and nervous. I turned to her and smiled, mumbling something to her about feeling sick, but the truth was, I was scared because I couldn't see any strings and I was wondering whether my actions were truly my own." Unquote. So yeah, this one's not full of scary serial killers or experiments gone wrong, but instead this one is the fear over how much control we really have over our own actions, if free will truly exists, as well as what I'd like to call our first theoretical information hazard pasta, or a story about someone discovering a dark truth about uh, the government or general surroundings or the universe itself and being burdened with that knowledge. I quite like this pasta. It's short and to the point and gets its disturbing ideas across pretty well. Gateway of the Mind. Well, wouldn't you know it? It's one of the other creepypastas that I read in full on my old YouTube channel once. I wonder if it still holds up. Well, it is a super short one. So why don't we give it a quick read? Quote, in 1983, a team of deeply pious scientists conducted a radical experiment in an undisclosed facility. The scientists had theorized that a human without access to any senses or ways to perceive stimuli would be able to perceive the presence of God. They believed that the five senses clouded our awareness of eternity and that without them, a human could actually establish contact with God by thought. An elderly man who claimed to have nothing left to live for was the only test subject to volunteer. 
To purge him of all his senses, the scientists performed a complex operation in which every sensory nerve connection to the brain was surgically severed. Although the test subject retained full muscular function, he could not see, hear, taste, smell, or feel. With no possible way to communicate with or even sense the outside world, he was alone with his thoughts. Scientists monitored him as he spoke aloud about his state of mind in jumbled slurred sentences that he couldn't even hear. After four days, the man claimed to be hearing hushed, unintelligible voices in his head. Assuming that it was an onset of psychosis, the scientists paid little attention to the man's concerns. Two days later, the man cried that he could hear his dead wife speaking to him, and even more, he could communicate back. The scientists were intrigued, but were not convinced until the subject started naming dead relatives of the scientists. He repeated personal information to the scientists that only their dead spouses and parents would have known. At this point, a sizable portion of the scientists left the study. After a week of conversing with the deceased through his thoughts, the subject became distressed, saying the voices were overwhelming. In every waking moment, his consciousness was bombarded by hundreds of voices that refused to leave him alone. He frequently threw himself against the wall, trying to elicit any pain response. He begged the scientists for sedatives so he could escape the voices by sleeping. This tactic worked for three days until he started having severe night terrors. The subject repeatedly said that he could see and hear the deceased in his dreams. Only a day later, the subject began to scream and claw his non-functional eyes, hoping to sense something in the physical world. The hysterical subject now said the voices of the dead were deafening and hostile, speaking of hell and the end of the world. At one point he yelled, no heaven, no forgiveness, for five hours straight. He continually begged to be killed, but the scientists were convinced that he was close to establishing contact with God. After another day, the subject could no longer form coherent sentences. Seemingly mad, he started to bite off chunks of flesh from his arm. The scientists rushed into the test chamber and restrained him to a table so that he could not kill himself. After a few hours of being tied down, the subject halted his struggling and screaming. He stared blankly at the ceiling, his teardrops silently streaked across his face. For two weeks, the subject had to be manually rehydrated due to the constant crying. Eventually, he turned his head and despite his blindness, made focused eye contact with a scientist for the first time in the study. He whispered, I have spoken with God and he has abandoned us, and his vital signs stopped. There was no apparent cause of death." Unquote. That's Gateway to the Mind, and it kind of reminds me of the Russian sleep experiment and other experiment-based creepypastas, and it follows a lot of the same sort of stuff those stories tend to do, even ending with a chilling, if not rather cliche, quote from the test subject. Although it is one of the older ones to be fair, so I'll cut it some slack there. I really like that in this one, the guy doesn't turn into a monster or get possessed by anything, but simply goes crazy and dies, which is kind of anticlimactic, yes, but also kind of is the only thing that would happen given the experiment, I suppose. This one is often cited as one of the best creepypastas ever written, and while I do think it is actually very, very good, I'm not sure if I'd put it in my own personal top 10 or 20, but then I have also read and listened to more creepypastas than the average fellow, so yeah, it is a good one though, one of the best ones to start with in the early days of Creepypasta. This Creepypasta was often paired with this black and white footage which was supposed to be the uh, supposed test subject, uh, but if you're a long time viewer of mine, you might recognize that this footage as being from Oliver de Sagasan, who created the video for performance art on his website. And here is just, you know, 
filtered through black and white. Mariana Mortegard Glesgorf. I already covered this one in detail on my YouTube iceberg, and it's honestly one of the most stupid creepy bosses out there. It's about a video which is this JPEG of this guy tended red, and it's apparently cursed, and you'll commit exit the game if you watch the whole thing. Uh, there's like a part of the story where a bunch of people watched it, and then they uh, like cut their eyes out, and then they mailed their eyes to YouTube.com fucking headquarters it's yeah that's it it's uh that's that's the gist next plankton got served here we have a lost episode creepypasta but with a bit of a twist and not by much but a little See, this creepypasta opens with the author noting how you, yes, you the reader or listener, has probably heard of lost episode creepypastas, especially that one about Squidward doing something pretty bad, if you know what I mean. But those are all false, unlike this one. Now this one is the real deal. The pasta goes on to explain, quote, I remember a Spongebob episode that was altered heavily, but still remains in circulation today. This is One Course Meal from Season 7. In the episode, Mr. Krabs finds out that Plankton is horrified of whales and uses it to his advantage. This is one of the least popular episodes of the show due to the dark nature of the episode, even after the episode was heavily altered, unquote. This is an actual episode, by the way, and is indeed often considered one of the uh, worst episodes of the series, mainly because the episode is about Mr. Krabs tormenting Plankton by pretending to be a whale until Plankton attempts to commit exit game by having a car run him over. Yeah, that is pretty mean-spirited and dark for sure. Anyway, our author goes on to note how he watched the original version of this episode, which apparently was quite different from the final episode, and it used to be titled Plankton Got Served. He also notes that he managed to see this episode unaltered because it was aired unaltered on Nick's website at the time before it hit TV. He then describes the episode up to the point when Plankton decides to commit exit game, just like in the original episode. But instead of it not happening, Plankton actually gets hit by a bus, and the following is what happened next. Quote, Plankton finds himself standing on a single platform, overlooking darkness. In the darkness, he sees whales all looking up at him. There are members of his family he can faintly make out, calling out for him to jump down. Plankton looks above and sees a light, a light he can scarcely believe. This would seem to represent heaven and hell. Plankton, resigned to his fate, jumps and plunges into the darkness. This is when the episode ends, and the traditional credits for the show are shown, parallel to Plankton's descent into the darkness." Unquote. Our author then spends the last part of the story swearing up and down that he for sure saw this, and that he doesn't expect people to believe him, but he is nonetheless telling the truth, etc, etc. Now, I will hand it to this creepy pasta it does feel much more reserved than most of them i suppose in some ways this is because it's based on an actual episode that already had an out of character joke slash scenario and so adding to it to make it just a little bit more creepy uh, works a lot better than you know other stuff we've covered that said the whole trust me guys i really saw it i know you read lots of creepy pastas but this isn't one i'm being serious guys this is the truth like it or not it's the truth it's it's kind of heavy-handed yeah it calls far too much attention to itself in fact i almost never like it when creepypastas tell the reader that they know that they read lots of creepypastas. I get what they're going for, but for how many times we're gonna start seeing that here soon, it becomes a cliche in of itself, and a rather desperate one at that. Symmetry slash noises. So these two stories are put together because they are written by the same Reddit user. 
that being at always through. Uh, they are also connected because they seem to be stories based around the same neurotic crazy fellow. The first story, Symmetry, is all about a guy who ever since he was a kid has needed everything to be symmetrical, from his hair, to his clothes, to his surroundings, to the way he walks, sleeps, eats, etc. There's just one little problem. Ever since he was a kid, one of his eyes are blue and the other green. I suppose you might be guessing where this is going, given that it's a creepypasta. You see, the lad scoops his green eye out with a spoon and then cuts off the optical nerves. Thus, his imperfection is gone. But then, he realizes that he was kind of fucking stupid. Now, he has one hole in the side of his face, but not a hole on the other side. And so, of course, he fixes that. That really is the whole story, but I will say that it's one of the most cringe-inducing stories I've read on the list. Uh, not cringy as in bad, mind you. Cringy as in the descriptions of the man cutting out his eye and the issues that happens with it with the second one. It makes my skin crawl thinking about it. And so certainly reading it. So, for pure shock value, it's a pretty good short story. There's not much else to it besides the pure shock value, but I suppose it does what it's trying to do pretty well. Noises, on the other hand, is about a blind man, presumably the same blind man, who gets a desk job, being able to make emails and such with his voice. But now, suddenly, he can't seem to stand the small noises people make. They're coughing, sneezing, sniffing, mouth smacking noises. This, like this man's issue with symmetry, comes to completely control his life and his thoughts. He gets angry, snaps at people around him, breaks out in hives and rashes, or at least he thinks he is anyway. The noises anger and pester him so much that he actually does believe there's a rash on the back of his neck that's constantly pestering him, which eventually the rash goes into his ears. This eventually leads to the poor fellow stabbing his ears out with a pair of pliers. The description, once again, being unbelievably disturbing and descriptive. The story ends with this man, now blind and without any of his hearing, but finally happy, free from the pestering noises that ailed him so. Those are the two stories, and while I will say the first one is a lot more fucked up, mainly because stuff having to do with the eye is just yikes, but all the same, the stories of people people's obsessive behavior, going to a comical yet frightening extremes is interesting. But again, there isn't much to the stories, mind you, it's just a lot of build up to a really fucked up scene. But at least it doesn't overstay its welcome. Unlike cupcakes. So now it's finally time for a couple of My Little Pony creepypastas. Something which back in 2011 or so when this first pasta was made was a rapidly growing fan base that if you frequented near any website that had any kind of art submission of the time, you would see the fans of this series singing its praise, creating fan art, etc. Like it or not, it was everywhere at the time and it was only going to get every where even more as the next couple of years came to pass. This first story is kind of simple in premise. It follows Pony Rainbow Dash, uh, this fast flying one of the group, who goes to Pinkie Pie's house, this uh, pink one of the group, and is there to help her make some cupcakes. But the twist here is that Pinkie feeds Dash a drugged cupcake so she can tie her down and torture her for the rest of the story, including cutting off her cutie mark, cutting off her wings, eating her freshly cut meat in front of her, etc. All for the sake of slowly killing and mutilating her, and eventually using her flesh for some more sweet cupcakes to feed to some more ponies. This creepypasta is almost exclusively a long, drawn out torture scene. And I guess it's pretty fucked up, you know? It's meant to shock the reader with it being innocent characters, being slowly tortured, and one of them is like a psychopath and what have you. But I'll be honest, maybe it's because I'm not a pony. And I'm, you know, not really familiar or much of a fan of My Little Pony in general. But beyond the basic horror, this one does little for me and kind of got super boring 
about halfway through. I've never been one for those long extended torture scenes anyway. It just all seems kind of edgy for the sake of it if you have it draw out for so, so, so long. Especially if there's no build up and there's not really anything that comes after. It's just sort of just a torture scene, I guess. Now I understand the appeal of these sorts of creepy bosses is seeing a character that you either really enjoy or connect with or growing up with or had grown up with or whatever being slowly destroyed it's it's one of those hashtag ruin my childhood sort of stories and hey that's cool i'm glad it had such an effect on you if you happen to feel that way but for me it's just some edgy fan fiction even if it were based on a series i really love and enjoy it just doesn't really do anything for me but oh well luna game now this one is a bit more interesting mainly because i'm not really sure if there was ever really a connected creepypasta story with this. This is more a series of creepypasta games and more so the story of the real life mystery and legacy that they left behind. It all started with an anonymous user on the most popular My Little Pony website of the time, Equestria Daily, uploaded a video game file simply titled Luna Game. Which bear in mind, fan games weren't really much of a thing for this series as of yet, due to bronies and the like still kind of being a developing fan base. So of course, a ton of people downloaded the game and was greeted with the following. A simple little game where you play as the My Little Pony character Luna, platforming through a rudimentary little area before suddenly a jump scare fills the screen with either this Zalgo infected Pinkie Pie or this ominous looking Applejack pony while distorted audio is playing. Eventually the game would then close and on your desktop you would find tons of pictures of the same creepy image you saw in the game along with a bunch of text files saying the end is nay, which, you know, it's their, their ponies, it's, it's kind of funny, I guess. See, at first, because of the way the game plays so many files on your computer, many thought that the game was a virus of some kind and it was quickly removed for that reason. And then site founder Sethisto announced that he would not be accepting any more submissions from yo-yo games or any other type of games that require you to download them to play, and that games of this sort were banned from the site. And he went on to apologize to anyone who was exposed to the Luna, which is kind of dramatic, but all the same, this caught many people's attention at the time. Since there wasn't really anything like it at the time, a creepypasta game. And after many did some virus checks on the game files itself, they found that there was nothing actually malicious in there. It was just sort of a creepy joke. Later on, the author of the game would end up making four sequels to that original game, though this time uploaded them to a separate website as well as a dedicated one. The Bruni community now eagerly awaited each new entry in this series, and they really became something so much bigger than what it originally was. Though, again, Again, the games themselves are mostly just Luna walking for a while through some rudimentary platforming and then there's a jump scare and that's it, the end. Not much else. In fact, you might call it a bit of a protosonic.exe sort of story since it did come before that and would be some good foundation for what Sonic.exe would ultimately do later on. That's basically it. A uh, YouTuber Izzy Z made a pretty good video if you want more details about the other game entry. 
entries in the series if you're super curious, as well as one of the only interviews online with the mysterious author of the game, a decade after they had all come out, which is pretty interesting. God's Mouth God's Mouth is a short story about a guy and his girlfriend Margaret who go exploring into a cave named God's Mouth which is illegal to climb into. Despite this, our narrator really, really wants to explore it because he's a spelunker, I suppose. While his girlfriend seems anything but happy to be here, they eventually get into a fight over this and then lose their way into the cave afterward. They try to make their way out, but it seems the cave is changing, even slowly closing in on them, the cold walls slowly turning warm to the touch. By story's end, Margaret gets separated from our narrator and dies by the jagged closing in of rocks and then the same cruel fate happens to our narrator and that's pretty much it it's a short story that taps into the natural fear that comes in being in such a dangerous place like this in a similar way to ted the caver though obviously much more short and far more simple overall a pretty decent pasta and then a skeleton popped out slash who was phone slash and the day of all the blood. So I put all these stories together on this tier because they all sort of represent the same thing. Uh, they're a meme or a pure troll pasta of epic magnitude. And they go as follows. Quote, warning. If you have a heart condition, do not read this. You will drop to the floor, flopping like a fish, while clenching your heart, seeing as you are having a heart attack. Also, if you have a sensitive anus, do not read this. The brick you shat will be painful. A few years ago, a man was walking down a road because his car broke down, and he saw a car coming up behind him, so he stuck out his thumb to hitchhike, and the car stopped ahead of him. He ran up to the passenger side and opened the door. When he opened the door, a skeleton popped out." Unquote. Now, what's sort of funny about this one is while the original story is somewhat remembered, what's really remembered is that catchphrase like ending and then a skeleton popped out, which then would often be times put at the end of long, more serious type creepypastas that would grab the reader's attention from the beginning only to completely deflate it with this troll ending. Next is the day of all the blood. Quote, this is the story of a day where there was all this blood. A man was walking around and blood started coming out of him everywhere. There was so much blood that it filled up an elevator. He went to the store and there was just blood all over the place. People were slipping in it and they were all grossed out. He tried to go swimming and all the sharks went nuts and bitten everybody. He got chased by all the vampires everywhere. One time, the blood got a kid and a dog. At the end of the day, everybody decided they would send him to space so that he would stop getting blood everywhere. The scariest part is that that man was you, or he was a lady, if you are a lady, and you forgot that this happened." Unquote. I, I think this one is pretty self-explanatory. I don't, I don't really explain it. And then finally, of the most iconic of them all. So you're with your honey. And you're making out when the phone begins. You answer it. And the VC is, what are you doing with my daughter? You tell your girl and she say, my dad is dead. Then who was phone? Who was phone? <laughs> This one was a favorite amongst the early days of creepypastas on 4chan and even created its own genre of troll pasta, that being these ultra brief, badly written on purpose stories with a twist at the end. And in a way, it's sort of deconstructing what made a creepypasta or an urban legend to begin with in a funny way. Cry Baby Lane. 
So this one is also based on something real, but not at all close to the actual thing. The Real Crybaby Lane was a Nickelodeon film that was basically just a ghost story type movie, where a couple of brothers hear a scary story about conjoined twins. One was good and the other was bad. And when they both passed away, one was buried normally while the evil one was buried in a shallow grave down at Crybaby Lane. Well, through a seance, these ghost twins end up waking up, and as you might imagine the evil one is trying to possess people and what have you. Paranormal stuff ensues and eventually all is put back to normal by film's end. That's the basic premise of the movie. However, it only ever aired once back in 2000 and for some time was assumed to be a lost film and that perhaps it was too intense for kids and was banned or something. This didn't end up being the case however when it was looked into and people were asked. Turns out Nick just sort of forgot all about it and that's really it. It was aired shortly after though on Teen Nick and a few more times after due to how much publicity it had gotten through the lost media community and what have you. The name Crybaby Lane does sound rather ominous as well, which is probably what inspired the author of this creepypasta. So then, now that you know what the actual Crybaby Lane movie is and that it's a real movie, wasn't banned, it was just forgotten, and it's just kind of mediocre at best, what about this creepypasta? Well, it's about a dude named Johnny who, after college, gets an internship at Nickelodeon Studios. He's quickly put to the job of an upcoming TV film, Crybaby Lane, and it's here where he meets a man who is eventually put in charge of the project. Peter Lauer. Lauer is described as a sick fuck who frankly sounds like a cartoonishly evil man who wants to see his disgusting fetishes play out on the screen through a live action Nickelodeon movie. Yep, that sounds about right. In all seriousness though, this creepypasta is pretty dumb. And mainly because Lauer is just 100% a crazy evil cult sadistic villain from the start. And no one even bats an eye at it at all. Like, here's a few examples. Quote, At first cannibalism and other fucked up shit was kept as jokes and tasteless comments. But as time went on, it became more and more overt. I'd give him an idea, which most of the time he would end up using. Like, how about a movie starts with a morbid undertaker who reads them stories? To which he'd reply, Yeah, and then he can cut them up into little pieces and force feed them to his dog. He made these jokes a few times in the early stages, but then he got serious. He'd stand up like he was Jesus or something, clear his throat loudly, and proclaim his idea. I'd be the only one to shoot it down every fucking time. One day, near the end of our brainstorming sessions, Lauer cleared his voice and stood up. We all fell silent and looked at him like we normally did. He stood up and said, Gentlemen and females, I have an idea. I remember what he did. He paused and looked right at me as he said, This story will revolve around the legend of a pair of Siamese twins. Have you ever heard of the Donner Party? Everyone nodded except for me. I didn't like where this conversation was going. They ate themselves when they got cold. They ate each other. Everyone nodded. I closed my eyes. What would Siamese twins do if they had nothing to eat? Would one wait until the other twin dies, then consume her own sister's flesh? Would they claw out each other's eyes until one of them died, then dine upon them like a vulture tearing at the skin of a dead deer? I do not know. It is interesting indeed. I didn't know what the fuck I was hearing. I opened my eyes and looked around the room. No one was fucking moving. Everyone's eyes were on Lauer except for mine. And when I looked at him, he was still staring at me. Children like violence. They revel in it. Children like to be scared. So we'll scare them, won't we, Johnny? He leaned over the table, getting pretty damn close to my face. His breath smelt like decaying shit. I stared back at him. I think you're fucked up, to be honest. He smiled and backed away. Oh, I'm fucked up all right, but you have to be fucked up to survive in this cutthroat world. 
His grin expanded. Literally right now I'm going to show you some pictures that will spark some of your imaginations. Unquote. See what I mean? Now I will admit, Lauer is so fucking over the top that the story is kind of fun to read. Just because you're just waiting for what the fuck this guy's gonna say next. But then the creepypasta implies that Nick used this man's sick ideas and just didn't end up using the sick part by the story's end. Quote, early on Lauer posed an idea of the two brothers capturing a squirrel, putting said squirrel in a jar and slowly drowning it before filling the jar with sand and dropping it into the bottom of a pond. Soon after this was suggested, Sandy from SpongeBob SquarePants appeared in the tea at the tree dome. Lauer also suggested in one scene of the movie for a man with a squid-like nose to take off his pants in front of the two boys and mmm them off screen, but heavily implied. Squidward soon appeared as a major character in SpongeBob SquarePants. It was suggested that the two be stepbrothers forced to live in the same house after the first one's mom was found dead in a shallow grave, her body heavily cannibalized by her own husband, a local weatherman. A show with a vaguely premise, Drake and Josh, started in 2004, and the stepfather is indeed a weatherman. Lauer also suggested the younger brother have a doghouse in which he keeps various animal fetuses encased in acid that he regularly uses to poison his mother to have sex with his abusive stepfather. As told by Ginger, debuted soon after. A man who captures the souls of children in a vacuum cleaner and then sends them to Hades? Danny Phantom. A robot who goes insane on two brothers, kills one of them and wears his skin, pretending to be the dead brother at high school? My life as a teenager robot. The list goes on, and Nickelodeon knows they are continuing the legacy of Lauer, sometimes subtly, sometimes overtly, and there's nothing that you or I can do about it." Unquote. Okay, so number one, Squidward was always a major character in the SpongeBob show. Uh, uh, two, I love the tone of this last part. It's like, yeah, I just have spent some serious black pills, mister. What you gonna do now, you fuck? When he literally said nothing that made any sense. So yeah, not very good. Though I will say that had this pasta been more subtle or implied that while this guy was coming up with the ideas for character and scenarios and kids cartoons, they actually represented something far more disturbing that only really he and maybe other fucked up people like him could see in it. Uh, maybe the use of code words or strange symbolic situations. Uh, yeah, I could see this one being a bit better to play to its strengths, but it just isn't. It's a fun read because again, Lauer is a pretty fucked up villain, but it's just too stupid to really take seriously whatsoever. But while we're on the topic of lost Nickelodeon stuff, Max and Ruby 0004. For this bonus entry, I want to include one of the more well-known lost episode type pastas that certainly made the rounds back in the day. Max and Ruby 0004 follows our well-meaning protagonist who is looking for a Max and Ruby DVD for his little cousin as a present for Christmas. According to the author, almost all the Max and Ruby DVDs were sold out or were in dubious quality on eBay, which I don't know how that was the case, but okay. Well, after several days of searching for a fucking Max and Ruby DVD, something randomly was shoved through his letterbox. It was this, a Max and Ruby DVD with a crudely drawn cover. Now, that is pretty creepy that you were, you know, looking for something online and then you randomly get it in the mail. Like, not even the official thing in the mail, someone's homemade version of it in the mail. It seems like something you might want to look into and, you know, kind of freak out about a little bit, you know, since that's pretty crazy. Probably implies someone is spying on you. Quotes, it was a Max and Ruby DVD, but I had never seen one like it online. It was like some little kid had drawn on the front cover with a marker. The title was just Max and Ruby, with what looked like a poorly drawn illustration of Max and Ruby on the front. There were no names or 
anything. But on the back, it had a list of four episodes, all with blunt titles. Episode 1, Episode 2, Episode 3, Episode 4. I quickly gave the DVD a wash over. To my surprise, all the episodes were in perfect quality and seemed to have no flaws. It was as if it was a real DVD, just with a homemade cover. The only thing I thought appeared odd was the episode selection screen. The episodes had names, but they were all titled Max and Ruby 1, with the numbers being changed as it went down the list. The actual selection screen was just a plain white screen with black and white text and nothing else." Unquote. So then we're just we're just gonna ignore that you inexplicably received this then? Not even a cursory thought as to how it got there. Not even a kind of idiotic mention of, wow, that sure was lucky. No? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Quote, after giving it much thought, I decided to change the cover to something a little nicer by printing out a DVD cover that I had found on Google and tracked down, and the names of the episodes so they were labeled correctly. So I left the episode list screen alone because I figured it was self-explanatory. Christmas went by and things were fine. I gave my little cousin her DVD and she was happy with it all through Christmas, but that was only because she hadn't watched it yet. On Boxing Day, the family had gone out for lunch and left me to babysit my cousin. I was not too bothered about being left at home. I figured now was a good time to put on the DVD for her. I had put the DVD in and allowed it to play while I was in the kitchen eating my dinner. From what I could hear, she had watched episodes one through three so far. I was just about to finish off my noodles when I heard my cousin screaming from the other room. Dropping everything, I ran into the living room and saw my cousin curled up on the floor screaming. I had looked up at the TV and I felt my heart in my throat. What I caught a glimpse of was one of the most horrifying things I had ever seen. It was what appeared to be a frame of Max and Ruby standing next to each other in complete darkness. But what made it so horrible was their lack of faces. They had lost their noses and mouths, and their eyes were replaced with big black holes. The colors were a disgusting blood red, and there was faint static in the background." Unquote. So it turns out that the creepily timed package with the creepily specific contents with the creepy cover art that also had disturbing implications that someone was watching you or your internet browsing history at the very least and was close enough to deliver this package to you had some creepy stuff in the actual episodes as well. <laughs> Who could have thought? Who could have figured that one out? Some other details are given about the screen, but skipping ahead, our narrator of course turns things off and later decides to watch the DVD in full by himself to see what exactly led up to all of that. It all starts off normal, and the first three episodes are standard fair stuff, but the last episode was now retitled Rest in Peace Mommy and Daddy. The episode then, through background noises and other effects, shows Max and Ruby's parents have died and then quote the scene then switched to both max and ruby standing in front of what looked like a gravestone labeled r.i.p mommy and daddy the two of them had no faces at this point there was also no sound apart from faint static this screen remained on screen for about a minute and a half before it cut away to black it then changed scene again now showing max and ruby sitting in ruby's room both of them were sobbing the sobs were so realistic and heart wrenching that it sounded like it was recorded from a real person mourning what happened next was probably the most disgusting yet saddest thing I had ever witnessed. The scene had changed to Max sitting in his room. He was standing on a chair with a noose hanging from the ceiling. He placed the noose around his neck. My computer screen faded black as the static got louder. Almost instantly it cut to Ruby walking in on her brother. She let out a horrific scream as the background turned black. The camera was panned on her face as the sound of a chair being kicked and the same choking from before began to play. The picture of Ruby's face stayed on screen for a good five minutes. This time her eyes had returned as the same gaping holes. Ruby then started crying, and as before, there was no other facial features. The static slowly grew louder and drowned out the sound of her cries. The scene cut to black with a loud static. When the screen returned, Ruby was now standing on her own in the garden by two gravestones. One labeled, Rest in Peace Mommy and Daddy, and the other, Rest in Peace Brother. At this point, 
I had already been sick and was sitting all shaken. The episode seemed to have come to an end at last. As an old computer noise started playing, I was about to eject the DVD when the same image came up like it did on the TV before. This time, however, there was text above the two rabbits which read, DEATH is our only release. There were no credits or anything else. It stayed on this for a few seconds before the DVD finally popped out of my laptop." Unquote. Pretty intense stuff, especially the DVD popping out of the laptop by itself. Our author ended up destroying the DVD after all that, but made sure to note that he took a few screenshots beforehand so you could all see these images. But he didn't have the forethought to just upload the whole episode online and further prove his story. The story ends with the following, quote, It was a late night and my parents had gone out for dinner, leaving me to watch TV. I heard what sounded like someone posting something through the door. At this point, the DVD had left my mind since I hadn't told anyone about it. However, it all came flooding back when I looked down at the letter in front of me. It was just messily folded up and said, Death is our only release. Unquote. And that's Max and Ruby 0004. It's not an exceptionally good creepypasta, in fact, it's pretty shitty. Though I do like the inclusion of so many pictures to add some visuals to the story. I also like that the story implies there is something far more sinister behind this lost episode. That being whoever the fuck the guy who was that gave him this DVD and parting message actually was. The only problem is the story never explores that far more creepy part. It's it seems more like a means to get this episode in our guy's hands rather than what it really should be a far more creepy focus, at least in my eyes. But again, I want to include this story because it was pretty popular back in the day. Hell, a lot of lost episode creepy bosses were good, bad, or otherwise, but mostly bad. Speaking of, King of the Hill Lost Episode. So I picked this bonus entry mainly because I really like King of the Hill. And it was one of those creepypastas that I remember listening to early on in my creepypasta enjoying youth. But it's also one of those bosses that has a kind of interesting story associated with it that I'll get to in a moment. But first, the pasta at hand. Our pasta starts off with our narrator heading down to Goodwill originally to get some N64 games, uh, but they end up going to the VHS section in the back. There he saw a set of Titanic VHS tapes, which he was going to get for him and his wife to watch. However, whenever he pulled the dust cover off, he found instead, written with Sharpie, King of the Hill, Season 1, Episode 1, Not Rated, as well as King of the Hill, Season 1, Episode 1, Not Rated 2. Piquing his curiosity, he decides to buy the set and take it home. Quote, I soon turned the TV to Channel 3 and began viewing Koth, S1, E1, and R. It had the regular opening of the first episode of King of the Hill, but without the music. It was just a silent camera panning over the city of Arlen. It began normally after that with Bobby at the baseball game and Hank yelling at him. As we all know, Bobby did not succeed. This is where everything started to get weird. On the ride home, Hank, Peggy, and Bobby were completely silent, and this went on for about three minutes. No one was angry. No one had any expression, actually. Just completely blank faces, with only silence for company. Abruptly, as the family pulls into the driveway, it cuts to a scene inside a house. Hank was yelling at Bobby for not giving 110%. Hank then picked up a baseball and got into a throwing position. At this point, the video quality was getting very scratchy and the volume level was raised roughly 10%. Hank pegged the ball and it hit Bobby's nose. Peggy was seen in the background crying, and Hank simply told her to Shut the hell up! Bobby immediately cupped his nose and ran out of the room, crying the whole way." Unquote. Hank Hill has had enough, clearly. I like the weird pun that the volume of the TV raised by 10%, as in if it was at 100%, it would now be at 110%. <laughs> Hank's power is truly beyond the dimensions of the VHS tape. Quote, as Bobby was in the bathroom checking his nose, a social worker came to the door. Peggy greeted him as Hank sat on the sofa, relaxing as if nothing happened. From this point, the colors began to look more like a real 
real episode. The scene with Hank telling the social worker off played as it did in the real episode. Suddenly, the scene from the officially aired episode cut to another scene, which was not from the real episode. It was a scene with more ragged video, yet the audio remained the same. This scene depicted Peggy sitting on the phone late at night, most likely contacting child services to tell them about how Hank purposely threw the baseball at Bobby. Hank suddenly walked through the doorway. He was in the bathrobe and had no glasses. He grabbed the phone. Who the hell is this? Hank yelled. This is the Department of Child Services, was the response. Hank's face quickly turned red and slammed the phone back on the wall. He grasped Peggy by the neck. You gonna get more of those twig boys over here to put me in prison and take my boy away? He howled. The scene cut to Hank taking Peggy by the back of the neck down the hallway to the backyard. Hank took a propane tank off the grill and shoved the valve into Peggy's mouth. The video went silent for a minute, simply showing the propane valve in Peggy's mouth. When the scene started moving again, Peggy's eyes slowly closed, and a voice was heard. Buck Strickland, forgive me for using propane like this, unquote. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I hope you're starting to see why I picked this boss now, because this shit is fucking hilarious. Legitimately, if this isn't a troll pasta, then it is accidentally comedy gold. Quote, the only problem was that when Hank said this, Hank did not sound like Mike Judge, the creator of the show who voiced Hank. It sounded like an older and deeper voice. The screen went black after this. I fast forwarded through the rest of the tape to make sure there was no more content on it. There was none. I just thought to myself, why so much wasted space? And at this point, I was really shaken up. I went to grab a coffee, and when I got back, I popped in the second tape. It was just a black screen. I fast forwarded to check for content and eventually came across stuff that was really starting to scare me. It was a funeral. There were very few colors. There was only various forms of gray and black and the colors of people's faces. It just did not seem like a real King of the Hill episode. The funeral was for Peggy. Attending it was all of the Hill's neighbors, including some acquaintances such as Hank's father, Cotton, and John Redcorn. Even Hank was there, claiming that Peggy had committed exit the game. As Peggy's coffin was lowered into the hole, it faded into an overhead view of it being lowered. This part really scared the shit out of me. It was a somewhat highly realistic image of Peggy in a coffin. The reason I say somewhat is because it looked real, but it all still appeared to be drawn and not a real person. It was just a realistic cartoon. Would you say it was even hyper realistic? The scene then cut to Bobby, Hank, and Ladybird sitting on a porch. Bobby had a queasy face and Hank had one hand on the propane tank that he used to commit the murder. Bobby turned to his father. Why did you do it, Dad? He asked in a humble voice. I don't know, son. Hank responded. He almost sounded like he was crying. He then stood up and walked inside, leaving Bobby and Ladybird, who were still on the porch. It once again cut to a very dull scene of nothing but black and gray and skin colors. It was a scene that literally made me sick to my stomach. It was Hank hanging from the ceiling with a note pinned to him. It just stayed focused on him swinging back and forth for two minutes or so. It then cut to the ending credits with the normal outro and theme music. I was actually kind of laughing on the inside at the fact that the show was playing the regular ending credits after all that stuff happened. <laughs> I'm laughing in real life, bro. Quote, I was really more confused and creeped out at it. I went on some forums but found nothing about this episode. However, I came across someone on Yahoo Answers who had a similar occurrence as me. They received a similar tape at a thrift shop in John Creek County in North Georgia, a place about 20 miles away from where I got mine. I managed to get on AIM with this person, but I got no answers. I was really curious at this point, so I drove about 40 miles and went right down to Cartoon Network slash Turner Broadcasting HQ. Fucking what? 
What? Is this a Nick Robinson video now? I knew that Fox Broadcasting made the show, but I assumed Cartoon Network had every episode on record as they aired them all. A bold assumption, but we'll go with it. Beforehand, I did some research and figured out who was in charge of broadcasting King of the Hill, so I found a receptionist in the studio and demanded to talk to him. Apparently though, I needed a guest pass of some sort. I was completely pissed off at this point, so I drove back home and put on my old sheriff's uniform. I was a sheriff for John Creek County about three years ago. I went back and although it was unlawful, I used my badge to talk to him. This is so fucking great. This guy walks in the Cartoon Network headquarters with a couple of King of the Hill VHS tapes and is like, what the fuck is this? I know that you know, bitch. And since that doesn't work, he breaks the law to get in now. This went from a casual guy watching a King of the Hill lost episode and honestly being mostly chill about it to this in the span of like a couple sentences. Quote, when I got into his office, he was sitting at his desk talking on his phone. I walked up to him, threw the tapes on his desk, and demanded answers. He dropped the phone immediately and grabbed the tapes. I followed him to another room, an office on the other side of the building. There was a small safe in this office. He opened it up and put the tapes in and locked it. He then told me to leave. I did not want to act like a sheriff anymore because I did not want to get in trouble with the law, so I left. I got home and flipped on the TV. Adult Swim is on. I was relieved to see a real episode of King of the Hill. To this day, there are only two copies of this episode on four tapes that I can find anything about on the internet. One of them I assume is still locked up in Cartoon Network Studios. You may possibly come across more of them at thrift shops throughout the southeast." Unquote. The end. So that was, uh, that fucking sucked. Wow, that was really anticlimactic. All that fuss. You know, you, you broke the law to do this, to find out the answers. Just to have the guy pick up the tapes and throw them in the fucking safe. And then you left like a loser. I mean, at the very least, if you're gonna go through all this effort, you might as well hold on to the tapes. Make sure that he can't just hide them away from you. They're basically your leverage if it's really something that crazy or whatever. But wow, it, it seems like somebody wasn't giving 110% here though, for sure. In all seriousness though, this is one of my favorite Lost Episode Creepypastas for everything I've just laid out before you. It's weirdly subtle in the beginning, and then goes completely over the top by the end. The only real complaint I have is I wish it would have gone on further. I wish it would have gone even crazier. We should have had some kind of crazy backstory associated with the tapes, uh, but alas, it had ended too soon. I also remember first hearing about this story from a creepypasta YouTuber I hear almost no one talk about, uh, known only as Dave the Useless. Well, I think his narration is, uh, well, to put it nicely, you can tell that he only does one takes and calls it a day for this stuff. But he is an interesting channel because he exclusively only reads Lost Episode Creepypastas. And has been doing that sometimes daily for eight fucking years at least. That's not only nuts that there are that many Lost Episode Creepypastas out there, but there is someone that dedicated enough to read all of that shit. It's gotta take some sort of psychological toll on you at some point I'd imagine. But anyway, that's enough Lost Episodes and bonus entries for now. Let's jump into something a bit different. Burger entries. Written by Jonathan Wojcik. This is one of the stranger creepy bosses that I've ever read. I had never even heard of it up until this iceberg, and it centers around our narrator who has noticed a, a bunch of doors and windows have begun showing up everywhere, and they seem to open up into these little restaurants that sell these putrid, disgusting, disgusting meat products that our narrator has a hard time understanding exactly what they consist of, although they are described in detail a myriad of times visually. He does however know anyone who eats it turns into zombie-like people, brainwashed, consuming the terrible flesh, until they eventually turn into these ugly egghead people that seem to turn invisible to everyone else around them. This story is told through several entries from a rather cynical author who is curiously one of the only people who has been able to notice this strange phenomenon and begins looking into it to find out what the hell is going on. Could it be demons? Aliens? Something that's always been there? The story itself reads a lot like a 
bizarre Twilight Zone episode, uh, with a lot more gore, of course. The author manages to paint quite the grisly and queasy image through his descriptions of the fleshy, strange, pulsating food and beasts that surround them. It's not the scariest thing in the world to me, but it is very interesting, and disturbing, and overall one of the more creative creepy bosses that I genuinely never knew what was going to happen next in. It would make a sick OVA. Psychosis. Written by Matt Demersky, Psychosis is often considered one of the greatest creepypastas ever written, a true masterpiece. The story follows John, a young man who seems to be suffering from a severe case of paranoia, or maybe he's not paranoid, but aware of something truly terrifying he's preventing from getting to him. He barricades himself inside his basement apartment. He's convinced that some kind of alien presence has taken over the world, but he's not quite sure, and this pasta is presented through his journal entries, trying to rationalize everything, but always finding something that's just off enough about every interaction he has with anyone he communicates with online. After some time, people seem to be getting worried about him, and would like him to leave his apartment fortress. Are these pleas from his loved ones? Genuine? Trying to get him to stop being a crazy bastard? Or is it the things trying to get him to come out of his home, using his loved ones as a means of doing so. The pasta is written in such a way that you will more than likely be wondering if something really is going on, or if he is in fact actually just crazy, and nothing is actually going on. It's a simple yet perfect pasta that executes its premise and ending in a truly amazing way. I won't be going against the grain here. If you haven't read this pasta yet, please be sure to do so. So, it is quite simply perfection, and that ending is sure to stick with you for quite a while after. Definitely in my top 10 favorite creepypastas of all time. You know, by the end of this iceberg, I might actually need to do a top 10 best and worst. And speaking of worst, Nina the Killer. Yet another bonus entry, and if you've been paying attention based on that title, you might know what this one's gonna be about. Now, what's interesting about this pasta is the original story of this is, in a similar fashion to Jane the Killer, a bit hard to track down. Although, not th because there are several authors. No, no, no. Because the original author of the story, who goes by Elogothic Twevel on DeviantArt, long ago to leave the original story because it kind of blew up, um, for all the wrong reasons. See, the basic plot of the original story was about Nina the Killer, or Nina Hopkins, who is a huge Jeff the Killer fangirl, and she's quirky and weird and crazy and stuff. Quote, Nina was not the type of girl that is very cheerful. She was not the type of girl that would open the window and let the light into her room and do something productive. No, she just enjoyed sitting down to watch animes or listen to music like rock, J-pop, or K-pop playing video games or just play guitar. She liked to be herself and loved her family and friends. But this time, she did not want to do any of the things that is considered normal. This time, she wanted to read Jeff the Killer, creepypasta for the thousandth time. She adored him. It was her favorite. She felt a strange attraction to him. She had an admiration for him, more than anything. Every time she read it, she felt a strange desire, but she didn't know why she enjoyed this strange desire." Unquote. So the girl's really thirsty for Jeff the Killer. Quote, when she started to read it, the door suddenly opened. She quickly saw her little brother Chris and his beautiful green eyes. Nina thinks Chris is her prince. She loved calling her little brother Prince because when she was just little, her mother would always tell her fairy tales when it's bedtime. She liked this type of stories and she thinks the princes of in the fairy tales looks like her little brother Chris. Chris has dark black hair, fair skin, and light green eyes, like his late father. However, Nina has light brown hair, fair skin, and light blue eyes, like her mother. Sis, it's time to eat, said the child with an instant smile. I'm going, my prince. She pinched the cheeks of her little brother, unquote. <clears throat> no comment upon any of that. 
But you see, uh, beyond this opening, Nina and her brother, or Prince, are being bullied at school and stuff. But Nina is like totally psycho because she read Jeff the Killer. And so she beats down the cartoons to evil bullies j just like someone else I know. This kind of freaked her brother out though because if he hadn't told her to stop, it seems that she was going to kill one of the bullies right then and there. She then went to go wash her hands of the blood. Well, after that, Nina went to go wash her hands. She knew she must avoid telling somebody or even mentioning what happened. The little brother Chris thought it was just self-defense, but she knew something else was going on there. She knew that something stronger and horrible is starting to form inside her. That feeling of being powerful and strong. The need to hurt someone. The day passed quickly, and when the siblings returned, they sat down to eat with their mother. Well, how is school? asked his mother, a sweet smile. Chris stayed quiet and didn't answer the question. Great, Nina commented with a psychotic smile. Nina went upstairs after eating and opened her closet, revealing her collection of Jeff the Killer, period. She had several Jeff posters, Jeff clothing, some Jeff notebooks, Jeff dolls, and Jeff stuffed animals. She took a doll from the closet and put it in bed. She looked at the doll. She couldn't tell if the doll's sinister smile intimidated or amused her. Then she whispered, If you made me do this, unquote. Mina also gets a note in her locker the next day, which reads, quote, I know what you did. Don't worry, I will not tell anyone. You are very skillful, but also very dangerous. Mina didn't find a signature. Anything to identify who wrote the note, but she had the nose that someone saw her, but decided not to reveal his name, unquote. Hmm, I wonder who he Well, regardless, later on, those same bullies found her little brother and proceeded to beat the ever-living shit out of him. And when Nina finds him, all beaten and bruised, she calls her mom this time, and then he's taken to the hospital shortly after. And it turns out that he was beaten so badly that he's eternally bleeding. So uh, the whole thing is just not good. That being said, even though he was beaten for an inch of his life and was eternally bleeding, you know how these creepy foster doctors go. They're either extremely efficient or just do not give a shit about their patients at all. And so of course, Chris is released from the hospital the very next day. I'm surprised he was able to stay there as long as he did. Quote, the next day, Chris was released from the hospital, but the doctor told him to rest for three weeks. Nina didn't go to school because she wanted to take care of her brother. She would tell Chris some stories, and she would help him by making sure he would take his medications. Nina went to school again, and she received a new note, which read, I'm sorry about your brother. I hope he recovers. You must never think you're alone. I'm here. I'll be your friend. Nina suddenly blushed after reading it. She checked the letter again, but she didn't find the signature. Unquote. Hmm. Yes, I do truly wonder who could it be. Quote, Weeks has passed, and the arrival of the school's picture day arrived. Nina was ready for the picture day. She wear a short black skirt, black stockings with deep red stripes, a sleeveless t-shirt that has black and blue stripes, and a bloody red ribbon in her long ponytail hair. But she felt that something was missing. So she look in her closet. She sees her favorite purple hoodie, which reminded her of Jeff the Killer's hoodie. So she put it on. She went downstairs and sees her little brother waiting in the stairs. They they both left the house and said goodbye to their mother. The siblings went to school, but this time, they went to the bus to avoid meeting the trio again on the road." Unquote. You know, you gotta wonder, not only with the doctors of creepypasta universes, but with the parents, you think they'd look into who the hell beat their little kid up to an inch of his life, or who was eternally bleeding?
reading? Does anyone care about that? Like, at all? Quote, When they arrive in the school, they saw the trio. Claudia, Malcolm, and Yoni are walking in the hallway. They seem to be searching for someone. But Nina was aware that the trio are searching for her and her brother Chris. The siblings decided to stay away from the hallway and must avoid being seen by them. The day passed quickly, but unfortunately, the trio found them. Nina felt that she was being followed. When she turned her face to her back, she received a punch in the face and she fell to the ground. Then, she saw her brother. He was caught in the arms of Malcolm. Nina tried to get up, but she received another Another punch in the belly. She fell back to the ground and looked up. She saw Claudia. At last, I found you, bitch, said Claudia while standing in front of Nina. This is my revenge for attacking me last time, she said while pulling a gun. I don't want to fight you, Nina said while trying to stand up. Claudia immediately shoot Nina using her gun, but Nina quickly reacted to it and avoided the bullet. Ha <laughs> ha, sick anime dodge roll, bro. Nina stood up and ran as fast as she could to an abandoned house nearby. It was locked inside, so she climbed up to the stairs. The trio tried to shoot her with lots of bullets, but they couldn't successfully shoot her. Nina went inside in the bathroom, and she was trapped there. She wanted something to defend her. Nina, you gonna stay in there? Did you forget at what I did to your little brother, you idiot? Claudia shouted out from the abandoned house. Nina suddenly felt a combination of hatred and anger, and that need to kill someone. Nina looked around the room. She saw an iron rod. A twisted smile formed on her face. She took the iron rod and left the room. She quickly dodged the bullets and hit Yoni through the head, releasing a stream of blood. Some of the blood went on Nina's face and there, something that changed her, something broke like a thin thread had broken. That thread that divides sanity from insanity. Malcolm and Claudia and took a few steps back. Nina turned to their direction, showing a psychotic smile, making even Chris shiver with fear. Claudia tried to run along with Malcolm, but Nina hit Claudia in the head. She fell down and Malcolm decided to release Chris from his hands, but Nina did not stop the violence. She attacked Malcolm in the head a lot of times and making his head full of crimson blood. Claudia tried to get her gun in the ground, but Nina prevented her. Nina pointed her iron rod at Claudia. N Nina, do you feel good? Chris said as he felt afraid from his big sister. Nina turned her face to him for a little more relaxed look, but she didn't stop smiling. Do I feel good? I feel great. My prince. Let's go home, Nina said to her little brother, unquote. So yeah, pretty much like Jeff the Killer, she kills her bullies. Uh, to be fair, they were just kind of crazy evil people, but I guess Nina is just insane now. Well then, that very night after the murders, quote, it was midnight. The mother of Nina and her brother were sleeping. However, Nina could not sleep, so she got up. She looked in the mirror and smiled in a twisted way. She went downstairs and she was ready to do the craziest thing in her life. Nina walked into the kitchen. She drank a bottle of vodka and put it on the table. Then she started to search for a bottle of bleach in the cabinets, but she found didn't found any bleach. Where's the bleach? Nina groaned as she looked for it. Did you look for these? Nina heard a voice behind her. She turned around and she was surprised to found a guy at the entrance of the kitchen. He was holding a bottle of bleach. The boy had an extremely pale skin. His hair was black and he had a disturbing smile. Ah, uh, you're Jeff the Killer, Nina said. I have been observing you for a while. I think you have become a killer like me. <laughs> Jeff said. Yeah, you're right. So I need that bottle of bleach, Nina said. Ah, let me help you, Jeff said as he opened the bottle and poured the bottle of bleach in Nina's head. Then Nina felt another liquid running through her head. She looked up and saw Jeff had a matchbox in his hands. Nina smiled at him. What are you waiting for? Do it, Nina said with a passion. Jeff grinned and he throw the burning match in her face. Go to sleep, Jeff said. 
as Nina's face began to catch on fire, unquote. So, much like a certain other story we read, Jeff the Killer finds Nina quite fascinating, and he has been watching her, I guess, for some time. Weird that this version of reality both has the Jeff the Killer creepypasta story, uh, Jeff the Killer clothes, posters, plushies, all of which is like real life, you know? Because there's actually real life Jeff the Killer plushies and, and, the, and the pasta and clothes and stuff. But also in this version of reality, there is actually also a real Jeff the Killer who really exists in this universe and presumably kills people all the time. It's also pretty funny that while Jeff got his pale white face and stuff from a bullies lighting him on fire and shit, allowing for at least a small moment where he's not completely invincible, I guess, Anina kind of just does it herself. She has yet to truly lose something as of yet, actually. Well, anyway, to speed things up, she then arrives at a hospital and after a bit of recovery, it goes up to a mirror. She sees that she's almost just like Jeff pale white skin and what have you. Although with the additional detail that her skin is also as soft as a marshmallow now, which I don't even know what, how. Then later back at the house, she's sitting in her room and then is suddenly killing a girl in her room somehow and pulls her organs out all over her bed. She then cuts a smile into her face like, ooh, ooh, Jeff the Killer Sama, and asks her mom if she thinks she's beautiful. And when her mom calls her a monster who killed somebody right fucking there and screams and runs away, she then kills her own mom. And then she gets tranquilized and uh, put into an insane asylum. But then, because she's so smart and clever and like, you know, she just she just can't lose, guys. She rips up her bed and pulls a spring out, which they totally have in those places, I guess. And then, when she calls for help and someone comes in, she kills the doctor who came in for her. And then she runs out and everybody is super scared of her. And the security doors aren't working because the tablet that they use to close them is covered in blood. And the blood what is like messing it up? Now, I'm trying to think of what kind of door only closes with like an iPad. Does that even exist? It, pro it probably exists, I guess. Uh, but but then there's just so much blood everywhere that you can't even get like your fingerprint, you know? Like you're fucking you're trying to use your fucking thumb, your fingerprint, you know? It's just not working. It's just, it's just not. Um, but yeah, uh, pretty smart uh, near the killer to think that one through. But anyway, then she goes home and she runs upstairs to her brother's room, who by the way, if you remember, she kind of really loves her little brother, maybe even to kind of a weird extent, maybe, you know? Um, and he's also kind of the reason that she turned insane because she wanted to protect them and their bullies beating him to death, you know? Uh, but I digress. Just, just something to keep in your mind as we go into the scene. Quote, Chris woke up in his room. And he felt he was in danger and he was scared. Nina slowly opens the door revealing her shadow when Chris realized that it's sister. He took his sheets off to see his sister, but when he saw his sister is holding a knife, Chris became scared again and he snuggled into his pillow. Chris, Nina said in a whispery tone. Then Nina asked her little brother a question. Am I? Beautiful, Nina asked him. Chris stayed quiet as he hold tightly of his pillow. Oh, come on, Chris. I didn't do anything bad, Nina said. She hides her hands in her back while crossing her fingers. It's a sign that uh, Nina was lying to her little brother. You know, I feel much better now. Let's start a new life. Will you come with me? Nina said as she gets closer to Chris. Her little brother nodded at her. Oh, uh, good boy. If you want to join me, just go to sleep, my prince. Nina kicked the front door of the house while carrying her little brother on her back. Chris was dead. His dead body was smiling that looks very innocent, but his eyes was wide open that makes him look like s still alive. But in reality, he's already dead. He was covered in blood and has multiple stabs. Nina took a few steps at the entrance and she slowly looked at her little, little brother. Chris, I'll kill more people and make them all asleep, Nina said as she put down her little brother in the ground. 
Then she walked away to the streets, unquote. So, uh, I guess uh, she kills her little brother because, um, uh, because she loved him so much. And, uh, um, well, that's not important, right? Right? I mean, what's important is that she turns, you know, into a killer and, um, she runs off into the night to find her true love, Jeff joining him in killing people uh, for fun. Uh, the end. Now, to be fair, the original author was using Google Translate to have their story in English since it wasn't their first language. Originally, this whole story was in Spanish. So even though the grammar is atrocious in this story, I'm gonna cut them a lot of slack there because, I mean, they just didn't know better. Obviously, this story is bad, like really really bad. It's so cliche, full of Jeff the Killer fangirling, and is literally one of the most Mary Sue, Mary Sue type characters in the creepypasta scene. Uh, thusly why the original author took it down because, well, they weren't really proud of it anymore. And hey, uh, that's perfectly understandable. I know I've written cringy shit in my past as an edgy preteen to teenager, so I can't be too harsh there, even if it's literally Jeff the Killer, but worse in every way imaginable. Except, of course, if you're like me, who loves reading cringy Jeff the Killer shit, in which case, this is the prime rib of Jeff the Killer junk. Truly something special. The general creepypasta community didn't like this story either, and it's often used as an example, like like actually instructive example of what not to do when writing a creepypasta. That being said, there was sort of a meme culture around this character, Nina, and furthermore, those who do enjoy Jeff the Killer stuff, like unironically, ended up really enjoying Nina. And I guess there was something about Jeff the Killer getting a fangirl to an emo serial killer that for some reason really connected with people. So yeah, there would end up being a ton of rewrites of the story, fan art, especially those depicting Nina and Jeff the Killer together, and even having her be a rival to Jane the Killer, etc. I think a lot of people also like the idea of uh, the Joker-like Jeff the Killer having a Harley Quinn-like Nina by his side. Made for some interesting fan fiction and fan art, don't you know? But since then, the original author of Nina the Killer has actually written a new version of her character from back in the day, actually extremely recently, with a redesign and everything. Her new story is that her whole family got murdered in a camping trip by Jeff the Killer, and now Nina is a mercenary out hunting him down, as well as some other creepypasta villains like Jane the Killer and others that we haven't quite gotten to yet. Her story is pretty similar to Jane the Killer now, though I'm mostly getting the this info from the Creepypasta Files wiki, since the new story is written in her normal language, Spanish. Uh, but from what I've seen, it does seem a lot better. And I think it's always cool to see authors of stuff like this come back to either show off how much they've grown as a writer, or try something new out with an idea that was once made fun of. And while it's fun to poke fun at shitty stories, it's also important to remember a lot of this stuff was written by younger angsty lads and lasses for one reason reason or another. And while it is, again, fun to poke fun at them, it's not really cool to hang it over their head forever just because they had a bad story go viral uh, back when they didn't even know what the hell they were doing at the time. We have one more entry on this tear, but before we get to it, I would actually like to read a couple of extremely short creepypastas because I'm just now realizing almost all my bonus entries were kind of shitty creepypastas. And while those are fun, I also want to maybe uh, cleanse our palate a little bit, eh? So, without further ado, let's do a quick couple of short but sweet creepypastas. Daddy, I had a bad dream. You blink your eyes and pull up on your elbows. Your clock glows red in the darkness. It's 3.23 a.m. Do you want to climb into bed and tell me about it? No, Daddy. The oddness of the situation wakes you up more fully. You can barely make out your daughter's pale form in the darkness of your room. Why not, sweetie? Because in my dream, 
when I told you about the dream. The thing wearing mommy's skin sat up. For a moment, you feel paralyzed. You can't take your eyes off your daughter. Then, the covers behind you begin to shift. The Masterpiece I've been laying down for hours now. It's 5.35 a.m. and there's not much I can do. You know what the worst part about my situation is? I'm in the same room with my parents. They keep looking at me and I can't help but look back and, and try not to cry or scream. Their eyes are focused on me and their mouths are, are wide open. There's a strong scent of blood and I'm paralyzed with fear. Here's the thing. The second that I make any hint that I'm not asleep anymore, I'm completely fucked. I will die and there's nobody around to save me. I've been trying to think of a way out, but the only idea I have is to rush for my bedroom door, run outside the front door and scream for help, hoping any neighbors hear me. It's risky, but if I stay here, I'll surely die. He's waiting for me to wake up and see his, his masterpiece. You're probably wondering what's going on. I, I do get ahead of myself sometimes. About three hours ago, I heard screaming from the other side of the house. I got up and went to check on the noise. And I realized that I, I had to use the restroom. Instead of doing the smart thing and investigating, I used the bathroom first. I could have gotten myself killed right then for my stupid actions but I actually did my business and took a peek outside the bathroom there was blood on the carpet I got very worried and ran back to my room and hid under my sheets like the pussy I was I tried to convince myself to go back to sleep that it was just some really vivid dream or something I heard my bedroom door open like the terrified child I was, I peeked from under my blankets to see what was going on. I could see something dragging my dead parents into the room. Whatever it was, it wasn't human, I can tell you that. It was hairless, with no eyes and no clothing. It walked like a caveman, with its back slouched as it dragged my parents. But this thing was much smarter than any caveman. It was aware of what it was doing. It propped my dad up on the edge of my bed and made him face me. Then, I sat my mother down in the chair and positioned her towards me as well. After it started rubbing its hands on the walls, staining them with blood, and then drew a circle with a pentagram in it. To finish it off, it scribbled a message on the wall that I couldn't read in the darkness. It then positioned itself under my bed, waiting to strike. The scariest thing is now. My eyes have, have adjusted to the darkness since then, and I can read the message on the wall. I don't want to look at it, because it's terrifying to think about. But I feel the need to see before I'm killed. I peek at the creature's masterpiece. I know you're awake. And with that, it's time for our final entry this tier. And boy, 
is it ever a doozy? Tales from the Dogscape. So for our final entry this tier, we have what is officially the most bizarre and out there creepypasta I have ever personally read. And I mean that in every good way possible. The Dogscape is what is left of the world of man, and perhaps I ought to read the first log entry to explain the premise better. Quote, Log 1. I awaken. I do not know it at the moment, but this day marks my fourth straight year of existing in the dogscape. I push myself up from the carpet of writhing, twitching dog flesh beneath me and rise to my feet, stretching in the morning sun. It took me a while to learn to balance on the layer of solid dogs that now blankets each and every inch of solid ground. But nowadays, I can walk and run as easily and as fast as I ever could on soil or concrete. Perhaps faster. It was a city once, I think, though which one I can't remember. I only owe my guess to the massive pillars of dogs jutting up into the sky. Perhaps ancient buildings now completely filled and overgrown by canine biomatter. I climbed one once, sinking my fingers and toes deep into the dog wall to gain purchase, and after hours and hours of climbing, was rewarded with an incredible vista, fur and eyes, panting tongues and wagging tails, hugging the contours of the once barren land, and stretching in a single, aomibic mass farther than the eye can see. Now, I don't do that though. Now I merely go about my day. I hike to the gardens where the dog plants sprout up in bizarre shapes from the floor of the dogscape, and reach up to pluck the fetal puppy fruits right off the wagging, energetic branches. I bite into the succulent flesh, the juices dribbling down my chin and dripping down to be reabsorbed by the ground flesh, and revel in the savory taste. I'm thirsty. So I range until I find one of the mother mounds, and there I suckle at the teat patch until I've had my fill of milk. Sometimes I see other humans around me as well adapted to the dogscape as I am, but I barely acknowledge them, say nothing. What, after all, is there to say? The world is different now. What meaning would our old words have? Free-ranging dogs are becoming rarer and rarer to see now, and those I do see seem is lost, as passive as I am. They too graze on the dog plants, step carefully over the undulating, bleeding dog floor, dimly acknowledge myself and one another. In the distant sky and on the far horizon, I sometimes see massive forms sail or crawl or undulate, and I wonder if in this new world, normal, singular, ambulatory dogs have become as obsolete as I am." Unquote. So, if you didn't catch that, um, the fucking ground is made of dog corpses and, like, a mass of alive dogs, kind of? And the world is now this ugly, festering, vile planet made up of dog-shaped abominations in all shapes and sizes. To say that this creepypasta is gross and really fucking weird and disturbing uh, would be an understatement of the year. I mean, the guy gets all his, uh, drink dog nips from the ground. It's, uh, it's something of a visual. Beyond the setting, we get to know our main narrator, his struggles living in the dogscape, as well as the general fall of humanity in this Lovecraftian, ungodly world. He and the others must eat the flesh to survive, and others, sometime, the flesh can tempt men to never leaving its side. It's quite ghastly. In fact, I should warn you that if you wish to read this story in full, there's some pretty not safe for work and not safe for life content in there later on. Tales from the Dogscape had me both repulsed and intrigued the whole way through, and it feels like reading the journal entries of an ultra surreal nightmare. It's a wild yet very depressing ride to say the least. 
I kind of forgot I was reading a creepypasta at some point actually. It felt like something more out of the imagination of Clive Barker, or maybe something out of the works of Junji Ito. Actually, it reminds me a lot of uh, Junji Ito's manga. I can confidently say that there's not going to be any creepypasta that's going to be quite as outlandish as this one is nor as depraved and dehumanizing as this one gets later on. It would take a while to cover the whole thing, so I'm gonna leave it at that for now. Uh, but if you're interested in it, definitely go give it a read. It's very interesting if you know what you're going into. Goodness, look at that. Molten pasta sauce. We must be getting awfully close to the pit of pasta by now. I know it looks like lava, but trust me, nothing is as it seems here. There is no logic or rhyme or reason to nearly any of it. Still, uh, trade carefully. You wouldn't want to get that creepy pasta juice in your shoes now, would you? Before you know it, you'll be writing the next Mario the Killer.exe, the Ritual of Lovecraft inspired Monsters Lost Episodes Curse. Or something like that. Ronald. McDonald House. Starting this next tier off, we have yet another one that was very famous at the time, but I don't really hear anyone talk about these days. The story starts with the following. Quote, I'm sure you've heard of the Ronald McDonald House charity. They provide housing for families of sick kids when they're in the hospital. Seems pretty innocent, right? Well, there's another sign to the charity. There's another type of Ronald McDonald House, one that not many people know about. There's one in most big cities. You won't find it by looking for it. It doesn't have an address. It doesn't have a sign above the door. It doesn't even have windows. No, the only way you'll find it is if you're taken there. That's how I found it, unquote. The story then follows our narrator, a 15-year-old boy who is an orphan, and a bad kid who has been jumping in and out of homes for some time now. This has left his caseworker with only two options. Either he goes to military school in Lansing, or the Ronald McDonald House, which is the last place left to clear him for acceptance. He decides to go to the Ronald McDonald House, but things don't go very well, like, at all. Quote, well, we're here, the car came to a stop. I looked out the window. We had parked in front of a tall, gray, windowless building, sandwiched between two other industrial buildings on a narrow city street. I noticed that there was an address on the building to my left, and one on the right, but none on this particular building, not even a sign. Are you sure? I asked, hesitating as I opened the car door and climbed out of the back seat. I slung my backpack over my shoulder, clinging tightly to the strap, and followed the caseworker up to the windowless metal doors. She pressed a buzzer and spoke to someone inside, and the doors clicked to unlock, and we walked in. As soon as the metal doors closed behind us, I noticed the pin drop silence. It was that sort of silence that was so oppressive and empty, it almost deafens you. Across the dimly lit lobby, there was a glass window with someone inside, a secretary. She was turned away, typing something intently. We walked over to the window. The caseworker rang a bell on the counter, and the secretary spun around in her chair. Her face was painted like a clown, like Ronald McDonald, in fact. She even sort of had curly red hair. Otherwise, she wore a typical white nurse's dress. I wanted to laugh at how bizarre it was, but I couldn't. A chill swept down my spine. Something just wasn't right. I watched as the nurse and my caseworker interacted. Paperwork was passed through the window. The caseworker slid my case file under the glass as the nurse slid her some papers to sign. As my caseworker signed the papers, the nurse looked at me. Her smile seemed to have been warm and welcoming, but... All I saw was her eyes, and in her eyes was... Hunger. 
unquote. Well, he of course is forced to stay here, and then almost immediately after he is, well, cast off here, he is surrounded by a group of clown makeup wearing adults who grab him, strap him down to a bed, and start laughing as they flash knives, saws, and needles all around his face. It really goes from 1 to 100 very quickly, until he eventually blacks out. He then wakes up in a dingy cell in nothing but a filthy hospital gown, the sound of screams in the distance. The only other thing in the room, besides a small drain in the corner of the room was his backpack. He unzips it and finds inside a photo album. Quote, I wearily opened the photo album, but instead of the photos that had been in there, photos of myself with my previous foster families, photos where I had attempted to look happy and hopeful even though I knew I wouldn't be there for long, instead of those photos, they were like crime scene photos. And in each one, I recognized one of my former foster families, brutally murdered and covered in blood. My heart raced as my stomach churned. I began to turn the pages quicker. Each page a new photo, a new family, new carnage. I recognized their faces and the inside of their homes. I had lived with all these people, and now they were all dead. I came to the last few pages, a photo of my house at night, then a window of that house, then inside the house, a dark hallway with light coming from one doorway, then a photo of my caseworker brushing her teeth at her bathroom mirror, then a photo of her looking at the camera in horror, then a photo of the caseworker, naked, covered in her own blood, contorted into an unnatural position in her bathtub. I turned to the last page. Written inside the back cover of the photo album were three words. You never existed. Unquote. After this terrifying incident, our narrator manages to pick the lock on his door open and then tries to escape the facility. Along the way, he finds a large room where the other orphans that were taken here are all crucified, tubes stuck into their arms and sucking the blood out of them and into this large, loud device. Just as he says what the fuck, alarms start blaring and a group of clowns start chasing after him into the basement level of the facility where rotting corpses reside. He runs with all his might until he reaches a ladder and climbs up. There's scalpels cutting at his legs until he's able to open the manhole out and then shut it back again, catching his breath. But where he is, he couldn't tell. It was all abandoned streets, broken glass, no lights, no cars, nothing. Until, quote, Then I saw a light in the distance. It was a big yellow M in the sky. A McDonald's. Of course, I limped towards it. When I came to the McDonald's, I saw that apart from the M, the rest of the building was completely dark. I walked cautiously towards the broken windows and looked in. Darkness. I turned and surveyed the Play Place outdoor playground. Ten foot tall structures of colored tubes for kids to crawl through. Sitting at one of the benches was a familiar figure, the Ronald McDonald statue. You know. The one where you could sit beside him and it looks like he's got his arm around your shoulders. Every kid has seen it. I shuddered at the sight. The doors were unlocked. I walked in, out of the rain. Silence. Darkness. I noticed that the decor wasn't like the modern McDonald's you see. It was still the same as it was in the 80s, with the white plastic booths and the red and yellow tiles. The wind seemed to whisper through the broken windows. I noticed something on the front counter. A black rectangle. I got closer. A laptop. A nearly new laptop. I let out a soft, <laughs> delirious laugh. I knew what I was supposed to do. So I took the laptop outside and sat beside the Ronald statue. I opened the laptop and began to type this story. The rain is falling on the keys, but I don't care. There's nothing left to do now but wait, because I've been noticing, out of the corner of my eye, Ronald is trying to look over my shoulder. <laughs> He's laughing now. <laughs> All I can do is join him. 
unquote. And that's the story of the Ronald McDonald House. And it's all right, even though this whole story is way outside the realm of reality and is very over the top. I do still think it has a couple of fairly suspenseful scenes, all things considered. With my main issue with the story actually being that I think there could have been a far slower dip into the insanity of the story proper. It's a story that had it been done a different way, say the place was more normal at first, and slowly things got more and more uncomfortable, uh, the dark secrets slowly being revealed, I think it would have been a lot better. Plus we could have had time to see some of the other orphans, maybe our main character becomes friends with some of them, enemies with others, before they all start going missing one by one by one. Maybe the whole idea of the very few people he does know, you know, like the other foster families and his caseworker having been killed, could have been done more slowly. The employees of the establishment gaslighting him into making them seem crazy that he was ever part of these other foster families and eventually even his caretaker until slowly his entire identity is erased. Really play with that whole orphan and lack of identity angle. Uh, but as it stands, it's not bad. It would make for a pretty decent horror game, I guess all things considered. Though the whole kids being crucified and their blood going to some giant device was kind of, I don't know, it was kind of, it kind of took me out of it a little bit because it's like, okay, well, why are they doing that? What, what What is that about? And it's never really explained, so that's a little whatever. But while we're on the topic of clowns, the clown, the paint, and the turbines. This one's pretty short and follows our narrator who's just a little kid who's moved into a new house next to a large field full of wind turbines. Since he's just a kid and his parents are often at work, he has lots of time left alone in the day to just sort of explore and play in the new giant house in the field. Although the only two things he was told not to do is to never go into his parents' bedroom and to never approach the figure in the field. Well, this being a creepypasta, the kid, of course, eventually goes deep into the field and approaches said figure. One which looked like a scarecrow from afar, but was in fact a clown. When the kid asks who the clown is, he responds with, Your worst nightmare, and proceeds to talk as if the kid's mother was aware of him or something like that. And so then the kid runs back into his house, the clown not far behind him. And then eventually he wonders if there's some sort of connection with the clown and his parents' bedroom. And he then goes into his parents bedroom only to find that his dad is hanging from the ceiling hooks in his back and the words sacrifice are scrawled all across the walls and then the clown comes up from behind the kid and knocks him out with a paint bucket the kid then wakes up in his bed thinking it must have all been a bad dream which the author strangely notes quote this seems like a stupid plot twist doesn't it it's not Please keep reading. You have to find out the truth. Which is just, um, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a little immersion breaking to say the least, but okay. But anyway, the kid then walks outside looking for his parents and sees someone waving back at him in the distance of the field. He, for some reason, thinks that this is indeed his parents and decides to go back inside and watch cartoons for hours, not worrying about it anymore. Then later in the evening, he goes back outside to see why his parents have have been outside for so fucking long. It's then that he sees that one of the turbines has been painted red and his parents' corpses have been hung from two of the arms of the turbine. The figure in the distance, uh, that being the clown, waved once again and there was now writing on the fence of their house that read, thank you for helping me paint. Um, the end. Now, um, if you were a little bit, uh, confused as to oh, what the fuck just happened what, what what the hell was that story even about well, well don't worry i've got the answer for you you see uh the story is actually about well anyway it's uh it's pretty confusing what the fuck is going on throughout this whole story to say the least like who is the clown uh what did his parents know or didn't no. In fact, it was all just so disjointed, I kind of thought the twist was going to be that the kid was already dead or something and this was some sort of strange purgatory, something like that. But nonetheless, this one's just kind of nonsensical and silly. But there is actually a prequel 
Yes, indeed, this tale is not quite done. So when I found that out, I wondered if some of the questions and nonsense of the original story was uh, maybe cleared up in this one. And of course, like all creepypastas, the prequel is far longer than the original story. So, what is it about? Well, this time it's about a 17-year-old and his family who go to the circus, and him and his brother eventually have to go to uh, the child-only show, where he has to keep an eye on his little brother. This is all much to the annoyance of our protagonist, who couldn't care less about the elephants, people doing tricks, tiger stuff, and all the other general circus performance art. This all eventually comes to a head, however, when his parents, who were off doing something else, are introduced onto the stage. And their mother warns the both of them to run from this place, which pisses off the ringmaster, and just as the two boys are uh, getting very scared and they try to escape, they, well, uh, don't. Now from here, the story connects with the original, as we meet the head of this circus, the same clown from before in the uh, field, who seems to enjoy torturing and killing people, because of course he does. And he wants our young protagonist to paint with the blood of his victims, which he does for some time, thinking that it's in exchange for his younger brother's life. And then, well, uh, I'll be honest, after that, the whole third act of the story just completely goes off the deep end again with being nonsensical and just plain bad. See, it involves the clown getting ready to kill our protagonist's younger brother and make him use his blood to paint as well, which uh, I don't know why he'd do that at that point. He doesn't really have any motivation to keep, to, but whatever. But then the clown's right-hand woman named Melanie betrays him for some reason and then she helps them escape and in their escape they find this big field of turbines where there are a bunch of locked up children in there and so then they all help them escape and then you know when the clown catches up to them Melanie cuts her own arm and that for some reason makes the clown like get passive for some reason because he like thinks that her blood is just so beautiful that he cannot put his dirty hands on her uh, which she uses to her advantage um you know by rubbing her blood all over our protagonist and then she stabs the clown and it seems like he's dead uh, but not really because then there's a police report as like an epilogue of the story after all of this detailing everything that happened and that the clown is still at large and that our protagonist uh, for some reason is acting like a serial killer now even though that he wasn't doing that at all before then and it just seemed like he just wanted to get his brother out safe but now he's like gonna become serial killer clown too or something um the end so uh, uh did that answer any of your questions regarding the first one hmm? yeah uh maybe it did uh, for me it uh it, it did not you know it's stories like these that really make me say wow you know at least jeff the killer was like coherent you know like at least i could like understand what was going on even if it was really stupid at least it had a sort of logical chain of events to some degree but these two i genuinely don't know what the author was going for here at any rate that's enough clown stuff next rap rant so this one's got a special place in my heart. It starts off with our narrator asking us if we've ever heard of a game called Nightmare. Quote, have you ever heard of Nightmare? Like a lot of other games from the 90s, it came with a VHS which you timed with your play. The character on the video would give you instructions on what to do while you played the game in real time. Being a scaredy cat, I refused to play it when my mom bought it for us. My brother was disappointed about not being able to play Nightmare, but my mom had a solution. She brought out Rap Rat. It was a cheap, dingy little thing catered to kids my age. You went around the board and collected cheese, and the first player to reach the end would win. It seems simple enough, and since it reminded us of Mousetrap, which we didn't have, there were no objections. We popped the movie into the VHS and set up the board. The first part of the video was just a simple explanation of the rules as well as instructions on how the game worked. Then, Rap Rat came onto the TV. He was not what any of us were expecting. My smaller brother, who was only three at the time, immediately left the room crying. The rat did not even resemble a rat. The ears were far too big. It had a mouth lined with two teeth, and the inside of the mouth looked almost 
swollen. The most striking part about the thing, though, was the eyes. They were large, glassy, and fish-like. I asked then, bothered, then begged my mom to turn it off. Rap Rat suddenly shouted loudly, screaming and wailing, saying, WAIT YOUR TURN! in a demonic, low-pitched voice that was not at all like his normal obnoxious nasal voice. In the background, you could hear the narrator saying, He's Rap Rat, and he's the boss. Over, and over, and over again, in an overly serious tone, unquote. From there, something crazy happens. Quote, the video was indescribable. Images crossed the screen in quick succession, overcut with Rap Rat's expressionless eyes. The images were some of the things I was afraid of at the time. A person looking over a balcony, a hornet slowly stinging someone's eye, an extreme close-up of a tarantula, a pit full of writhing cobras, and a bloodied syringe filled with green fluid. We immediately turned the video off and I ran out of the room screaming, slamming my door. It took my mom 20 minutes to convince me that the video was gone, that I would never, ever see it again. I had nightmares all week about Rap Rat, unquote. There's then a time skip, and our narrator is now an adult. He's planning on moving in with his girlfriend, so he starts going through his old stuff, including his closet, and finds none other than that old Rap Rat game. This kind of freaks him out, and he explains to his girlfriend the story from his childhood, but she doesn't believe him. So, he sets out to prove it to her by getting a VHS player and showing her the tape. Quote, I borrowed my neighbor's VHS and played the video for her. However, the images had changed. I saw a clown, its nose bursting and spraying blood onto the screen. I saw a woman alone in the dark room. I saw a man being forced to pick up white hot metal and hold it in his outstretched hand, turning his hand into a leathery mess. The scratching I heard as a child continued, picking up louder and louder. Then Rap Rat showed up and began twisting and convulsing, his arms thrusting this way and that. The costume wasn't a costume anymore, the felt was real fur. His face wasn't plastic, but instead a bristle of thorns with teeth. The eyes turned inward and suddenly popped out again. Rap Rat's huge fish eyes were inside out staring right at me, watching my every move, my every expression. It grinned wildly and gestured at my girlfriend and I with a single outstretched inhuman hand. I could hear the faintest scratching at my front door. The TV went blank, showed static. The scratching got louder. It wasn't scratching anymore, but thumping. The thumping of tiny feet on wood. My girlfriend embraced me in fear and my senses kicked in. Before anything else could happen, I stopped the video, ejected it, and unplugged the VHS. The scratching stopped. When I looked out the living room window, nothing was there." Unquote. Well, after all that, they tried to call the police, but they of course found nothing. Both he and his girlfriend began having nightmares every night. At some point, he wants to get to the bottom of this and, in his words, sue the company for damages, which, okay, fair enough, I guess. He finds out the name of the company that made both Rap Rat and Nightmare. Uh, they were once called a couple of cowboys. They, however, went defunct in 1994, only two years after they created Rap Rat. We then get the epic backstory for how Rap Rat came to be. Quote, in 1992, the year of the game's development, a couple of cowboys had commissioned a manufacturing company in Haiti to create the doll portrayed in the game. The company who created the puppet ran a sweatshop, where they forced women and children to produce the various components of the puppet, including the felt and plastic of the doll. One day, a young Haitian girl got her arm caught in the industrial sewing machine, the spring loader. Unable to handle the weight of the machine, came loose and struck the child's neck, killing her instantly. A few days after the funeral, the mother of the child came to the factory, demanding to see the owner, who denied that he had anything to do with it. In a fit of rage, the mother said that the blood of the innocent would seep into every crevice of the doll, every component with which it is created, and all who touched it would die. She claimed to have summoned a fear demon and screamed at the top of her lungs. Apparat, 
will curse you. The owner simply laughed and told his corporate bosses about Apparat. They spread the joke from person to person, and the game was eventually renamed to Rap Rat, a loose anagram of Apparat. Each recitation of the name Apparat brought with it a greater and greater curse. Only two years after Rap Rat was created, the company was shut down and the owners hired by Mattel. There were stories of the workers begging for days off, skipping work for weeks and weeks, finding the puppets in strange places. Sooner were the stories of self-exit the game, grim, violent self-exits of the game, in which workers would stab their hands and burn themselves to death, writing, I am fear, on the nearest surface in blood. Nobody knows where the Rap Rat doll went after the original creators disappeared. Some say that the last things the victims saw before going insane were large, sunken, fish-like eyes." Unquote. The story ends with a warning about never saying the word Apparat out loud, as saying a demon's name out loud is inviting it into your home, which since I'm the one reading the story, I guess I'm already fucked. You're welcome. And he also notes that, quote, a lot of people have been watching the normal video from the normal board game. That's the thing. Rap Rat can be normal. It'll trick you into thinking it's just a puppet and then stalk you day and night, unquote. And that's Rap Rat, and even though it's pretty silly, I actually kind of find it charming. It's a pretty simple haunted game sort of story, but there's something kind of funny about it that I can't quite put my finger on. Maybe it's just the idea of this cartoon rat haunting the children's dreams, and maybe I'm just going crazy at this point, you know, <laughs> after reading this many creepypastas. I suppose it's just a fun, scary story that while not super scary to me, I think is a fairly well put together little urban legend type tale. Not bad, and one I certainly remember fondly from the past. The Thing in the window. I'm pretty freaked out. That thing has been there for almost a week. The figure in the window. It looks featureless. Only skin on a human frame. And it's pressing itself against the glass somehow. I don't know how it got there. And I don't know how to get rid of it. At first I thought it was a prank. A doll or a mannequin that some jerks put there to scare me. But I realized as I walked out of my house to pull it away, it wasn't there. I shrugged it off thinking that someone had hidden it while I was walking through my door. But I went back in and looked out the same window, and it was looking in, staring at me. I walked around my house yelling for whoever it was to come out, but no one was there. The thing is hairless and naked, and it didn't look like it actually had eyes, or even a face at all, but its head is turned toward me when I enter the room. When I sit on my computer, I can feel its faceless hatred boring into my neck, but when I turn around, it innocently turned in a different direction. Finally on Thursday, I tried to open the window, but it's stuck. I think the thing's hands are keeping it down. But I got a good look at its face. Its eyes and mouth are behind the skin, pushing outward. It stared at me, smiling. I pulled back a fist and smashed it into the glass, determined once and for all to get rid of the glaring monster. I know I'm strong enough. That glass should have cracked, but it didn't. It shuddered under my hand, but it didn't break. And that smile just got wider and wider and wider until I thought its head would break in half. It raised its own hand and bashed the window of its palm. It was mocking me. But I saw the faintest crack begin to appear where it had hit, and I backed away. No way did I want that smile in the same room as me. So I got a roll of duct tape and I started covering the window. I couldn't look directly at it. I nearly shit my pants just knowing it was watching me, but I couldn't help it. I took a quick glance at the skin-covered face 
a small peak. It was angry. That menacing grin was now gaping frown full of teeth. The skin had ripped away from its mouth and I could see down its carnivorous throat. A menacing rumble started to fill the house and that hairline crack began to spread like splintering ice. I pulled down the duct tape. The rumble stopped. The split skin sealed over. And I began to smile again. Now it's night. And the noise hasn't started again. There are no sounds. No rumble, no crackling glass. Everything's quiet now, but I can feel its claws gripping the back of my chair. I can hear its skin stretching as it smiles. It's watching me type. Autopilot. So this one's kind of based all around its twist ending, but it starts with the following. Quote, Have you ever forgotten your phone? When did you realize you'd forgotten it? I'm guessing you didn't just smack your forehead and exclaim, Damn! A prose of nothing. The realization probably didn't dawn on you spontaneously. And more likely, you reach for your phone, pawing open your pocket or handbag, and were momentarily confused by it not being there. Then you did a mental recap of the morning's events. Shit. In my case, my phone's alarm woke me up as normal, but I realized the battery was lower than I expected. It was a new phone and it had this annoying habit of leaving applications running that drained the battery overnight. So I put it on to charge while I showered and stuff into my bag like normal. It was a momentary slip from the routine, but that was all it took. Once in the shower, my brain got back into the routine. It follows every morning, and that was it. Forgotten. Unquote. The narrator then goes on to talk about how this is a normal and at times dangerous brain function that we all have. Uh, to go into autopilot. To assume everything is in order. Our brain filing it away. Even if we had forgotten something. No matter how big or small the detail. The autopilot can kick in and then it's forgotten until it's too late for you to fix the issue immediately. Like leaving your phone at home and only remembering once you're already at work. He goes on to talk about how his day went without his phone at work and all that sort of stuff. And really contemplating the idea of our brains going to autopilots. Now, that said, it is kind of hard to do what comes next, this twist justice here, because there's a fair bit of build up after this. But basically the dude gets in his car with his daughter, uh, drives her up to her nursery, and then heads to his work. It's a hot summer day, the day baking those inside of the office building as he ponders upon the idea of autopiloting even more, and the strange quirks of the brain. He then drives back home, heads inside to finally grab his phone, when his wife asks where Emily is. And it's at this point that he remembered something. He never actually dropped her off at the nursery. He only drove up to it and left. She had been in the car for nine hours in the sizzling sun. He left his phone on the counter that day, the same day that he left his daughter for dead in his back seat. And that's the story. Pretty simple, but very dark all the same, with some a pretty good build up to a terribly, terribly tragic twist. Elevator Safety Guide. This one reads like an actual safety guide for other such things, with plenty of rules such as only 10 people in at a time. Uh, don't bring dogs into the elevator. Be respectful of others' personal space, etc. And then it starts going on about not touching the handprints on the walls. Don't look at the reflection of the passengers that aren't actually there. Don't get off on floors that don't exist. You know, scary stuff like that. And that's pretty much it. And not much to this one. Instant death disease. So this one is, uh, it's, um, well, I think it's about that time that we do another full reading to do it justice. Quotes. I was a worker working at Kolkanom Laboratories, Wales. 
We work with drugs and medical elements, creating cures and vaccines. My boss told me that whatever I do, I should never tell anyone about what we are doing. He began acting strangely only a few weeks ago, when we began Project Axolotl. We were aiming to give humans the ability to regenerate lost limbs. But it went wrong. Horribly wrong. My boss called me up to see him. He was a tall man with dark hair. He told me that he, there seemed to be a problem with testing Area 5B, where my best friend was working. Of course, I immediately took the job of going down there and checking with him if all was good. It was not. My friend was sweating terribly and breathing heavily. His hands were shaking and he backed away from the testing area. I had never been in the testing area. Well, not while I was a professor at work, anyway. I worked upstairs, where we formed chemical combinations and researched, dissected, and examined. I thought that in the testing area we'd be testing on animals. No matter how cruel that sounds, it sounded a whole lot better than what we were actually doing. Testing on humans. He backed away from the glass panel and I stared through, asking what was wrong. His hands trembled and he tried to pull me away, telling me not to look. The humans were there, all dead. I was immediately sickened. The idea of testing on each other sounded horrible to me. But I noticed that Wong was alive. She held her child in her arms. We were also testing on small children. Suddenly, she looked at the corpses. She looked at us and mouthed something. I looked away and didn't see. The sight of death itself proved too much for me. But I heard a sickly groan from my friend. Dread filled me. I grabbed him by the shirt and shook him. He gave a hollow rattle, as if there were no eternal organs in him. I felt the sudden need to get as far away as I could. I cut my hands over my ears and closed my eyes, running, although bumping into walls, all the way back into my boss's office. I told him frantically what happened, waving my arms madly. My boss's eyes opened wide, but then he smiled. He grinned, began laughing. That laugh was not of mirth. It was of insanity. It drove me mad, his demonic chuckle screaming through the room. He explained, We had been forming a disease, a new special disease. It would instantly kill our opponents. He had injected one dose into the test subjects of 5B, then told one of the men to read off of a card. Once he read it, he gave out a sickening gasp. He was dead. When his body was examined by scientists just a few rooms away from me, the thought of this caused me to vomit. They found that he had lost all of his eternal organs, all at the same time. His death had been instant, but excruciatingly painful for that fraction of a second. The thing is, the woman next to him heard what he said and suffered the same fate, only mouthing the words to the man next to her. He then shouted the words, only heard by the baby. The last woman was deaf and mute. The woman was terrified at losing her baby. She went insane, but did not show symptoms of the disease. She cradled the baby and wrote to the scientists, Why won't my baby drink? Why is he so pale? How come he's so cold? This was too much to bear. The card was shown again, and after reading it and mouthing the words to my best friend, died. Anyone who says the name of the disease, reads it, hears it, sees it lip red, feels it in braille, sees it on Morse code or click code or any language, is instantly killed. Instant. Although unbelievably painful, he said. He asked me if I wanted to know the name of the disease. I screamed no, covered my ears and ran outside the door. <laughs> when I peered back, my boss was laughing. He hadn't even said it. I went home, trying not to think about it. When I went to bed, I dismissed it as A, a crazy dream, or B, my boss pulling a prank. However, I felt like I was lying to myself. I couldn't help but feel that way, you know? I couldn't get to sleep. I felt a churning in the pit of my stomach. My head throbbed like it was imploding, and I felt as if someone had taken a sledgehammer to my shins. Deciding to call in sick, I rung up my boss in the morning. I explained to him, and he just laughed. His sickening chuckle dissolved into a disconcerting giggle. He told me, okay, uh, but I'd be missing out. It was in all the newspapers. 
Colconome Laboratory shut down. All employees found dead. Company president Mr. B.H. Large found dead in office. No evidence of how deaths occurred. No weapon found. No gas leaks. Sign of accident. Only worker survived. C.W. Dickinson stayed home sick. I couldn't take it. I packed everything I could grab into a suitcase, smashed open my rainy day jar, the contents of which amounted to about 50 pounds, and stuffed the notes and coins into my wallet, which now felt like a lead weight. I started up my car, cranked up the radio, and regardless of what was on, I floored it. I drove as far as I could until I had almost crossed the border. My radio buzzed. This just in from the Kolkanom Laboratories case. The dead seem to have no eternal organs. There is no sign of lacerations or wounds. It is almost as if their eternal organs simply vanished. This seems instant. But recordings, CCTV, and a three-letter message scrawled by one of the employees may prove that it certainly wasn't painless. I crammed the CD in and slammed on the pedal, doing a halfish U-turn and L-turn, and went for the countryside. I drove and drove, aimlessly following roads roughly north. I didn't stop until I ran out of gas where I grabbed my cases and ran. When I entered a field and I couldn't carry my cases anymore, I threw them in a ditch. As long as I could run, I ran. I didn't sleep until my body dropped. I woke tired and groggy, my bones aching. I knew I had run from what I knew. There was a virus going around. I knew exactly what my boss had done. He had shouted the name of the disease over the loudspeakers. Everyone who heard died. Some tried to block their ears, but the words flashed on the computers. The lights blinked it in Morse code. Everyone in that building was now dead. The terror they must have felt. The split second of reality bending agony. All the friends, the men and women I used to know. I'm now sleeping in a hotel room I found. It's far away. It's old and quaint. I think I'll be fine here. They don't have TV and I always stay away from the radio. I'll live. I know a harrowing truth, but I can't tell. I have the name of the disease. It's simple. It's blunt. It does exactly what it says on the can. I call it instant death. Disease. <laughs> uh, the end. And that's the tale. Um, it's, you know, pretty bad. But if you can believe me, on the same tier, I have a story that makes this one seem like fine literature. This is one of the most infamously bad creepypastas ever written. One by the name of Blood Whistle. So, I don't even know where to begin with this one. It's somehow all of these things at once. A cliche video game based creepypasta, an edgy gore fest, grammar wise perfectly competent, purple prosed, boring, dead fucking serious shitty pasta. The story starts off with the following paragraph and this um, sort of disclaimer. Quote, this is the recorded blog of a college student who was playing a modified version of Super Mario Bros. 3 on his computer. Shortly after submitting the last story, he committed self-exit the game of life in his dorm room. Unquote. Then the story proper begins. Quote, a friend of mine recently sent me what he claims to be a weird Super Mario Bros. 3 hack that he wanted me to try out, because he didn't have the courage to. I started this blog to record my progress through the game. He got this from a weird and presumably fucked up place, and I've seen some pretty scary occurrences with emulator games before. Just look at Ben. All of that aside, however, there was something definitely off about this ROM. Its title was SMB3BW. Anyhow, I won't play any today as I'm quite busy with college work and such, but I will definitely start tomorrow." Unquote. So, um, 
Obviously, the ending of the story was given away from the start, which is almost never a good idea, and it also commits the terrible sin of mentioning an other, more popular creepypasta, thus implying that the guy who's writing this story either reads them a whole lot while he's writing this one, which is both meta and extremely not scary, or Ben Drowned is somehow real in the story's universe, which is on a whole nother scale of dumb. That said, what follows is a long, detailed description of the game as he plays through it. It all starts out normal until he discovers the secret to unlocking the game's true nature. Quote, I wish I hadn't unlocked that secret. This game will be the bane of my existence. I'll try my best as I can to explain what happened and what will certainly entail. I don't know if any of you will believe me, but this sick mockery of one of my childhood favorites must be exploited and never be seen by the eyes of any other breathing man on God's green earth. And Todd, what I'll call my friend for the sake of privacy and possibly security, do not send that link to anyone else. You'll see why below. I entered the castle stage, knowing its only secret was the warp whistle. I disposed of the dry bones before donning a raccoon tail. With a running start, I was flying above the stage until I hit the secret area. My whole life before I hit up on my arrow keypad was completely different. I was happy. I was normal. I could wake up in the morning recognizing my own reflection, being absolute about my safety. Now it's lies. All lies. I know that, as of what happened today, my life will become an infernal hell in which every day will be a futile struggle to retain my own sanity. After finishing this wretched collage of electronic dejection, I will embrace death like a long lost lover with open arms. Now, to get on with what had come to pass. The blocks that lined the wall were a gloomy, albeit polished obsidian black. Mario's skin now had a grayish tint to it, but that wasn't what was wrong with that picture. The music was a sped up version of the normal bonus room theme. Toad's skull was cracked open and profusely bleeding, spilling blood onto the floor and making the room slippery like an ice stage. His mouth was also agape and spewing blood onto the floor. The blood had an eerie reflective quality that should have been graphically impossible for an 8-bit game like Mario 3. I walked up to him to see what it is that he might have to say. What he had to offer is this, blood whistle. Hear its cry. I then ran towards the chest to see its contents. The chest was drenched in reflective realistic blood of the same type, emanated by the orifices and exposed cranium of the poor little mushroom-headed fellow. Pressing onward, I ran through it to discover its dark secret, its twisted surprise. I wasn't prepared for the following events. A blood-soaked warp whistle ominously arose from what I now believe to be the deepest crevice of hell. It blipped twice as the normal whistle would. That, my fellow reader, was the only normality of what I have played today. It played a deep tune that I can't get out of my head as I write this. The whistle descended, violently striking Mario in the chest. He unleashed a blood-curling scream as it went into his back and out of his chest. His cry wasn't 8-bit at all. It wasn't even close to cartoon-esque. It sounded like an unfiltered anguish of utter agony. His expression reflected the same. To end my experience on this perverse version of something I once loved, Mario was transported to the warp zone of the blood whistle. I call it this because it had only the cookie cutter outline of a quaint island. The water consisted solely of the same blood aforementioned in my encounter with the whistle. Corpses of Koopas and other enemies of Mario were scattered afloat near the shores. White menacing eyes glared at me between the waves. Surf just to cast their evil glance at Mario, or me. I can't be sure at this point. All the worlds were indicated by their respective numbers, and all the dots were crimson. At this point, I noticed yet another abnormality, this time concerning the dot of the world eight. Beside it were two eight bit patches of fire that twisted and contorted in place. Without me pressing any buttons, the whistle stabbed Mario in the ribs. This cued him to move to the World 2 dot, refusing to pay any further attention to the horrors that surely await in the distorted desert. I saved the game and quit. I have played more than enough of my fill for today. 
I guess I figured out the acronym of the ROM title meant Blood Whistle the Hard Way. Despite the horrors that plague this abomination, I will continue to subject myself to this suffering for the sake of all of you. Well, also for mine. It'll help me keep track of the days. And maybe this desperate attempt to cling to my stable frame of mind won't prove to be in total vain. There are 5,000 people that have followed this blog in the two days that it's been up. After this pointedly interesting post, I'm hoping to have some more. For those of you following my post, read tomorrow's and share with your friends. I need you to expose the stark luridness of this shell of something I once knew and loved." Unquote. Very dramatic, to say the least. In fact, I think this might be the most dramatic video game based creepypasta protagonist narrator i guess whatever this ever existed it's so over the top that it's almost kind of funny accidentally like imagine if this is all it takes for this guy to go into this deep detail of these the horrors the hell that he's going through imagine if you played something like silent hill or resident evil or clock tower or something and while i appreciate the more complex vocabulary that's clearly shown throughout this creepypasta, when it's about something as mundane as a creepy Mario ROM hack, it all starts to just feel a little bit uh, pretentious, or at the very least much. You know what I mean? What's more is the whole story goes on this way as well, and it just gets worse and worse with quotes like these. While I die fibers of my perception of reality long enough to play through World 2, I have come to the conclusion that whoever made this is completely and utterly deranged. There's been a rusted gear or broken spring in the mechanics of their sadistic mind. Their only purpose in creating this mod was to mentally and psychologically flagellate the naive soul poor enough to take the bait of its mysterious origin. Well, I'm fucking dumb enough to fall into that category. I digress to the experience. Or, quote, Oh, that reminds me of another thing. You're probably wondering why I am complacently talking about Mario as if he is a human being. A human who suffers pain, sorrow, depression, starvation, and thirst like the rest of us. A human who is capable of feeling happiness, remorse, goodwill, and love like anyone else. Else. It's because I thoroughly am convinced that he is. Please don't stop following this blog because you think I'm insane. That will come later. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that inside this game is a character with a complex range of emotions. Someone who feels like you and me. But it's just a game, right? It's just a contrived mixture of code and data put together to present words and images, correct? Wrong. I know with everything inside of me that Mario has to be alive. I have seen him truly happy and truly sad. And at one point, I may even see him truly angry. He feels like any other living, breathing human being." Unquote. It's uh, uh, it's all rather crazy. I do like that he acknowledges at first that it's some weirdo who made the game. That said, it's also just a horror-themed Mario game, so I don't really know if making that alone suddenly makes you evil. And that said, Mario goes through some terrible torture here, from being cut up to uh, having his like heart ripped out and all that sort of stuff, eaten alive by giant fish, all sorts of terrible, terrible stuff, only to come back again and again to endure yet more pain. The game also starts to know more information about our protagonist's past. At one point, someone tried to report the author as insane and had his campus police pay him a visit, and he continues to describe the bloody mess that uh, was the level's several worlds in mind-numbing detail. At one point, the protagonist compares his journey through this game as fighting one hell of a war, like D-Day, <laughs> which is, uh, uh, he then states the following, quote, I'm starting not to care anymore. I am in the throes of such a severe depression, it's all starting to fade away. Everything. School. Friends. Family. It's safe to say this game is single-handedly ruining my life. Such sadness has never become me ever before in my life. My grandfather died when I was young, but that didn't come close to equate to what I'm feeling now. It's a direct result of the level that I played today, which I'll get into right now." Unquote. Ooh, 
Oh, yes. Ah, uh, sit there and mm, savor that for a moment. I don't know if we're going to get a video game creepypasta with as ridiculous of a paragraph as that one on this iceberg. So soak it in. Take a deep, long breath. Because this was peak. What the fuck did I just read? <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding, fam. You know I wouldn't hold out on you. That shit is nothing compared to this next quote. It is ironic, indeed, that today is June the 13th. The unlucky number. The unlucky day. I suppose today isn't completely horrible. Today is the last day I had to play this wretched game. This horrifyingly absurd remake of what I used to see as a wonderful game will soon be out of my life, along with everything else. With this being my last post, I, I suppose I can be finally honest about my true intentions ever since I finished World 2. I'm going to commit self-exit the game of life. This game has caused me sorrow on such an inevitable level that there is no other option. Life will never be the same. Mom and Dad, I love you. Michael and Kelsey, you guys be good. Listen to Mom and Dad. They have a lot of valuable lessons to teach you. Lessons that I learned but can never apply again. Now, for what you 75,000 followers read this post for, the rest of the game. <laughs> so I guess that's why our author decided to commit exit the game, of life that is. He can't exit this game that's making him want to die, you see, because uh, uh, he can't turn off the game that makes him want to end himself because uh, anyway, this game is just so bad that he has to die. Sorry everybody, the cord to my brain is already disconnected. I might as well disconnect my heart while I'm at it, you know? At any rate, more spooky shit happens in the game. Princess Peach is actually evil, I guess. Big twist. And then he beats the game and dies because the game was uh just that scary, you know? What what can you do? What can you do? And that was Blood Whistle. I skipped around a lot, I know, but honestly the details of the game are just kind of boring and honestly hard to focus on when you have the world's most idiotic protagonist right smack there in front of you. That said, it is so over the top that it was kind of fun seeing just exactly how this guy was going to react every single time. And I kind of like to imagine like what if he was watching something like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or some shit. He was like, these are real human beings of a soul. I can't bear to live knowing that this exists. What a fucking weenie. It's a bad creepypasta. What more is there really to say? Cat flap. This one's kind of weird um, because it's really short, but all it really amounts to is this guy or gal is afraid of cat flaps, you know, the little doors on doors for cats, uh, because he mistakes the cat's behind as a, a monster coming in. He sees the tail as like a nose and the asshole as an eye. You know, it's, that's, that, that's pretty much it. That's the joke. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Persuaded. This one, like so many this tier, is another short one, and it's a basic story about a zombie apocalypse starting, but with a slight twist. The zombies are not only fast, but they are also aware, as in they are actually intelligent creatures. This leads to our narrator eventually seeing his neighborhood get overrun by them, jumping through windows, breaking through everything, so he grabs his supplies and hides in the most secure place in his house, the bathroom. However, one of them saw him before he went in, and so now the rest of the story is the zombies outside of his door, trying to persuade him to open up, that he can't be in there forever. The story ends with him having been in there for two days and wondering if maybe being a zombie would be so bad. Overall, a, a decent enough little story, but one that I think could have had a little bit more meat on its bones, as I like the idea of zombies that can talk, but not much is actually done with it besides the initial concept. Tomino's Hell. So this one is best read in full since it's both short and adds to the atmosphere. Quote, this is a popular Japanese story. It is a, about a poem called Tomino's Hell. They say that you should only read it with your mind and never aloud. If you were to read it out loud, then you must take responsibility for your actions. Tomino's Hell is written by Yamoda Inohiko 
in a book called The Heart is Like a Rolling Stone, 27th collection of poems in 1919. It's not sure how this rumor started, but there's only a warning that if you read this poem out loud, tragic things will happen. This story used to be very popular on 2chan, and there were many people taking pictures and videos as proof and posting them on 2chan. There were many users that said that nothing happened, but there were also many posts that didn't have the user come back to post the results. I think it's scarier than someone posting that someone else got sick or that someone else had passed away, but if you were to read it out loud, it's better to read it in Japanese rather than in the translation. So with that in mind, I hope you're all ready to hear the English translation of the poem read aloud. <laughs> Let's read. Quote, Tomino's hell. His older sister vomited blood. His younger sister vomited fire. And the cute Tomino vomited glass beads. Tomino fell into hell alone. Hell is wrapped in darkness and even the flowers don't bloom. In the person with the whip, Tomino's older sister, I wonder whose blood is on it. Hit, hit without hitting. Infinite. Hell's one road. Would you lead him to the dark hell? To the sheep of gold? To the bush warbler? Fit as much as you can into the leather sack for the preparation of a journey in the familiar hell. Spring is coming even in the forest and the stream. Even in the seven valley streams of the dark hell. The bush warbler in the bird cage, the sheep in the wagon, tears in the eyes of cute Tomino. Cry, bush warbler, toward the raining forest. He shouts that he misses his little sister. The crying echo reverberates throughout hell. The fox Pinoy blooms circling around hell's seven mountains and seven streams. The lonely journey of cute Tomino. If they're in hell, bring them to me, the needle of the graves. I won't pierce with the red needle in the milestones of little Tomino. Unquote. Now, of course, a poem isn't going to kill you, and, well, I'm still here, so I guess it didn't kill me either. It's only a Japanese urban legend, after all, but one that's been pervasive for some time. The poem itself was actually written by poet Saijo Yaso all the way back in 1919. There were many interpretations of what the poem might be about, but all the same, it does have an aura of general despair to it that some say comes from the loss his author felt when he lost his father and sister to World War I, while others believe it comes from the story between the lines of this poem, that being about a girl who murdered her parents and now descends into the lowest part of hell. There are other interpretations of that story in between the lines though, like some people interpret it as the girl being locked in the cellar and beaten by her parents. Or maybe it's just the general hell of losing a loved one, or even life itself. It's hard to say. Oh, and also this famous picture that is always associated with this poem was never actually made for it, though it does add a very disturbing visual to connect with the poem. The piece was actually made by an artist by the name of Yuko Tatsushima, and is titled, I Don't Want to Bride Anymore. And from what I understand, it is made to represent some sort of self-harm and other dark-related topics. I check out her other stuff as well. It's all pretty interesting, if a bit tragic and sad in the same respect. Channel Infinity. So this is one of those ritual pastas, similar to Bloody Mary and the like, where you have to perform some sort of task in a ritualistic form, usually for some sort of reward, uh, but not always, and always at great risk to yourself though. This ritual starts with the following, quote, there is a legend circulating around the television industry. It is about Channel Infinity. Channel Infinity is hard to get to, and reports vary as to what it actually is. I will tell you how to get there, and then what to do, unquote. From there, some instructions are given on how to access Channel Infinity, and it starts with the following steps, quote, 
Acquire a television, preferably with analog for the best experience. The older, the better. Acquire a remote control. It does not have to go with the television that you're using. Turn on the TV and set it to a channel that is static, or just a plain black screen if you're using a digital TV. Basically any channel you do not receive. Leave the room for about three hours. If you have a significant other in the house, have them with you. It is also best to call over a few friends. During those three hours, you should acquire a few items. I will list them in order from most important to least. Note that none of these are mandatory, but they help. You will want an item that you hold dear, two handheld mirrors, a firearm or other weapon, a favorite book, a mobile communications device, a key, a sledgehammer or pickaxe. After roughly three hours have passed, re-enter the room. Have everyone else wait outside the door. Close the door. Stare at the static or blank screen or whatever you set your TV to until you feel disoriented or freaked out. Call the others into the room. Give the item that you hold dear to the person that you care about the most in the room. Then send them back out. If you did not grab an item that you hold dear, hug that person and whisper a secret into their ear. Send them back out and command them to not come back in no matter what until you open the door again. Note this will be harder for them if there are more of them, but it will be safer for you if there are more people. Trust me. Hold the mirror so that one is reflecting the television screen into the other, and the second is reflecting you, so it looks as if the television is behind you. Stay like this until a question appears on the screen. If you did not grab the mirrors, then sit in a chair facing away from the TV until you hear a noise. Grab the remote. There will be a question on the screen. Press channel up to answer yes, channel down to answer no. There will be anywhere from three to 26 questions. If reports are to be trusted, the questions will be anywhere from trivial to deep, philosophic, personal questions. Answer truthfully, or you will not succeed in reaching channel infinity." Unquote. So what exactly can be found on channel infinity? Well, it said one of these three things will occur. Number one, your favorite show of all time will come on, but in the episode, all the characters will be heart-wrenchingly killed. Number two, you will see a picture of your least favorite person or thing ever. This is where you use a firearm or other weapon. Break the TV with the weapon. It will then fix itself. Note, this obviously is the easiest of the three things. Or three, a strange, shimmery vortex will surround you, and you will be pulled into an alternate dimension. If option three occurs, there is a whole other set of instructions on what to do when you're in the other dimension. It will be a twisted replica of your house, and there will be beings there that won't want you to leave. All the same though, I'll leave those details aside for now because should you be successful, all three lead to the final result, having access to Channel Infinity. Quote, After this, you will reach Channel Infinity. What you do now is up to you. If you go to the Guide function, you will see shows listed such as The Meaning of Life, How to Acquire True Love, Choose one. Note, the more people you have outside the door with you determines the revelations that are the shows. The more people, the better chance you have of seeing shows with more life-changing results. Or if you keep watching the static without going to the guide or breaking eye contact with the television, you will see a series of images that will, if deciphered, reveal the answer to your greatest question. There are, at this point, many options. Too many to write here. Just do what you feel like you must, and something will happen. The overwhelming majority of things will be good, but some will be bad. You may leave the room at any point. However, there are two catches. You may never speak of what you learned after accessing Channel Infinity, and you may only reach Channel Infinity four times in your life. I hope that you find the experience enlightening." Unquote. And that's Channel Infinity. Like I've said, I'm kind of a sucker for these ritual-based ones, and this one's pretty good, mainly because there is a reward for successfully performing the ritual, which I think adds to it a great deal. Uh, but there is another ritual that I'd like to also give a spotlight as well, one that I remember was all the rage when it first started circulating. Bonus entry, One Man Hide and Seek. For this one, I'll quickly read it in full. 
Playing hide and seek alone is quite popular in various parts of Asia. Those who have tried it report that it actually works and that they felt their lives were threatened. You will need the following things. A doll of legs. The doll serves as a place for the spirit to enter. Therefore, it is advised that you do not use a human doll or a doll that you really like because there will be a great chance that the spirit will not leave the doll. Rice. The spirit that eats this offering is said to grow stronger. Red thread. This symbolizes blood and acts of restraint. Something from your body. Fingernails are the most commonly used, but some have also used their own blood, skin, hair, etc. Do not use someone else's body parts, though, or else it will become a curse. A weapon. Something to stab the doll with so that you can anger it. Real knives are dangerous, so most people use pencils or needles. Salt water or alcohol. Without this, the game won't end. This material is used to get rid of the spirit. Hiding place. And finally, a name. Giving the spirit a name is the most powerful thing a human can give it. Names give spirits great power. Step one, cut the doll and replace its insides with rice. Step two, place something from your body into the doll. Step three, wrap the doll with the red thread as if to hinder it. Step four, in a bathroom, pour water into a large wash basin and find some place to hide. Step five, place a cup of salt water in the place before starting the game. Now here's how to play. Step one, start at 3 a.m because that is the time when spirits are most active. Step two, give the doll a name. Step three, when the clock strikes three, close your eyes and say, first tagger is doll's name, three times. If you're talking to the doll, you must talk sternly. Step four, go to the bathroom and place the doll into the wash basin. Step five, turn off all the lights. Step six, close your eyes and count to 10. Ready your weapon and head to the bathroom. Go to the doll and say, I found you, doll's name, and stab the doll. Afterward, close your eyes again and say, now doll's name is it, three times. Step seven, place the weapon next to the doll and go to your hiding place. You must lock the door as well, as well as all other doors and windows. Step eight, drink the salt water, but do not swallow or spit it out. The salt water will protect you from the spirit. To end the game, take any leftover salt water or alcohol and find the doll. Keep in mind that the doll may not be in the bathroom and there have been instances of being outside. When you find the doll, spray the salt water in your mouth on the doll and do the same with the excess water you have left. Close your eyes and shout, I win, I win, I win. The spirit in the doll will give up and then the game ends. It is advised to dispose of the doll by burning it afterward. Here are some important notes. Keep the game under two hours. After two hours, the spirit in the doll will be too strong to be removed. You must play alone. The more people there are, the higher chance of someone getting possessed. Do not go outside. When you're hiding, be silent. Turn off all electronics before starting. When running away, do not look back. Also, don't fall asleep while playing. The doll might stab you. When discovered by the doll, you can get a small wound or even get possessed. If found by the doll, be careful because your weapon will be somewhere on the floor or in your pocket. After the game is over, it is important to clean up properly. Be sure to put salt in every corner of the house, especially places where you put the doll and where you found it. Salt is said to scare spirits away. People who have played have reported some of the following events that usually take place while playing. TV channels changing on their own, perfectly normal lights flickering, doors opening and closing, as well as hearing the sound of laughter." Unquote. And that's how you play One Man Hide and Seek. And while the idea is already creepy enough, imagine actually playing it. Though, I have no idea why the fuck you would ever play it because, I mean, yeah, it just sounds like a bad time. I mean, it's not going to work, obviously, but still, theoretically, it would be kind of a bad time. That reminds me, though, does anyone remember a channel by the name of Lupus Creepus? I used to love watching that guy's videos, primarily his series called Will It Kill Me, where he and his friends would basically try out all these rituals a few times. Of course, the whole problem with the show is that nothing ever happened because, you know, well, 
all this stuff is fake. But like I said, I have a soft spot for this kind of stuff, and be it with friends or watching a group of friends fuck around with these creepypastas, it's kind of got a comfy vibe to it, you know? But at any rate, it is now time for another Adult Swim related creepypasta. Turn the Crank. This one starts with the following paragraph. Quote, have you ever wondered why certain shows were off limits to you as a child? Probably because of swearing, sexual content, the occasional use of the word penis, right? Well, that is true, but there's a deeper layer than that. For me, anyway. Unquote. From this point on, our narrator begins reminiscing about how when he was about six years old or so, he would be fascinated with all the adult cartoon blocks on TV, uh, primarily because his mom would always tell him to not watch them, which only made him want to watch it all the more. It was a uh, forbidden fruit of sorts. Something which may scare him, something adults and cool bigger kids watched, and so he tried whenever he could to watch those late night blocks when he was sure his mom wouldn't be able to catch him. His dad on the other hand didn't really care what his son watched, and at times he would just allow him to watch stuff like South Park alongside him. Which, while they did freak him out from time to time, he enjoyed the experience of immensely. This all leads into the night when our narrator saw something. He was there with his dad, who was already fast asleep, while Adult Swim's normal block played on. Our narrator then describes the TV cutting from the show and transitioning to a black screen. He awaited the normal Adult Swim logo to appear on the screen, but for a while, there was nothing but still blackness. Then an unfamiliar logo appeared on the screen before fading into black and the THX sound effect began to rise and eventually blare through the TV, something which he surprised didn't wake up his dad at the time. Quotes, we now present our feature presentation. A man boomed, sounding a lot like the person that narrates over movies in the theater. You know, the man who tells you to shut off your cell phone and buy loads of popcorn and candy. Instantly, I felt tons better. I figured that this was all just how Adult Swim presented their movies. And after a day of watching nothing but Disney, I was excited to see the show and movies all my first grade friends got to watch. The only thing I could think of about was bragging to my friends that I had seen an adult movie on the Forbidden Channel." Unquote. What proceeds was a strange sort of film, a little blood droplets falling from a darkened sky. The blood rain was washing the purple hair color from a young woman. The woman's eyes were pitch black slits, resembling that of an electrical outlet, with thin, black little stick figure limbs. An eerie piano music droned on in the background as the camera pans to a window and eventually leads inside the glass, and there sat a fat Santa Claus looking character with a long white beard, blue glass-like eyes, and rosy red cheeks. He sat next to an out-of-proportion record player, which seemed to be playing funeral music. Quote, turn the crank. Turn the crank. He suddenly sputtered as the camera zoomed onto his hand, turning the crank. The motions were agonizingly slow, forcing me to really feel the stillness of the moment. Turn the crank. Turn the crank. I was beginning to feel less thrilled and more anxious now. I took a moment to slide closer to the couch where my dad was fast asleep, completely oblivious to the content on the television. While I slid, a long cracking sound was heard. It dragged on for what felt like a lifetime, growing louder and louder as it continued. I turned back to the screen when the sound caught my attention. The crank that the unnamed character was turning was being wound tighter and tighter, straining the gorgeous wooden base. The base began to reveal tiny cracks as the crank turned. The cracks grew larger, the sound grew louder, and the crank grew weaker. Turn the crank. Turn the crank, the cherry man shouted with a creepy, joyful voice. I could only assume he had a smile on his face, but the only thing the camera would show was the record player slowly collapsing upon itself. Turn the crank! Turn the crank! My eyes were beginning to fill with tears. I remember how loud noises would always upset me when I was younger. I was an odd child, 
Neither silence nor noise pleased me. If it was too silent, I would be scared. If it was too noisy, I'd be equally scared. Unfortunately for me, this movie had already manipulated both of those childhood fears. My teary eyes widened as the next scene of the movie took place. The beautiful record player finally gave out the crank breaking apart into the jolly man's hand. The remaining bits of the record player began to sputter a violent amount of smoke, which surprisingly only hovered around the player, leaving every other inch of the room untouched. No more must I turn the crank. The man whispered, the camera focusing on his face, and his face alone. His cherry-colored cheeks were growing pale, and his glimmering eyes began to lose their luster. Suddenly, those once sparkling blue eyes shattered, shards of glass falling to the floor. I was surprised that they didn't fling into the screen. They just sort of fell from the man's eye sockets. I later figured out that the rain at the start of the film had actually been the glass falling from his face. The Lonesome Girl has finally sank. The screen cut to an abrupt moment of darkness, but only long enough to fade into the next scene. There was another bird eyes view of the street where the female character had been walking at the beginning of the film. There were shards of glass completely coating the street below. All you could see were the very tops of some of the buildings, which were all tinted with a very rusty shade of crimson because of the massive amount of broken glass. The camera began to lower the view, zooming in by showing choppy cut frames, each one closer to the mess than the last. As the last frame was presented, I could see the outlet-like character from the beginning laying motionless in the midst of the glassy sea. The shards that surrounded her body were a pale shade of purple, obviously caused from the color that had completely drained from her hair. By this point, I was bawling my eyes out. I may have been young, but I knew what a dead person looked like. I knew for sure that girl was dead. No one could survive being pelted by so much enormous amounts of glass like that. The scene changed at that point, showing a close-up of an hourglass. The camera was slowly, gently, pulling away from the hourglass, which had grains of sand sliding through its midsection. It kind of reminded me of that soap opera, Days of Our Lives. I'm sure you soap junkies know what I'm talking about. Only it was much more grim and against a colorless background. She's perfectly fine. Now don't you fret. Thanks for watching my show, kids. But you're not out of hell yet, unquote. Our narrator let out a terrible scream after that last line, which happened to wake his father up. He then proceeded to sleep in his mom's bed that night, and the next morning he overheard his mom scolding his dad over letting him watch adult cartoons at night. Our narrator ends the story noting how he has, of course, seen far worse, a more creepy, disturbing stuff in his life, and in shows and the like since then. But at the time, that short film really affected him, and to this day he's never really been able to find it though there is another part of the story. See, when he initially woke his dad up that night, his dad's elbow hit the TV remote, and it switched to, funnily enough, Adult Swim. The TV hadn't been on Adult Swim at all that night, and what's more is when his dad apologized and changed the channel. The channel that he had been watching up until now, now only showed programming not authorized. Please confirm that you are subscribed to the channel or unplug your receiver to resolve the issue. If you continue to see this error, please contact your cable provider. We apologize for any inconvenience. Our narrators wonder to this day how he was able to watch that film and who made it. Who did the voices and if anyone else has ever seen it. And that's the tale of Turner Crank. And I quite like this one a lot. I already mentioned how I enjoy watching Adult Swim late at night as a kid. And while I obviously never encountered such a thing, it's something I can almost imagine dreaming up in the days of the night as you slowly fall asleep to the sound of Adult Swim. It's also pretty simple and not at all over the top and just mysterious enough and in the same kind of vibe that weird dark Adult Swim experimental stuff was that it almost seems believable. Like, this does sound like something that would be on Adult Swim as like a 15 minute short at like 4 o'clock in the morning. And again, I find it much more 
relatable and even scarier whenever the author acknowledges that yes, there are other things they've seen that are probably scarier than this thing. This thing didn't change their whole life or make them want to take their life or whatever, you know, uh, but it was something that sticks out in their brain. And those are the types of memories that I think we all have a few of those that we try to think, was that real or was that a dream or something in between? Overall, a great and seriously underrated creepypasta. Well guys, it looks like it's that time again. Time for the Jeff the Killer OC bonus round. Yep, that's right. We're going to be knocking out some of the other Jeff the Killer type stories here. Though I promise these ones are at least a little bit more interesting and different from the uh, typical ones. For the most part, anyway. In fact, two of these are just straight up sequels slash spin-offs of Jeff the Killer. But while the rest of these are just bonus entries that I wanted to get to, uh, this first one is actually on the iceberg and it goes by the title of Liars. So this one, like so many on this tier, is yet again short and simple. The story follows this cool, confident guy named Jimmy, who has a tendency to maybe be a little too honest. He doesn't pull his punches, and he doesn't expect others to do the same with him. Some people love him for this reason, while others, well, don't take too kindly to his mouth. All the same, he ended up saying something about someone's mom being a MILF, but this time he pissed off this psychopath of a kid who decided to gather up his friends to teach Jimmy a lesson. Uh, by throwing formic acid on the guy's face, he screamed in pain and the bullies acted as if he did this to himself on accident, lying to everyone while Jimmy couldn't say a word. Well then, after Jimmy recovered in the hospital, only having sight from one eye now, his face completely ruined, he decides to get revenge on the bullies by kidnapping them torturing them, carving liars into their backs, and of course, finishing them off with formic acid. That's pretty much the whole story. It's not bad, uh, not the best ever, uh, but sort of a concentrated version of one of these types of stories. Honestly, the most memorable part of the story though is this picture that came from it. It seems to be a frame from this particular video from other people's research that I've come across, in case you were wondering. But all the same, it's an unnerving picture that captures that uh, Jeff the Killer vibe, for lack of a better term. I also do like the theming here with him being this guy who tells the truth all the time and the enemies who ruins his life are a bunch of liars. It's simple but effective. Jeff versus Jane the Killer. That's right, somebody actually decided to write the big old payoff to the whole Jane the Killer after uh, Jeff the Killer thing. Now what's interesting about this one is while it's written by user uh, Logo Mausoleum, it's most well known for being scripted and adapted to audio by Mr. Creepypasta himself, with a whole cast of other Creepypasta related YouTubers at the time voicing different characters. It's by far not only one of his most popular videos, but I think also helped boost Jane the Killer's popularity up by proxy. It's also one of the longer pastas of its kind, and at first it sort of seems like a direct sequel to of the original Jeff the Killer story. With it now being 10 years later, Jeff still very much being the unstoppable emo boy killer, unstoppable force that he once was. However, through a series of events, he finds himself back in his old hometown, the place where it all started. He thinks back to how it was all started by those bullies, that it was their fault for making him into what he is today. And then he enters his old home, surprised when there are parts of the house that still have electricity. It's then that he starts seeing ghostly figures of his mom and dad, his mom a loving and forgiving figure, his father vengeful and angry. He then sees his brother before his very eyes, Louie, who is somehow alive, with a whole story as to how he managed to survive Jeff's original stabbing. He seems to forgive his brother though, it's not clear at this point if this is all in uh, Jeff's mind or what the hell is going on though. Then later, Jeff is at a dive bar, I'm gonna assume hiding his face in some way, when a prostitute comes up to him and offers a night of fun for 50 bucks. Jeff is hungry. I mean, not for that, but for blood. So he agrees. After the two of them go at it, Jeff is then quietly preparing to grab his knife and kill that prostitute, when he suddenly feels queasy and falls asleep. When he wakes back up, he's back in his old house again, but can't tell if 
it was all just a dream or not, or what the fuck just happened. But that thirst for blood is still very much in need of being quenched. So then we get an extended slasher movie scene, where we have a babysitter slowly getting stalked by Jeff the killer, as he breaks into the house of the baby she's watching. She hides away, but forgets to grab the baby. She calls 911, and all the while, Jeff is stalking through the dark house. He finds the crying baby, but seems saddened by the sight of it, and decides not to kill him. A pair of police eventually get there, but are promptly killed off by Jeff, and then the babysitter is also too brutally killed. Skipping ahead, this is when it all eventually leads into Jeff being knocked out uh, by what he thinks is his brother, but is actually, in fact, Jane the Killer, who I guess in between all this time made a deal with the devil so that she can have the power to shapeshift. She was his brother, his mother, the father of the police investigator, which was a whole other scene that I didn't get into, but it's not that important, as well as the hooker from before, which means Jeff the Killer had sex with Jane the Killer. I guess Jane wanted that Jeff the Killer action after all. Well, anyway, she caught him and begins telling him how much he's longed for this day and that he ruined her life, which makes Jeff laugh as he seems to genuinely not remember who the hell she is. She then begins stabbing him and tearing at the skin on his face before he is able to slip out of his binds and starts beating the shit out of Jane, including putting her hand in a vice so tight that it basically destroys that hand and wrist. The two of them fight for a while before the house they are fighting in catches on fire, and Jeff sees the visage of all his family members from heaven, and they are all happy, and then they all pull out knives and start stabbing Jeff till he seems like he's dead. The story then finally ends with the two of them in a morgue. Jeff is presumed dead, though he then moves his eyes, so no, I guess he's not really dead. While Jane is actually 100% dead, and the cause of her death was apparently, and get ready for this one, childbirth. The end. Now obviously I skipped around a lot to summarize the story, uh, but in short, it's kind of a fun, if nonsensical story, mainly on Jane the Killer's part in particular. Like all the Jeff the Killer related stuff seems mostly like stuff that he would do, uh, but the question must be asked, why did Jane wait so long to knock him out and try to kill him? She pretended to be his parents and brother and taunt him, I get that, but then she proceeds to pretend to be a prostitute. She knows he's gonna try to kill her at this point. She seems to have drugged him. Why didn't she lock him up at that point and kill him? Like, he was right there. Also, why did she have sex with him? Like, she died of pregnancy. Jeff has a kid now. What the fuck? But yeah, she didn't kill him then, and so then, he was able to kill three more people right after that. And only then does she capture him. But even then, Jane is still such a stupid bitch, because she had him locked up, torture tools at the ready, and somehow, she ended up being the one dying in this exchange. Why didn't she just cut his fucking head off? Blow him up to smithereens, I don't know, whatever you want to do. She didn't even kill Jeff the Killer and died giving birth to his son, who we all know is going to be just as evil as him because of how creepy pastas work. She made a deal with the devil to have the ability to shapeshift and utilizes it almost completely uselessly. She did it for no fucking reason. Have fun burning in hell for all eternity, dumbass. That said, I still enjoy the story in the same way I have a soft spot for all of these uh, cringe Jeff the Killer shit. And to be fair, it did kind of feel like a natural conclusion to the tale of Jeff and Jane the Killer, warts and all. It would be jarring for it to be exceptionally good at this point after all. Uh, but I hear you saying, uh, Jeff versus Jane. Nah man, I want to see Jeff fight someone who isn't a dumbass. I want to see Jeff up against something crazy. Something like, like Jeff the Killer versus Slenderman. Yes, this really does exist. It's a fair bit shorter than Jeff v Jane as well. Uh, but before we get into it, can we um can we just address something real quick? Obviously, it can depend on the version that you're referring to. But in general, I'd say that Jeff fighting Slenderman is one of the most one-sided fight ideas that you could possibly come up with in the creepypasta scene. Slenderman is 
akin to a Lovecraftian god, unknowable, seemingly unstoppable, versus a young guy with a knife. Maybe you can attribute resilient young guy with a knife, but that's about it. It's like, who would win? Cthulhu or Ghostface? Like, come on, it's just not even fair. That said, obviously at this point, it's pretty clear that Jeff the Killer's portrayal in these types of stories is a lot closer to a, a slasher villain like Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers. So I can suspend my disbelief enough to say, okay, so Jeff is like basically immortal then, right? Nothing can stop him. So I guess he might really be a decent fight against Slenderman, maybe? See, then the problem kind of becomes Slender Man, or at least some versions of Slender Man, uh, tend to make people into proxies or something of the sort. Basically, his unstoppable little minions. It kind of seems like if Slender Man came in contact with Jeff the Killer, he'd probably try to make him his new proxy and a really damn powerful one at that. I'm not really sure what the motivation for the Slender Man fighting Jeff would really be. That said, the actual story itself is pretty much just Jeff walks into his hometown, uh, similar to the other story that we just read. He then ends up going into the woods and Slender Man starts stalking him uh, for some reason. The two then eventually throw blows, Jeff being thrown around like a rag doll by Slender Man's tentacles and which gets Jeff the killer to say, and I swear I'm not making this up, is that all you got? I've suffered worse beatings from my dad's belt, which is, like, the most unbadass thing someone who's young writing this thought was a badass thing to say ever. Jeff then gets all cut up, but through the power of insanity is able to hold his ground, and even cuts off one of Slender Man's arms at one point. Which begs the question, if you can just cut off Slender Man's arms, if, you, if, it's, like, if it's that easy, um, can he be defeated by a gun, you know? Uh, has anyone tried a gun on Slender Man? You know, just once. I know most creepypastas and scary stories would be over far quicker if uh, the person in danger just simply had a gun to handle the situation. But that said, we're talking about Jeff the Killer. You know, how come none of these the killers ever just have a gun once in a while? Surely this would be a useful tool for someone in your trade, yes? Well, at any rate, eventually through a long fight scene, a Jeff is impaled on a tree ranch. Lol, and accidentally lights the fucking woods on fire, which gives Slender Man plenty of time to escape and watch as Jeff screams in terror, his fate surely sealed. Slender Man obviously winning in this fight. Well, except Jeff didn't actually die here either. He's back up a scene later, only a new burn on his face, seemingly being the only real damage seemed to have gotten from that. And then he then proceeds to kill a stupid couple that walked into the burned woods. The end. Like I said, pretty short, but I suppose it does deliver about what you're expecting out of it. Slender Man vs. Jeff the Killer do have an extended fight scene. One of them does in fact win. I suppose it's kind of similar to uh, Freddy vs. Jason Voorhees, you know? You kind of know what you're coming into the story for, so I suppose all things considered, it's okay. But certainly nothing to write home about. The Bloody Painter. Finally ending this Jeff the Killer related marathon off, we have one that's gotten more and more popular as time has gone on, and one that many consider to be much better than the others of its kind. Written by Delucat, this story is in three pieces, the first of which being written back in 2013 and follows the story of a 14 year old boy named Helen who likes drawing in his notebook. He minds his own business as one of his classmates, Tom, is bullied in the classroom. And he, so too, minds his own business when later on during recess, a girl named Judy says that she's missing her watch and some big kid named Ben goes and nabs it out of Helen's bag. He says it wasn't him who stole it and that he doesn't know how it got there, but that didn't help at all. And the next day, as he's walking into the classroom, he hears whispers from his classmates about how he's a filthy thief and what have you. This eventually turns on into full-on bullying, as he is now the new target of ridicule. And they tear up his art book, and when he tries to fight back, they beat him up some more, leaving him beaten and bruised. When his teachers and parents ask where he got the marks, he tells them they got it from a bad fall, not wanting to incur an even worse fate for narking. He gets ridiculed, hurt, 
and humiliated for weeks after that. And it all was becoming sort of his new norm. His life was utterly miserable until he gets a Facebook message from none other than Tom, both relating with one another being the targets of bullying. The two of them become good friends for a while. One night, Tom tells Helen to meet him on top of the school rooftop that he has something to tell him. It's here that Tom reveals that it was him who stole that watch and put it into Helen's bag to begin with, that he had been bullied for so long that he needed any way for someone else to be their target instead. This eventually leads to the two of them arguing and then suddenly Tom fell backwards and off of the roof. Helen was stunned, the sound of Tom's body hitting the pavement echoing in his mind as the police would come to question Helen. With both of them and many of the school assuming Tom committed exit the game, though there were those that thought Helen might have pushed Tom off as well. That night, Helen cried for hours. The guilt was too much to bear until a thought entered his mind that it wasn't his fault. And furthermore, Tom was a bad person a piece of shit that got what he deserved. And that maybe, maybe it's time others got what they deserved as well. This leads into Helen donning a mask and going to kill Judy and her friend Maggie and everyone else in the school dorm for that matter. Quote, that night, all the students who were in the dorm were murdered. No one knows how that killer did it. The murderer used the victim's blood to paint on the walls of the dorm, with most of the paintings being smiley faces. Many of the corpses were being chopped and mashed, possibly to get their pigments. Helen Otis, the culprit, is still missing currently." Unquote. And that's pretty much the story of the original Bloody Painter. This one's kind of strange because for a while the story was actually pretty good, all things considered. I like that he gets bullied and doesn't immediately reach from within to overpower them. I like how it's sort of left a little ambiguous if he really meant to push Tom off the roof or if it was an accident, or maybe a little bit of both. But then when he goes and kills an entire dorm full of people without anyone hearing the screams, overpowers them all, paints the walls with their blood, it feels like we kind of jumped so far it collectively pulled everyone's back out of shape. I think it might have worked a little bit better if he only killed a couple of people and left it at that. Then again, if it was more realistic and he had a gun, maybe it would kind of make sense. But then it also asks the question, how did no one hear it? You know, wh where was everybody? How did he manage to do that much damage and everyone in the dorm? No one was able to escape. It's, it's something that needs some explanation to say the least. I do like, however, that the story does acknowledge how no one knows how he managed to pull this off, as if to say, yeah, there's no way this could really happen, but it did. But there are far worse stories of this kind, so besides that, I'd say it's a fair bit better than the others we've read like this so far. All the same though, the next part of this story is titled Bloody Painter on the Snow, which is a short prequel to this one, again created back in 2013. But this one is actually very short and seems to have gone under the radar as well, with most big creepypasta channels never even having read this one. The story takes place back whenever Helen was only 10 years old, and he has a friend named Phil who has an abusive father. Well, to make a short story even shorter, it's a snowy day and some bullies are teasing Phil. They throw a snowball at him, but this one has a rock in it and it bashes over Phil's head and he dies right then and there. The bullies try to cover it up by covering him in snow, but then later when Helen is looking for his friend, he finds his corpse out in the blood-soaked snow. The bullies then try to pin the blame on Helen. When the police get involved and then all the kids at school and in the area thinks Helen is a murderer, eventually an eyewitness comes out and testifies that it was the bullies that did it and not Helen. Helen's mom was happy about this and of course asks if Helen would like to go meet the boy who saved his life from prison so that they may become new friends. But Helen is done having friends it seems. He's still in pain from losing Phil and so instead he goes into the comfort of drawing in his books. The eyewitness, however, was actually Tom from the first story. And that's the story. And honestly, it's very, very simple. Uh, but the whole twist of the eyewitness being Tom, who would later, four years later in fact, try to pin the blame 
name of a stolen watch on Helen seems kind of like a weak way of connecting it to the first story when actually I sort of like the whole theme of Helen being blamed for things that he didn't actually do as a connecting piece instead. It's already there but the Tom twist kind of deflates that a bit. But with that said, we have one more Bloody Painter story to read. This one being made in 2017 and seems to be the story the author pushes towards the forefront, with it being the longest of the three, it being called the original story, and the others now being called prequels, which is a little bit confusing and it's not how that works, but whatever. And this one also has an animatic version on Delucat's YouTube channel, which all the footage in the background obviously is from that. So all things considered, this is like one of the highest production value creepypastas that I've ever seen from an individual before going in. But is it any good? Well, yeah. Yeah, this one's actually pretty good. The story follows the events after the killing spree Helen went on in the school dorms. And he's now in a psych ward, but seems to be very quiet and doesn't remember what happened that night. His doctor slowly gets more info out of him over a few years, however, and learns more about Helen's past, like why his name is Helen. You see, his parents had a hard time conceiving a child, and they really wanted a girl. So when they had a newborn baby boy, they decided to raise him as a little girl, fucking with his brain from a young age until they suddenly made him dress like a boy when he started going to school out of fear of what others might think of them, realizing their mistake, I suppose. This further adds to the narrative that Helen always is being gaslit, pinned down as someone that he's not, a thief, a murderer, even a girl. His life is full of this sort of stuff, it would seem. Well, eventually the doctor and Helen grow rather close, almost like friends, and Helen was always on his best behavior, stayed out of trouble, and eventually the doctor almost saw Helen as a sort of son that he never had, and he guided him towards rehabilitation. Though the mystery of what happened that night in the dorm stayed a mystery. With the high body count of 17, many wondered if it was even possible for one boy to do all of that, and this actually helped in his case of being released later on, which I thought was rather clever since that was one of the most unrealistic aspects of the original story. It's now being turned on its head, the illogical now being looked through a logical lens. A few years pass and Helen is now a functioning member of society, dressed in a nice suit, a gentleman all things considered, and the doctor couldn't be more proud. Well, that is until 2003, October. There, some missing persons cases with no connecting pieces to them. That was until it was discovered that all the victims were all in the same class with Helen Otis before he entered the hospital. His house was searched and the police were quickly met with dead bodies, upside down corpses facing them like a butcher shop. But each was also connected to a canvas with paintings made of their own blood. The doctor fell into despair. He couldn't believe that the boy he helped rehabilitate, who seemed like he was truly misunderstood, was nothing but a monster. One that he couldn't, maybe no one, could have helped or can stop now. What's more is there was a letter addressed to him at the crime scene that read as follows. Quote, Dear Doctor, I finally remember what happened that night after I looked at my mask. That night seven years ago, the day before Halloween, I kept fidgeting on my bed, unable to sleep. All of the things that happened to me stung my mind like needles. That time I thought to myself, I had to do something about it. And then it happened. I threw a turned on hair dryer into the public bathtub. There were a lot of people present. I remembered I used a simple fork to dig someone's eyes out. I remembered I ripped someone's head from their neck. <laughs> I attacked everyone who lived in the student dorm. I can't fully remember all the details. I just did what my mind told me to do. When no one was screaming or struggling anymore, peace fell upon me. A peaceful feeling I never felt before. I fell to my well-deserved slumber on a pile of bloody bodies. When I opened my eyes again, I saw you, Doc. You said, that the reason I am here is because I am sick. 
Well, I must be pretty ill for now, but I never felt so peaceful in my life. Maybe I'm better off to be sick like this. You told me that the next time we meet is on the electric chair. Well, what if it was the other way around? You must know that I have my own way to meet you in person. I'll see you soon. Unquote. It was then that the doctor knew he was never his friend. He was his prey, playing with his food, even in the hospital. It's then, after the doctor understands the severity of his situation, he hears his house's door open, his fate ultimately sealed. And that's the story, the whole story, of The Bloody Painter. And overall, I'd say it was one of the best of these killer OC types of stories that I've ever read. Is it perfect? No, but considering the competition, this is actually a pretty fun and a mostly tightly structured story. And while most of these OC killer stories seem to just be weird wish fulfillment, this one actually seems more like a slasher film. Kind of like a combination between Halloween, Sleepaway Camp, and maybe just a little bit of the unusual suspects. Oh, and random fact, did you know that the author of this creepypasta is now a VTuber? So, you know, that's pretty cool I suppose. But with that out of the way, let's get a few more uh, non-killer OC related stories, shall we? The Dating Game I remember this one being quite highly rated at the time when it first came out, and it starts off with the following paragraph. Quote, I've been single for a while, and I was sick and tired of it. Being 32 and single is no laughing matter. The traumatic experiences of watching your friends get married, have children, and attain the American dream are akin to the hopeless depression of the schizophrenic mental patient. I wanted a wife. I wanted kids. I wanted a steady job. I was tired of working at Burger King and living alone in a studio apartment. I was almost certain I memorized 90% of porn stars on the internet by name. Disgusted by the company of my left hand, I decided to go out to one of those speed dating events." Unquote. And so he does just that. And after quite a few misses at the speed dating event, he then meets a special someone. Quote, the woman I met at the next table was the most interesting of all, but not in a bad way. She had long, flowing dark hair and green eyes. She had this cute smile, and man, what a tight body on this one. Black dress, black shoes, black everything. For someone dressed in such a gothic manner, she had such a bubbly personality. Everything I said made her giggle, and I felt like a king just talking to this girl. She was 27 and currently unemployed. She was married to a husband before, but he had left her after their two children that died of leukemia. She told me that the cancer was entwined with her lineage, dating back as far as the 18th century. Therefore, in numerous fits of emotional rage, her ex-husband blamed her for giving the children cancer and left. Too pained by the loss of her entire family, she moved to the city a few weeks ago and was living on unemployment. Unable to continue working at her job due to the crippling depression and panic she suffered as a result of her abandonment. Despite the torment of her life, she never seemed depressed about it. Either she was incredibly optimistic at life, or she was one of the best actors I had ever seen. Either way, I was willing to take a shot." Unquote. And so he does just that, and the two end up going on a few dates, their first being at a pool hall, which she seems to be very good at. Every time she giggled, he falls deeper and deeper in love with her. Weeks and months passed on, and after about seven months of dating, our narrator pops the question. She excitingly screamed yes, and the two began to really start their life together, starting with him moving out of his shitty apartment and into her lovely ranch house. But that's when something weird occurred. Quote, As I was moving my final things in, I noticed how much of a mess I was making. With my boxes of stuff and all, I apologized and motioned to the basement to finish moving my things. Her face instantly darted to mine. In a hurried and almost frantic voice, she assured me that she'd take care of the rest of my things, and that I should relax. It was a bit odd, sure, but she had been through so much excruciating sadness throughout her life that her having a psychiatric illness is something I expected. I complied with her request." Unquote. 
After this, another few months pass, and the two have their wedding day and honeymoon. But that damn basement was the only thing. They'd already gotten into a few smaller arguments about it, but it was the only blemish on an otherwise lovely relationship. That is, until, as the narrator puts it, everything he knew about his life shattered. Quote, One day, she told me she was going to the grocery store. I noted that I wanted some ground beef in order to make hamburgers for dinner. She smiled at me with that cute, adorable smile I had grown to know and love and headed out. After climbing Burger King's corporate ladder, I had finally attained the position of regional financial manager for the entire state. I was working on some budget information, assessing the costs of all the franchises across the state. It was a long and arduous process, but I was getting just about six figures for it, so I wasn't complaining. After each report was fully completed and evaluated, I moved the files to a USB drive so I could upload them to a computer for a corporate meeting the next day. To my horror, with only three reports left to finish, the computer crashed. If I didn't finish these reports, I would surely lose my job. I called my wife, asking if she had another computer or something I could use, but she didn't answer. I rummaged through the house to find something to finish these reports with no avail. Desperate times call for desperate measures, so I took a daring risk of approaching the basement. The handle was unusually cold and the door was locked. Frustrated and defeated, I slumped on the couch in a depression. That is, until I realized that there was a specific flower pot that my wife always guarded with her life. On a hunch, I went over to it and found that key at the bottom of the pot, under the dirt. As soon as I opened the door, a rancid and tangible odor attacked me like a falling wall from a decrepit building. The entire basement looked as if it was wasting away. A clear contrast to the rest of the house. The heavy layers of dust upon on every surface suggested that the basement hadn't been accessed in years. Using my cell phone as a flashlight, I guided myself down the stairs and flicked a light switch. Surprisingly, the bulb still worked. The walls looked molded, the wood was breaking down, the stench was putrid, and the entire place was in disarray. I encountered a strong sense of dysphoria after setting foot in the room, so I quickly searched for some old computer with the intent of running upstairs as quickly as as possible. To my luck and astonishment, there was an old laptop and charger in the corner, hidden under some boxes and books. Oddly enough, one of the boxes was one which she brought down after I had first moved in. I had not seen some of this stuff in a long time. Ignoring the nostalgia, I seized the computer and charger and raced up to the master bedroom. After giving the laptop a few minutes to power, I booted it up. It ran on Windows XP and was quite the technological dinosaur compared to modern equipment. But it had Microsoft Office, so it was acceptable. As soon as Windows finished booting up, a system message appeared on the screen, notifying me that new sources had been added to the tagged video cache, and if I'd like to check it. I had never seen a system message like this before. I know that snooping is generally taboo, but curiosity overcame me. I was taken to a hidden file that required a password to access it. Rolling my eyes, I moved the cursor to the X out of the program when suddenly something typed the password in for me. A bit frightened at this point, I was sucked into the screen. There were four videos entitled him.avi, one.avi, two.avi, and y.avi. All four thumbnails were pure black. Curious, I clicked on the file entitled him.avi. I should have never done that." Unquote. What he saw in those videos was purely, simply evil. The first being a man being tortured and eventually killed by her, his own wife. The second being a young boy suffering the same fate and being burned alive. And the third, being a baby. A baby being injected with some sort of acid that slowly melted it all away. The cries from all three videos is enough to have our narrator break down, and in all the videos was this sick, evil giggle that turned into what he could only describe as demonic by the third video. Then, there was the new video, freshly uploaded to the computer. Quote, Shaking, I forced myself to click on y.avi. Before the video played, I noticed that this file was modified within the last hour. Almost blinded by fear, I swallowed my apprehension and opened my eyes. 
Lake. This time, there was just the woman. No other person was present. She was facing away from the camera and was speaking in a demonic tone. I can't recall exactly, but here's a paraphrased transcript of what she said. Hello. Clearly by now, you know that I'm not the person you thought I was. I'm a sick and twisted woman. I love this. It makes me so happy to see somebody die, especially at my hand. I know you're watching this, and I know you're terrified. The ghosts of those things I have killed are swarming around you right now, telling you to pull away from the screen, to save yourself. Yet you still sit there and watch, waiting for some happy ending or reasonable explanation as to the events you have just witnessed. There are no special effects here, what you saw was real. I love watching this footage, even so much as to pleasure myself to it, but I can't hide it. You couldn't know, your lonely piece of shit brain, tell you to turn me in. You were so desperate for love, you fell in love with a serial killer." Unquote. His wife, the love of his life, didn't lose her husband by him abandoning her. She murdered him, and worse, her two children, baby, destroyed mercilessly by their own mother. She then buried their remains under the cement of the basement floor, thus the smell. Before long, it's eventually revealed that she's in the same room with him as he watches the video, and from there, he blacked out. The neighbors heard screams from the house and called the police. He was lucky enough to come out of this whole thing alive. And what's more is his wife received the death penalty when she was tried. She giggled as it apparently took four lethal injections to take her out. She cursed her husband, telling him that he'd have to live his life in fear, for she'll find some way to finish the job before finally dying. The story ends with our narrator doing well for himself, but implying that through some sorcery that she might be alive again and after him or something. And that's the dating game. And while I think the actual last, very, very last part of this of her somehow still being alive is a little bit dumb with her being so hard to kill and maybe coming back somehow, I do think overall the story is quite creepy. Although I suppose it is mostly through shock value and just how fucked up those videos are on her computer. Truly some horrifying imagery is painted through those videos descriptions. But overall it's a pretty good pasta. The Wyoming Incident. Now this one's a little bit to unpack, but to start let's read the very short creepypasta connected with it. Quote, the Wyoming incident, or the Wyoming hijacking, is a lesser known case of television broadcasting, hijacking slash hacking. A hacker managed to interrupt broadcasts from a local programming channel, I believe to serve several smaller communities in the county of Neobarara, and aired his slash her own video. The video contained numerous clips of disembodied human heads showing various emotions and poses. The camera positions changed often, usually every 10 to 15 seconds, and the video was often interrupted by a special presentation announcement. This clip is taken from one of these intervals.
The video is mostly locally well known and would probably not even be that popular if it were not for the effects it had on the few residents who watched it for an extended period of time. Complaints included vomiting, hallucinations, headaches, etc. While some believed it was paranormal, specialists had determined that the cause of these afflictions were frequencies played regularly throughout the broadcast. In this clip, the frequency being played is somewhere between 17 and 19 hertz. This range of frequency, when played for long periods of time, causes eyeballs to subtly vibrate, sometimes inducing visual hallucinations. This video is significant in that it is one of the most recent television hijackings. Such actions were rare even in the 80s. A search for the Chicago Max Headroom incident as an example, and are even more rare today. The hacker has not yet been caught, and all attempts to trace the video have proven futile." Unquote. Now what's interesting about this creepypasta is that it's actually part of an ARG that began back in 2006 and is considered one of the very first horror-based ARGs ever conceived. I talked about this a bit on my YouTube iceberg as well, uh, but it's connected with this video I've been playing in the background. The ARG is well known for being one of the oldest ones as well, over 17 years old at this point in fact, and most of the story associated with it takes place on a forum called The Happy Cube. YouTuber Nightmind has covered this ARG across three rather long videos, and it's a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, but to put it lightly, even if it's a very old ARG, it also seems uh, to lack any real focus and is kind of a fucking mess to try to document in any meaningful way. At any rate though, the original hoax hijacking video remains the most interesting part of this whole ARG in my opinion, as something truly unnerving to watch late at night. But besides the video and, again, the fact that it's 17 years old, uh, there's not really much to talk about here. So, moving on. Gregory's Room. Like the last one, this one isn't really a creepypasta, and more so a video connected with a very interesting channel. I'll play the video quickly in full here since it's only a minute long. Oh, I didn't see you there. Hello, I'm Gregory, and this is my room. We're going to have so much fun together, just the two of us. We can look at the stars together. We can read a book together. We can stare into the glorious flames of the fireplace together. But no matter what we do, it will just be the two of us, alone in this room. Just me and you, no parents, no police, no one can hear you. Embrace me. I need love. Gregory need love. The description to this video reads, quote, The above is a rare clip from the 1999 Nick Jr. pilot titled Gregory's Room. The show was ultimately rejected due to a poor focus group test results, unquote. Now obviously this is fake, but this whole channel, Seinfeld's Spitstain, is pretty well known for some crazy fucking videos, usually connected with Nickelodeon and the series in particular, Jimmy Neutron. Here is a few choice examples. Hello Jimmy, hello you. I am going to make a delicious dinner meal. Jimmy, your mom is dead. Do an order of pizza for dinner. Okay, Danny. 
Hello can I get a large pizza pie for the Nutrin household? Now it is time for father-son bonding. Bond with me Jimmy. Hi, hi. Okay. Uh, no one's more about the outcome. When the fourth round was... Don't you call in? Here's your pizza. The pizza is aggressive. Oh shit. Just another day in the life of Jimmy Nutrin. What's interesting about this channel in particular, besides the odd videos, is that it hasn't uploaded in 7 years. And what's more, is the last video they ever uploaded not only connects all his older videos together in a sort of shared universe of creation, but it also gets extremely meta by showing the supposed creator of the channel, a man in a completely white void, with Pixar rejection letters and failed Nick Jr. pilots surrounding his desk. The video that he created in the video was a screwdriver destroying all his channel's past creations, from Gregory to Jimmy Nutron and so on. And then a message comes up on his computer screen that says, quit while you're ahead. And then, well, he does, and he ends himself, only then to be picked up and carried away by God, or uh, Hugh from Jimmy Neutron. Free of his pain and failures, his desk full of his creations left behind. We then see a picture of Jerry Seinfeld, all while the song titled Summer Teeth by Wilco plays in the background. A song about living all alone, a man going to work so he can eat, and then one day die. And there are also lyrics about committing exit the game of life in the summer as well. Now, some have actually come to think that the creator of this channel made this video not only as a final look behind the curtain and goodbye, but as sort of an ending of life message, if you catch my drift. While anything is possible, and that would truly be tragic, I feel like maybe the video is about a creative man who failed being able to achieve his dreams, at being an animator, or maybe did at one point and was eventually fired, something like that, and was never able to pick up work again. So he turned to YouTube to create these sort of jokes, shit post type animations, and they got him very popular and earned him a very sizable audience but he still wasn't happy, and so decides to stop while he's ahead, leaving that channel there as an immortal legacy while he moves on to the next era of his life, killing the channel in the burst of one last creation. But who knows for sure? It's really hard to say, but it definitely is a very interesting video to end the channel out on, and is a channel in general that I'd highly recommend you go give a watch sometime if you haven't already. And finally, for our final story this tier, quote, Man and girl go out to drive under moonlight. They stop at on at a side of road. He turns to his girl and say, Baby, I love you very much. What is it, honey? Our car is broken down. I think the engine is broken. I'll walk and get some more fuel. Okay, I'll stay here and look after our stereo. There have been news report of steris being stolen. 
good idea. Keep the doors locked no matter what. I love you, sweaty. So the guy left to get full for the car. After two hours, the girls say, where is my baby? He is supposed to be back by now. Then the girl hear a scratching sound and a voice say, let me in. The girl doesn't do it and then after a while she goes to sleep. The next morning, she wakes up and finds her boyfriend still not there. She gets out to check and... Man, door, hand, hook, car, door, unquote. Okay, so, um, you know, obviously that was another meme creepypasta. And while it truly is a literary masterpiece, let's do one more serious pasta this tier. Tulpa. Ending this tier out, we have one more bonus entry, and one of my favorites at that. Tulpa begins with the following, quote, Last year, I spent six months participating in what I was told was a psychological experiment. I found an ad in my local paper looking for imaginative people looking to make good money, and since it was the only ad that week that I was remotely qualified for. I gave them a call and we arranged an interview. They told me all I would have to do is stay in a room, alone with sensors attached to my head to read my brain activity. And while I was there, I would visualize a double of myself. They called it my tulpa. It seemed easy enough and I agreed to do it as soon as they told me how much I would be paid. And the next day I began. They brought me to a simple room and gave me a bed then attach sensors to my head and hook them into a little black box on the table beside me. They talked me through the process of visualizing my double again and explained that if I got bored or restless, instead of moving around, I should visualize my double moving around or try to interact with him and so on. The idea was to keep him with me the entire time I was in the room." Unquote. From there, our protagonist tries his best to imagine his double, but has a hard time keeping focused on having him there for very long, up until the fourth day when he's finally able to keep him present for the whole six hours. By the second week, they gave him a different room, with wall-mounted speakers that would play discordant, ugly, and unsettling music and sounds to see if he can manage to keep focused on the tulpa being around despite the distracting stimuli. He managed to do just that over the next two weeks. Uh, by the time he had been doing this for a month, he started to get bored though. So to liven things up, he actually started interacting with his doppelganger. He'd start having conversations with it. Imagine him juggling, play rock, paper, scissors, etc. When he asked if his tomfoolery would have adverse effects on the study, he was instead encouraged to continue doing so. But then, something kind of strange happened. Quote, I was telling him about my first date one day, and he corrected me. I'd said my date was wearing a yellow top, and he told me it was a green one. I thought about it for a second and realized that he was right. It creeped me out, and after my shift that day, I talked to the researchers about it. You're using the thought form to access your subconscious, they explained. You knew on some level that you were wrong, and you subconsciously corrected yourself. What had been creepy was suddenly cool. I was talking to my subconscious. It took some practice, but I found that I could question my tulpa and access all sorts of memories. I could make it quote whole pages of books I once read, years before, or things I was taught and immediately forgot in high school. It was awesome. That was around the time I started calling up my double outside of the research center. Not often at first, but I was so used to imagining him by now that it almost seemed odd to not see him. So, whenever I was bored, I'd visualize my double. Eventually, I started doing it almost all the time. It was amusing to take him along like an invisible friend. I imagined him when I was hanging out with my friends or visiting my mom. I even brought him along on a date once. I didn't need to speak aloud to him. So, I was able to carry out full conversations with him and no one was the wiser. I know that sounds strange, but it was fun. Not only was he a walking repository of everything I knew and everything I had forgotten, he also seemed more in touch with me than I did at times. 
He had an uncanny grasp of the minutia of body language that I didn't even realize I was picking up on. For example, I thought the date I brought him along long was going badly, but he pointed out how she was laughing a little too hard at my jokes and leaning towards me as I spoke, and a bunch of other subtle cues I wasn't consciously picking up on. I listened and, well, let's just say that date went very well." Unquote. Our protagonist goes on to note that by four months his tulpa was with him everywhere at all times. However, at some point he starts to withdraw from the world a little bit. You see, he was having trouble relating with other people. They all seemed so confused and unsure of themselves, while he had a manifestation of himself to confer with. While others wouldn't understand their own feelings, he understood not only his own, but those around him, or at least his tulpa did. Eventually, this leads to a friend of him confronting him. Quote, he pounded at the door until I answered it, and came in fuming and swearing up a storm. You haven't answered when I called you in fucking weeks, you dick! He yelled. What's your fucking problem? I was about to apologize to him and probably would have offered to hit the bars with him that night, but my tulpa grew suddenly furious. Hit him, it said. Before I knew what I was doing, I had. I heard his nose break. He fell to the floor and came up swinging, and we beat each other up and down my apartment. I was more furious than I had ever been, and I was not merciful. I knocked him to the ground and gave him two savage kicks to the ribs, and that was when he fled, hunched over and sobbing. The police were by a few minutes later, but I told them that he had been the instigator, and since he wasn't around to refute me, they let me off of a warning. My tulpa was grinning the entire time. We spent the night crowing about my victory and sneering over how badly I'd beaten my friend. It wasn't until the next morning when I was checking out my black eye and cut lip in the mirror that I remembered what had set me off. My double was the one who'd grown furious, not me. I'd been feeling guilty and a little ashamed, but he'd goaded me into a vicious fight with a concerned friend. He was present, of course, and knew my thoughts. You don't need him anymore. You don't need anyone else, he told me, and I felt my skin crawl." Unquote. When he tried to explain this to the researchers, they laughed it off, that you can't be scared of something you're imagining, and though he tries to take their words to heart, it's difficult to make his tulpa go away. It's automatic at this point, and he now needs to actively concentrate to make him go away. What's worse is he is slowly changing. His eyes twinkled with mischief. There was malice in his now constant smile. His skin grew ever more ashen, teeth more pointed. That discordant music from before now followed him, as if it were a calling card to his tulpa. He continued to visit the research center for some time. He needed the money after all, but now he was actively trying not to visualize him. He assumed they had no way of knowing he was lying to them now, but he was very wrong. As at one point, he is then grabbed up by two impressive men and injected with something that knocked him out. When he awoke, he was restrained to a bed, and none of the researchers would speak to him, answer any of his questions. They simply force feed him pills and injected him with stuff that made his head feel fuzzy and made the tulpa seemingly ever present. He was now worse than ever before, looking more like a demon than a man. It actively mocked him now played with his head, and at times it seemed like the doctors were actually talking to his tulpa rather than him, almost as if he was the doppelganger, but didn't know if that too was just an illusion, the drugs, the tulpa, or what the hell was going on. The following is the conclusion to this tale, since I think it's best done justice through its own words. Quote, Another thing that I pray was a delusion. He could touch me. More than that, he could hurt me poke and prod at me if he felt I wasn't paying enough attention to him. Once he grabbed my testicles and squeezed until I told him I loved him. Another time he slashed my forearm with one of his talons. I still have a scar. Most days I can convince myself that I injured myself and just hallucinated that he was responsible. Most days. Then one day, while he was telling me a story about how he was going to gut everyone I loved, starting with my sister, he paused. A querulous look crossed his face. 
and reached out and touched my head, like my mother used to do when I was feverish. He stayed still for a long moment and then smiled. All thoughts are creative, he told me. Then he walked out the door. Three hours later, I was given an injection and passed out. I awoke unrestrained, shaking. I made my way to the door and found it unlocked. I walked out into the empty hallway and then ran. I stumbled more than once, but I made it down the stairs and out into the lot behind the building. There, I collapsed, weeping like a child. I knew I had to keep moving, but I couldn't manage it. I got home eventually. I don't remember how. I locked the door and shoved a dresser against it. Took a long shower and slept for a day and a half. Nobody came for me in the night, and nobody came the next day, or the one after that. It was over. I'd spent a week locked in that room, but it felt like a century. I'd withdrawn so much from my life beforehand that nobody had even known I was missing. The police didn't find anything. The research center was empty when they searched it. The paper trail fell apart. The names I'd given them were aliases. Even the money I'd received was apparently untraceable. I recovered as much as one can. I don't leave the house much, and I have panic attacks when I do. I cry a lot. I don't sleep much, and my nightmares are terrible. It's over, I tell myself. I survived. I used the concentration those bastards taught me to convince myself. It works. Sometimes. Not today, though. Three days ago, I got a phone call from my mother. There's been a tragedy. My sister is the latest victim in a spree of killings, the police say. Their perpetrator mugs his victims, then guts them. The funeral was this afternoon. It was as lovely as a service as a funeral can be, I suppose. I was a little distracted, though. All I could hear was music coming from somewhere distant. Discordant, unsettling stuff that sounds like feedback and shrieking and a modem dialing up. I hear it still, a little louder now, unquote. This is it. My friend, we have found the center of the island. The pit o pasta. Now you're probably wondering, what the hell do we do from here? Well, you see there's something I've required for a long time at the very bottom of this molten pasta sauce. Something that means, well, a great deal to me. That's why I'm here. Ask for you. Well, to be honest, I never really asked you why you came along, but I'd hazard to guess you came along for the journey. You probably want me to get back to reading those spooky stories to you out loud. You know, you really are a bit of a weird one, you know that? Well, nonetheless, I'm not judging. You and I are in this together at this point, right? So, let's get our pasta-proof suits on and dive on in. The case of Stitch Case, file number 56. Starting this tier off, we have one that I had never heard of before and honestly thought it was a totally different creepypasta until I noticed it was a, a two and a half hour multi-part pasta. That said, this creepypasta follows two detectives trying to solve a, a spree of extremely gruesome murders where the victim seems to be completely torn apart, as if an animal had gotten to them. The start of this pasta, we see our detectives looking over the photos, journals, and security camera footage. Is here where they start to notice that in each of the three cases, the victim was acting strangely paranoid and seemed to be under the impression that they were being watched. And then, a bombshell. When they're going over the security camera footage, our protagonist sees that the person killing these people isn't human. It just simply looks like a human, but it's haphazardly stitched together. 
It has no eyes and a mouth full of jagged green and black teeth and it moves unnaturally quick and just unnaturally, period. This is when the two detectives start to hear strange noises outside of both of their houses. They begin to both have terrible dreams and at some point, they both seem to come clean that this shit is scaring the fucking hell out of them and move in with one another for the time being. Our protagonist calls the creature Stitch named after the fact that it's covered in stitches. It's a shame all I can think of is this though, but oh well. Anyway, this goes on for a while and the story has a pretty comfy vibe in the beginning. I was thoroughly enjoying it, even if the dialogue could be a bit stilted at times. They eventually realize that this creature has been around for decades all across the world. And the very idea of stopping this thing starts to become more and more self-indulgent. How can they stop something supernatural? Something that has been killing people, toying with them, a demon in every sense of the word for so very long. This is something that they look into as well. And again, I was really enjoying this part of the pasta as well as the detectives try to fit the puzzle pieces together and just what the hell this strange urban legend creature is. Though they never really commit to one particular creature, but it does sound awfully similar to the rake. But all the same, how do these detectives stop this supernatural entity? Well, the answer is, they kind of don't. Now bear in mind, I'm skipping a lot here because so much happens in this story from one of the detectives going missing to the protagonist being accused by the FBI as the main culprit for these murders. Since no one really believes him when he says that some fucking monster named Stitch is killing people. To later the monster actively talking and toying with our protagonists. See, once all the mystery of what is killing people is out there, the story kind of shifts to more of a straight on paranormal hunt pasta, which I thought was an interesting turn of events. After all, you don't often see stories where the detectives or protagonists in general go after the weird creepypasta creature, or at least so much so as to try and kill it anyway. It's usually a lot more about the victims of the beast through happenstance, Though I will say, at about the halfway point of the story, I could tell the author didn't quite know what they wanted to do with the concept they spent several parts establishing, or at the very least was saving some kind of big twist for the end. And by the end, there's this big showdown where our protagonist is in a huge church and Stitch is toying with the protagonist, taunting him for thinking that he can stop the very idea of fear. The creature seemingly having some sort of connection to a biblical demons, but again, never really explained. Explained. He also at one point uses a nun as a marionette doll. Again, it's pretty crazy, but if you're into the supernatural paranormal type stuff, it's still kind of fun. That is, up until the very last part of the pasta. See, the church showdown just ends with our protagonist blacking out and waking up in a hospital. And then, by the next part, he's being taunted by Stitch again. I, as the reader, start to wonder why Stitch doesn't just fucking kill this guy at this point. Maybe he likes watching him suffer, I guess? And then our protagonist can't bear the pain of all the people who have died because he wasn't able to stop this demon, including his partner at this point. So, he kills his other partner because he's scared and he wanted to spare him the fear, I guess. And then he commits exit the game of life. And that's how the story ends. Very anticlimactic. I usually always hate at the end of creepy bosses when the protagonist exits the game of life by their own hand because it's just so done to death. And while it can be done very, very well, don't get me wrong, and leave an extremely haunting final note on the story, I notice this often used when the author kind of runs out of ideas and doesn't know what to do with the story anymore. So they end it this way to cheaply get some sort of last shock value out of the reader. This story had potential and has some decent parts near the start, but ultimately it fumbles the delivery of any of its core ideas in my opinion. However, this story did remind me of a creepypasta that was somewhat popular way back when, which was actually the creepypasta that I thought this creepypasta was at first glance. Titled, No Reserve, I Just 
want it gone. So this one might take a moment to read, but I feel as though to get the full effect, we should read it in full. So let's jump into it. Quote, the following is the actual text from the auction of the Stitch Doll. No reserve, I just want it gone. The following auction is true. I will not be mentioning any names here, as I do not want any of my family or friends to be hounded by people wanting more information. The only one who would know anything other than me would be my fiance anyway. If anyone has questions, they can be asked of me directly. I please ask that no one try to contact my fiance, as she has gone through quite enough with this ordeal. Pictures are at the bottom of the page. Okay. I've come to the last thing I can think of to get rid of this cursed thing, but I'll get to that later. Last summer, my fiance and I were visiting her family in Florida and taking a stop in Disney World. As big fans of the Lilo and Stitch movies, we were interested in buying some Stitch toys. We ended up getting quite a few of all shapes and sizes. We have had no problem with any of them. They're all regular friggin' teddy bears. One, however, has been a problem since day one. That was the one we picked up on our way from Orlando to Daytona Beach. We stopped at a little out of the way place while looking for a restaurant. This place was small and kind of dingy, but they had food and a gift shop, if you could call it that. I wish I could remember what it's called, but the only thing that seems to ring a bell is Leary. Anyway, they had another Stitch toy there, which looked just as good as what we picked up in Disney World, and was a quarter of the price. The person behind the till seemed a little too pleased to be making the sale. And now, now I can see why. We visited my fiance's family and flew back home without any incident. We thought we had just had a normal vacation. We displayed the toys on our TV stand with some other stuffed animals my fiance has collected over the years. Nothing has ever moved them except for when cleaning or dusting, and then they are promptly put back in place. After the new Stitch toys were put up, about once a week we would find one or two of the other stuffed toys on the floor on certain mornings when we would get up. Originally thinking nothing of the fact, we have a dog who we thought maybe bumped the stand, uh, more on him later. We would put the animals back on the stand. This became a semi-regular occurrence until early November when we awoke to a loud slam in the middle of the night. I got my fiance to stay upstairs and crept down to see what was happening. I had a light at the top of the stairs, which meant I could not see clearly into the living room to see what had happened, but I did notice different things scattered on the floor. I turned the light on at the front door and saw the items on the floor were actually all of the stuffed animals, the other stitch toys. The only thing left on our TV stand was the stitch that we had picked up from that store. That would have been enough, but the top of the TV was cracked as well. It looked as though something heavy had been dropped onto it. We still have no idea what happened there. At this point, I knew that there was something wrong with this toy. So right there and there, I threw it in the garbage, in our kitchen cupboard. I put the stuffed animals back as well as I could, and went back up to bed to explain to my fiance why that stitch would not be on the shelf when she got up in the morning. Since I didn't want to scare her, I told her it got ripped open when it fell off the shelf, and I had to throw it away, because it looked too bad to repair. Sleep was hard to come by that night. The next day, I got up early, emptied the garbage, and threw it in the dumpster in the parking lot before leaving for work. Problem solved, or so I thought. Later that morning, I got a call from my fiance asking why I thought it would be funny to joke about throwing one of her stuffed toys away. I explained that I put it in the dumpster that morning, and she asked why it was still on the shelf. Both doors were still locked, and no windows or anything were broken. I left work early. As soon as I got home, I explained to my fiance what had happened, and told her I was getting rid of the toy. I grabbed it and left and drove out to the Safeway that was a few blocks away. I tossed the thing in the dumpster there, and took off for home. Thankfully, that time it didn't come back for four days. The strangest thing is that it was clean. It looked as though it had never left the house 
Trying to dump the stitch in different places on the other side of the city, etc. became a regular thing since no one believed us when we tried to tell the story. There was nothing else we could really do. Thankfully, neither my fiance nor I were seriously hurt at all. The only injury worth mentioning was it had tripped me, as far as I could tell, as I walked down our front steps one day. I didn't notice it there when leaving the house, and I definitely caught my foot on something. When I turned back, it was there. Thank God I had only scraped my knee and palm. Christmas was thankfully quiet in regards to our problem, unfortunately. Right after the new year, the worst came. I had taken the teddy out to the landfill site just outside the city limits and buried it under any debris I could find close by. It had been close to three weeks since we had seen the thing and we were starting to think that the nightmare was finally over. In the early evening on Tuesday, I let our dog outside, just as we normally do all the time. After he had been outside for about 10 minutes, I thought maybe he had found some food or something to eat, as he usually does. I looked outside and saw him laying in the snow, and he wasn't moving. I ran outside and grabbed him and noticed the stitch toy laying beside him. Our dog was breathing, but unconscious. I rushed him inside and called the vet. We were able to take him to the emergency clinic, and after examining him, we were told that they could notice nothing actually wrong with him. It appeared as though he had just passed out, but his blood pressure was extremely high, and he was still having problems breathing. They kept him overnight for observation, which was good because I wanted him kept safe as possible. When we got home, we decided to burn the toy in our fireplace, but we couldn't get it to light. We even tried lighter fluid, but as soon as it touched him, it was completely absorbed. He did not feel damp, and he did not smell of the fluid. If we could not burn it, we would incapacitate it. I grabbed a pair of scissors to cut off each of its arms and legs and head. I then took the six pieces, put them in a garbage bag, tied the top, and put it outside on the front step to get rid of it in the morning. The next morning I went outside to get the stitch and the bag was gone. I could not find it anywhere in our yard or the parking lot. I went back inside and there it was. The toy was back on the TV stand and it looked like it had never been touched. Not a speck of dirt, not a rip or tear on it. I grabbed the toy ran to the car, went downtown, and ran into the first pawn shop I could find. The owner said they did not take used stuffed toys, as they could be dirty. I told him that he could have it for free. I just did not want it. He started to ask why, but I left it on the counter and ran out of the store, and thought maybe if someone else were to buy it, it would stay with them and away from us. February was a great month. Our dog was healthy and my fiance and I were able to sleep peacefully as the stitch was nowhere to be seen. I felt bad that maybe we had put the curse on someone else, but sometimes you have to do what you have to do. Two days ago, it came back. I opened the front door to go to work Monday morning and it was sitting on the front step, facing me. I put it in the house, pinned it under our TV and told my fiance about it and to leave the house as fast as possible. After discussing what to do for a few days, we have decided that we really have no other option than to try and list it on eBay and get it as far away from ourselves as possible. We do not want to send it to someone who is not expecting it, and we want to send it to someone who is asking for it. This is why the opening bid is for one cent and there is no reserve. We just want to get rid of it. Thankfully, it has stayed under the TV up until now, with no real signs of change. I don't want to sound like a wuss, but this bear is the scariest thing I have ever experienced, and I am a horror fanatic. It may look like a regular stuffed toy, but it's evil. Please, if you have children or pets, think twice before bidding. This is not a toy for a child. I cannot say with assurance that you will have the same experiences as us but there is a strong likelihood that you will see what I mean. And I do not want to feel any guilt for harm coming to a child or an animal. We also cannot guarantee that the item will stay with you after you've received it. If it stays as persistent as it has previously, it may try to get back to us. I will not be putting a return address on the package. 
as if when you realize that the item is evil, as I'm sure you will, I do not want you sending it back to us. It will become your responsibility as soon as it enters your possession. The buyer is to pay for shipping in whatever form they would like. I can dismember the item before shipping as well, if you feel safer that way. But I cannot guarantee you will arrive in this form. If you would like the toy shipped without being cut up, I will attempt to immobilize it with either duct tape or rope, or a combination of the two. It is your choice. Payment accepted for this auction is PayPal only. I do this because I do not want the winning buyer to have my address for the same reason listed above. Again, I have to warn that if you have children or pets, please, please think about what you are bidding on. We are not responsible for anything that happens after this item leaves our possession. The pictures below are as follows. There is an image of the stitch, as it is now, trapped under the TV. There is a picture of the top of the TV, where it was damaged previously. The last picture is of an old picture we took after we had finished decorating, showing where the stitch was sitting with the other stuffed toys. It is the second from the right. Serious bidders only please, I do not want to have to keep this for any longer than I have to. Ten days for the auction is already pushing it, but I want it to actually be sold. So I need as many people to see it as possible. If you have less than 20 feedback, please let me know you are serious before bidding. Lastly, if you have any questions, please ask. Thank you. Unquote. So yeah, this was an actual eBay auction. And while obviously you can make up any story you want on eBay, it is also a super cool way of telling a scary story. Once again, using the internet, or in this case, eBay, as a means of telling a scary story. Even attaching an item that I'm assuming you could have actually bought to connect with said scary story. Even if the item is probably just a regular ass stitch toy. Now mind you, it is sort of an old creepy doll tale, and I'm sure that we are all very familiar with. I don't cover it on this iceberg, but it kind of reminds me of the Robert the Doll tale, which again is also based on a supposed true story with an actual doll that you can see. But bear in mind, this was posted all the way back in 2005, and for its time was at the very least a very unique way of sharing this type of story. It's also yet another good showcase for what early creepypastas were all about. These strange stories that almost seem like they could be real. Maybe. Possibly. But of course, are not. But they are at the very least presented in this fashion. The author trying to sell you the tale. But anyway, that's more than enough Stitch related stories for now. Beast in the Night. Sometimes I can hear it pacing around my bed. He's kinda in a hurried motion, as if he had more than two feet. Which he doesn't. I know because sometimes I catch a glimpse of him. He looks a bit anorexic. If he's even human. For all I know, he could have been buff for his kind. If there is any more of his kind, God, I hope not. His mouth is wider than anything I have ever seen. I think he either broke his jaw or has no jaw. Another thing that doesn't help the fact is that his large, gaping hole of a mouth is occupied by two beady eyes with black skin surrounding them. Another thing that I know is that he is blind. I once met his eyes, but he turned as if I wasn't there. I try to meet his eyes a lot, but I get no response. What makes up for his loss of eyesight is his sensitive hearing. Once my cat jumped off the couch, and the beast heard it from my room. He bolted out of my room, and then silent. The next day, my cat was found dead in the backyard. They all thought a coyote or a stray dog had killed it. I could only make out a huge, a 
human-like bite mark under its torso. He had killed it. He had to have. I've never seen anything that could have made a bite so large. All I could say is that the coyote could not have possibly created such a huge bite. Tonight was a different night. I had the sneeze and I did, but the pillow muffled it. I, I didn't think he noticed. He just turned and scratched my closet door. At least, that's what I thought he was doing. After a while, it seemed as if he was writing something. To my amazement, he was. I started freaking out once I lost sight of him in the darkness. The only thing that calmed me was the complete silence. My pupils dilated as I could see in the dark. I saw the corner where he once crept to, and he wasn't there. And then I heard at the foot of my bed a growl like an angered dog's growl. My heart sunk deep into my chest. My heart rate must have slowed down a lot. Even after this, I dare not move. As I crawled slowly, closer to my face, I read his message carved into my closet door. I heard you. <laughs> Necrosis. This is yet another experiment-type creepypasta, this time taking place in the 80s when a group of scientists go to Africa to research a strange new disease that they eventually dub the Wendigo Complex, in which strange spores seem to infect people. Wounds on their body have a bulbous muscle growth over them, and ultimately, they will eventually die. Well, except they don't because then they become the living dead and uh, yeah it's basically a zombie outbreak origin story it's a pretty good one though and eventually finds our very narrator getting infected with the disease with the final few journal notes being his slow descent into madness about it but yeah not much more to say about this one other than it's pretty decent booth world industries so this one's pretty interesting, primarily because it started a whole trend of people calling the number attached to the pasta, and even managed to create several copycat type stories as well. The actual story focuses on our protagonist who is answering a phone call from the plumber, and when he answers the call, a strange chime plays and a woman tells him, quote, Welcome to Booth World Industries. My name is Samantha, and I will be your operator today. Name? Unquote. Our protagonist seems to be rather confused by this, but through a back and forth conversation, he eventually tells them his name and then gives them the name of his ex-girlfriend, Jessica Goodwin. Quote, I could hear clicking of a keyboard on the other end of the phone. It sounded like the woman was pounding the thing with her fists. After a few moments of this, she returned. Jessica Goodwin, she said, remodeling is scheduled for August 21st of 2015. Would you like to reschedule? I was silent on my side of the phone. I could not believe this. Someone had to be playing a prank on me. Who is this? Is this you, Jessica? Are you playing a prank on me? I asked. The woman didn't respond for a long time. I thought that whoever was on the other end of the phone was holding in a laugh. Hello? I asked. Yes or no, sir? The woman asked back. Yes? I said, not understanding what the woman was asking. I have a Tuesday appointment available, will that work? At this point, I thought I was going insane and that it actually was the plumbing company. What about today? I asked. Do you have anything available for today? Normally, we can't arrange for a reschedule on such short notice, but today we had a cancellation. How does three o'clock work for you? Three o'clock is fine, I said. Three o'clock it is then. Would you like a courtesy call? Sure. Wonderful. We at Booth World Industries say thanks and welcome to the club. You have a marvelous day. That strange chord played twice again and then the line went dead. I rolled my eyes and went back to unpacking. My phone rang at three o'clock on the dot that afternoon. Hello, I said. Sir, this is Samantha with Booth World Industries again. Your courtesy call begins now. What do you... I began to say, but was cut off by those 
diminished chords blaring into my ear. Then I heard Jessica's voice. Why are you doing this? Jessica asked. I could hear the tears in her voice. Jessica? I asked. Sir, the operator said. She cannot hear you. This is a courtesy call. The appointment has already been concluded. Please, Jessica begged. Please don't do this. I'll do anything you want to. I'll... Jessica's voice choked off into a wheeze, and all I could hear on the other end of the phone was the rustling of clothing and more wheezing. Eventually it stopped and someone picked up on the other end. The scheduled work has been completed, a man's voice said. We at Booth World Industries say thanks and welcome to the club. You have a marvelous day, sir. The operator came back on the line. Was that to your satisfaction? I sat there for a long time, cold sweat dripping down my ribcage. Jessica was my ex, because I walked in on her and my best friend fucking at a party in high school. I smiled and whispered. That was perfect. Wonderful, the operator said. We at Booth World Industries aim to serve. Would you like to make another appointment? As I stared at the water leaking from the door of the dishwasher, I smiled even bigger. Yes, I said. Yes, I would, unquote. So basically, the service that Booth World Industries provides is an elaborate hitman company, something which they refer to as remodeling. Now after that part of the story, when our protagonist tries to set up another remodeling, Booth World Industries notes that they can't schedule at the time he requested, since his remodeling will be happening before then. He asks if there is a way for them to reschedule his remodeling, to which they reply that he'll need to invite 1,000 new members, something which this very story is meant to do, as he also provides the phone number for becoming a member and putting a hit out on someone, which funnily enough, for a time, actually worked, as seen here. Still rain? You have reached this of industry. Your number has been lost and trained. A service representative will be with you shortly for a phone. We at Booth World Industries may say, You have a marvelous day. Whoa. Okay. Now, I got to say, the person who invented this creepypasta, I'm gonna give you props, or whatever, whoever has this number, because I don't know if you could hear the me hear the message, but it said, thank you for calling Booth World Industries. Your number has been traced, and a representative will call you back shortly. <laughs> wow, okay, that's kind of freaky. You have reached Booth World Industries. Your number has been Hi, um, I would like to make an appointment if you can just call me back. Thanks. Yeah, this poster writer went above and beyond by actually having this number lead to a creepy answering machine, something which several YouTubers at the time called for fun. It goes without saying none of it was real, but it was a fun and fairly creepy concept to be able to read about and then actually call and hear someone actually pick up. What's more is the author of the story once in a while would actually call back the people who called the number, which is some real dedication and I imagine it was pretty fucking freaky for a fair few who called in not expecting that at all. Though I will note that the way the story is written makes it seem like the guy who was making the uh, appointment was like playing really dumb or confused, which doesn't make sense since he clearly knows what it is actually doing what Booth World Interstice is and what his goal was later on in the story. It was kind of written in a purposely dumb way so that there could be a big twist at the end, which I'm not really a fan of that. If you're going to write a story that way, you need to actually like 
be better at writing it, as in make it so if you read the story back again, it actually makes sense. Like what he's saying could be interpreted a completely different way so that the twist makes sense. But having read this at least twice now, nothing implies that he knows what he's fucking doing until he randomly does at the very end. But hey, the idea of a hitman hotline that you could actually call was at least still pretty cool. So there's that. The real Chuck E. Cheese. This pasta opens with the following paragraph. Quote, Have you ever thought that there was something the creators of Chuck E. Cheese were hiding something from us all? Or have you ever found something to be off about the place? Even the creepy robotic mascots that danced on stage? I didn't until I found out the truth about Chuck E. Cheese. It all began on the first time I ever visited the place. I was around the age of five or six, so of course, I was pretty ecstatic to go." Unquote. You know things are really starting off well when there's a mistake within the very first sentence. Have you ever thought that there was something the creators of Chuck E. Cheese were hiding something from us all? Atrocious. Bad grammar aside, what follows is a tale about a five or six year old as he plays around the Chuck E. Cheese until he hears a strange voice coming from the staff only door say, Test 15 on mutated rat results in angered behavior such as throwing desk and scientist at the wall. And, What are we going to do with this beast? And, Get away from me! Well, eventually the staff realize this kid is listening in on them and pulls him into the room, saying, you know, you know, over and over again. Eventually, the strange beast that they're panicking about gets loose and starts killing staff members. Our protagonist is able to escape it by running through an air vent and eventually makes his way back to his mom and they get the hell out of there. Later, there's a news report about some sort of mutated rat seen running away from the scene of the crime that being a bunch of mutilated staff members. Our protagonist doesn't seem to know what the hell is going on, but he vows to never again go to a Chuck E. Cheese and to never listen in on the staff. Uh, the end. So yeah, pretty short and pretty lackluster at that too. Like, almost as soon as he gets to the Chuck E. Cheese, he's then being pulled into this scary scenario and just as soon gets out of it. So this whole story feels pretty rushed and Far less than half-baked. We're working with straight-ass raw dough here. I guess the real Chuck E. Cheese is a mutated rat, and now he's on the loose. Ooh, scary. Uh, but speaking of Chuck E. Cheese, the truth behind Chuck E. Cheese. This one's a little bit better than the last one as it follows our narrator, a fella who's in desperate need of a job and so applies for one of his local Chuck E. Cheese. Strangely enough, the manager of this joint, John, hires him without question or needing any background info on him, something which takes our narrator by surprise. He's later told that his job will be to clean up the tables, floors, and all the animatronics. John tells him that the animatronics can act oddly at times, almost going haywire, and if that should occur, he should spray them with a bottle of what looked to be water. Our protagonist feels this whole situation is rather curious, especially when he goes to clean the animatronics at first time and finds that they are all perfectly clean. As would be expected after all, why would they need to be constantly cleaned? What would possibly get them so dirty? Well, that is until he reaches the Chucky one, which has a mess on its face and mouth in particular. He notices that it looks more realistic than the other animatronics. It had a much softer texture to it as well. After he got finished cleaning it, it, it opens its mouth wide and stares at our narrator, but does nothing else after. While he nearly shits his pants over this, he checks it up to being one of those strange haywire things John noted before. However, a stranger part of his job was that after he was finished cleaning the animatronics, he was to stay put in the same room as them until he was told to go home, which he is never told for what purpose. He is eventually let out and goes home. But that night, he wakes up to the sound of high-pitched laughter outside of his window. Later on the next day, he once again has to clean up the animatronics, but this time when he waits for someone to come and tell him to go home, no one comes. In fact, it gets to be 10pm by the time our narrator finally just leaves the room and notices most of the lights are turned off in the joint, 
and everyone's gone. There wasn't even an animatronic show today. What was the point of him watching them all this time? Our narrator, rather peeved and starting to freak out, goes home once again, planning to leave that job the next morning. He is, however, once again awoken by the sound of laughter outside his bedroom window. This time, however, he checks his window and is immediately startled by the animatronic, or maybe at least someone wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot suit standing right outside the window. He falls backwards in fear and by the time he's gotten back up, the rat is gone. He figures this must have been an elaborate prank by the people who hired him for that job. That that must be why they didn't do a background check or anything. That it was all some sort of elaborate fucked up prank. But then, why him? He marches out the next morning to Chuck E. Cheese to give them a piece of his mind. But then he sees, when he gets there, police tape and cop cars all around the building. He asks the police what happened here, and they tell him someone stole the Chuck E. Cheese animatronic. Which, uh, you know, is probably pretty expensive, but uh, I'm pretty sure they don't set up police tape and get several police cars involved for someone stealing a fucking fur-covered robot, but uh, whatever, I guess. At any rate, the story ends with our narrator being alone once again in his house when he hears the laughing again, and so this time he calls the cops, and it's then when he sees the Chuck E. Cheese animatronic in the corner of his room, mouth agape and ready to rip the flesh from his bones. He quickly jumps out his window and runs like hell. The police later come to visit his home and he tells them someone in a Chuck E. Cheese suit tried to kill him with a knife, knowing full well that they wouldn't believe what actually happened, but figured that info was good enough for them to investigate the Chuck E. Cheese establishment. When they do, they discover that John the manager is nowhere to be seen, and that there is a room full of dead, torn apart teenagers, all of them being previously missing case victims in the local area. Our narrator finally noting that he fears for the fact that that thing, whatever it is, is still out there, and that sometimes, late into the night, he can hear just barely the faint sound of a high-pitched laughter. The End and that's the story of the truth behind Chuck E. Cheese. Like I said, it's a bit better than the last one. And while it has several issues, I'd overall say it's at least a more interesting read. It is kind of a fun twist that the animatronic eats teenagers uh, that work there and not the kids or something like that. We never really get to know what John's connection is to all this though, besides the fact that he's at least aware that this shit is happening. It's also not clear what exactly the Chuck E. Cheese monster is either. Animatronic gone haywire? Guy in a mascot suit? Maybe John is a real anthro furry ass Chuck E. Cheese? Maybe he's like fucking the purple guy from fucking FNAF and he's like putting on an animatronic suit? I don't, I don't fucking know. Who knows? All I do know is that if you thought the truth behind Chuck E. Cheese was enlightening as to the true, darker truth of Chuck E. Cheese, then what comes next will truly blow your mind, shock you, even. The Chuck E. Cheese Shocking Truth. <laughs> why, the fuck, why the fuck do all these... Chuck E. Cheese creepypastas have titles like The Real Chuck E. Cheese, The Truth Behind Chuck E. Cheese, The Shocking Truth of Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, I don't fucking know, but there is definitely a bit of a, a naming convention to these, isn't there? They're all about a grand conspiracy or truth being revealed, which so far has just been that Chuck E. Cheese is apparently a real monster mutant rat that eats people, or is an animatronic that eats people. But what about this one? Well, it starts with the following paragraph. Quote, I'm a huge Chuck E. Cheese fanatic. I use the sites under the name CheeseFan101. I used to work there. I still have the Pascal outfit in the closet, along with several plastic spiders and Coca-Cola souvenir cups and a big old bucket of plastic pasta that cost 6,000 tickets. Unquote. Now I want you to remember this paragraph. This dude is a huge Chuck E. Cheese fan and owns several pieces of merch and used to get f go to fucking fan sites under the name of Chuck E. Cheese Fan 101. So clearly this is a man who loves this kid's arcade pizza establishment, right? Well, the next paragraph opens like this. Quote, There's something you should know. I went to that place 
from 1995 to 1997, when things took a strange turn for the worse. Indeed, the cheese, as we call it in the biz, is not at all what it's cracked up to be. Eggs, listen carefully, because I don't want to frighten you. I know you're easily scared, and this story is easily going to make you lose your sanity because of how much has been covered up by the Chuck E. Cheese Corporation over the years, unquote. It's at this point that I'm starting to think the story might be a troll pasta. The line, I know you're easily scared, and that this story is easily going to make you lose your fucking sanity, is either one of the worst genuine lines I've read in a creepypasta, or one of the better joke lines I've read in a troll pasta. Also, um, eggs? Yes? <laughs> What the fuck is eggs, period? What the fuck is that? What, what was he talking about? What? What? Okay, but moving on. The story goes on to follow our strange narrator, who after being hired back in 1995, then goes on to describe the training video that he was shown upon entry into his new job. Quote, I first knew something was off when I saw the training video. The man never took the Pascal outfit off and they never broke character. It was really weird. A character named P. Farnabas Q. Cheese was seen in the background, but he never interacted, nor were they ever included in the original Cheese lineup. Later, Munch, the large purple what's it word replaced P. Farnabas, who I believe was deemed too weird for American audiences. Chuck E. Cheese originated in Canada. Now you probably don't know that Chuck E. Cheese was created by the guy who invented Pong. This is important, but I want you to remember that for now. Later on you'll understand everything. The training room was fine. A little cold. Uh, Pascal was shown baking up the pizza and telling us how to cook it. Be sure to butter it up with our special butter sauce. Muy buen. Pascal costume kissed his plastic lips, the head looking a little bit off. I could go for a whole bit pie of that cheesy, cheesy, cheese pizza right about now. His head turned a little. I noticed that the Chuck E. Cheese logo, which usually contained the little rat giving a thumbs up, had a small, Masonic symbol on it. I didn't know Chucky was a Mason. <laughs> the training video was really long. They showed us how to prepare the dough, make the sauce, and put the piping hot pizza in the oven. And be sure to cook the pizza. Always use a glove. Pascal winked, a sinister wink. I was getting a strange feeling. Otherwise, this may happen, and the chunk won't like that. Pascal Costin reached into the piping hot oven with his bare hands, taking out the pizza, screaming violently. Oh my fucking god! He yelled, and there was a weird CG laugh stapled on. He had visible blisters on his hands. His red and burning hands were not puppet hands. They were human hands. I can't cook pizza this way, he screams. My art is ruined! He takes out a knife and begins to slice off his own arm at the wrist. The training tape immediately cut to a bunch of kids playing in the ball pit, as if that never happened. Then Chucky began to talk. You know, remember, don't play on the machines until after dark. What the hell did that mean? Oh. You can play bouncy gyrocopter or horse rider for a quarter, but nothing's gonna cure that deep depression when you're too old to take a ride anymore." Unquote. The story goes on like that for a bit until later our narrator notes that quote, this, this is too weird for me, but they made us sign a non-disclosure agreement before we became part of the Chuck E. Cheese family. That was the weirdest part. They had me take a blood test. Not a drug test, like a normal employer, but a blood test. I was thinking about that in the last few minutes of the training video, when Chuck yelled, Cheesy blood! Cheesy blood! He spurted a blood pack all over the pizza and walked out of the kitchen with it. Unquote. Uh, when our narrator notes how they are serving the pizzas with blood on them, wondering if this was supposed to be some kind of joke, the store's manager just notes that they do things differently in Canada. But the Cheese Foundation is all American, which I, uh, 
I have no fucking idea what that means, but uh, sure. Our narrator is told to come back tomorrow and everything will be sorted out. Even though all they did was watch a training video, so I'm not sure what is needing to be sorted out. It was all at this point, I was getting pretty fucking confused with this pasta. Later, when our narrator gets home, he has a nightmare because... I mean, of course he does. About the manager of the Chuck E. Cheese putting blood in the pizza for some Masonic ritual. This makes our protagonist determined to know the truth behind this Chuck E. Cheese restaurant. I, uh, I guess. And, um, I'm, you know, I'm just gonna fucking read it. Quote, I was gonna have to do it. I was going to break into Chuck E. Cheese and finally figure out what the hell is going on. I got a black night suit, some goggles, and a pair of non-slip sole shoes. While I was breaking and entering, the pizza kitchen was quite greasy in the late hours, and I didn't want to trip and fall. I jimmied the lock using a small knife, some fish bones, and a rubber hammer. <laughs> and a rubber hammer. I climbed through the window anyway, worried that there may be a security system. A red laser grid wired protected the floor. This seemed like a law of security to protect a bunch of cheap souvenirs in the skee-ball games. Or so I thought. Or so I got really confused at what I was looking at. I went into the back closet, being careful not to trip the wires. I found it behind Ruben's desk. The big quarter! I picked it up and silently crept over to the other side of the room. The quarter was heavy and had burn marks all over it. Why the hell would the Chuck E. Cheese Corporation mint something like this? I saw a slot back behind the wall. I put it in. All the machines turned on immediately. All their eyes began to move in unison. The entire thing was lit up at once. You could probably see it from miles away. The car rise honked. The slot machines rolled. The animatronic puppets began to dance at a rigorous pace, as though they were going to break. I took up my screwdriver and began to unscrew the machine. The chicken machine! My favorite game! I unscrewed the four main screws and popped the top off. What I saw next shocked me to my very core of my being. I will never forget it. To my horror, there was a dead Chuck E. Cheese employee inside. Wait, not dead, moving! The lips were sewn shut and it had a horrified expression on its face. It was hooked to an IV that fed him intravenous pieces of food that were attached to the ink on the ticket machine. What in God's name? The words, ut in honestis sacrifice queso were burned into his chest. I later found out that that meant an honorable sacrifice to the cheese. The other machines started to knock and bang. There were people in all of them, stuffed inside. I didn't have the chance to save them because something happened next that truly terrified me. The characters. They were human. I know what you're thinking. It's just a suit. It wasn't a suit. That was their skin. A furry rat man walked out with a crooked nose and hobbly, warped teeth. He looked sinister with his cap, wasn't even fitting. The real Chuck E. Cheese had arrived, and he was covered in ugly, patchy fur for his oblong kneecap and bulging dough chunk gut. Pascal too, the Italian man leered at me, angrily, holding a ladle covered in what I hoped to God was just pasta sauce. And the others. Jasper T. Jowls, a crying dog face whose skin looked like a worn out leather shoe. His banjo was missing strings and his suit was ill-fitting. Helen Henry, whose bloody chicken wings had glued on its own feathers and sewn off beak. And Mr. Munch, whose fur was strong and thick that you could barely see anything but his oversized glossy human eyes. Blood on his bl purple whiskers, and when he opened his mouth, an endless gullet filled with all kinds of esophical bacteria that clung to the sides of his sickly, sickly skin. He leered at me with a kind of look. Please the cheese, he said. Please the cheese. They began to corner me, and I was hit with a ladle square on the head. The police arrived. I had tripped the wire. Good. I was about to blow the cover of this whole fucking thing. Thank God, officer, they're real monsters. Oh God, the officer. The cop was wearing a Chuck E. Cheese costume. He pulled a gun on me and led me back to the police car. Unquote. I, uh, I have no fucking words, but, um, I think we should definitely read this <laughs> final quote, which I'm pretty sure 
confirms this has to be a troll pasta because if, if if it's not, we have contender for probably one of the worst creepy pastas ever written. Quote: They put me in cheese jail. <laughs> they put me in cheese jail, a place where bad employees are forced to watch crappy reruns of that shitty show they show on the screen. I was allowed to eat pizza dough chunks and bacon A's, a form of bacon flavor mayonnaise. After eight years, they let me go. But by then it was too late. The Chuck E. Cheese had closed down, replaced by a bowling alley and all evidence removed to think that the Cheese Corporation would bind employees to the floor and force feed them tickets, all so that they could save a few dollars on their electric bill. Or maybe it's not that at all. Maybe I'm just some crazy guy on the internet, huh? Just some crazy guy making up stories about a pizza restaurant for children. I fucking dare you to go open one of those machines right now. They say the palm creator went nuts in his final years. All those infinite hours of bouncing the ball until he finally lost it. They say he started a pizza chain because he wanted to create the first human AI that he failed. And the only way he could compromise was by starting a cheese-based religion that required real intelligence. Living flesh machines. Just put a man in a rat suit, feed them pizza, some flashing lights, and they'll show up in droves, he said. He was right. The end. So, uh... Yeah, that was probably uh, the most dumbass creepypasta I have ever fucking read. Uh, but I'm at least 99% sure it was meant to be that way. So, I guess mission accomplished. If it is somehow actually a real genuine attempt though, um, that was some distinctly bad writing. Especially since after all that and the big overdramatic speech at the end, you gotta remember, it all started with I'm a Chuck E. Cheese fan, I go by Cheese Fan 101. So it all just adds to this sandwich of pure nonsense. Oh, and while we're on the topic of all these Chuck E. Cheese creepypastas, which stress me, if I wanted to, I could make the rest of this tier bonus entries based entirely on this robot rat. Another pasta group that there's a fair few creepypastas around that were made back in the day was for Five Nights at Freddy's, of which I won't be reading any of them here because while many did appear on video game creepypasta wikis, I feel like so many of them hedge a little too close to just straight up fan fiction for my liking. And from what I remember, they aren't anything to write home about anyway. Uh, but I figured I'd mention it here while we're talking about all these animatronic based creepypastas. Anyway, that's enough cheese cult related stories for my liking. What's next? The Intestines. Quote, You wake up not knowing where you are or what your name is. There's a sign saying, Trust your intestine. Then an intestine drops from the ceiling, from an open vent that you could fit through, so you climb through, which you s will soon regret. Just when you think you escaped, you fall through an air vent into a pile of what you think is goo. Suddenly the goo transforms into a goo monster. You back I not a wall, and he gets closer and closer. Just as he opens his enormous, foul-smelling mouth, you hear a deafening screech and cover both of your ears. A naked dog-like creature with wings flies into the room and attacks the blob and faces you and talks and whispers into your ear saying, We are what you see when you die. We torture you, rip parts of you out, and eat your soul. The only way to escape is to trust your intestine. The creature rips your intestine out and then you wake up safe and sound in your room but still don't remember who you are. You hear what you think is wind, but it gets heavier and heavier until you cover your ears and look at a table next to your bed and see an intestine with a note saying, remember, I told you, and then you slowly fall asleep. The next day, you ask your neighbors what your name is and who you are. Your name is Joshua. Your parents died in a car crash and you live alone and work at McDonald's from Monday to Friday, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. You wonder how they know what happened. Oh my God. You wonder how they know 
that much about you and go back inside your house. That night, you dream the same dream, but you remember who you were and instead of ripping your intestine out, the creature brings you intestable and rios it open and there is a note saying i am coming tomorrow so beware you continue the day normally and think a dream is just a dream nothing's gonna happen but the moment the doorbell rings so you go to the curtain closet of the door and open it you see the creature but it is even more horrifying he has red eyes his flesh was ripped of and his winds were broken you ran up to your room and locked the door. Just then you remember that the creature did. He broke the intestine. So will all of your strength, you ripped open the intestine. But there were words saying no way out. The creature knocked down the door and ripped your intestine out and said go to sleep. You woke up with a fright and was relieved. It was all just a dream. Then you had the pain in the stomach. You look down and find your stomach ripped open and your test and gone and you collapse and die news report boy of the name joshua has died unexpectedly with no signs of damage all his limbs are intact except his intestine which was found on his neck saying trust your intestine the end um i why, why don't uh why, why don't we just take a little commercial break huh Never again. This one is yet again a very short pasta and follows a 70 year old boy who is constantly abused by his bitch face mother. Well one night he sees a strange looking little girl on his living room couch. She's pale and covered in dirt and has feet all blue and green in color. He asks her who she is to which she replies Lacey Morgan. Seeing how cold and scared she looked, he tells her she can stay the night and gets an old afghan for her. When our protagonist wakes up the next morning, he gets a coffee mug shoved into his shoulder by his mother who is angry that there's a dirt all over the couch. The little girl seemed to have been completely gone. He takes responsibility rather than uselessly explain to her and gets a powerful slap on the cheek for it. It's then later at school that he hears something that sends a shiver down his spine. Quote, Lacey Morgan was found dead last night. I passed the day waiting for any more news on the subject, but found none. Upon arriving home, the news was broadcasting a live report on her though. Lacey Morgan, six years of age, was reported dead at seven last night. Her body was located in the backyard, buried there in her pink dress. So far, there has been no sign of her mother. Marissa Morgan, who is suspected to be the killer. Marissa has reportedly abused Lacey multiple times and may be responsible for her death. Suddenly a picture of Lacey appeared on the screen. She appeared very close to how she had when I met her. Blonde hair and braids, pink dress, pale face. Only her cheeks had color and her eyes were baby blue. To most, this would seem unimportant, but to me it was. She died before arriving at my home, if what the newscaster said was true, died hours before." Unquote. Later that same night, our protagonist wakes up to the sensation of cool fingers on his cheek, and a voice which whispered, never again. It was Lacey, and within the next 10 minutes, he heard his mother screaming, quote, My mom was thrashing wildly on her bed a small creature having buried its face into her chest. I could hear the sound of flesh tearing, and my mother's screaming increased in volume. I wished I hadn't gotten up. Later on, I'd tell myself I hadn't, but I had. So when Lacey pulled back from the gaping hole in my mother's chest cavity, I had a plain view of her razor-sharp teeth glistening in the light, glinting with my mother's blood. She smiled innocently at me for a moment, before swiftly tearing out my mother's jugular. That time, I did faint. When I awoke, I was in my bed. I walked to my mom's room, morbid curiosity getting the best of me. Upon opening the door, I found the room empty, the bed made neatly, as if my mom had left for work early. The only oddities were the dirty, child footprints and the open window, showing that Lacey had in fact visited. I never saw my mother again and I never really missed her either. 
I eventually got married and we had a child together. I named her Lacey. Recently I noticed the neighbor's daughter has all sorts of scrapes and bruises on her arms. I've started washing their home and the other day I saw something odd. A little girl running barefoot through their backyard up to their back door. It was around midnight so I couldn't be for sure. But I thought she met my eyes with her black ones. And I could swear that she mouths two words to me. Never again. Unquote. And that's the story of Never Again. And it's pretty decent. I do think it could have been a bit longer. And have more build up to that last paragraph, you know? Since I think it has some pretty decent bones. Uh, but as it is, it's just kind of a okay little scary revenge type story uh, but i see the potential for something a lot more but i mean what can you do doors ah now this one is truly a classic one of my personal favorites for having one of the most effective twist endings that i've seen in a creepypasta scene but with that said what's the story about well it's a fairly short one and honestly i feel like i cannot quite do this one justice without reading in full, so let's get to it then. Quote, I was adopted. I never knew my real mother. Rather, I knew her at one time, but I left her side when I was too little to be able to remember. I loved my adoptive family though. They were so kind to me. I ate well, lived in a warm and comfortable house, and got to stay up pretty late. Let me tell you about my family real fast. First, there's my mother. I never called her mom or anything like that. I just called her by her first name, Janice. She didn't mind at all though. I called her that for so long I don't think she even noticed. Anyhow, she was a very kind woman. I think that she is the one who recommended my adoption in the first place. Sometimes I would lay my head against her in front of the television and would tickle my back with her nails. She was one of those Hollywood mothers. Second, there's Dad. His real name is Richard, but he never really liked me much, so I began to refer to him as Dad in a desperate attempt to gain his affection. It didn't work. I think that no matter what I called him, he would never love me as much as his own child. That's understandable, so I really didn't press the matter. The most notable attribute of my dad was his unmoving sternness. He was not afraid to pop his children when they did something wrong. I found that out before. I could use the restroom properly. He didn't hesitate to spank me. Well, I'm in line and it's because of his methods, I suppose. Lastly is my sister. Little Emily was really young when I was adopted, so we were about the same age, but she was slightly older. I like to think of her as my little sister, though. We got along better than any siblings could possibly get along. We would always stay up late together and just talk. Well, she did a lot of the talking. I mostly just listened because I loved her. It was a great setup that we had. We were short on bedrooms, so because I didn't want to sleep in the living room by myself when I was littler, I had a pallet set up for me next to her bed on the floor. This is where I have slept since, but it was cool with me because I enjoyed being with her and I had always felt pretty protective of my little sis. Everything changed on a horrible Wednesday night. I was at home taking a nap when little Emily opened the front door. The sound of the door opening pulled me to a state of consciousness, and I walked from the room down the hall to the living room. That's when I first remembered it was Wednesday. I was never any good with keeping track of what day it was. Actually, I'll just go ahead and say it. My sense of time was horrible, but nevertheless, I knew it was Wednesday because Emily had just come home from her church's youth group gathering. She walked in the front door and hugged me, and then was followed in by Dad and Janice. You have a good nap? Janice said teasingly as she ruffled up my hair. I just shook my head and away and snorted in a matter that clearly expressed that I was teasing back with her. Don't you snort at your mother like that, said my father gruffly, with authority, shut the door behind him and hung up his coat. I was clearly joking, I growled under my breath. He must not have heard me because I didn't feel him smack me. Emily then proceeded to our room and I followed. She started telling me about her day, you know, usual teenage girl stuff, but I listened so that she would feel better. After her summary, she suggested watching TV and I obliged and jumped onto the couch as she 
was going for the remote. She rolled her eyes at my little brother-like immaturity and scooted me over and sat down. The TV turned on and we watched it together until the sun went down. Emily was the kind of girl that instead of watching cartoons and soap operas, would rather watch Discovery and Animal Planet and Natural Geographic. I liked those too, so I didn't mind. Actually, those were the only channels that could hold my attention. So it got late and Janice walked up behind the sofa. Emily, it's past your bedtime. Turn off the television and go up to your room. You too, she pointed at me. Emily turned off the program. We were watching grudgingly and stood up. She started down the hallway to our room. As I followed, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. We went into our room and Emily turned off the light. Just as she did, I caught a flash of movement out of the corner of my eye. It was out the window, but as soon as I directed my line of sight to where the window was, no longer in my peripheral vision, what it was I thought I saw was gone. I still remained alert for my sister's sake. I laid there in the darkness with nothing but a thin ray of light from the street lamp outside to illuminate the room. It wasn't much. Time and time again, I could have sworn that I heard subtle sounds just out the window. A twig breaks, leaves crunching, clothes jostling, and all the while I could smell the faint stench of sweat and blood. I kept my eyes open most of the night. The sounds outside subsided and the smell left my nose. I began to feel at ease. My eyelids closed. Not long after, I heard a very loud crash on the other side of the house. I was up in an instant. There's someone in the house! I barked with extreme adrenaline coursing through me. Wake up! I shrilly pleaded at Emily. She did, and as soon as I saw her sit up, I ran to my parents' room. Dad was dead. His neck was splayed open and gaping as blood spilled out of it, off the bed and onto the floor. I saw that the master bathroom's door was closed and just before it on the outside was a man. A man I don't feel comfortable calling it that. He was very large and rugged. He turned around and saw me and that's when I saw him accurately for the first time. I won't forget it. His eyes were large and beady and trapped with lust. He was styling a beard that was badly unkempt, with blood dripping off. His clothes were dirty and his face was cold. Just then I noticed the same horrid smell of sweat and blood from earlier, but this time it was overwhelming. He saw me. He saw me and grinned with a set of crooked yellow teeth. That smile threw me off. I thought that I was going to die, but then he turned back to the bathroom door completely unperturbed by my presence. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. I just yelled and cried. I watched as he shouldered through the door. That was mom's only protection. I watched as he raised the large razor that he was carrying, but obviously neglected to use properly. I watched as he sliced her open and tore her to shreds. I then heard something. The last thing I wanted to hear. It was Emily's scream coming from behind me. The large monstrosity looked up from my butchered mother and stared at my little sister. I was distraught. He stood up and quickly started walking towards us. My sis turned and ran, and I was at a loss when he bypassed me and went straight after her. Why was she still in the house? Has she not assessed the situation and run? Apparently not. And now she was dead, and I was alone. I ran after them both. I expected the man to kill her as he had the rest of my family, but I was sadly mistaken. He grabbed her by the arm and jerked her as a way to make clear that he was in control. He dragged her through the house. I was making all the noise I could now, hoping and praying that someone would come in to my aid. He mustn't take her, not her. As he passed me, I backed against the wall and whimpered with terror. Why? He didn't respond except by putting his free hand on my head while Emily screamed in the other, saying, Good boy. He gave another crooked grin and a very cold, unnatural laugh. I followed him to the door where he dragged my helpless sister after him. He opened it, pulled her out, and slammed it shut behind him. I am now sitting in the house with my mutilated adopted parents shivering and whimpering with dismay. He's out there with her, doing who knows what to her, and I can't do anything. I would if I could, but I can't. I would chase after them in a heartbeat, but I can't. 
I sit here, looking at the front door. I look down at my paws. If only I could open doors. Unquote. Bro was a fucking dog the whole damn time. <laughs> I love that upon rereading this creepypasta, it's super clear that he's a dog, like the whole way. The whole creepypasta alludes to this fact over and over again. Uh, but you may, maybe you'll catch on to it. Maybe some of you did while I was reading it, but maybe some of you didn't. And so, you know, it's a, it's, it's a pretty good twist. I will say I'm kind of surprised the dog didn't try to, uh, you know, bite the, uh, the, the crazy bearded man. But then again, uh, maybe he, he's like a chihuahua or something, you know? I mean, he couldn't do a whole lot then, could he? But overall, it's a pretty good creepypasta. If only for that really cool urban legend type twist at the end. 9, 17, 10. Ah, now this is one of the classics. You know, I tend to say that a lot. But this one is at least a pretty good classic to me. This was one of those creepypastas that really got me from a young age and that I enjoyed sharing around with others at the time. Since I never really remember it doing much numbers, like you didn't really hear people talking about it a whole lot, but it was definitely one of my personal favorites at the time. The story follows a new college student preparing for his freshman year. And after he had easily gotten all his other supplies, the last thing he needed was a laptop. Only problem is, is he's a bit of a penny pincher and doesn't plan on spending the money he would need to toss out for a new one. Quote, I scoured the internet for a good deal on laptops, finding none that suited my frugal habits. Classes were only two weeks away, and I was becoming desperate for a computer. Several days later, I saw an ad in the newspaper for a laptop that was being sold for only 600 bucks, and not too far from where I live. It was a really very nice Dell laptop too, seeming odd that it was being sold for almost $1,000 less than store price. I drove to the seller's address the following day. The house was farther out of the city, butting up to a dense forest. Outside of the house was an old Chevrolet and a mess of old signs and other various vintage looking items. I rang the doorbell and a thin man in a flannel jacket came to the door. When I asked about the laptop, he looked almost relieved and told me that he was ready to sell it immediately. Luckily, I came with cash in hand and after proof of good condition, I went home with the new computer." Unquote. However, as you might imagine, not everything was exactly peachy king with this laptop. Quote, Excited to have my first self-bought laptop, I powered it up and began uploading my own programs and applications onto it. Upon searching the hard drive, I found a folder hidden away on it, which was odd because the man selling it to me told me that the memory was wiped clean and ready for a fresh start. The folder was titled 9-17-10, presumably a date. I opened the folder, revealing six videos and three pictures. Curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to watch the videos." Unquote. What follows is an increasingly awful set of videos, the first being titled 001, and so on, showcasing a video shot by a shaky camcorder inside a vehicle recording a woman walking out of a bar and then getting into her car late at night. The person holding the camera then drives slowly behind her before the video ends. The next video is 47 seconds, and the camera now is on the dashboard, still following the woman's car. It's now raining. The next video, well, I'll read the quote. This was the one that got me officially concerned. The clip began from the same shaky hands as the first clip. It was now pouring rain outside of the car, and I could barely make out a figure in the fur coat and it with an umbrella walking to the front door of the house. I could only assume who this person was, and whose house this belonged to. The figure entered the house and closed the door. The following stillness greatly unnerved me. The only thing that could be heard was the sound of rain dumping on top of the car. After roughly two minutes of this nerve-wracking nothingness, the lights inside the house cut out. Another minute or so went by, before the camera was placed onto the console again, and the sound of a person exiting the car broke the stillness. After the car door quietly closed, another figure, this time hooded, 
could be seen walking towards the house. I began to feel a knot tightening in the bottom of my stomach as the stranger walked around to the back of the house. Whoever this person was, they definitely weren't supposed to be there. After another couple seconds, the lights to the outside of the house cut out. It was pitch black and only the rain alerted me that the camera was still rolling. The video ended after about nine minutes of rain and darkness. I was now pretty sure that this was not an innocent little project or anything of that nature, and I began to feel stupid for not checking this laptop seller's credibility. Was this person stalking the woman the same person that I met with earlier? Throughout the whole experience, I had a dormant thought in the back of my head to call the police, but I wasn't ready just yet. Reluctantly now, I began the fourth video, 004. It was dark again, but the rain had stopped and I was left with only silence. Not long after the clip began, I could make out the sound of footsteps on the gravel, getting louder as someone was approaching the vehicle. The car door opened and the dome light was turned on. I could tell that the camera was now on the floor of the car, pointing up towards the roof. I heard some fumbling in the background and suddenly a thump sounded from the back of the truck. An arm abruptly obstructed the camera's view and a large tarp could be seen being pulled out from the car. I had only one scenario running through my head and I hoped it wasn't true. The person picked up the camera and put it back onto the console and began to back up. They drove for a good three minutes before parking in a branched off road and exiting the car to work on the load that they were carrying. Six minutes after, the car was moved again to a different location, and the camera was picked up and carried underhanded away from the car. I could see now that it was the same shit bucket truck that was in the front of the seller's house. I was about ready to call the cops on this creep when the camera turned towards the house. It was a completely different house than the one I just visited. I was a little relieved by this though it didn't prove anything. As the fourth video came to an end, I was wondering whether or not I was prepared to see what came next. I could only hope that this was a prank, or at least had a happy ending. 005 began inside the house. It was extremely dark, and the only thing I could make out was a figure that would occasionally walk in front of the camera. It was also quiet from the first few moments, minus the occasional barking of a dog outside. Eventually, a small sound started to appear. The small sound soon escalated to a loud, muffled scream. Shaking and struggling sounds became more apparent as time went on, as well as crying. A light abruptly came on, and the camera was lifted and panned to the center of the room, revealing a beaten and bloody woman tied to a chair. From what I could make out, this was in fact the woman from the bar. The camera zoomed in on her face for what seemed like an eternity before stopping. I couldn't believe this was happening. The original hope that this was a movie or something like that had long since diminished. With only one video remaining, I was beginning to fear for my own safety. I locked my door, closed my blinds, and pushed onward." Unquote. The first thing our narrator heard in this last video was the sound of power tools. This went on for some time until a woman in a lab coat walked into the bathroom, which the camera now sat in, and dragged a garbage bag in there with her. Quote, felt like I was dreaming. It was like I was watching a horror movie unfolding on the screen. She lifted the bag up from the tub, now empty, except for whatever entrails, and still dropped out. She picked up the camera and placed it on the ground facing the tub. On the floor in front of the bathtub was an assortment of corrosive substances and several other empty containers. The woman began to dump the liquids into the tub, which was followed by an awful, awful noise that I can only describe as pop rocks mixed with coke. The video ended and I was left bewildered and panicked. I finally opened the pictures. The first was a picture of the truck. The second was a picture of the girl tied up before she was beaten. And the third picture brought up a corrupted file notice. Uh, but, but maybe that's a good thing. I managed to keep the two pictures before I handed the laptop over to police. I was reimbursed my $600 along with a bonus. Apparently the victim was the young girlfriend of the older woman's ex-husband. The older woman was arrested almost a year before 
but was freed of all charges due to a lack of evidence, and the ex-husband was incarcerated instead. I guess this was the missing link. I hope th this has solved any unanswered questions, although I'm not sure who the man in the flannel jacket was or how he got a hold of the laptop, or how he owns the same truck as the murderer. Uh, I guess I'll just leave that to the police. Unquote. And that's 91710, and I still to this day really love this one, mainly for how simplistic it is. I've always loved the idea of a horror film where the found footage part of the story is completely from the perspective of the serial killer. And it's why pastas like these, or even YouTube channels where people record and watch people, always send a distinct shiver down my spine, as there's something just so disturbing about the idea of seeing the perspective of a would-be killer hunting their victim. It's an ominous look into the hands of ultimate fate, I suppose. And this one is for sure up there as one of the first online things that got me to realize how personally terrifying and interesting I find this particular horror scenario. I found the hidden door in my cellar, and I think I've made a big mistake. So this one's pretty short and simple. A dude and his wife moved into a new house that has a, a cellar where they keep all their wine. It was one of the reasons they bought this house in particular because the wife liked the idea of having a wine cellar, but eventually they kind of stopped using it. A while later, the two of them go down there and notice something strange with one of the walls. It's got a hole. And what's more, peeping through the hole reveals an entire new area of their home. A staircase that went further down in such a way that actually didn't really make sense architecturally, since it would more than likely cut into their neighbor's own cellar. Well anyway, our narrator eventually breaks down the wall and goes down there to investigate what it's all about. What he finds is a dark room covered in old blood, as well as a man who moved his limbs as if he didn't actually understand how one moves. In fact, as soon as he caught wind of him being down there, the thing started running at him backwards. Our protag escapes just in the nick of time though and alerts his wife and calls the police. When they get there, they find no trace of the man thing, but do notice that the back door is open. So whatever it was is gone now. Our protag ends the story knowing he made a massive mistake, as whatever that thing was, someone locked it up for a reason, and now it's on the loose. And that's the story. It's not bad, but also kind of a little predictable and ends way, way too quickly, I feel. Like, I feel like it would have at least made some sense if there was a follow-up where the man thing comes back or something like that. Maybe they do some research on who owned the home in the past and find out some stuff. I, something. But, oh well. Moving on. Red Bull gives you wings. Now this is an obscure fucking pick, especially since the official post, as far as I can tell, only has 14 upvotes on the No Sleep subreddit from over four years ago, and the only reading that I could find of it on YouTube was from Dave the Useless, which opens with this. Oh sugar, oh honey, honey. You are my candy girl. What, uh, wait, what? You, you already did that one before? Ah, oh, shit. Oh, well. At least I tried. Just kidding. I, 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 didn't, I didn't try at all. Yeah. So, with that said, what's this story about? In short, it's uh, about a guy who drinks some Red Bull from a mysterious and shady cellar, uh, grows some weird lump like sores on his back and is in constant pain until they pop open and he grows wings. The end. It's a little longer and drawn out, uh, of course, than what I'm letting on, but that's the gist of it and nothing else really happens. So I guess it's just, you know, if Red Bull actually gave you wings, I, I guess the creepy creepypasta's idea is that it would be painful. So I, yeah, I guess the title is apt. Red Bull gives you wings. You'll never even know. This one has an interesting concept and starts with the following paragraph. Quote, 
Surveillance is a growing fact of life these days, but I now believe we've expanded the scope of human sight to dangerous levels. I'm not a master hacker by any means, but I was definitely able to Google a script to break into my neighbor's a new smart home system. Believe me when I say that ignorance is bliss and that you can never go back once you know the truth." Unquote. From here, the creepy boss follows our narrator as he notes how a neighbor of his was talking about his new security camera system that he had had installed and how it's top of the line and that it was perfect security. This statement makes our narrator scoff and laugh as when he looked it up, he found at least a dozen different scripts that could be used to hack into the system and have access to all of the camera feeds. Well, while hesitant at first, let's just say that curiosity and perhaps just plain being a nosy neighbor got the best of him and he decides to hack into their system and see what life is like in that house. Quote, I told myself I'd take one quick look and then be done with it. While loading up the script, I promised myself I'd delete it right after. Yeah, that was the right thing to do. No harm done. And if I got caught somehow, I could just explain it as a, a one-time accident. That sounds reasonable. A black window scrolled text down my screen rapidly for six seconds, and then I was in. Nerves thrilling. I watched breathlessly through a security cam feed in the living room as the girl came in, greeted her brother and father, and then headed upstairs. It was definitely the same girl I remembered, and she definitely had gotten absurdly pretty in the last year somehow. After settling into certainty, I closed the feed, deleted the scripts, and then spent a paranoid hour clearing my computer of any evidence of what I had just done. For maybe a week, I sat at home terrified that the police would break into my door and tase me at any moment. But that's the funny thing about temptation, when no consequences followed. The urge to look began eating away at me. I had a few drinks one lonely night and then went for it before I could change my mind. The son was watching television in the living room. I couldn't see what he was watching from the angle of the camera in the living room, but he seemed zoned out. My neighbor himself was sitting in the kitchen working on his laptop. Again, I couldn't see what he was doing from my angle, but he was certainly downing coffee as he worked. My pulse quickened as a hallway feed caught the daughter going from her room to the bathroom in just a towel to take a shower. Okay, you know, borderline creepish, I told myself, but it's not like I could see in the bathroom or the bedrooms, right? It, just to confirm that it, I, I couldn't, I tried various devices around the house that the neighbor had connected to the system, end quote. So, uh, yeah, kind of a creepy protagonist we have, uh, this time around. But all the same, he continued looking through their camera feeds until something extra strange caught his eye. A camera feed into their basement, where it was nearly completely black, besides a strange gray blob of pixels that was moving about. Quote, What was I seeing? Was the sensor just effective? What device was it even part of? I managed to narrow it down to a forgotten digital clock that must have been running on batteries. But nothing about this made sense. I looked up a script to sharpen video data and I let everything run all night. In the morning I pulled myself up, got coffee, sat down at my computer, and then froze. Repeatedly I played the confusing horror the script had produced. The blur of gray and shadows had become coherent, but not in a natural way. Instead, it appeared I was looking at an androgynous gray humanoid form with a pillowcase over her head. Since this was just a uh, graphical best guess, her glitchy movement brought out severe unease and disgust in me as I watched her jerkily walk around the basement. She appeared to be able to navigate despite the pillowcase covering her face, and she even made it up a few steps towards the basement door before her random movements took her back down. What the hell was I seeing? For two days I watched that thing stumble around my neighbor's basement before she finally went all the way up the stairs. It was four in the morning, and all of the three of them were asleep. This time she seemed to move with purpose. She was still not visible in any high-resolution camera, but I tracked her from sensor to sensor by her twitching blur. After so long watching her unfocused form, I was beginning to get the sense of where her legs and arms were by the movement and patterns of the gray 
Each limb moved as if on a different conflicting joint. When she walked, it was as if her ankles, knees, and thighs each wanted to go in opposite directions, and the conflict was only resolved by odd rotations and strange body angles. Gripped by terror, I watched her slowly ratchet her way through the kitchen towards the second set of stairs. There was no doubt in my mind that she was heading for the bedrooms. My knuckles went white as I gripped the edge of my table. Finally, she clambered up and out of sight of the sensors. I panicked. She still wasn't visible on the hallway camera, but I knew I had to do something. But what? If I called the house, they would have my phone number, and they would start asking questions as to why I called at 4 in the morning. There was no way I could pretend it was random. The only reason I even had my neighbor's cell phone number was that uh, I'd heard him say it out loud the week before on one of my feeds. Unquote. Our protagonist tries to distract the creature by throwing a quarter out at the window of a room in he was currently in, but when he checked the feed again, the creature seemed unfazed. Quote, Crawling back to my room, I checked the feeds. Apparently completely unperturbed by my noise, the entity had begun ratcheting her way back down the stairs. It was not fleeing into the basement. I watched as it approached the small table at the front door and began going through the mail stack there. It carefully picked out one envelope and crumbled it into oblivion in a blurred gray hand. Then it moved to the kitchen where it touched the keypad on my neighbor's laptop repeatedly for nearly a minute. What was it doing? It returned to the basement to move in lurking circles, and I sat and stared at it half awake until a shout from both my computer and my open window jolted me to full awareness. It had been my neighbor from his kitchen. He yelled loud enough for me to hear it for real. Stalking back and forth while on the phone, he was insisting that he hadn't sent any compromising emails. He'd been fired from his job. In the front hall, his son was busy looking through the pile of mail. He asked his sister and father repeatedly if any college acceptance letters had come in, but his father was too busy arguing on the phone and his sister hadn't seen any. But I had. What type of entity were we dealing with here? It hadn't physically harmed anyone, but it was still lurking in their home every hour of every day and it had made invisible moves against them by sabotaging my neighbor's job in his son's college career. At long last, my neighbor seemed to convince the other end that his account had been hacked, but he was somber and concerned about how it would reflect on him at work. The son continued on his day, oblivious of the fact that his acceptance letter had come in and been destroyed. It was then that I began to think about the timeline of what had happened. I'd resisted the urge to spy on my neighbor's family for weeks. Indeed, beyond that, he'd lived there for years. If the entity had been in his basement this entire time, then perhaps they were not physically at risk. There'd been plenty of opportunities to hurt them directly. No, this was something else. This was a specter of misfortune, a curse, an information parasite. But my neighbor had not been particularly unlucky as far as I knew. Not until, not until he'd gotten the surveillance system. A bunch of little complaints I'd heard him make suddenly began to add up. Things had been inexplicably going wrong for everyone in his family recently. Alarm clocks had been failing to go off at the proper time. Emails and texts had been a bit weird and each of the three members of his household had a general growing frustration with life. It was undermining them. It was literally lurking in the basement, lurking out of sight and sabotaging them, and they had no idea. But where had the entity come from? Almost all of the devices and cameras had been there before. The only difference is that they had been integrated. Did observation have an effect on the physical universe? I was no quantum physics expert, but I knew that observation was a crucial part of existence. Did overlapping connected layers of observation somehow enable this entity to slide into our world? When you put all the pieces together, did the whole add up to more than the sum of the parts? I began thinking of a plan of action that involves sneaking over there and turning off all their devices in the hopes of banishing the entity in their basement. But as I did so, I looked down and to the left at my cell phone. It sat quietly glowing on the table. 
for I had moved my hand above it and activated its motion sensor. Then I looked up and noticed the webcam above my monitor that was always kept pointed at myself. Then I looked to the to my right at my television is self-containing a sensor, and the game console behind it that had also had sensors to detect my motion. Microphones, cameras, everywhere. I'd applied for so many internships last summer and gotten none. I'd missed dates and lost budding relationships because of texting troubles. Everything had felt hard and difficult lately. That's why I was sitting alone on my computer most nights. I sat without breathing for nearly 20 seconds. There would be no plan. There would be no action taken. My neighbors would have uh, to fend for themselves. I let out my breath, put my hands back on my mouse and keyboard, and loaded up, uh, up a computer game. It would look like I'd given up to anyone watching. Unquote. And that's the story of You'll Never Even Know, and I think it's actually a very different and uniquely creepy idea to have a creature that goes out of its way to ruin one's life through quiet, simple little actions rather than kill you or harm you physically. It also was a pretty decent subversion since I'm sure most people assumed by the way the story was going that the family was keeping some inbred monster down there or that it was a creature like the rake coming to kill them all at some point. I also like that the protagonist is kind of a piece of shit spying on his neighbors and that this is how he gained this information about the, well, I don't know what you would call it, security connection beast? That is kind of the strangest part of the story. Why does having the cameras and everything connected bring out the beast? It almost makes me want to assume that the monster isn't actually real, and it's more of a manifestation of a greater metaphor. Maybe about how connecting all parts of your life to technology can allow terrible people or organizations, the beast, the ability to ruin your life. I'm not 100% sure if that's what the author was going for, uh, but it is all the same pretty fucking cool interpretation, I'd say. And if nothing else, is a very unique concept for a creepypasta. Jason the Toymaker. Ah, uh, back to those tried and true slasher villain creepypastas. This one being created a bit after my time it would seem, as while it's not new by any means, it did come out by the time I was personally taking a little bit of a break from creepypastas. I've always been listening and reading them throughout the years, but uh, this one was written around 2015 or so, which would have been around the time I started looking into other genres, shall we say. At any rate, Jason the Toymaker focuses on an orphan with amnesia who has a bunch of toys with vague memories of their past as they see through dreams more often than not. Well, around the time they start sleeping with a particular doll in their bed, they start having dreams of being tortured, as well as others around them being tortured as well. Well, to make a long story short, these dreams and visions of the past and amnesia all sort of come to a head and are finally connected through a dream that eventually turns into reality, somehow, by a creepy looking goth dude named Jason the Toymaker. You see, Jason the Toymaker wants our protagonist to be by his side forever. And he seems jealous of them being around their friends, adoptive family, or really with anyone else, period. With the prime example being our protagonist's friend, Daisy, who Jason the Toymaker turned into a fleshy doll. This interacting with Jason makes our protagonist realize something though, that this had happened before, that Jason was a demon that had followed them since birth, that their mind keeps repressing and whom was responsible for killing their original parents to begin with. So after this shocking revelation, our orphan's adopted parents end up trying to save them from this toy maker demon, only to end up being killed by him. But not before the orphan makes a deal with Jason that they will come with them if they promise to not kill their adopted mom. Well, Jason kills her anyway and then takes the orphan away to become a doll as well. Because, uh, I mean, yeah, he wasn't gonna abide by any 
promise, I suppose, of the end. Now, I know I just skimmed through a fairly long story there, but honestly, this one's just kind of boring to me. And I really try to give things my best shot, but when writing down my thoughts about this one and trying to, like, summarize it, I, it nothing was clicking. It's just kind of feels like a lesser laughing jack in a way. It's never explained why Jason is so infatuated with this one orphan since they were born. He just kind of is. And it's not in a very scary and mysterious way, just more of a, oh, okay then, I guess kind of way. Nothing is ever really explained, and basically as soon as Jason the Toy Maker is revealed, everyone dies, and that's pretty much it. I'm not even sure if there's an official prequel or origin story to Jason the Toy Maker. I tried looking it up and I, I couldn't quite find it. I found a lot of like fan related stuff, but not from the original creator as far as I could tell. So we're left with a lot of just loose ends and really not much to go on. That said, I guess his ability or his way of killing people uh, by means of turning them into little toys for him to play with is kind of a cool and, you know, creepy idea, so I'll give the story that. And again, it's not the worst of its kind by any means, it's just very bland. That being said, the artist that created Jason the Toymaker seems like a pretty talented person. I mean, just look at all this art. I really dig their style, so a huge shout out to them. I may not be a fan of the story all that much, but I can appreciate a good design if nothing else. And it's certainly much more creative than our next entry. Homicidal Lou. So things have finally come full circle. You guys remember way back on Tier 1 when we were talking about Jeff the Killer, yeah? And like the other dozen times he's shown up across the iceberg, I suppose. Okay, well do you remember in that original story that he had a brother who seemed to love him deeply and who he seemed to love back? But in the end, Jeff ended up killing him anyway? Named Lou? Well, this short story asked the question, what if Lou had survived that night? and wait for it, became Jeff the Killer too, Or as the story so eloquently names him, Homicidal Lou. Now what's funny about this story is the majority of it is just going back over certain parts of Jeff the Killer's story but from Lou's perspective. And since he's a pretty one note character, you already know what his perspective is anyway. If you're wondering if he did anything interesting in like Juvie or if that's like part of the origin, no, not, not a fucking all. Then we get to Jeff killing him, we get the details about how Louie felt. And then in the finale of the story, we see Lou waking up in a hospital, hearing the nurse say he's lucky to have survived that demon. A voice inside Lou's head tells him to kill the nurse, and so uh, he does. And then he hides the body and walks out of the hospital. Now a killer just like Jeff. The end. I mean, wow. You know it's bad when even I had higher expectations. I thought the story would have at least been following Louis in the aftermath of what happened. Maybe trying to find his brother, maybe he wants revenge, maybe he wants to reason with him. I don't fucking know, something somber and dark like that. But instead we get a lazy retelling of Jeff the Killer, and then Louis is just randomly a killer now, and that's it. It ends right fucking there really does a good job in showcasing that as bad as Jeff the Killer is, fuck me can it be done so much worse. At least Jeff the Killer was made by somebody who was trying to tell a story. This is just being lazy now. But that didn't stop Homicidal Lou from becoming one of those famous emo boy creepypasta icons anyway. This one in particular being a testament that it doesn't take much to be part of that club. Super Mario 128. This one is an old classic creepypasta, written by the same guy who wrote uh, the Dead Bart one, funny enough. So, is it any good? Well, it starts with the following. Quote, Mario has been a gaming icon for decades, and has been in more games than can be counted. 
Although no year in recent memory has gone past without some type of Mario game being released, series fans will remember the nearly decade-long drought of original Mario platformers. From 1997 to 2005, there was only one new Mario platformer released, Super Mario Sunshine. During the second part of this drought after Sunshine's release, the mysterious Super Mario 128 was the main focus of the fanbase. No concrete information was given on the game, and eventually series creator Shigeru Miyamoto claimed it had simply been a series of test concepts that were never intended to be an actual game. The mystery faded from memory as the Mario drought finally ended and most people forgot about the game that had once been the better center of every Mario fan's imagination." Unquote. The author goes on to describe how the game Cubera was a tough time for Nintendo, how the video game market was favoring darker, more violent and mature games, and this put pressure on them to move alongside the market, or starkly go against it. According to the author, Nintendo's idea was to experiment with giving some of their franchises an edge, Mario included, with Luigi's Mansion being an example of this. While Mario Sunshine was more so made to test the waters, pun intended, to see how well the traditional approach worked. While Nintendo would end up suffering a fair bit more during this era and were clear losers in the console war by this point, and so a darker Mario project was cooked up, or revitalized, that being titled Super Mario 128. The author then goes on to describe how no one knows exactly what went on with Nintendo at this time, notably everything regarding Super Mario 128, but that a ROM of the game was apparently leaked online for anyone to try and play. And from here, the story is the author's recollection of the game, getting into more familiar video game creepypasta territory now. Quote, the game was clearly in early beta. The title screen was nothing but white text saying Super Mario 128 against a black background. There was no options menu or save file selection either. After the title screen, the game started. Bowser's laugh from Super Mario 64 looped in the background while a plain text box displayed this dialogue. Mario, I have taken Princess Peach and she will not live to see the sun rise tomorrow unless you take her place. You know what to do and where to go. Do not try and stop me unless you want to hasten her death. The game certainly was going for a darker tone. After I made the text box go away, I was thrust right into gameplay. The first thing I noticed was Mario's character model. His body was as detailed as in Super Mario Galaxy, although a little more realistically proportioned but his head was taken from his Super Mario 64 character model. Obviously, his design wasn't finished yet. The setting was a sky level. There was some simple platforms floating in the air. The rest of the area was just blue sky and several clouds scrolling in the background. The clouds seemed more realistic than the usual cartoony puffs in Mario games. They were quite graphically impressive. There was no music or full voice samples from Mario, but there were sound effects slash grunts when he jumped. The jumping was more subdued than any other Mario games. Jump as high as he usually did and had little control over his movement in the air. The different types of jumps in every 3D Mario wasn't present. I played through the level. There was nothing especially notable about the gameplay. Enemies didn't seem to have been added yet. I just jumped from platform to platform and it wasn't very challenging. As I went through the level, I noticed the graphics gradually changing. The sky became more and more cloudy until it was entirely composed of clouds. The cloud background gradually turned to a dark gray. After this, it started to rain. I reached a small platform with a toad on it. He looked like the Super Mario Galaxy model. When I landed on his platform, dialogue appeared. <laughs> We don't want you anymore, Mario! You don't belong here! Just give Bowser what he wants! Die! After the text box went away, I no longer had control of Mario. Mario just stood there for a while, then turned around and walked off the platform. His body seemed to go limp as he fell." Unquote. From here, Mario falls into this real-world cityscape, where he lays there in pain and defeat. 
people walk by him, most ignoring him, others looking down upon him with a sort of hatred. Eventually, our narrator can once again gain control of Mario, and he explores the cityscape until he finds an out-of-place house. When he approaches the house, it has the title of House of Torn Memories as its level title. When he enters the house, one of the first things he finds are two children's skeletons on the couch next to one another, in front of a broken TV. Then a hyper-realistic Bowser jumps up from the floor. Okay, to be fair, the author doesn't call it hyper-realistic, it just happens to be a good description for what he looks like in the game. Quote, You've been keeping me waiting long enough, Mario. I will taste flesh soon. Will you finally surrender, or does Peach have to die? I still didn't have control. Mario just stood there, shivering for several seconds before nodding his head. Bowser impaled Mario with his claws. There was no blood, but it was clear from the animation and sound effects that the sharp digits of Bowser's hands had gone through Mario's body. In one swift motion, Bowser dragged Mario up to his face and bit his head off. Again, there was no blood or graphic details left behind on Mario's neck, just Mario's character model being destroyed. The screen faded to black, in white text, another level name appeared, Mario's Eternal Home. Mario's character model was whole again when the level started. It was the only thing on the screen besides the black background. It was floating as if in space. I could somewhat control it, but it felt more like I was deciding the general direction in which Mario would tumble than fully controlling him. As I drifted towards no apparent destination, voices faded in. They were echoing, deep voices telling Mario that he was worthless, that the world no longer had any use for him, and everyone would be better off if he was dead. High-pitched crying was layered onto the voices after a bit. It sounded like it was supposed to be Mario's cries. This really disturbed me and I found myself fighting back tears. For reasons I couldn't understand, this was affecting me on an emotional level. The voices and aimless wandering went on for several minutes until I spotted a light gray speck in the distance. I moved towards it. It took a very long time to reach and grew closer at a much slower rate than it should have. When I was close enough to make it out, I saw it was a tombstone. It was a very plain one with cracks in several places. When I got right next to the tombstone, I could see the writing on it. I, I turned off the system right after reading it. I am not going to play the beta or hack or whatever this was again. There was a single word written on the tombstone. Innocence. Unquote. And that's the story of Mario 128. Funny how the author really likes ending stories with ominous tombstones, huh? But yeah, it's alright. I mean, is it the best? No. Is it scary? Not really. Uh, to me, anyway. But considering the absolute shit we've read connected to Super Mario on this iceberg, this isn't too bad. Which is a lot, lot more than what I can say about our next entry. Time Travel Journal. Okay, so I'm going to attempt to read this in full. I don't really want to analyze it, because if I do, I'm pretty sure the brain rot that I would get from doing so would finally reach my central nervous system. So, with that said, allow me to present to you one of the absolute worst of the worst. The cream of the crop. Quote, January 9th, 1987. What was it tomorrow I venture in the cave? I don't know what to expect, but if anyone finds this journal, I'm dead. John Terry missing since 1987. Journal entry number one, January 3rd, 1792. I'm finally in a new state. I just can't wait until I finish my log cabin. Journal Entry 10. It was a monster that killed my mother. A monster, I tell you. It had giant eyes, long legs, and a heart on its head. But it had no head. It's just not there. Jackson McCarthy died due to severe mauling and blood loss. January 1st. 
1733. I saw something in the woods. I went to investigate. I heard a scream. Something I had never heard before. It sent chills through my spine. It jumped at me. It ripped my arm clean off. The pain was horrible in ways I cannot describe. I ran to the nearest town in New York. I know I'm not gonna make it, but I will never forget what I saw. I call it the SHINGER! Marcus Matt Fang died by blood loss January 5th, 1700. Something terrible happened. The people on board the McCarthy were found dead. I saw something crawl out of the ship, something I saw in England. But I must have, but I must be just par paranoid. I should just get to sleep. John Doe missing since he went on a hunting trip January question mark 1899 I'm going to die today I'm going to shoot myself better to die than that beast if you were reading this tell Lisa I love her Jack Adams died of self exit the game all of the men who died were in their 40s to late 50s so I know I'm gonna die because of Doe goodbye cruel world bang bang oh no clashing matthew torin died by question mark unquote i hope to our merciful god that this was just a troll poster because if it wasn't if it isn't <laughs> yeah we're moving on blind maiden website so this one's a bit of an urban legend website of sorts, and very short, so let's read it in full. Quote, There's a website that offers its users the choice to experience the ultimate horror. This website's called blindmaiden.com is supposedly a site dedicated to a doomed spirit that will enter the home of people who have viewed it. However, no matter how hard you try, your browser won't allow you to enter the site. You see, to access the site, you must wait until exactly 12 a.m., making sure that the night in question is a new moon night. You must be on your own in your home with all the lights turned off. Only when these conditions are met will you be granted access to the site. As soon as you enter, you will see a montage of pictures being displayed quickly. These images are of boys and girls without eyes, and faces that are twisted in tremendous fear. After that, text will appear on the monitor saying, This website will take you to a whole new level of horror. A horror that will use all five of your senses. You must be very careful not to click on anything by accident. You will be faced with a real experience of absolute horror. Click the accept button to engage actively in the experience. If you click decline, you will be rewarded with access to the entire archive of those gruesome images. A gore site pretty much. Click accept however, and there will be no turning back. You have sealed your fate, and trust me, you will experience the ultimate horror. Upon accepting, you will see a sinister silhouette walking towards your home on your monitor. The spirit will then approach and enter the same room that you are in. You will then see your own back on the monitor, and you will feel the presence behind you. Suddenly, you will feel somebody tapping on your shoulder, and as you turn around, you will see the blind maiden's face and scream in terror, and that will be the last thing that you will do, as she will then kill you. The blind maiden will then pluck your eyes out and take a photo of your face. Congratulations, you have successfully completed the ritual. As a reward, that photo will forever be a part of the website's picture gallery, just like all the other photos of people who were stupid or curious enough to press the accept button. And yes, if you are a thrill seeker, then you will love the last few moments of your life." Unquote. And that's a story. A pretty short and simple, but a fairly creepy concept all the same. I'm always a sucker for website-based stories and urban legends, be they simply about a strange group of fetishy creeps, or something ground in dark reality, or something like this which is just purely paranormal. So, eh, not too bad.
the worst experience to awaken to. This one yet again seems very obscure. You can always tell when this is the case, and when looking up to see if any of the many creepypasta YouTubers have read the story, it yields little to no results. That's when we got ourselves a certified underground pasta, though I make that sound a lot cooler than it actually is though. Anyway, this pasta is actually pretty fun and creepy. It opens with our narrator trapped in the web, upside down in some dark, dank basement. He struggles to get free, but just simply can't, which is freaking him out more and more as the seconds to minutes roll by since he's claustrophobic and, I mean, it's just kind of a fucked up place to be in anyway. Well, it's then that a strange woman walks down the basement stairs and is soon revealed to be the woman he was hitting it off with over coffee the other day. They end up going to her place and did the deed, but then he fell unconscious. Turns out, she is actually a giant crazy spider woman, but one that believes he would be the perfect father to her children. So she shoots a tube down his throat and puts all her eggs inside him. After what can only be described as upside down, tied up, male preggers constipation spider diarrhea, he does end up birthing the creature somehow. And when he wakes up after the long several days of it feeling like there was a cacophony of legs tearing at his insides, he's now free. And when he goes to leave the basement, he finds a room full of spider children, all covered in goo, which all immediately run to him, hug him, with real love for their new father, to which our narrator notes that he guesses that today is his first real Father's Day. The end. Short, very gross, but the ending really sold me on it since it's weirdly wholesome. Well, you know, when you get past the whole spider woman rape, the upside down, tied up, male preggers, constipation, spider diarrhea, and just general fucking grossness of the story, it does have a dark comedy edge to it that I kind of dig over at taking the concept fully seriously. Not bad. The boy who loved to read. Once there was a boy who loved to read. He read everything he could get his hands on and loved going to his favorite bookstore. One day the boy realized he had read everything the store had to offer. He confronted the owner and asked him if he had anything the boy had never checked out. The owner said, why yes I do, and pulled out a book called Death. He gladly sold it to the boy at the discounted price of $50. However, he warned the boy never to read the front page. Well, the boy returned to his house and read the book and he was content. However, he always wondered what could be on that front page. It was always in the back of his mind, until one day the temptation was just too much for the boy to bear. And so he flipped to the very front of the book and dropped the book in horror. There, in bold print, was MSRP 799. World's Best School Psychologist. So this one's unlike any other we've seen on this iceberg thus far, and it really went in a direction I wasn't expecting. So the story starts with our protagonist noting the following, quote, when I was 12, I came to the conclusion that everyone in the world, including my own family, was against me. I was never a problemed child, but my parents sure treated me like one. For example, I used to need to be home by 5pm every day. This clearly restricted my amount of playtime outdoors. I wasn't allowed to have friends over to play at the house, nor was I allowed to go over anyone else's. I had to finish homework directly after I came home from school, no matter how long it took. My parents refused to buy me video games and forced me to read books and then write a book report on them to prove I actually read it. Not even though those rules listed above were quite frustrating to me as a child, they aren't what upset me the most. What really hurt me was the lack of compassion on behalf of my parents. My mother was a bitter woman who always made me feel guilty of accidents or mistakes I've made. My father only knew one emotion, frustration. The only time he spoke to me was when he screamed at me for receiving poor test scores or beat me for misbehaving. But enough about them. Let's talk about my school psychologist. And for his own privacy, we will call him Dr. Tanner." Unquote. 
From here, our protagonist talks about his interaction with Dr. Tanner and how he tells him all his issues that he has with his parents and how they treat him. Uh, Dr. Tanner then says the following, quote, You know, I'm the best school psychologist in the world. I promise we will fix this. I rolled my eyes. Okay, but how, I asked. I have my ways, he replied. I'm a man of my word. I promise within just one month, the relationship between you and your parents will change for the better, forever. After a brief pause, he continued. Although I do need you to make me a promise, you have to promise me that you'll come back to my office after school tomorrow and that you won't tell anyone that we had this conversation today. It'll be our little secret, I promised, unquote. Well, the next day comes and Dr. Tanner and our narrator talk about various topics before he is then offered a soda from Tanner, something which he nearly never got the chance to drink, so he of course took it. It wasn't long before then that he passed out from the drugs that Dr. Tanner had put into his drink. Quote, It took me a minute or so to adjust my blurred vision upon waking, and when I did I had no idea what to think. I was handcuffed to a bed and my mouth was sealed with duct tape. I immediately began to panic, squirming and tugging at my cuffs, but gave up soon after. My eyes widened in disbelief after looking around the room. There were posters of superheroes pinned up on all the walls, and photographs of famous athletes on shelves. In the middle of the room was an old television and Super Nintendo. Various game cartridges stacked alongside it. I didn't know what to think. Here I am in a room filled with items most kids would die to play with. I would have probably cried from joy had I been handcuffed to the bed frame. My stomach sank once again as the door opened and Dr. Tanner walked inside. He sat down on the edge of the bed. Now, listen, he said. Remember that I'm here to help you and I would never hurt you, okay? Dr. Tanner gently removed the tape from my mouth and then the cuffs from my hands. My first instinct was to begin crying, but something about Dr. Tanner made me feel safe. He smiled at me. You're going to be staying here for a while, he continued. And during this time, you're allowed to play with any toys in this room while I'm here at home. But when I leave the house, I'll need to cuff one of your hands back to the bed. You can still watch the television but I want you to only watch the news channel when I'm away. I sat in silence, still trying to process the information he had given me. So, Dr. Tanner yipped, slapping me on the knee. You go ahead and knock yourself out. I'll be back when it's time for dinner. He got up from the bed, walked across the room, and clicked the TV's power button before locking the door behind him. Several more minutes passed before I realized that Dr. Tanner wasn't joking. All that was left for me to do was boot up a Nintendo and play Mario until nightfall. At about 7pm, Dr. Tanner returned to the room carrying two plates of mashed potatoes and chicken strips. I finally gathered up the courage to ask him how long I'd be staying in this room. Well, about a month, he replied, give or take a few weeks. I just have some work I need to do, unquote. As the story goes on, our narrator spends his time in this room, and he eventually sees that there is a statewide Amber Alert for him on the news, with several investigators looking for potential abductors. Quote, I began to feel nauseous as a photograph of me appeared on the screen. It was my yearbook picture from last year. The captions for the photograph displayed my name and age my school and my town. Above my picture were alternating titles, FBI begins search for child, and kidnapping suspect unknown, and potential runaway. The live footage continued and two figures I soon recognized as my mom and dad stepped up to the podium. Both appeared to have reddened eyes. Tears streamed down my mother's face as she took hold of the microphone. I'd never seen so much emotion come from my mother before as she wept on live television, stuttering on sentences such as, please return my baby back to me, and I'm so sorry, and please come home to us. When my father took the microphone, I nearly expected his attitude to be stone cold, but he too had tears in his eyes. He pleaded to the world to bring his son home safely, and lastly, begged for my forgiveness. 
I know I haven't been the best father, but God damn it, do I wish I had been now. Please bring my boy back. I turned the power off shortly after. My emotions were mixed, for I had never once seen my father cry. I felt miserable that my parents were being put through so much, but at the same time I felt relief. I now know how much my mom and dad love me." Unquote. You might be able to imagine where the story is going next, with him being kidnapped for a month, his mom and dad realizing how important he is to them, and then eventually he goes back to them and things are better. But Dr. Tanner takes things a little further than that. Quote, One morning when Dr. Tanner woke me before heading off to work, I noticed a stern look on his face. I also realized that it was three hours earlier than when he usually wakes me. You need to watch the news today. No exceptions. I want you to keep the television on all day and pay close attention to it, he stated grimly. I of course complied and watched him exit the room. About two hours later, a breaking news segment interrupted the toothpaste commercial I was watching. The title, Human Remnants Found. Two staunch looking men in suits stood aside one another and began speaking. We are displeased to bring up such unfortunate news this morning regarding our missing child case from earlier this month. One of the men bowed his head while the one speaking shoved through some papers. He continued, Remains of a body have been found in a garbage bag beneath a highway overpass. The body appears to be that of a child, although not much of it is left. The body has been decapitated, and much has been burnt to ash and bone. The screen shifted over to a helicopter view of the freeway. Dozens of police cars gathered near the bottom of a tall overpass. The man's voice could still be heard. Within the bag, police found a junior high school identification card labeled as such. The screen showed the school ID card I always kept in my backpack. The plastic was sort of melted away, but my photograph and name were intact. After the two men dismissed themselves, the camera panned over to my parents. They were sitting among reporters. My mother's face held a painful grimace, and my father sulked his head down at his knees. I shut off the television. Dr. Tanner returned home very late. He hurried into the room, unlocked my cuffs, and placed a bottle of fizzing water into my hand. He placed his hands upon my shoulders and smiled. I made a promise, didn't I? I nodded tears squeezing their ways out of my eyes. You need to make me a promise again, he whispered. He told me that I needed to drink all the water in the bottle. It would help me sleep, and that from here on I am never to tell anyone that I ever met him. I promised. I told you. I'm the best school psychologist in the world, didn't I? And he was right. I awoke later that night to find myself lying in the middle of a park. Stars shining brilliantly across the night sky. I recognized the park. It wasn't too far away from my school. A mile or so down the road. I saw my house. The lights were off inside, but I could still make out my father sitting on the step leading to the front door. I hesitantly called out to him. He lifted his head slowly, but when he saw it was me, he sprang to his feet ran towards me, arms open, yelling my name. My mother erupted from the house behind him. Dr. Tanner was right. My parents smile more often and treat me lovingly. I could not have asked for a more perfect ending. Every now and then I see Dr. Tanner on campus, talking to and from his office. Rarely do we ever make eye contact, let alone speak to one another. But sometimes he'll shoot me a wink and a smile. I'll always keep my promise to him to pretend I never met him. But there will always be the one question forever floating in my mind. Who did Dr. Tanner decapitate and throw off the overpass?" Unquote. And that's the story of the best school psychologist, and boy, is it a strange one. It's kind of a creepypasta with a sweeter ending, to some degree, relatively speaking. Since I'll be honest, I kind of was expecting Dr. Tanner to eventually find an excuse to keep our protagonist there with him, and that he would eventually kill the kid's parents or something like that, I don't know, something of that sort. Him being played totally straight is actually a pretty good subversion in of itself, well, except for the part that he did kill somebody, uh, for added effect on the parents, 
but I suppose. I guess it kind of goes with the cartoonishly forward approach of Tanner. Instead of talking with the parents or solving the issues, why not just simply kidnap their child so they are forced into caring about him? Why not kill a child so that they think their child is dead so when he comes back they love him even more, thinking that they lost him forever? Though that last part, it does feel a little extra since I'm sure just the kidnapping would have sufficed. Plus they gotta wonder, where was their son? Who was the kid that they thought was him? Why was his ID on the dead child? What if his parents just get mad at him even more because they assume that he ran away from them? What if it only serves as a good justification for the parents being even more strict to him? Dr. Tanner would have had to have made up a pretty good story for a protagonist to tell to keep up this lie or some kind of way of keeping the peace around there. And even if he did escape the clutches of a madman as a cover-up story, wouldn't the police be interested in talking to him since there is at least one dead kid in the area right now that just so happens to have our protagonist's school ID on him? Isn't that a little suspicious? Wouldn't that actually cause a lot of fucking trouble for our protagonist, potentially? I guess what I'm saying is, is there's a ton of jumps in logic for all of this to work out as a story that seems to want to tell. It also kind of has that whole, I don't know, childhood fantasy of running away from home and then your parents like really being worried about you and then completely changing when you get back home. It's, it is kind of childish in that way and maybe that was on purpose, but I don't know. It just doesn't really click with me. But as it stands, I like the concept, but I think it needed a little bit more time in the oven. Happy Sun Daycare. Maybe I'm just growing more cynical as this tier goes on, but this is legit one of the most boring creepypastas I've read in a while. It's about a guy who's interviewing people who used to work at a daycare called, uh, well, Happy Sun Daycare. And by some coincidence, the daycare just so happened to be holding a dark secret. That secret being that one of the employees was a werewolf. And there was a room with a gray door that they would put children into if they were bad so that they could get scratched up by said werewolf. That's the whole story basically. I know I'm not really doing it justice here by just summarizing it so quickly like that, but again, it just wasn't much going on with this one. I think what made it so boring was the way the story was delivered. That being through our narrator interviewing people and the interviews always going the exact same way. Something like this. How was it like working or being a kid at the daycare? Oh, it was perfectly normal. Pretty boring, honestly. Huh, okay, so it's pretty normal and boring, honestly, okay. Well, uh, did anything weird happen? Oh, well actually, yes. Let me tell you about the shadiest shit ever in the most melodramatic fashion I can possibly muster. By the third time this exact exchange happened, I laughed out loud because by then, he's talking to a person who had went to prison and he's now crying over the darkness of that gray door's content. Before that, he was talking to like a nanny of the place who was talking about how things were normal and it was a pretty easy going job. You know, other than the fact that children were constantly getting scratched and harmed there and they had no idea who was doing it. That there are cries and roars of some kind of beast which haunts her to this very day. So I wasn't much of a fan of this one. But hey, I guess at least it's about a werewolf. You very rarely see stories about them in creepypastas, so there's that I suppose. I taught creative writing and two stories stood out to me. Now this is a good fucking creepypasta. Before this iceberg, I had once again never read this one before, but I'm glad that I did because it has so many of the elements that I personally enjoy in a creepypasta. An interesting protagonist slash narrator, or at least one that has an interesting perspective. A good creepy hook and mystery to uncover, twists and turns, and some ominous ambiguity that leaves you pondering the story after. It opens with the following. Quote, Fresh out of college, I took a teaching job in a small town in central Wisconsin. In my sophomore creative writing class, I signed a flash fiction exercise around Halloween. We'd studied urban legends and folklore, and it was the students' turn to construct stories of their own. Assignment link 100 to 1000 words. Directions? Scare me. The submission quality was to be expected. These were sophomores after all. But 
one story stood out halfway through my stack of papers. A piece by a quiet student named Jake. His first person flash fiction seemed so real, like it was dipped in reality, a little too closely. Almost like he wasn't making it up, but had been retelling something that happened to him. Uh, I put it aside, impressed. Kate's submission was the last paper in the stack. I remember reading the experience vividly, the beads of sweat accumulating around my temples, the clickety-clack of the red pen in my hand, and a weird feeling of dread in the pit of my stomach. I placed it on top of Jake's story and I thought, what the hell am I going to do? I still have photocopies of the original stories and I often wonder, why do I still have these? But there is something about them. They are so interconnected, and there is something so raw and beautiful about them. I have a strong affinity for interesting student writing, and it'd be a shame to let the flames of these stories be extinguished. I'll share the student pieces and the subsequent events that transpired right here. I do enjoy a good story, unquote. From here, we are presented with a story entitled Jake's Flash Fiction. And it follows the tale of when he and his family would go to visit their grandma Rosie at the nursing home. She would always stare out the window, come spring or snow, with big bulky headphones attached in onto her radio, which was always turned on to the station 89.1, which was nothing but static. Something which kind of worried Jank. This all came to a head when, quote, I visited one day to drop off a box of chocolates. Grandma Rosie rocked slowly in her chair, with large headphones over her ears, staring out the window, watching the snow fall. I couldn't tell if she knew I was there. I walked over and placed the chalks on the small table, and her hand suddenly reached across and snatched my wrist. Shh, she whispered. Listen. Grandma Rosie leaned in close, and I put my ear to hers. I lifted up the cup of her headphone and listened. There was only static. I was about to speak, but she covered my mouth with her hand. Listen closer, she said. I did, but all I heard was more static. Soon they will come, she said. They will come and to take me away. This freaked me out a little, and I went home and I told my mom and dad about what happened, but they didn't think it was all that weird. I kept thinking about it. One night I couldn't sleep, so I buzzed my friend Abby on our walkie-talkies. She lived across the street and somehow she knew all about Station 89.1. She told me it was an old legend in our town, and you needed two things to explore the legend further. A radio and a closet with a door slightly open. Face away from the closet, tune in to 89.1 and listen very closely. At some point through the static, You'll hear the faint sounds of an organ, distant screams, and the dragging of metal chains along a gravely surface. The open doorway is an invitation. Keep your eyes closed, and only if you keep your eyes closed, a figure will appear and drag you into the closet. From there, your fate is unknown. How do you know this? I asked. I've heard about it, she said. Don't tell anyone. The less people that know, the better. I looked out my window and saw Abby in her bedroom. She put her finger up to her lips. It's our secret. The walkie-talkie buzzed. For the next few days, I kept thinking about the ritual and Grandma Rosie. Why would she be playing this game? Why did she want to be dragged into an unknown fate? I again told my parents that I was worried about Grandma Rosie. They were very dismissive. Ever since Grandpa died, I think she just wants to let go, my mom said. She wants to be with him. I wanted to know more, so I decided to try the game myself. It was late at night, and I opened my closet door just a crack. I sat on my bed with my back to the closet, tuned my radio to 89.1, and put on my headphones. I heard the static, and I closed my eyes. I sat there for a long time, focusing very hard on the static, the longer I sat there, the more I felt like my room was shrinking. Kind of like the space was filling up with something else. Like I wasn't alone. In my headphones, I heard the distant organ, and I heard the screams that seemed far away. 
It sounded like they were getting closer. The screeching of the metal began, and then I heard a voice. Open your eyes! I jumped from my bed very startled. Happy was laughing hysterically through the walkie-talkie. I looked around my bedroom. I was alone. I looked out the window and saw Abby, smiling and giggling. She brought the walkie-talkie up to her mouth. <laughs> I totally scared you, she said. There's no one there. You're such a wuss. I noticed the closet door was wide open. The static of 89.1 hissed from my headphones. I was only joking, the walkie-talkie chirped. But I wasn't so sure it was a joke. Grandma Rosie died two weeks later in her sleep. Her time had come, and I was done fooling around with legends and superstitions." Unquote. The story obviously impressed our primary narrator, since it had a mysterious legend, sentimental characterizations, and an ambiguous ending. And he thought that it was all made up, fiction, until he read the second story, Kate's Flash Fiction. Quote, Panic. Fear. No one would believe me, not ever. I told him I was joking about everything. He helps me sleep at night. But I know what I saw. A young boy, a ritual, and death. Death itself, a black death with a clutching grip, an entity that surrounds its victim, dragging a companion to its secret and eternal lair. But I was joking, joking all along, which made it okay. I had to know, no more. I went to her room. It felt recently vacated, like the plug had just been pulled from a sink. Headphones on the floor. Static. Nothing but static. Noises from the closet. Labored breathing. Fingernails squeaking on the door from the inside. I clutched the handle. Something. Something else. Something dark. Can't open it. Won't open it. Refuse to let it out. I slowly back away, a tiny voice squeaking. Help me! Static echoing in the small room, nothing but static. I close the door on my way out. Won't let it out. Won't tell. Will never tell. My story doesn't exist. It's simply not there. It's nothing but static. Unquote. This seemed to be two stories that were very much intertwined, as our narrator notes. Quote, This seems real. A few days after Halloween, I kept Kate after school. I wanted to know more. Specifically, was she the Abby character in Jake's story? And was she confessing to visiting the grandmother in her own piece? I pulled out Kate's flash fiction. I asked her how she wrote it. What was her inspiration? She shrugged. I guess it's avant-garde. I was just experimenting with ideas. Did you like it? I nodded. It was an interesting piece, I told her. Have you ever heard of 89.1? Kate asked me. I started to speak but couldn't. A few words sputtered out but were interrupted by Kate's laughing. Oh my gosh, Mr. Patrick, the whole thing was just a joke. Kate explained how she and Jake conspired to write multiple viewpoints of the same story, partially as a creative writing exercise, but mainly just to screw with me. The whole thing was made up. It was a Halloween prank. We so got you, Mr. Patrick, Kate laughed. Uh, I smiled uncomfortably. It was a good one. And yes, they got me. I told her that I enjoyed her piece. Let's continue developing your avant-garde writing and enjoy your Halloween. But something didn't feel right. I had drinks with a veteran, freshman English instructor, me the first year teacher in a new town, and he, the wily old mentor. I told him about the assignment and the stories Jake and Kate turned in. He laughed and thought about it a bit more. That just seems off, he said. Did Jake and Kate conspire to play a joke? They were thick as thieves in my class at the start of the school year. But in the fall, they stopped talking. Wouldn't even look at each other anymore. Had some sort of falling out. I guess they made up, unquote. For the next few weeks, our narrator watched Jake and Kate closely both in his class and in the hallways, and they never seemed to speak once to one another, which seemed very odd that they would then make up this prank together. Later, he would talk to Jake about how he's been enjoying watching his growth as a writer, and that that Halloween flash fiction piece and prank both him and Kate did on him was great, which Jake awkwardly replied with a simple, 
We got you good, huh? Jake would go on to claim that everything in the story was made up. The grandmother Rosie, Station 89.1, etc. Quote, I told him good job and to keep writing. Still, the situation seemed amiss. Like I was missing part of the act. Was it possible that these two were so committed to screwing with me that they wouldn't even speak at school? Or maybe they were dating and didn't want anyone else to know. So they played it cool in the hallways in class? They were 15 year olds after all. That seemed reasonable. But it was keeping me awake at night. Nothing else mattered. I taught during the day and I obsessed over the stories in the evening. News, sports, and current events faded to the background. The real world slipped away. I pushed forward. Armed with a couple of possible last names, thank you school records, I called senior citizen homes in the area. I was trying to track down my mom's old friend, Rosie, I told them. Each phone call followed the same script. The receptionist went through the files and found nothing. No one was there by either last name I had. I scoured the internet. I spent too much time in the stacks of the local library. I found no folklore or urban legends relating to 89.1. And each time I felt like quitting, I pulled out my photocopy of Kate's story. She had visited Jake's grandmother. It simply felt so real. I knew it wasn't fake! In a last ditch effort, I spent a lot of time alone in my room, listening to the static of 89.1, with my eyes closed and the door slightly ajar. I'd hone in on the static, and I'd listen deeply and intently for the chimes of an organ, the harsh and troubled screams in the distance, and the clickety clank of the middle chains. Sometimes I'd think it was there, and I just had to focus a little harder, and I'd sense a presence in my bedroom about to creep out of my closet, the dark mist waiting to drag me away. I wanted it to come, because I wanted this story to be real, but it didn't come. One day at school, I saw Jake and Kate smiling and laughing at Jake's locker. I walked past them and Kate winked at me. That was the clincher. I finally succumbed to the notion that I'd been had. It was over. I ended my search for 89.1. I had drinks again with my colleague. Many drinks, this time. And I drunkenly told him everything I'd been doing. He found my investigation ridiculous and ultimately dangerous. You like stories too much, he said. If I didn't know any better, it's almost like you were trying to write one of your own. Just let it go. I pulled out the photocopied stories from my back pocket, and I pressed them down on the bar, staining them with splashes of beer. My colleague picked up Jake's story and he took a look at it for the first time. His eyes skimmed the page and they stopped cold. Wait, he said. You never told me about Abby. I shrugged. Abby was Kate, I told him. It was all part of the game. I wonder, he thought aloud to himself. Hmm. He laid it out for me. A year ago, about ten months before I moved to town, an 8th grader named Abby had gone missing, seemingly vanished into thin air. One minute she was alone in her room and the next minute she was gone. Some suspected that she ran away, but there were no clues. No evidence of foul play, no suspicious or shady family members or neighbors. She was simply gone. I read Kate's piece again. My heart sank. The whole time I assumed it was about her visiting the grandmother. But maybe I was wrong. Maybe the squeaks and pleas coming from the closet were coming from Abby. Kate never specified who she was visiting or where she was. I read the avant-garde flash fiction one more time, honing in on every word just to be sure. And at that moment, everything changed." Unquote. Our narrator then spoke to the school administration and contacted authorities. However, this ultimately leads to nothing, as Jake and Kate simply say that it was all a prank, a joke, just stories. And Jake even apologized for naming a fictional character after a missing girl, and that it hadn't crossed his mind when he was writing it. Quote, I was now the monster for dragging two innocent children into this mess. The staff ostracized me and the town crucified me. I was done. 
I left the teaching profession soon after that. I walked out of the school holding my small crate of supplies and Kate smirked at me with a knowing glance through the first floor window. I haven't seen her since. I didn't take much with me, but I did take the photocopies of the stories. I pulled them out occasionally and relived the past. And sometimes, late at night, I'll get a fire in my belly and a burning desire to travel back to that small Wisconsin town. Maybe Grandma Rosie was a great aunt that Jake's family referred to as Grandma. Or maybe it was an elderly family friend. Maybe I missed something about the missing girl, about 89.1, about Kate's intentions. Perhaps I can try the ritual a few more times, just to see what happens. Or maybe it's just all bullshit. It was 10 years ago. I'm probably the only one that thinks there's still a shred of truth in those stories. I'd be wasting my time. But it still keeps me up at night. The slim chance that it's all true. And oftentimes, the idea of it is something I contemplate more than what really happened to Abby and the grandmother in the story. If it is true, why did the kids write it all down like that? I don't have a good answer. I'll never have one. I suppose that, just like me, they really just enjoy a good story. Unquote. And that's the story. And again, I really, really like this one. In many ways, it feels like an answer to what if, in the shower story, it was the student that had a crazy tale to share rather than the teacher. I also like that the ultimate ending is left ambiguous as to what really happened. If it truly all was just a story, or something far more sinister. It kind of reminds me of one of my favorite classic novels, The Turn of the Screw, where the crux of the mystery and possible sinister story going on is a gang with a teacher figure and a child, and is solely dependent on if you believe the narrator to be reliable or not. Is the narrator just a fucking whack job that looks way too far into a couple of kids' flash fiction stories? Or was there something truly more sinister going on that he just had no real way of proving 100%? Also on that note, you should totally go read or watch a movie version of Turn of the Screw. It's really fucking good. The Disappearance of Ashley, Kansas. So this one's really old and pretty simple. It's about the town of Ashley, Kansas. Well, disappearing. A lot of the story is from the perspective of the local police station as they get calls in from the town reporting a giant black hole growing in the sky. And when the police go to investigate, the one-way road to the town leads to nowhere, as if the town was completely dematerialized. And yet, they continue to get calls in from the town, from people going missing, to strange sounds, to the black hole growing larger, and this all eventually leads to fire shooting out of the black hole, and from that fire comes dead relatives from the people of the town's past coming to visit them. By story's end, the town is completely gone, only with a great fissure left where it once was, and no more calls coming from there anymore. Overall, not a bad little story. Arizona. So this one is yet another very old one. One of the classics, you might say. But I'll admit something. This is one of the classics that I've always been kind of lukewarm on. It's not bad, just sort of random. Let me explain. See, the story is about a dude and his girlfriend who are going out to Arizona to a party or whatever while they're on break. But along the way, they find that on a long stretch of nothing road that they're running out of gas and will more than likely not be able to find a gas station anywhere before they run out and end up stranded in the middle of the desert. That is until they find a gas station that seems completely abandoned in the middle of nowhere. And when our protagonist goes in, there is what looks to be a completely dark, deserted, and flooded building. He then sees a scary looking monster in there, falls on his ass, and then runs back out to the car and tells his girlfriend to book it. When he eventually tells her, after half an hour, what he saw that spooked him, 
she starts crying and telling him what she in turn saw. Which is weird because until now she seemed sort of startled by the fact that her boyfriend wanted to leave so quickly and she hadn't really shared anything until now, but whatever. Uh, but she saw a man with a broken jaw and a little girl with a smile that stretched all the way around her whole head. And that's when the said little girl starts chasing after them with her fucking spider legs. So they keep driving and driving trying to escape it. All the while, even though they are driving on a straight road, they keep driving by the same gas station. Then as they're running out of gas and things seem the most desperate, they come across an old house and go in there and barricade the place. And then the guy's girlfriend keeps fucking crying and hiding in the closet. And now she seems to be turning into some kind of monster, maybe. And then the TV starts turning on and reading out all these numbers in a scary voice. And our narrator is just kind of left there totally fucked and wishing he never went into that gas station. Uh, the end. Now again, this isn't a bad story. It's very surreal, I suppose. It just has a major case of and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, with no real rhyme or reason for any of it. I do like stories where they are in a sort of endless loop of sorts, because that sense of pure dread and true despair that comes from knowing all your running away is truly fruitless, and that you will run out of resources eventually, and succumb to a terrible fate, is very gripping and intense, and in better versions of this type of story, can be seen as a metaphor for trying to escape death itself. Uh, but in this creepypasta, it all happens just so fucking fast that I guess there's no real time to linger in that dread whatsoever. So, it has some qualities that I normally like, but the execution is just kind of haphazard and just not very good. Tales from the Gas Station For our final entry this tier, we have one that has really been long overdue on this iceberg. Tales from the Gas Station is a truly epic series that I honestly find very daunting to even consider covering because there is a lot, as in a whole book series of things to cover. So let's start with the fact that this is one of those creepypastas that move from beyond just the internet and has paperback books for each volume. Yes, I said volume. Here is the Amazon description for the first volume. Quote, Working at a dead-end retail job in the middle of nowhere can be hard. The long hours, the helpless customers, the enormous eldritch horror living deep below the building. As the only full-time employee at the 24-hour gas station at the edge of town, Jack has pretty much seen it all. But when he decides to start an online journal documenting the bizarre day-to-day -day occurrences, he unwittingly attracts the attention of much more than just a few conspiracy theorists. With the body count steadily on the rise, and a dark ancient force infecting the dreams of everyone around him, Jack will do everything in his power to stay out of the way and mind his own business. After all, he's just a gas station clerk. It's not like he's getting paid enough to wage a battle against the nightmarish aberrations plaguing his community. Besides, he already has his hands full attempting to manage all those mysterious lawn gnomes, the mutant raccoons, and the charming phantom cowboy who lives in the bathroom. Based on the award-winning creepypasta by Gas Station Jack, Tales from the Gas Station Volume 1 is a love letter to the pioneers of classic horror tailored to a generation that grew up in the era of smartphones and Wi-Fi." Unquote. If that at all sounds interesting to you, then I would highly recommend you go and try and give the series a read for yourself. Full disclosure, I have read all the first volume and a fair bit of the second one, but there is still hours worth of content that I have yet to get into. And while I would love to read it all and give an in-depth review of it, there is a limit of how much time I have if I want this iceberg to be fucking completed in any kind of timely fashion. So I wanted to bring this up here, as it is one of the more influential and interesting creepypastas that I've personally read. It's not all creepy either, as there is a distinct sense of dark humor that runs throughout the series that gives it an interesting edge. So again, if any of this sounds interesting to you, I implore you to go give it a try. There are of course plenty of readings of it here on YouTube as well, and I know you guys like watching long form content, 
if you're this far into this iceberg series, so maybe it'll make a fun and creepy listen for you sometime in the future. We've reached the bottom of the pit of pasta. I wish I could tell you that our journey is near its end, but in truth, it's really only just begun. This is what I've been waiting for. What does this place look like to you? A mansion, right? Like something from Resident Evil, perhaps? It'll do that. You see, at the very bottom of the creepypasta island, past all the strange monsters and edgy teenagers, cursed objects, and just generally cringy weirdos, sits something truly special. A dream machine, capable of conjuring up places you're somewhat familiar with. The truth, however, is we have entered its maze. The belly of the beast, you might say. Despite the outward appearances, this is but just a perception of the mind. Something to make sense of the otherwise otherworldly environment that we truly find ourselves within. One might say that it's the entire reason this island exists to begin with. After all, creepypastas aren't real. They only exist within our minds. An illusion made up from our imagination. Our dreams, you might say. Now that we've gotten this far, I suppose I ought to come clean. I've come here to reach the Dream Machine Center. To make a wish, for you see, at its very center, reality and fantasy are one and the same. And so you can conjure up anything that you could imagine, anything that you could want into being. It's through this that I'll finally have something I've always wanted. It's also going to be our only means of escaping this place, as a little hint. So, stay close. Otherwise, you might find yourself lost within the maze of dreams forever. Listen to the stories I tell you closely. Should you fall asleep, step out of the sound of my voice now. You shall enter the darkness of the tale by which I speak. Yet if I do not continue to speak of these tales, this place will twist us both into something unrecognizable. We do not keep our heads firmly within the thoughts of stories. Our imaginations shall warp us into the very things that we think. So, with that in mind, take my hand, O oh, brave traveler, my faithful companion. Are you ready? I dared my best friend to ruin my life. Ah, now this is one of those creepy pastas that you would find in a creepy mansion inside a volcano. What I mean by that is, is this is a pasta in a league of its own. Now, the title of the story sort of reveals what the plot is about, but allow me to read you part of the opening chapter to this tale so you can get a better idea of its contents. Quote, My name is Xander, and my best friend is trying to ruin my life. It started out very small, but it has quickly grown out of control. I'm currently sitting inside a church, using their Wi-Fi to post a story and taking advantage of their air conditioning. I'm posting this story in case, well, in case he finds me and kills me soon. It's only a matter of time now, and I want someone to know what happened before I die. A few years ago, my friend David and I were sitting on the couch at my house, Thoroughly bored. It wasn't a temporary boredom either. It was a resounding boredom with life. We both worked full time at a local movie theater making minimum wage and cleaning up after idiots who couldn't keep popcorn and soda in their mouths. We had graduated high school two years prior and had no plans to attend college. Life looked bleak for us. College didn't sound appealing, work was annoying, and the little free time we had was blown on video games and YouTube. We both still live with our parents too, 
which made dating somewhat embarrassing. Looking back, I'm sure we're suffering from mild depression on top of everything else. These circumstances blended together to create the perfect storm for what I now have to call my reality. As we sat on the couch at my parents' house, channel surfing the TV, David asked me if I was bored with life. I responded in the positive and sighed. High school was so easy because we knew our purpose and our goals were set out for us. Outline the English essay, finish the math homework, get decent grades, pass the driving exam, be home by curfew, find a girlfriend. Now that we're out of high school, there's no structure. Our lives have become meaningless, and we are just floating through space with no aim or purpose. Would you go back to high school then? I asked. He shook his head. In the moment, high school was annoying. It's only after looking back that I see how much better it was than I realized. What's the solution then, I asked. Either go somewhere that has structure and can deliver what high school gave us, or create our own structure, David replied. Well, I don't want to go to college or the military, I said, and I can't think of anywhere else that provides the same structure. Guess I have to make my own, but I have no idea where to start. The thing about high school was, that it required a minimum effort. If you didn't give that minimum effort, you'd face the consequences. The consequences were bad enough that you and I would put the effort into school. When high school ended, the minimum effort level decreased. Now our minimum effort is not enough to improve ourselves. Whatever structure we build has to have some consequences built in and a minimum effort that forces us to improve constantly. David was, and is, a very intellectual person. Thinks about everything, if you can't already tell. I was pretty dumb compared to him, but I stuck around because he always had interesting things to say. This conversation definitely counted as interesting. I won't bore you with the entire conversation that we had, but it lasted an hour where we discussed how to build structure in our lives. I want to emphasize here that boredom is dangerous. Well, it's not dangerous by itself, but it can quickly lead to dangerous things. Boredom can lead to pain, accidental children, technology that disrupts a monopoly, and even death. Our boredom led to a dare. I dare you to try and ruin my life, David said. What does that mean? I asked. It's a way to build structure into my life. If I know that you are always trying to ruin my life and actively trying to make me fail, then I am driven to fight back and act on initiative. But how could I ruin your life? I asked. You could ruin anyone's life if you gave it enough thought. Planning an action, David said with a smirk. I'm not going to give you any ideas. I just want you to try and ruin my life. I remember sitting back and thinking about what he meant. The first thoughts that came to my mind were about tripping him occasionally or hiding his toothbrush every time I went to his house. My young mind didn't fully understand how serious David was being. His mind was running three tracks above mine, so I didn't know what I was getting into when I said, Okay, I'll try and ruin your life, but I dare you to try and ruin my life as well. He smiled with a newfound enthusiasm, and I smiled back. I had hoped it would be a great way to relieve my boredom with life. David stood up and punched me in the leg as hard as he could. I shouted at him, mostly out of surprise. He just laughed. The dare starts now, he said, grabbing his shoes. We are no longer friends. We are nemeses. He opened my front door and looked over his shoulder. Good luck, he said. I hope you'll work half as hard as I will, unquote. It's an interesting setup for a creepypasta. Hell, a story in general, and what follows certainly delivers, as David King starts making moves against our protagonist, subtly and eventually overtly ruining his life before things really escalate in this game of cat and mouse. I go into more detail, but it's a fairly long one full of twists and turns. And if this sounds at all interesting to you, I would highly recommend going and giving it a read or listening to someone read it yourself. I don't hear it talked about very often, but this is seriously a well-written thriller story with an antagonist that always manages to be one step ahead boredom and seemingly having no real reason to live motivating him to become a terrible force, but one that for the most part stays fairly grounded in reality. There's a lot of details about identity theft, cybersecurity, and contacting the police that 
are all used in clever ways to further trap Xander in his abject hell David eventually puts him through. Truly a great read or listen of how well paced and put together the whole story is. I dared my best friend to ruin my life is seriously one of the best creepypastas that not as many people know about. Generation Loss. This one's very short and goes as follows. Quote, In 2007, a British audio programmer and electronic musician attempted to make a video documenting generation loss, which is when one tape is copied from another, but each incarnation wears the quality down by a certain amount. He used a spare tape recorded by a friend in the early 90s, featuring footage of a nearby intersection, edited his own music into the clip, and then copied it back and forth until the footage had deteriorated enough. However, this clip circulated on 4chan's Sector B in the mid-2008, with first-hand reports claiming that watching the entire video in one sitting caused a sharp burning sensation in the back of the skull. Common side effects included hearing screams deep inside the tape's grinding music, seeing human shapes and static, and seeing a disturbingly thin young boy in the window to the immediate left of the yellow traffic lights, whom is staring directly at the viewer. While the effects can be avoided by pausing the video and watching or reading anything else for any amount of time, it is unknown what will happen to an individual if the entire video is consumed without stopping, as these effects vary from person to person. Some users have reported long-term effects of seeing the skeletal boy around them in public or hearing vague whispers and clicking. One user reportedly committed exit the game of life out of desperation by throwing himself from his apartment window. His body discovered to have severe bruising on the back of his skull." Unquote. This one starts off very interesting and then kind of completely and utterly falls apart as soon as the second paragraph opens. I guess it's a basic enough urban legend type story, but I thought it was going to go somewhere much more interesting than it did. A Game of Flashlight Tag This is one of those stories that despite it being quite good, I also never really hear about. This pasta opens with our narrator noting what flashlight tag entails and how it was a popular game for everyone in his neighborhood to play. Quote, When I was 10, I played a late night game of flashlight tag with a bunch of neighborhood kids. If you don't know what flashlight tag is, it's the same as tag. But you played in the dark. The person who's it gets a flashlight, and they have to yell the name of the person they see with it in the order to tag them. It was really cloudy that night, and most people had their curtains drawn, so it was the perfect level of darkness for hiding in. The side of the street my house was on was skirted by a broad length of woods. That was basically our boundary for our side of the game. You could run through any yard, even go across the street and run through their yards. But you weren't allowed to hide in the woods because it was too difficult to find anyone in there. And it was very easy to trip over tree limbs or end up in poison oak. Of course, this rule was frequently and flagrantly ignored when people got too close to being caught. They dug off into the bushes for a few seconds or run behind a group of trees to evade capture." Unquote. From here, our narrator notes how one night he was hiding in the backyard of a house two or three houses down from his own. He ended up being pretty lucky for a while until a flashlight came around the corner and flashed him right in the eyes. He began running into the woods to duck for cover, but something was a bit off. The person holding the flashlight wasn't chasing him. Quote, They shine the light right in my face, and I tried to cover it with my hand to avoid identification. The creepy thing was, they never said anything, just shined that light on me. You got me, I explained hoping that if it was a homeowner, they'd realize I thought they were the flashlight tagger. And I realized that two houses down, people were yelling and there was the it guy's flashlight beam chasing them around. I stood up and tried to see who was shining the light on me. They just stood there, not moving, not saying anything. I felt a little freaked out. If you don't want us playing in your yard, I'll go tell them it's off limits, okay? The person started walking toward me. It didn't feel right. So I started walking towards the edge of the yard. The person just kept shining the light on me and coming towards me. So I ran. When I looked back, the person with the flashlight was running too, and they were an adult. Much bigger and much faster than me. I felt scared now, but not sure why this person was chasing me. I was running toward where the other kids had been, but they were gone now. 
it seemed to be me and the person with the flashlight. So I turned right and ducked into the woods. I dropped to the ground shaking bushes and stuff to try and confuse the person. Then shimmied under a ring of thick bushes and curled up. I could see the flashlight in the woods with me. Looking around, I could hear the person's footsteps breaking sticks and crunching on pine needles. I didn't know what the fuck was going on. I just wanted to get back to all the other kids. Eventually, the flashlight wandered deeper into the woods and I crawled, quiet as a mouse, back to the edge of the trees, then got up and ran towards the street." Unquote. Our narrator is eventually caught by the actual IT guy, and when he warns them not to go into the woods, they just run off, not wanting to get caught by the new IT guy. Our narrator continues playing, but anxiously watching now for who that could have been. Before later in the night, Charlotte, a girl who was a year younger than our narrator, and who usually hung around her own house so she could quickly run back inside her own house if she was afraid of the dark, was in a place that was very unusual for her. She was standing in the woods. Quote, Charlotte, I see you, I yelled. She just stood there. I continued to hold the light on her and call her name, but she didn't seem to move. She stood there, partially obscured by a tree, and looked at me. The distance between us was enough that I couldn't see if she was blinking or not, but she had her head propped at an angle like she was looking around the trunk at me with her mouth hanging slightly open. Every now and then, she sort of twitched or squirmed. It was a real freaky kind of movement. Charlotte, come out of there, I yelled. Everybody, Charlotte's it, but she won't come out of the woods. Some kids, including my friend Dustin, appeared behind me and started joining in my yell for Charlotte to come out. You see her, I asked? Yeah, she's over there behind that tree. Charlotte, get over here, Dustin said, but she wouldn't come. Charlotte, are you okay? Get over here, dummy. Charlotte seemed to stand up straighter and then disappear behind the tree. We could hear movement, but it seemed to be going away rather than toward us. Dustin started shouting Charlotte's name again and trudging into the woods after her, but I grabbed him and gave him the flashlight to take with him. I was scared again, because this all seemed surreal. I went to Charlotte's house and knocked until her father answered." Unquote. The whole group went into the woods after her until eventually Charlotte's father ordered the kids to all go home and ask their parents for help and that they were going to call the police. A search then began, and it didn't take too long. Two days after her disappearance, she was found dead, and stuffed into a drain pipe with a broken neck and several stab wounds. Quote, My parents wouldn't tell me about it. They thought it would upset me, but Dustin told me all the details at school the next day. It was the most awful thing our town had ever had happen. The police blocked off the logging road and spent months tracking down loggers and truckers who frequently used it. There was a curfew for months, and we were told to not play flashlight tag anymore. We didn't argue. What leaves me shaking to this day is the memory of Charlotte's face, hanging out from behind the tree, looking at me. Sometimes I wonder if, at that moment, I had been witnessing her death, and I wonder if it had almost been me." Unquote. And that's flashlight tag. A simple concept with a rather haunting ending. Thomas. So this one was made quite famous by YouTuber Michael Leroy, and his reading of the story in his and his friends' long-going series, Bad Creepypasta. A shout out to them, by the way. If you like diving deep into the worst of the worst as far as creepypastas go, they happily provide many years of content for you to enjoy. That being said, Thomas is about this school outcast named uh, well, Thomas, who was pretty well known for doing great in his classes, was rather skinny but could pack a real wallop of a punch, and was well known for the glare he gave the other kids in the school. He was expressionless, void of emotion. Anyway, after the story notes how much of an outsider and creepy dude Thomas is, the story then goes on about this girl named Valerie Hudson, who is also an outsider and is head over heels in love with Thomas. And so, a good chunk of the story then follows Valerie and Thomas's relationship as it goes from a friendship to maybe something more. We also see Thomas's home life is, well, quite bad, with his dad constantly drunk and his mom apparently having committed exit the game of life after an argument with her husband in which she threatened to do as such and wanted to prove that she meant it. Ever since then, something snapped in Thomas. A fire of rage was constantly on the verge of coming out. Because you see, Thomas saw past the one-way mirror of life. He saw the world as an ugly thing full of evil people, and he hated anyone 
who was generally happy with their life. I'm paraphrasing, but the story really does have this whole speech about how much life sucks and what have you. Well anyway, Thomas thinks that maybe Valerie is his key to letting go of his anger and what have you. But of course, like every other one of these types of stories, you then get some cartoonishly mean bullies start to bully Thomas and Valerie pretty much out of the fucking blue, smacking them with lead pipes. And Thomas' response to this is breaking one of their necks, stabbing one of them with one of the lead pipes through the bully's skull, and then with a regular ass knife, let me emphasize that, with a regular ass knife, decapitates five other bullies with one swing each. Fucking how many monster energy drinks did this emo kid fucking drink to do that? At any rate, the story ends with Thomas having easily, absolutely destroying the fucking bullies. And let me emphasize that, they are fucking destroyed, not killed, destroyed by Thomas, which Valerie finds pretty hot. And they both kiss and yeah, that's pretty much how the story ends. It's nothing that we haven't seen before on this iceberg, but this one is one of those that's more apparent with its Mary Sue or Gary Stu self-insert type of story, since Thomas as a character is basically smart, strong, cool, he gets the girl, and he has no consequences for his actions, he always wins, he's very opinionated, and the story works in such a way that his very stupid opinion is always Correct. Oh, and you know, the story is also full of grammatical errors, but I suppose that sort of comes with the territory at this point. We're kind of kind of splitting hairs, you know, when we get to the grammatical stuff at some point. Bad Night Out. So this one seems rather obscure and was kind of difficult to figure out which one of the actual iceberg wanted me to discuss, given how many stories have very similar titles to this one. However, the one I found first was a story about a woman who loves going to watch horror movies uh, at night at the cinema. Uh, but she's actually not a human. She's a strange sort of monster that looks like a human, but has these black leech-like creatures that crawl in and out of her mouth to go and feed on the blood of other moviegoers. And then they come back to her so they can feed all the blood to her. That's kind of it. The story pretty much begins and ends with this Admittingly kind of cool concept for a monster, and that's it. The Mario Theory. So, this one is a doozy. It's a troll pasta, but one hell of a good one. And by good, I mean bad, of course. The basic premise here being that the Super Mario Bros. games are based off of a real-life story of Mario Lombardi, which involves Mario trying to save a woman named, uh, Paula or something. She's who Peach is based off of in this story, who is kidnapped by some fucking creep who Bowser is meant to represent. Well, Mario ends up failing at first to save her when he sees her kidnapped on the street, and after he falls the assailant to his home and screams outside the house because he was scared to run in, as soon as he does run into the house to save her after already alerting the guy who kidnapped her, he is then held by gunpoint by the Bowser guy to walk into an animal cage and is then tossed down a set of basement stairs wherein a fucking chimpanzee mauls his legs. The screaming angry chimpanzee mauling his legs is meant to be what Donkey Kong is based off of. Mario ends up killing the angry monkey with a fucking hammer on the floor. Meanwhile, Peach is being brutally, mm, multiple times, and then reptiles start eating her skin and organs while she chokes on a dead turtle. I, uh, yep, that makes sense to me. So Mario does end up crawling his way up the stairs and into the room and then kills the guy who killed Peach in this awful manner. And to make a long story short, this is what Nintendo apparently thought was the perfect inspiration for creating their signature franchise, Super Mario Bros. Oh, and also Mario dies later in the story after um, having given permission to Nintendo to tell his life story through the, a game via an acid overdose. The end. There's a bit more to the story, but that's the gist. 
And since it's meant to be a troll pasta, I don't want to waste too much time on it. But it is still quite something, and if you've never, like, listened to a reading of it, I would highly recommend it. It is quite the ride. Frosty the Snowman. I've looked high and low, and as far as I can tell, the only creepypasta called Frosty the Snowman is this one from creepypasta.com, which confusingly enough has Frosty the Snowman as a title, but then when you click on the actual story, it's actually titled Soul Survivor. So with that said, let's give it a read. He was cold, bitterly so. It was not the unforgiving December wind creating lazy vortexes in the freshly falling snow. Rather, it was the numbness that consumed both body and soul in one fatal unseen breeze. It also did not escape him that his surroundings seemingly felt the same bleak and deserted. Perhaps deserted was not the proper term. Being two days before Christmas, there was many people filling the cityscape. Some gathered under the building awnings for shelter. Others slumped in their cars, locked bumper to bumper. And still others reclined upon street benches, waiting for public transportation that would never come. Even the bodies sprawled awkwardly here and there in the street and on the sidewalks, testified this city was not deserted. No birds perched in rotting trees which arched in the darkened sky. No Christmas shoppers hustled and bustled for last minute gifts. No children warred with other children in the time honored battle of snowball superiority. Dead. A condemning chill raced through him, the speed of thought. I am alone. However, this was not his first exposure to loneliness. For the past decade, he had spent his existence secluded in the beautifully barren confines of a Canadian parcel of land in the Arctic Circle. The sub-zero temperatures were of little concern. In fact, the serrated blades of Arctic wind refreshed and strengthened him. Curiously, this environment inspired his continued survival and kept him safe in an arctic embrace. Although the prospect of longevity outweighed the void of companionship in his early years, his later years were a true test of sanity and solitude. Occasionally, the old man would visit him, briefly dispersing the looming shade of lethal boredom. The old man's eyes forever sparkled with an eternal hope, and always offering a jovial laugh with any story. Suspending the soulless sorrow of isolation. Unfortunately, that cheer could not prevent the predator of loneliness from eagerly returning shortly after the old man departed. And on his way to whatever brought him out of his happy home in the first place. In those days, without the comfort of another, he would curse the warmth of friends. Trying unsuccessfully to deny he even needed companionship. Yet... Deep down, he knew he would instantly return to civilization in a heartbeat. However, he knew he could not return, as the enemy would be waiting, and the enemy would not take pity on him. His nemesis was far more omniscient, but the beast need not be. His foe had spread his influence all about countries, cities, and suburbs like a virulent plague. In these places, no one could hide from the beast. The enemy did have a weakness, a brief period of impotency every year. Yet, he still felt unsure as to the beast's machinations as those periods were not easily measured. So he played it safe against the enemy with the deadly gaze and kept to the safety of his frozen sanctuary. He had not forgotten that terrifying first encounter. He remembered the incident with crystal clear accuracy, burned into him like a glowing brand, iron kissing virgin flesh. The morning had sleepily awakened when the enemy attacked with sadistic fury. His body had become a well of pain under the beast's well-honed talons, feeling as if millions of razor blades ripped into him. Every pore screamed, yet the beast drank freely from his essence, one excruciating sip at a time. He felt the scoffing eyes of the enemy toying with him, as if to say, the worst is yet to come. He knew further hellacious torments awaited him if he did not immediately retreat. Racked with deep pain, he fled to the outer reaches of northern Canada, a place where his nemesis did not follow. Perhaps it was the extreme temperatures or the geography. Nonetheless, the enemy had, in one ironic stroke, condemned him to his frigid tundra and saved him. But now he stood defiantly in the realm of his nemesis. Fearless of retaliation, the enemy had been placed in check, and he knew it. 
The crux of the conflict occurred months prior, in the deep night sky. Stars seductively winked at him as he watched the glorious beauty of the northern light swaying in heaven's inky darkness. Then he noticed a peculiar object falling from the sky. A meteorite? An old space satellite? Whatever the cause, the object maintained a purposeful nature. It was then that a second, then a third, then a fourth meteorite appeared. They seemed to multiply exponentially. The meteorites gashed the serene sky as the stars retreated under the onslaught of hundreds of projectiles. Repulsed, he turned away from the aerial horde, only to find a mirror of the same on the opposite horizon. Seemingly ignorant of each other, the projectiles laced between one another, most sped off to their destination unmolested. But occasionally some would cross paths, issuing an eruption of brutal luminescence. It was then that he realized the bright explosive flashes were missiles, nuclear missiles. He could not bear to watch the horror and retreated to the confines of his igloo. It was like sleeping through a distant thunderstorm as the mechanical abominations rumbled across the atmosphere with small flashes like a violent destructive heat lightning. When he left his igloo much later, he noticed the sky, or rather, the absence of it. In its place was a dirty gray film of sediment, thick and smothering, the nuclear bombs had tossed the waste of their destruction into the atmosphere, defying the stars to shine, or even a satellite to broadcast an important emergency broadcasting system message down to our planet. The Earth had become a lightless coffin of an ecological nightmare as a casket lid. He guessed that what the nukes didn't vaporize, or the radiation didn't kill, the polluted atmosphere would handily finish off. Weeks later, he heard a voice at his door. Anybody home? It was the weakened voice of the old man. When he laid his dark eyes upon the old man, he stared with a mixture of sympathy and revulsion. Radiation had taken control of the old man's body. Putrid facial lesions were painfully visible, and large patches of now hairless sections of his head had been replaced by wet, runny red splotches. Thick green mucus and saliva ran unchecked from the old man's nose and mouth, and the old man's swollen, radiated hands were as red and puffy as the parka he wore. Just thought I'd stop by for a visit. The old man tried to chuckle, which turned into a bout of racking, painful coughing. The light was fading fast. Well, my boy, even though I know you've been naughty, it doesn't do me much good. The earth is dying, my boy. I'm pretty wily, but... The old man stared at the bloody holes in his fingers where nails once grew. Even I'm not immune. Matter of fact, my last pack animal passed away about a half mile from here. Poor Don. He tried, but those nukes take the fight out of ya. Tears welled and ran down the old man's sunken cheeks. Please, you can't. Don't start on me, the old man cut in. We all gotta go sometime. Just never thought we'd all go at the same time. We're all dead, my boy. Every plant and animal, dead or die, except you. The old man fell to the floor of the igloo, hacking blood and lung tissue. He cradled the old man as he continued to hack. God, how I pity you. You'll survive. I just age slow, but you... Another series of coughs shook the old man's frame. So, sorry, the old man sputtered, before a violent death rattle extinguished the remaining fire from his eyes. Now, as he stood in the silence of the gray soot in midwestern town that spawned before him, he reflected on those who gave him life. His makers knew very little of the arcane arts, yet, caught in the throes of creativity, these youthful wizards had used base alchemy and common elements to give him life. Was it, he thought, a magical device? My creator's desire, fate, hand of God? Frankly, he did not have the reasoning capacity to properly analyze such an esoteric subject, nor did he care to dwell long upon it. The most vivid memory he had was the day the beast had forced him to leave. He was waving farewell to a little girl in a fluffy pink winter coat and thick white corduroy pants. 
he could see she was fighting the flow of tears and a heavy heart. She waved back with a mittened hand. Don't you cry, he called back to her. I'll be back again someday. Now he had returned. Not that it mattered anymore. The little girl in the pink coat was surely a dead, frozen husk, like the rest of humanity, like the animals, like the plants and flowers, like every living thing on the planet, except for him. He walked through the dirty snowfall, stopping at the town square. Amidst the dead and discarded machinery of mankind stood the town's wilted Christmas tree, decked with bold ornaments and shimmering garland. Even though Christmas was just two days away, he did not feel celebratory. Every ounce of Christmas spirit drained from him. The moment Santa Claus died in his arms, somewhere within the harsh Canadian north in a desolate igloo. The sole survivor of the earth began to weep. He knew his nemesis, the beast known as the sun, would not appear again for many, many decades. That is, he was lucky, or fate was merciful. The golem of snow, once called Frosty, continued walking without destination. Black tears flowed unchecked from his eyes made of coal, and his tears were cold, bitterly so." Unquote. Yeah, I guess I kind of gave away the ending to that one with my whole beginning preamble, huh? You know, as silly as it is to write a story about Frosty the Snowman being the sole survivor in a nuclear winter, I've got to commend the effort. It's very well written, it's played straight, and overall, it's not bad. I mean, it is a little bit funny, you know, all this lovely prose and dark themes centered around Frosty the fucking snowman, but somehow I don't think that that's lost on the author. And I have a feeling they changed the name from Frosty the Snowman to the sole survivor as to better have this surprise ending since they never actually mentioned that we're talking about a snowman or Frosty the Snowman until the very end of the story. But anywho, what's next? Substitute. Created by YouTuber IcyPie, who also created another popular creepypasta that we're going to get to in a moment, Substitute follows Clyde, a high school student who recounts his strange experience with a substitute teacher who made him question his entire reality. You see, the teacher asks his students questions like, what is the sun made up of, or glass, or a pencil? Do they believe in God, etc.? Which eventually leads to the teacher telling them nothing really exists, that all of reality is an illusion, and furthermore, he seems to be here with the sole purpose of proving just that to them. Now the story itself, I will admit, sort of plays its cards a little too early. There are some interesting twists and turns this story takes, but a fair bit of the time I was waiting for some kind of shocking reveal, a gotcha moment that the story felt like it was building up to, but alas, nothing like that really happens. So we are kind of left with a well-written, but kind of dry story in my opinion. Don't get me wrong, I do think that for what it is, the story really did keep me engaged the whole way through, but I feel like it left no lasting impact on me personally. The guy says that reality is an illusion, and then we find out and see evidence towards this being the case, and he just keeps saying reality is an illusion, and our protagonist is like, no it's not, and he's like, yes it is, and doesn't really go anywhere, but still, not too bad. We deleted you. Created by YouTuber IcyPie, this is, surprisingly enough, one of the highest profile creepypastas we have covered yet, with a three and a half hour animatic series made by The Masked Chris, with over five million views on YouTube to go along with this one. To say that this one is popular, will be underselling it. Frankly, this one's in a league of its own these days. So then, with all this popularity, the question must be asked, is it any good? Well, it's all right. The story starts off as a little kid getting a, a brand new Nintendo Wii nine days after its release date and going to the Me channel only to find that there's a Me already made there. With big round eyes, a bald head, a big old grin, and the name Edeled, or delete backwards. Our protagonist can't seem to delete the me no matter what he does, and eventually the me talks to him in a low-pitched voice, 
asking him why he wants to delete him so badly. This eventually leads to Edeled taking his anger out on our protagonist's own me, chopping him up into pieces, something which greatly disturbs our protag. Later on, it's revealed that when Ami gets deleted, it gets sent to this hospital of sorts, where they live out the rest of their time until they die for good. And Edeled knows how to escape this place, but it pains him terribly every time he goes back there. Something which he reveals to our protagonist sometime later in an attempt to have him understand why it's bad to delete Mies, and why he got so angry earlier. It is then later revealed that Edeled is actually not a me. He has a bit of a backstory part, where it turns out that he's actually the soul of a lonely man who worked at Nintendo by the name of Henry, who died while making this me in an electrocution accident. And yeah, if you want to know more, I suppose you can go watch the full animatic. For what it's worth, I do think it's well put together and somewhat engaging as a story, but, and I really hate to say this, I just could not for the life of me take this story seriously whatsoever. And I found at several points, it just had strange leaps of logic to have characters act in ways that seemed either overdramatic or outright dumb for the sake of keeping the story going. It's also just not very scary, but the characters at several points act like Edeled killing another me as some sort of traumatizing or scary event, but he's no actual danger to anyone in real life and the other me's aren't real, he's the only one with a soul, so I mean, it should, in theory, be just as traumatic as seeing anyone else play a video game killing random characters, right? It's just not scary. I also feel like the story at the last second creates a new villain out of fucking nowhere, and so much of the story's core beats and ideas are repeated time and time and time again. Like, take a drink every time somebody says, Edeled, why, that's the leap backwards. I swear to God, they said that so many fucking times in the story that I actually started thinking, wait a minute, is it actually going to be revealed that it means something else? Like it's an anagram for something else and not that? Because everyone fucking brings it up every single fucking time the character's introduced to anybody. But no, it's just the leap backwards because I guess he doesn't want to get deleted or something. Also, later on, the cursed Nintendo Wii changes hands to, like, this girl who's like, I'm not a typical girl, I'm a gamer girl, I have you know, and I am different from the people and girls that go shopping and stuff. I only play video games. It's one of those types of characters, and the whole thing's just very cringy to me, and the original owner of the Wii, the guy, you know, who was like, he was a kid and he got scared of the Wii. He wants his old Wii back from this new girl because he wants to destroy the Wii so that Edeled can be destroyed. And we're never given a reason as to why he wants to do that because he already knows that, like, doing so will just, I guess, take out the soul of the guy that was in there. But he can't do anything, and he hasn't done anything to him other than be a scary character on the screen. And so I kept thinking, oh, well, there's a time skip, right, between whenever the Wii moved hands. And I thought maybe the Wii had some kind of thing where it, like, killed his whole family. Something. Like, it did something, and now this kid's out for revenge on it. But that wasn't the case. And... It's never explained why he's so adamant about destroying this Wii that has this me on it, that has the soul of a guy named Henry in there. It, none of it makes any fucking sense. And then later I found out that part of the reason this whole creepypasta is so popular to begin with is because there's a Friday Night Funking mod of it, which also contributed to the revival and repopularization of Sonic.exe along with several other creepypasta characters. Fri f like, I, I don't know what happened, really. I mean, I guess what happened is Friday Night Funkin' is really popular, but every creepypasta character, like, over the course of the last year or so, has gotten repopular all over again, thanks to being mods within Friday Night Funkin'. 
It's an interesting way of all these stories to be revived yet again, and it's it's kind of funny, you know, coming from me, being someone who grew up with all these back whenever they were first created and, you know, were come up with, and seeing the new generation discover them through, frankly, a bit of an unlikely place. But hey, whatever. That being said, We Deleted You is still, like, leaps and bounds more popular than quite a few of these other things. In fact, they even had a plushie dedicated to it. Uh, fairly recently. No hate, of course. It's clear that this was a passion product that these lads very much put a lot of time and effort into making, that plenty very much enjoy. So if you're one of those people that do happen to enjoy the story, more power to you, but it just didn't do anything for me. SpongeBob Hope is Lost. This pasta is literally just Squidward's sussy sussy, but with an extra overdramatic narrator. Like, legit, it follows the exact structure of that creepypasta to a T, with it following an intern who works Nickelodeon and he stumbles into a room he's not supposed to, only to find a monitor with a video, a Spongebob episode which seems to be titled, You Shouldn't Have Been a Nosy Intern, like that's literally the title of it, and the episode sees Spongebob sacrificing Patrick to the devil, and the whole thing is super over the top and edgy. All while our intern, protagonist cries and screams to the sight of Spongebob characters being killed. As he is sure by episode's end that God has abandoned us because of a Spongebob episode. Yeah, very original. At any rate, that's pretty much it. It's hot fucking garbage. So, moving on. Oh shit, looks like the maze has changed. I don't know about you, but to me it looks like we're on the misty roads of Silent Hill, and we've angered a few protectors of the center. You can hear them scuttering about. Stay low, use the fog to our advantage, and whatever you do, don't let them touch you. I tried to submit this pasta to the Creepypasta wiki, but it was rejected and it made me sad because it was an okay pasta. Quote, June 27th, 2093. The bombings keep coming. It seems like they come every minute now, every second. I guess the EWU is picking up the pace. The hospital is getting busier and busier. More patients are getting the disease. Further testing is required. The radiation treatment centers are becoming full. Only elderly, young, and women are permitted. June 28th, 2093. The EWU attacked the hospital today. They killed a young nurse and a 27-year-old female patient. They infected three more with the disease. The usual symptoms of vomit and organ rot have shown in the patients. I've heard that President Catherine Withers may be surrendering to the EWU. This would make things a whole lot easier. June 29th, 2093. She tried to make peace, but it failed. Withers declared all the women between the ages of 15 to 55 must join the armed forces. This exempts medical and other essential personnel. Meanwhile, almost half the people in the hospital have the disease. I am now required to live in the hospital. It is too dangerous to go outside. Who knows what would be out there. June 30th, 2093. The military is now guarding the hospital. It sounds like there are people trying to break in. President Withers was assassinated today. Almost 75% of the patients have the disease. We are now asked to wear disease-resistant suits. June 31st, 2093. The EWU army broke in again. Most of the medical staff was killed, but I managed to survive. The patients were left unarmed. 147 of my patients have their organs completely rotted out. Following autopsy, there was no organ matter left in the body. July 1st, 2093. All the patients have died of the disease. 
Vice President Jones has declared a national emergency. The radiation is really bad. I am showing symptoms of radiation poisoning and I expect to live only one more week. The hospital was almost completely destroyed by another bomb. July 3rd, 2093. I spent the last day sleeping. The radiation sickness is taking a toll on me. One of the creatures escaped the lab room. I completely forgot about them. It killed a male doctor and a female assistant. The creature was instantly killed by me. I have heard that Vice President Jones will give the Federated Republic of America to the EWU. July 4th, 2093. The country's birthday is now also his death day. I can feel my eyes becoming heavy. A loud explosion just went off outside the hospital. I can feel the collapse of the building. I don't think I will make ineligible. Oh my god! Oh my god! The creature! Ineligible. Bleeding out! Ineligible. The four man! Ineligible. The end. Honestly, I was expecting that creepypasta to be way worse based on the title. Um, but, I mean, yeah. It's nothing all that significant, but whatever. It's okay. Ending's pretty dumb, though. $1.wav So this pasta starts off strong, and then over the course of a few minutes, turns into absolute brain mush. It starts like this, quote, After my computer got burnt to a crisp in a lightning storm, I was left with only my old computer. Fortunately, I had everything from my destroyed computer already backed up onto a USB drives and CD-ROMs. My old computer was running Windows 98 and desperately needed an OS upgrade. It was time to search online for a new OS install disk that was at an affordable price. You might ask, why not just get a new computer? I would have, but because of the crappy economy, I didn't have the money to do so. So my only other option was to upgrade my old one. Anyways, I searched around on eBay to see if anybody was selling a copy of Windows XP at an affordable price. There was no way my computer would be able to handle Windows Vista or 7, so I'll just have to go with XP. Lo and behold, somebody was selling a full Windows XP clean install disk for only $1.45. Nobody else was bidding on it, so I placed mine. Even after I had placed my bid, nobody else did. And needless to say, I won the disk with nobody else challenging me. A few days later, I received the disk in a white envelope. I opened the envelope and pulled out the disk. It seemed like any other XP bootable disk. I turned on my old computer and popped it in, and installed Windows XP as one normally would. While I waited for it to install, I popped some popcorn, took a dump, and watched some television, occasionally checking on the progress of the installation and responding to dialog boxes, entering the registration code, etc. Finally, it finished installing and I could use the computer. First thing I did was transfer everything I had backed up from my destroyed computer onto the old computer. CD after CD, USB drive after USB drive, and finally I got everything onto my computer the way I wanted it. I decided to randomly browse around the computer a little while before I turned it off to get ready to go to bed. This random browsing led me to the C Windows slash media folder. Then I noticed a file in there called $1.wav. I didn't put the file on the computer, so I assumed it was installed along with all the other files in the folder. But I realized I didn't remember any such file ever being included with XP when I had it on my destroyed computer, before I upgraded it to Windows 7. Curious, I double clicked the file to open it. It was a very peculiar file. All I heard when I opened it was some weird static noise, almost as if it was some extremely distorted song. The file was just four solid minutes of this weird sound. It kind of creeped me out. I mean, it was nighttime with my sleeping dog being my only company, and I find a file on my computer that I never put there and wasn't part of the original XP installation. And all of it is four minutes of weird static noise. Furthermore, it's in a system folder. Thinking it might be a virus of some sort, I scanned the file. Behold, one Trojan came up. I had no clue where I would have gotten it from. I'd barely been on the internet at all since Windows XP was fully installed. Suddenly I realized I'd seen a file with that same name flash for a split second on the screen as the disk installed all the system files. I could only come to one conclusion. The disk had been tampered with. I decided to delete the Trojan, delete $1.wav, and do a full system scan with both of my antivirus programs, 
it was going to take a crap load of time to finish scanning, so I decided to go to bed while I waited. I still felt a bit mad that I went through all the time to finally get my computer set up and upgrade the way I wanted it, only to find out the installed disk had been tampered with. I woke up the next morning, ate my breakfast, took a shower, brushed my teeth, and went into my computer room. I sat down at my computer and turned on the monitor, which I had turned off the last night before I went to bed. I couldn't believe what I saw. My desktop background had been changed to a picture of a dollar bill. There were two errors saying that my two antiviruses had crashed, along with a bunch of other blank error dialogues that were titled $1.wav with a single OK button. Every icon on my desktop had been replaced with a shortcut to $1.wav, even the recycle bin. My start button now said $1.wav, and the usual flag icon was replaced with a $1 sign. When I clicked the start button, or in this case the $1.wav button, to bring up the $1.wav menu, every icon there was also replaced with $1.wav. The administrator name was changed to $1.wav, god how many fucking times am I going to have to say that? And the account picture was that of a dollar bill. I clicked don't send report to both the errors, saying malware bytes and Microsoft security essentials had crashed. I then clicked the OK button on each $1.wav error box. Okay, the screen was cleared of all those windows now. I tried to reopen my antivirus programs, but they both gave me a blank error titled $1.wav. I clicked OK on those. I went to the $1.wav menu and, and clicked shut down. But I just got the familiar clunk error sound. I tried the power button. Nothing happened. Finally, I just unplugged the computer and it finally shut off. I plugged it back in, booted it up in safe mode, and tried opening the antivirus programs there. But when I did, my computer made the weirdest noise ever and abruptly powered off. I tried pressing the power button, but nothing happened. It didn't even whir up. That freaking virus had completely destroyed my only remaining computer, and I hadn't even got it from a website or anything. It had come from my operating system. Well, that was that. I had to go get some things at the grocery store, so I left my house along with my dog. I have yet to earn enough money to buy myself a new computer. I do everything computer related on my friend's laptop that he generously let me borrow when I need to check my email, do something on my bank account online, etc. I have used that same laptop to type up and publish this story onto the internet, along with $1.wav, which I have gone through and manually removed the malicious coding from. After a certain cryptic message I read talking about some last evidence that will be destroyed if I share it with anybody, which you will read about in just a moment. I've decided to research as thoroughly as I can about the mysterious $1.wav until I've figured out the sinister mystery that surrounds it. How did I get back $1.wav after my computer was destroyed, you ask? Well, when I go home, my dog's ears perked up and she began growling menacingly. She followed the scent into the computer room. Everything seemed normal. However, when I looked where my second destroyed computer was, it wasn't there. Everything else was still there, but my computer was gone. I thought of a robbery, but who would want an old computer that doesn't even boot up anymore? I also noticed the tampered with XP installed disk I had gotten off of eBay was missing as well. In its place was a different disc. It was a white CD-ROM with something written on it in green sharpie. I picked up the disc and read, this is the last remaining evidence that I know of. Keep it secret or I'll have to destroy it too. I glanced down at the table the disc had been sitting on. Where it had been was a single dollar bill. It wasn't crinkled or damaged in any way, unlike most dollar bills. It was in absolutely perfect condition, as if it had just been made. I took the disc and the dollar over to my friend's house, the one that has the laptop that I'm typing these words on. I explained how both my computers were destroyed and he agreed to let me borrow it whenever I needed to. So I got on the laptop and put the CD in. On the CD was just one file, $1.wave, unquote. He also provided with the story a sound file with the fabled horror audio on it, which I'll play a few seconds of for you here.
Now in of itself, this is an alright setup for a story. And right after this, the next entry in our story sees our narrator trying to find information about the virus online, which leads him to a message board where the fucking stars align and somebody else also has a story about the exact same file destroying their PC as well. And they just so happen to have gotten their PC OS uh, with said file from the exact same seller, the exact same house, etc. Also, a little note beforehand, him putting this disc on his friend's computer to show the sound file, kind of a weird thing to do. It, it seems like that would have definitely destroyed his friend's computer and that would be a bad idea. I just wanted to note that as well. I didn't miss that, just was waiting to bring it up. So all this is a bit silly, but then when our narrator actually goes to investigate the seller's house and asks them why they sold them this fucking Windows XP with a virus on it, it turns out to be an old woman who the narrator describes as follows. Quote, A woman almost instantly answered the door. She seemed to be an elderly woman, short and stout with white hair tied up in a bun. Then I looked into her eyes. Oh, those eyes. They seeped through me and into my soul, hungrily examining it, seeing if it was suitable to feast upon. I almost sprinted back to my car and drove off right then and there, but I couldn't. I had a mystery to solve. Why, hello, John Goodman, said the woman in a menacing tone that sent shivers down my spine. My first thought, oh dear, she knows my name. Oh God, please help me. My, my dog growled threateningly at the woman. It took all of my courage to finally sputter out. Look, I don't have time for fooling around. What is this one dollar dot wave? And why did you put it on my Windows XP install disk? Oh, I can't tell you that. <laughs> Cackled the woman, whom I was now certain was no good. Why not? I countered angrily. Because, said the evil woman. However, I can tell you this. Be wary in the days that follow. For one dollar will haunt you until all is hollow. And before I could say another word, the woman shut the door on me, cackling wickedly. I had no other choice but to walk back to the car, unquote. Well, as it turns out, on the way to his car, he talks to the next door neighbor, where the following exchange happens. What were you doing over there? I was talking to the woman that lives in the house over there, I replied. The man's expression became concerned. Nobody's lived in that house for over 10 years. I looked at the house, but instead of the bright yellow cheery house that I had just seen when I arrived there, there was a crumbling abandoned foundation with a wooden plank nailed to the front door saying condemned in green letters. But, but I was just talking to an elderly woman that lived there a minute ago, I argued. All the color drained from the man's face. Elderly woman? Yes, I said, you know, with her hair all tied up in a bun and whatnot. Last person who lived there was an elderly woman, always having her hair tied up in a bun. But she's dead. So I didn't actually find out much of anything new about Dollar Dot Wave, but apparently it was created by a ghost. Interesting. But this is no laughing matter. I realized that the moment I saw that dang woman out of the corner of my eye, giving me that freaking soul devouring stare and smiling like a maniac when i focused on her she disappeared i then proceeded to sprint out of the room and hide under the blanket for the rest of the night when i dared go back into the living room a dollar bill lay on the floor where the woman had been unquote so uh, <clears throat> this went from a virus story to a ghost story in a matter of no time but what makes this even more strange is other seem to be able to see the fucking ghost lady as well. And later when they have a confrontation with the ghost lady, the guy's dog bites and kills her, which is, uh, I, I thought she was a ghost. How the fuck did the dog do that? There's also something about a curse with the dollar bill that the old lady says is, the curse of greed and that burning all the money she ends up placing in his living room is the only way to fully get rid of the curse, which our narrator does without question, and uh, yeah, this whole story sort of just goes nowhere for a solid 20 minutes and then ends anticlimactically. The end. The Brass Vase. So this one was randomly suggested to me by a good friend of mine as a sort of curveball, a quick one to toss in there. The tale starts like this, quote, A few days ago, I received a very strange letter from my best friend, Julia. Jason, I need you to do something for me tonight. 
It's very, very important that you do it exactly as I ask. You're probably going to think that all of this is crazy, but please, just humor me. Maybe we can laugh about all of this if I ever come back. Do you remember the brass vase that I found half buried in the forest? The one with odd markings engraved on it. I need you to go to my apartment and get it. First, I need you to get a black marker and draw two eyes on the palms of your hands. Make sure the pupils are in the middle of each palm. Then I need you to go to my apartment. Bring a bag and a candle with you. When you get to the apartment, it will be dark. Don't turn on the lights. Use the candle to light your way. When you enter my bedroom, you may hear the sound of whispering. You won't know where it's coming from. Don't let it freak you out. Just ignore it. Don't let it convince you of anything. Just remember, everything it says is a lie. You'll find the brass vase sitting on the dresser. Make sure you pick it up with both hands at once. Make sure the eyes on both your palms are touching the brass. If you feel something touching you, just ignore it. None of it can hurt you. Tip the brass vase over until all the blood is drained out. Make sure you drain it until there is not even a drop left in it. Whatever you do, don't look inside it. For God's sake, don't put your fingers inside it. Just drop it into the bag and leave. Take it away and get rid of it. Put it somewhere no one will ever find it. I'm sorry I have to ask you to do all of this, Jason. But you're the only person I can trust. If I'd known then what I know now, none of this would ever have happened. If everything goes well, I'll see you soon. All my love, Julia. Unquote. This is actually a pretty fun and creepy means of starting out one of these uh, ritual pasta sort of creepy pastas. Since those sorts usually read like instructions for the reader to follow, rather than something a character must do. However, in his pursuit to, well, do what Julia asked of him to do, Jason unfortunately makes a grave mistake. Quote, It was signed in her usual flourish. I didn't know what to make of it. Was she joking? Was it some sort of prank? I decided to call her and find out. Her phone rang a dozen times, but there was no answer. Then, her answering machine kicked in. Julia here. The recorded message said, Please leave a message. Hi, Julia, I said after the beep. I know it's late, but could you give me a call? That letter kind of creeped me out, and I just wanted to check that you were okay. I heard a faint, muffled, Help me. I froze and almost dropped my cell phone. Julia? I yelled. Is that you? What's wrong? Help me, she said again, her voice barely above a whisper. The buzzing on the line had grown louder. Frightened. I'm frightened. I'm frightened. I'm frightened. I'm frightened. I'm... The buzzing was drowning out her voice completely. Julia! I yelled. What happened? The line went dead, and I stared at my phone, her words echoing in my head. I tried to call her back, but the line was busy. I found a candle in a bag, grabbed my car keys, and left the house. I kept trying to call her all the way over to her apartment, but there was no answer. I parked outside, and when I got to the door of her apartment, I put the key in the lock and opened it. Inside, it was as dark as dark could be. I reached in and was about to flick the light switch when I remembered the instructions in the letter. Don't turn on the lights. I took out the candle instead, and after lighting it, I walked into the apartment. The flickering flame cast weird shadows on the walls. Julia? I whispered. There was a musty smell in the air. Something felt wrong. And the closer I came to Julia's bedroom, the more wrong it felt. I put my hand on the knob and opened the door. That's when the whispering started. It was faint, and it sounded like many voices all whispering in unison. I couldn't make out what they were saying. Lights. Turn on. The lights. Turn on. The lights. Turn on the... It was very dark. Lights. Turn on. The lights. Turn on. The lights. Turn on the... I had to resist the urge to turn on the lights. Lights. Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. Turn on the... It was very, very hard to resist. The brass vase was sitting on the dresser, just as Julia said it would be. It had a squat body with a long, thin neck, 
and an opening just large enough for two fingers to fit in. I grabbed it carefully with both hands at once. It felt warm to the touch. All of a sudden, the candle flickered and went out. I was plunged into darkness. It was pitch black. The whispering grew louder and louder. That was when I remembered the instructions Julia had given me in the letter. The eyes on the palms of my hands. I had forgotten to draw them. There's nothing I can do about it now, I thought." Unquote. So yeah, our guy had an exact list of instructions, all of which were very ominous, and he didn't think to double check them. So after he does the rest of the ritual to get rid of this entity of sorts and head into his car, he starts hearing voices yet again, and this time they want him to go home and feed the vase, which he eventually does end up giving into. The vase feeds on blood, and so he must prick his finger and let the thing, or whatever is in the vase, consume more and more of his essence. And that's pretty much the story. Not really the best in the world by any means, but it's certainly not bad. But with that said, what's next? I chose the blue pill. So these next two entries are requests from my Arch Owl patron, Just Us. So this creepypasta is about a man at the end of his rope. His life in shambles, depressed beyond belief, and currently existing in his own self-made mud pit of agony and self-hatred. And it is in this state when he comes across an ad, quote, do you feel like everything is hopeless? Do you feel like the drones around you can't help you? Do you need a way out that's different? Click here to find out more. In my mind, I immediately answered yes to all three. Those questions perfectly hit the nail on the head, describing how I felt. For long, I was given a number to call to arrange a home visit. In the call, I told them all of my problems and how I felt, adding the caveat that I felt too different for any ordinary service to help. They seemed to be interested in my case and gave me a date for a visit a week on Friday. The time couldn't come any faster. I found myself practically counting the time away for that home visit. This was it, I thought to myself. This was what was going to be the beginning to the rest of my life. Friday rolled around and I made sure I was doing nothing. I didn't start any games. I cleared up a spot on my otherwise messy house for us to talk. I even laid out some snacks. When the guy showed up, he wasn't what I was expecting at all. He was a very serious looking man in an all black suit and tie, carrying a very formal briefcase. He looked like he should be a bodyguarding someone of importance, not messing around with a slob like me. I offered him food and drink numerous times throughout the appointment. However, he denied each time. He was just here for business and he was serious. The speech he gave me was astounding. He rattled on about how I was the driving force for everything that's happened in my life. That all the bad that's happened to me was either directly or indirectly due to decisions I've made throughout my life. That all my decisions has led up to this point. How my future decisions will either pull me out or keep me going on this downward path. I was taken aback by how mind-blowing all this was to hear, and it was all true. I often felt like a mess. Yet I kept my house messy, which reinforced that ideal. I felt horrible when wasting time, yet I purposely chose to waste the free time I had. I was always tired, and yet I chose to stay up late all night. I barely get any sleep before work. I really was the primary reason for everything wrong in my life. This was all perfect and everything I needed, until the last point. He started to go on about one last decision I had to make. This is when he pulled out his briefcase something which she hadn't drawn attention to at any other point prior. He opened it up on my just about cleared coffee table and turned it around. In the case were two pills, each on a soft bed. They almost glowed in the light with their glossy opaque coat. I stared at them. One was the most intense warm red I'd seen in person before, and the other was a cool, chilling blue. I stared at them in disbelief, furrowing my brow in anticipation of what this was all about. I had already half figured it out in my head. I mean, who hasn't seen The Matrix? I was more just curious about the direction he was going to take this. Your life is a series of decisions. Decisions which has led you to this one key moment. Will you take the blue pill? See your life carry on as is. 
Or will you take the red pill and grasp the opportunity to end that cycle? He said all this with a straight face. So I reciprocated by taking it seriously, putting on a concentrating look while I eyed each option. My mind first came to the thought of the red pill. I mean, it sounds like the correct decision, right? This whole session was about making decisions to forward my life and to stop choosing to be stagnant. But then reality kicked in. If there's something I've learned from failed diets and life-changing schemes, it's that there is no fast fix in life. If you want to lose weight, you have to work hard with a diet and exercise. If you want to get rich, you can't just magic opportunities. You have to be proactive. And I figured that this was the moral of the session. I'll take the blue pill, I retorted. This was the first time I saw him react, and his serious guise was briefly dropped when he took in what I said. Are you sure? I've sat here telling you that to take control of your life, you have to make proactive decisions, he said, trying to sound persuasive. However, no matter how persuasive he was, I had it all figured out in my head. No, I'll take the blue pill. I know I have to make good decisions from now on, which I will do, but I also know that there is no magic fixes in life. Right now, I'm making the first big decision for my new life. I'm choosing to take the hard way so I can grow. At first, he scowled a bit, but then he smirked and left me with one last remark. Okay, you have made your decision. He handed me the blue pill as he carried on. However, I will leave you with the red pill. If you ever feel like you need an escape, this is always an option. And with that, he left. I took the blue pill and swallowed it with the dregs of coffee I had left, smiled, and had a new outlook in life. From here, everything went uphill, unquote. And so it did. And while it took a very long time, and he had his relapses, eventually, come a few years, our narrator was doing much better for himself, improving his life in small ways until all those little things built the foundation for the rest of his wonderful life. He always kept the red pill as a reminder of the revelation he had that day, and that no matter what rock bottom he falls to, he chose and chooses to stand back up and try again, rather than take the easy way out. Well, later on, our narrator realizes that he had never thanked the man who helped to improve his life, and so he wanted to try and contact him again. But it seemed like the website, the phone number, everything about that place and its mysterious suited man was gone from the internet. And it was then that he googled the company, and something rather disturbing is revealed. Quote, As I searched, the first few links were to major headlines on news websites. My heart sank as I clicked on one of them. The article went into detail about the group that ran the service, how they were fanatics dedicated to mass murder, and how they had persuaded many people in similar situations as me to commit exit the game of life. At first I thought it might have been a different group under the same name, an easy alibi as things like that have happened before. I made every excuse under the sun to deny their involvement until I saw how they did it. First they would find people who were at a low point in their life, then they would offer them a choice. A blue pill, which was just a simple placebo, or a red pill, which was filled with a lethal dose of cyanide, which, if ingested, would result in a person's death within mere minutes. My stomach sank reading this. It went on to say there were no survivors, that everyone involved were either arrested or found dead on scene, having taken one of the red pills themselves. This was contradictory, as I am living proof that there was a survivor, not that they could ever find out, since they never kept a strong paper trail. I was in shock. Everything I based my life around was, in a way, a lie. They weren't a help group. They were just a bunch of mugs lusting for murder. A murder cult which took advantage of people in a dark point in their lives. A concept that helped push me to where I am today. I had to take a break from my computer, so I went to my room to sit on my bed and look at the red pill. My prized possession, now a symbol of death. But that's when I had an epiphany. The red pill had always represented an easy way out. An option that was always there, yet one that never truly fixed any problems. It was, it always represented, exit the game of life. A message which they believed was the perfect solution. However, to me, it's a misguided message. Exiting the game of life is always an option. However, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. The blue pill represented nothing. 
The choice to have no magic fix intervene in your problems, but the choice to take them on yourself. A message which was not lost on me. In the end, I made the decision to stop thinking about whether they really were some sick, twisted help group with a good message or a bunch of savages. Because to me, in a way, it didn't matter. What they did for me was the best thing that ever happened. And the message, though now more morbid, had never really changed. To make sure it couldn't hurt anyone, I took the red pill out of its easily opened box and put it in a sealed, clear frame and hung it on the wall. I still tell the story of what it means. However, I always leave out the last part of its true origin." Unquote. And that's the story. And I would say overall, it's quite a good story. It's simple, but extremely effective. And the twist is, well, well done, I'd say overall. And I do really like the positive message that it has. Something which you don't often find in creepypastas, to be quite honest. Overall, one of the better ones that I've read. Little Black Bugs. Written by rather popular creepypasta slash just general horror author Vincent V. Cava, Little Black Bugs is an interesting psychological horror story about two opposites. You see, our protagonist is a neat and tidy sort of guy. He likes keeping things extra clean and abhors anything that gets in the way of that. And... Unfortunately for him, he's living with his older brother, who is, by contrast, in a constant state of slobbery. He stinks, eats food, gets high, and jerks off all over the fucking place, apparently. He's got zero aspirations. His dorm room smells and looks like shit, and he's just the kind of guy who simply exists in filth without a care in the world. Once again, by contrast, our protagonist strives for good grades and has the tendency to think about everything and everyone. He cares about his image and tends to even overthink it at points, which makes having to live with his brother in his college dorm because of their parents only being able to afford one rooming situation type thing is in a constant state of anger, stress, and depression over having to live in such a situation. He is constantly cleaning up after his slob of a brother, and he's becoming a bit of a social recluse because of it, because he's too afraid and too embarrassed to invite anyone over to their dorm, which makes keeping friends and dating a complete no-go for the guy. However, eventually things come to a head when the girl of his dreams, who he's been interacting with and thinking of a way to spend more time with her for some time, ends up going with a completely different guy. All because he was too afraid to make a move. Not out of lack for confidence, but because he didn't want her to see the filth that he lived in. When a protagonist tries to swallow his anger and clean up yet another mess by his brother, he sees a swarm of little black bugs crawling in and out of a pizza box left on the floor. In this abyss of black creepy crawlies, something snaps in our protagonist. He begins to think of a solution to his problem, a way to clean the dorm forever, to get rid of his problem, and this eventually leads him to the idea of taking care of his brother permanently. So he comes up with a plan to kill his brother, and it's a pretty simple one, relatively speaking I suppose. Strangle him when he's high watching TV on the couch, and then cut off all of his fingers and pull out his teeth drive him to the lake house their family owned, toss him into the river with weights and such, and then park the car he used at some local fast food joint, cleaning every single spot meticulously, as he always does of course, and then report his car and his brother missing to the police to help in his image. He had everything planned, and he ensures to the audience that he is in fact of sound mind, and that he knew that this was the only true and permanent solution to his problem. And so, he does end up killing his brother, and all seems to be going according to plan, up until he brought the body to the lake house, where he'd start pulling out the teeth and what have you. It's then that something strange happens. The dead body starts moving, convulsing, a loud hissing sound emanating from it. And then a swarm of black bugs start swarming out of the body, crawling every which way, and one even crawls up and down our protagonist's back and bites his neck. While he is eventually able to get rid of the body, after the experience of such a terrible horror, things in his life 
seem to be spiraling out of control. In fact, he starts having dreams and hallucinations about his brother and the bugs. People seem to stare at him with an ugly contempt, and the little black bugs are appearing everywhere in his dorm room. And no matter what he tries, they never seem to be gotten rid of. It's all starting to drive our protagonist mad. And while I am skipping ahead a fair bit here, there's a lot of good psychological horror in this one, so I'd recommend it. It all ends with our protagonist deciding to light the dorm on fire, killing the bugs once and for all, which they do end up stopping him from doing by forming together into a strange humanoid shape and then knocking him out before then crawling into every single hole he has on his body and filling him up completely with their collective. They seem to want him to be like his brother, to be a slob, to feed them garbage, to be their giving, loving, filthy god. But our protagonist, even in his immense suffering, refuses to be like his brother, and so he finds the will to light the dorm on fire and then shoots himself. The fire killing six others in the dorm, and his legacy being the strange recluse that always brought cleaning supplies to his room and complained about his brother. Oh, and a murderer, of course. That's the story, and honestly, I really like this one, primarily because the protagonist is very interesting. He's a guy who you sort of feel bad for at the start, for living in an embarrassing situation that's clearly out of his control, but slowly but surely, he starts showing his true, rather sick mindset with how he views the world, others, and himself. And you kind of root for his downfall, at least for me personally at some point. He made for an interesting character to follow as he tries to pull off this scheme of his, and how the little black bugs, or perhaps his own mind, undoes him in the end. There's a gigantic spider in my basement. This one was suggested to me by a good friend of mine on Discord, and follows a man in a rather unfortunate position. See, his marriage is falling apart. It seems like his wife and kid are going to be moving out of his life, leaving him alone and wondering where his life has been going the last several years. But that's all secondary. The main issue he's having is within his basement. You see, there's a giant, kitten-sized spider down there, along with quite a few other smaller spiders and ugly little creatures. This fact not only is making him scared to walk around his own house, it seems to be taking a psychological toll on him, as he seems to pay little attention to his crumbling family, and is instead focused on this damn spider, hoping and praying with each passing step he doesn't find it crawling up his leg or biting him. This story is pretty straightforward and is essentially about a rather strange man and his extreme arachnophobia. There's a few twists and turns here and there, but overall the protagonist's narration and the almost dark comedic tone makes it an interesting read. There could also be some kind of symbolism in there about the man ignoring all his real-life problems in favor of this spider problem in his basement that he could totally be avoiding by just not going down in his fucking basement. But it's kind of unclear if that is intentional or not. But either way, not bad. My brother died when I was a child. He kept talking. So this is one of those creepypastas that stuck with me quite a while after reading it, mainly because of how unrelentingly grim and haunting it is. As the title implies, the story is about our protagonist's brother dying. See, he was fighting cancer since he was about 10 years old, and, well, it finally caught up with him. The family obviously being in a terrible state of despair, and their family truly in shambles as the young man passed away in his hospital bed. But then, something strange happens. He begins to talk, specifically calling out to his brother. The doctors try their best to figure out how this is possible, but in truth he is dead, stone cold to the touch. But something, somewhere, is giving him the ability to talk. Though everyone can hear him speaking, only his brother's voice can get back through to him. Perhaps because the two of them were twins, but no one knows for sure. A strange man eventually walks into the room and talks with our protagonist, asking him questions and telling him that the moon landing was so significant, not as much because a man stepped on the moon, but because we could speak to him. 
we could communicate with the brave souls who were traversing the black abyss of the great unknown, and that he was akin to Houston in this case. He should ask his brother questions of what he's seeing, of what comes after death. So, he does. He talks with his brother, but there is something strange about him. He's not quite like how he was when he was alive. He talks as if he's much older. He seems to have a lot of knowledge on a great many things, like the afterlife came naturally to him, as if this knowledge was innate. But the thing is, while you might be expecting something sad, but maybe a little uplifting, this story takes a rather dark turn when the afterlife is a terrible place full of nothing but Grey and others, walking towards the center of an unbelievably large landmass of sand. People are naked, and you can see right through them. Not just physically, but emotionally and historically, their life story being displayed around them like wandering ghosts. There are creatures that like to feed on your negative emotions, and there is so much suffering, people crying out in anger and desperation about how they died, or how someone killed them, and why none of this is fair, is endless suffering on a mass scale. And even the alluring power of the center brings no hope of anything good, but rather simply a goal in this endless abyss. All of this is a lot to bear and makes what is already a terrible event, having his own brother die in front of him, all the worse as he cries out in desperation, wishing and guiding his brother in any way he can, hoping that his suffering will end, but it only gets worse. There are moments where mere minutes of silence between the brother in our time pass like years in the afterlife. As at one point, our protagonist doesn't know what to say, and then when he calls out to his brother to ask where he is now after the moment of silence, it's been years, and his brother is so happy to hear from him again. All of this ends with the deceased brother finally making it to the center, only to find that it's a monster that is truly indescribable. He thinks it might be the devil, but eventually he comes to believe that it's God, and being around it brings so much bitterness and anger and pain. It's like feeling all the sins and hurt of everyone in the world who has died crushing the spirit over and over again. His deceased brother's last words, before he embraces the center, is pleading for his brother to please, please never die. And that was it. Our protagonist left to suffer with the knowledge of the terrible truth about what comes after death, and that his brother, his twin, his second half, someone who he loved dearly, was suffering forever while he lived. Many years later pass, and our protagonist begins having vivid dreams about his brother, and the thing, the god he so desperately tried to describe, and how he feels like it's an omen for something terrible coming. And that's the story. And this was honestly one of those stories that kept me engaged the whole way through. The descriptions of this strange and terrible version of the afterlife, the emotions at play between the characters, and the terrible feeling the story left me with, hoping desperately for something good to come, some light at the end of this grim dark tunnel, that it would somehow end on a positive note. However, that unfortunately never came. It's a very well written story that invites you to endure its depressing tale and leaves you with several questions as well. Overall, it's a pretty damn good pasta, and one that I don't ever really see people recommend either. So, take it from me. While I'm definitely one for happy endings, and that's always definitely more a my cup of tea, personally, for what it is, this is a very well written and very creative story. It just so happens to be a rather depressing and dark one at that. One Million Visitor, yet another very obscure one with good old Dave the Useless being the only guy to have read this one. And it's really fucking dumb. Like the story opens like this, quote, I believed myself to be very dull until I linked up my account to a website called 100000.icu, unquote. Really? ICU? <sighs> anyway, the website says it can give him 1 million viewers, and sort of works like one of those AI websites. Though if you ask it almost anything, it just says, I am one in one million. 
So he uploads a YouTube video and sure enough, he gets crazy amounts of views on it with a ton of weird comments to boot. And then after he gets a ton of views and he goes to thank the website bot, I guess, it's now been replaced with this video of an eye with like a one shaped pupil, which scares the guy. And so he like deletes his stuff, I guess. And something bad is going to happen when he reaches 1 million viewers or something. I don't fucking know. It's kind of unintelligible near the end and ends very abruptly without any clear conclusion. So, uh, yeah, diamond in the rough, obviously. This is not. The disappearance of Ashley Morgan. Not to be confused with the disappearance of Ashley Kansas, this follows two twin sisters who were very close and always getting up to all sorts of mischief. However, very recently, their dog Rocky had passed away, something which their parents used as a opportunity to teach the two of them about death. They were only six, but this memory stayed with them for some time, until one day after the family had a little pool party, the two of them were put to bed early. Despite not being tired and out of anger, the two decided to pull a little prank on their mom by dressing in each other's clothes and pretending to be the other twin for a bit to confuse and mess with her, something that they did fairly often. However, as the two fell asleep, that was the last time our narrator ever saw her twin sister. What proceeds is a story of a family falling apart as they first try and find her, only for the realization that she is more than likely dead, beating down on them all. What makes it worse is according to the father, their older brother had gone to Japan just before all this happened, and decide to stay there with a girl he met, meaning that there were now two people they were missing. This eventually leads to a lot of tension between the father and mother, with the mother accusing the father, or maybe the father's brother, of kidnapping slash, hmm, assaulting Ashley before killing her. But she has no real basis for this thought. However, this would eventually lead to their divorce, and our protagonist left with only her father, as her mother ended up moving in with some other man to shoot up heroin to run away from her pain. The father, meanwhile, grew more and more distant of his only daughter, staying in his study and eventually sealing up their pool and building a shack over it, and generally acting very strangely. Over time, our protagonist grows to resent her missing sister, how her running away left their family torn apart, how she left without even saying goodbye, and how her family now hated to even look at her, as she reminded them of the one that they lost, her dead sister. Like a ghost walking about, her visage brings them nothing but pain now. All this comes to a head when her father eventually exits the game of life via a gun, and when the police get involved, everything slowly gets revealed. The pool that was being sealed up had several dead bodies under it, one was their dog, one was the body of Ashley, and one was the body of her older brother, who she hadn't seen in years, who she thought was still in Japan all this time. She, of course, believes all this to be the fault of her father, since he was the one that hid and buried all this, hiding his secrets before ending his life out of guilt. So she had her father cremated and tossed his ashes across the road, him deserving no sort of sentimentalities in her mind. However, in one final twist, they did indeed find DNA, or, you know, stuff on Ashley's body. But it wasn't her father's, it was her brother's. The way it seemed to go down is that that very night after the two of them went to bed, their 18-year-old brother took Ashley and assaulted her, most likely accidentally killing her via strangulation. The father caught him in the act and proceeded to beat him to death. Now left with two dead bodies, he chose to hide them and not tell his daughter and mother out of trying to keep some sort of hope alive or something like that. And that's pretty much the story. Very dark and twisted, but pretty decent overall. I will say though that the way the story sort of tries to redeem the father as this hero that sacrificed so much to carry the burden of this knowledge for himself, I thought was kind of fucked up and wrong. Like, he's not a hero. He killed his son out of passion for his son killing his daughter and then buried their bodies to hide the crimes. Yeah, I suppose you might say he was justified, but he should have called the police if he was really a hero, even if he killed his own son. First, it's a weird tonal shift that I thought was kind of a fucked up message overall. But besides that, it's overall a pretty decent story.
upstairs. When I was a child, I lived in a rented two-floor house. Both my parents worked, so I was often alone when I came home from school. One early evening when I came home, the house was still dark. I called out, Mom? And heard a voice say, Yes? From upstairs. I called my mom again, and again got the same, Yes? Reply. I felt she was calling back to me and climbed up the stairs. When I reached the first floor, I called her once more, and the voice, Yes, came from the furthest room. I felt both uneasy, but also felt a strong urge to see my mother and started to walk towards the room. But just as I was about to open the door into the room, I heard the front door downstairs open and my mother come in, carrying a lot of shopping bags. Sweetie, are you home? My mother called in a cheery voice. Hearing her voice made me feel instantly better and I turned back to go downstairs at once, but, but not before I had a quick glance towards the room. While I watched from the top of the stairs, the door to the room slowly opened a crack. For a brief moment, I saw something strange in there. A pale face staring at me. The Chanting in the Woods This story is about a kid living with his dad in the woods alongside his little terrier dog named Cash, and everything seems to be going fine. Well, until him and Cash stumble into a strange part of the woods where little dolls are with the clean polished animal skulls for heads are all strung up, alongside paintings on the trees depicting a half man, half goat thing. Something about that place felt terribly wrong and his dog Cash immediately started barking and running out of the woods, leading our narrator out of there and away from that morbid place. When our narrator tries to tell his dad about all this, he says that it's probably just some teenagers doing some stupid stuff in the woods. This put our narrator's mind at ease, up until that very night when he started hearing chanting in the woods, chanting that went on for five hours straight. A terrible feeling of fear overcomes our protagonist, and of course, when he tells his dad in the morning, he has another excuse for why it's not something weird or scary. This goes on for a bit, as you might expect, up until he has to go to his mom's house for the weekend since, well, the two are divorced. And on his way to his mom's car, he sees a black van with two men standing near it. They are bald and wear oddly thin sunglasses, and he sees them staring at him before they talk to one another and then glare back at him, like they wanted him to know he's being watched. Once again, he tries to tell his mom all this, and it goes nowhere. And when he has to go back to his dad's house and eventually finds the right mind space to fall asleep, he's in awoken in the middle of the night by two men, one in particular wearing a goat skull as a mask. They turn to tell him what they want, holding his mouth tightly shut. Quote, Scream and I will kill you, the voice whispered in my ear. My eyes couldn't, no. They wouldn't break away from that horrible person wearing the severed goat head as a mask. He was shirtless, wearing a necklace of what appeared to be bones. He was horribly emaciated, and there were markings all up and down his torso. In his right hand, he held a knife about the size of my forearm. His build wasn't like any knife I had ever seen. It took a step closer to me and pressed it up against my throat. The steel was bitterly cold, and the tip of the blade was sharper than anything I ever felt. It would take less than four ounces of pressure to open my throat, and they knew that I knew it. I couldn't cry. I couldn't even breathe. In its other hand, it held a basic candle. Tomorrow, the thing said, his voice muffled by the lifeless dead goat mask. You will exit your house at midnight. You will light this candle, place it on the ground in the center of your yard and you will sit behind it, legs crossed, right foot on top of the left knee, and vice versa. If you don't do this, voice whispered in my ear, the blood of your loved ones will be on your hands. The goat man quickly retrieved the blade from my neck. I don't remember what happened next. I remember waking up in my bed, panting and crying. My dad came in to see what was wrong with me, and when I told him, he told me it was just a nightmare. 
At this point, he sat me down at the end of my bed. He looked very wary, like he didn't want to say what he was about to say. He rubbed his eyes with his fists and wearily explained to me that this was all just me stressing out over the divorce. That maybe we should look into talking to a therapist about these voices and hallucinations I'm having." Unquote. Well, skipping ahead, that night does indeed come, and outside of his window, he sees several people in masks cultists waiting for him to perform the ritual, but he was too scared. He couldn't find the strength to leave his bed with all their eyes upon him. And so the next morning came, only to find that his dog Cash was murdered and left on the side of the road. It was a painful thing to endure through, knowing full well that this was all his fault, and should he not do it the next night, the next victim would be his father. So the next night came, and our protagonist does the ritual, only to find something with beady green eyes staring at him. A goat man. A real goat man. A dark god of sorts that was ready to take him in the night. The light of his candle being the only thing keeping the goat man away from him as the cultists watched in anticipation. However, he ends up going against the ritual and escapes the goat man by the skin of his teeth only to find that, of course, no one believes him yet again. In fact, he is taken into a therapist by his parents, who thought he was doing all this as a cry for help and not taking the divorce well. He ended up being diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia disorder, being told he made all this up, that it was all in his head. Quote, For a while, I believed everything they told me. The lies felt safe. The lies were comfortable. Several years later, they would tell me that I would have made a full recovery. It was an easy process since I never had another encounter again. At that point in time, I was so angry I just told them what they wanted to hear. When I became old enough, I severed all ties with my parents and moved out of the state. Once on my own, I looked into the town's archives and researched as much information as I could about the area when I was nine. The missing person report. The manhunt in those woods lasted several days, and all they found was one man. He was torn apart his limbs removed, his organs missing. They found that he was wearing a peculiar mask, the head of a ram, but its innards were carefully carved and hollowed to fit over a human head. When they removed the helmet, they saw that he had died with an expression of absolute horror. I took pleasure in that. I would like to believe that these men were cultists, that they were attempting to appease some unseen, unnamed god, a god that absolutely should not have existed, a god that had no right to walk among men, and that during their attempt to appease it, I had botched their ritual by breaking an important piece of the process, the doll, and in their attempt to salvage it, they forced me into offering myself as a sacrifice, but its failure to do whatever it was going to do to me that night destroyed the whole operation. I would prefer to believe that in the name of vengeance, this angry thing turned on its own worshippers, killing them all and dragging them back to wherever it came from. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. There's just one thing I still couldn't figure out. Why is it that no matter where I go, when I'm all alone, in quiet places, in the dead of night, why can I still hear them chanting that unholy sermon that I heard so long ago in the woods when I was nine? Unquote. And that's the story, and yet again, I think this one is pretty good. It is a bit cliche, and you kind of already know what's going to happen. At least I did going into it, but it's still pretty good. The Strangers. So this is a very unique creepypasta, and one that is admittingly a bit hard to do justice here. But the basic premise is about a guy who has to ride the metro to get to work. And lately, he hasn't been taking his backpack to work so that he might start looking more mature without a giant backpack slung over his shoulder, I guess. His iPod also stopped working, and so lately, he has just been sitting there quietly on the train, watching people. He starts noticing people of all sorts and their habits, notably habits to avoid talking to other people, such as pretending to fall asleep, using their phone, reading a book, or fidgeting quietly while staring at the floor never making eye contact with others. 
Everything seems normal, until he noticed a man sitting perfectly still, never speaking a word, never reacting to anything or anyone, just staring blankly at the wall. The more he watched him, the more something terribly off about the man started to show through, the uncanny valiness of his expression, almost like he was trying to hide amongst the crowd, but also not. Eventually, our narrator decides to stick around and watch the guy longer, find out where he gets off or what he does besides sit there blankly and doing nothing. He comes to find that the man continues to ride the train for hours, the entire day in fact, and even goes on to the terminal, where our narrator is hesitant to go since it's so far from his own house. But eventually, he just can't stand it anymore. He needs to know what this man was, what his deal is, and so he decides to stay with him to the terminal, and, well, maybe it's best I leave the surprise for you to go read yourself. But needless to say, a harsh left turn is taken in the story, and a real clear sense of dread and helplessness is what I would say encapsulates the rest of the story, along with the payoff to this mystery being something quite unique, at the very least. So if you really want to know what this story is all about, I'd really highly recommend going and checking it out for yourself. It's a pretty damn good creepypasta. Mario 1-111. Alright, it finally happened folks. We reached a creepypasta that I have no fucking clue as to what it is. Or rather, where it is I suppose. I have tried writing in every variation for this creepypasta title into Google, into YouTube, etc but I just cannot seem to find this pasta anywhere. So, uh, sorry, this one might be a little too obscure, or maybe it was taken off the internet for some reason, maybe it's one of those DeviantArt ones that often get lost time when the author gets too embarrassed about it, when it gets some notoriety, but even then, if it got notoriety, someone surely would have read it on YouTube, right? But I see no evidence of this either. Maybe this was something that the actual creepypasta iceberg creator wrote and is lost the time there? I'll have to ask them. But I'm on a strict schedule to try to get this video out. So, as much as it pains me to say, I don't know what this one's about. But if you do happen to know what this story is or find it in any capacity, please let me know in the comments down below. And if you could, try and provide me a link and I'll include it in the director's cut of this whole series iceberg thing. But until then, let's move on. Updates. So, as it turns out, since this original upload, I have since found the original stories, thanks to one of the cool dudes over on my Discord server. Also, it turns out that Bad Creepy Pasta actually did a reading of them on their channel, and I just completely and utterly forgot about that. Not gonna lie, this was a pretty big oversight on my part. I had a big dumb dumb moment. So, as punishment for my crime of not being thorough enough, I'll be reading this trilogy in full right now. So, let's give them a read. First tale in our saga, written by Supreme Kai 4, entitled Mario, goes as follows. Quote, I was asked to clean out my father's house after he had passed away. He was a huge gaming nerd. He even camped out for the release of the NES when he was about my age, 19. He had them all. Atari 2600, Atari Flashback, Magnavox Odyssey 2000 uh, through 5000, NES, SNES, N64, Nintendo GameCube, Wii, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, DS, DS Lite, DSi, 3DS, oh my fucking god, we get it, he had every console, Xbox, Xbox 360, PlayStation 1, 2, 3, PSP, and PS Vita. He might even had the Wii U if he was alive long enough for the release, not that he was missing anything. I was in my father's house, alone, cleaning out the basement. I grabbed one of the last cardboard boxes down there. I noticed how light it was. Wondering why it was so light, I peeked inside to find that one old NES game cartridge. It did not have a game label on it. It only had Mario crudely written by my father with a permanent marker. I became curious. Why was this game all by itself in a box? Why was the label torn off? Why was it written on? 
And why was Mario spelled so crudely? Since my father handed me down all of his games and consoles, which included his NES, I decided to take it home and figure it out for myself. I got home and set up the NES. I immediately popped the game and started it up. Things already seemed a little off. The game had no startup screen. It simply just placed me at the start of the first level of what appeared to be the classic game that we all know and love, Super Mario Bros. Well, the game is old, I thought to myself. Maybe it is just a little glitchy. And that is why it skipped the startup screen. Dad did buy it at midnight release after all, so I continued. As I expected, the game was rather glitchy. Sometimes when grabbing a fire flower, it would make Mario small. The stars only work 75% of the time. As well, Toad never said the message he had for you at the end of every castle. You know, thank you Mario, but our princess is in another castle. He never said anything. That was until World 7's castle. Only one step closer to becoming one of us. This message made me chuckle a little. I assumed my father had hacked the game for laughs and that was why it was so glitchy before. Things got weird after that. In level 8-1, the sky was a dark red and the music was a little slower than usual. The whole level was nothing but five minutes of walking. No enemies or obstacles, just the ground. Reaching the end of the level, I grabbed the flag. The ending fanfare did not play and the fireworks sounded more like gunshots than 8-bit explosions. Okay, that was strange, I thought to myself. What was the point of that? Oh well, on to the next. Level 8-2 was even stranger. The sky was an even darker red, and the music played even slower. This time there were enemies. I was approached by a Koopa Troopa, and for points, I jumped on him. The delightful little noise that plays when you jump on an enemy did not play this time. Instead, there was a squish accompanied by the crackling of bones and a slight groan. This was weird and sadistic. It did not seem like something my father would do. In fact, he in no way condoned anything scary in my house as I was growing up. He never allowed my older sister or myself to play any scary games or watch any scary movies. We did at our friends' houses, of course, but that is besides the point. I moved on and ran into a Goomba. To make sure the earlier sound was not a glitch, I jumped on it. The same sound played. I was becoming unsettled, to say the least. When I reached the end of the level, the same thing happened as it had at the end of the previous level. I noticed something even more weird. The spot on the screen that showed what level you were on did not display World 8-3. Instead, it showed World, followed by the symbol on the flag at the end of every level that looked like a skull. I know that it is not actually a skull, but it looks like one. The third level of the world skull was even stranger. The sky was a dark red, much darker than before, and the music did not even play. The enemies that I came to were already dead. Their bodies appeared twisted and mangled, like someone had beaten them to death. I reached the end. There was no flag or anything like that, just a castle. It had Welcome Mario painted on the front of it, with, I assumed, to be blood. Reluctantly, I entered. The black screen that shows your status between levels showed that I had X zero lives, and I was in World Ed. I was pale and trembling with fear. Just what was this game? The castle was like the first level of World Skull, there were no obstacles, enemies, or slow music. I walked straight for what seemed like at least 15 minutes. Why the fuck would you keep going if it took 15 fucking minutes? My time reached zero, but the level kept going. It felt like Mario was not alone, like someone was watching his every move. My only questions were, what was Mario's mission in this sadistic twisted game? What did he want to accomplish and why? I had to finish the game to know. Finally, I came to the end of the level. There he stood, Bowser. His eyes were missing and his belly appeared fleshless. I prepared to fight him, but he quickly grabbed Mario. 
he began to laugh evilly, realistically, sounds that cannot be made on an 8-bit console. You might even say they were hyper-realistic. It became clear to me this was not a hack. Bowser bit Mario's head off. Mario's body shivered and struggled as Bowser dragged him behind the battle scene. You know, where Princess Peach was supposed to be. I was expecting to see Princess Peach. Oh, who am I kidding? I was not expecting anything that would save me from this nightmare. I saw a toad, Luigi and Peach. However, both Luigi and Peach had toad's heads on their bodies instead of their own. Bowser grabbed the toad's head and stuck it on Mario, then placed him next to the others. Bowser then proceeded to rip off his own head and began to pull out his intestines. Text appeared. Press B for a harder quest, and even you can become one of us. I threw my controller at the screen so hard that the screen actually broke. I ejected the cartridge and threw it at the wall. It fell into pieces, and I noticed that there was a note inside. I picked it up and read it. Dear son, you're next, dad. I threw both the game and the letter in the fire that I started in my fireplace. I will never be able to get that satanic picture of my beloved characters like that out of my head. To this day, I cannot play Super Mario Bros. And the other morning, I woke up to see Mario carved into my arm. To take my mind off of things, I began looking through all the other NES games. On top of the stack was Super Mario Bros. 2. However, the label was different. It spelled... Super Mario Bros. 2. The picture of Mario delightfully carrying the turnip was instead a picture of Mario with an angry toad head carrying Birdo's decapitated head instead of a turnip. After that, I just decided to never play any Mario games ever again. Whatever was on this game could only be worse. Thank you for reading. I want somebody to know about this before something happened to me. Unquote. And so, that is part one of this epic saga. You know, there was almost a sort of interesting premise in there. Imagine if his dead dad was well known for making fan games, mods, and hacks, and what have you. Especially given his history with gaming. Although the whole waiting outside for the NES thing doesn't seem like something that would have actually happened, but whatever. And so the son starts playing all these fan hacks and fan games after discovering them only to find out a sad and creepy truth about his dad, family, and just generally disturbing or odd things through these fan games. Maybe there's even a hidden message left there for his son to discover, maybe even something kind of sweet by story's end. This of course is not at all the case, uh, but oh well. But with that being said, what is part two about? Well, Mario 2. Quote, Sadly, about a week ago, my younger brother took his own life. My father had died about a month before, and I had believed that my brother was depressed without him. They were quite attached to one another after all. The day before he committed exit the game of life on himself, he came to my house and gave me our father's hand-me-down games and consoles. We were all such gaming nerds. I loved the three original Mario Bros. games. Unfortunately, I was unable to find the first one in the giant stack of NES cartridges. However, I did come across Super Mario Bros. 2. I could tell my funny man father had printed off a label he must have made somewhere, because there were a few things different about it. For one, the title was spelled as Super Mario Bros. 2. And the picture of Mario on the cover, Mario had a toad's head and was carrying Birdo's head by the bow instead of a turnip. Yeah, my father had a rather dark sense of humor. This completely goes against what the other brother said about not liking horror in the house, but whatever. I popped the game into the NES for nostalgia. I decided to let the game tell me the story about Mario's dream, only it read something else. After Mario suffered a terrible fate, he decided to get revenge. He has become insane with rage. 
and is going to take the life of every mortal who crosses his path. That was rather disturbing. I guess my brother had hacked it somehow. He knew how. He was a huge computer nerd. I went on. The game did not give me the choice of my character, it simply threw me into the game as Mario, who just like on the cover of the cartridge had a toad's head instead of his own. There was no music and I didn't jump from the sky. I was at the beginning of World 1-1, only things were a little different. The background sky was black and all the enemies were replaced by angry looking toads. This was weird. Each toad angrily charged at Mario. I didn't even have to do anything, though. When the toads touched Mario, they turned into skeletons and crumbled to the ground. I was uneased by this. My favorite game was this unsettling game? I guess my brother must have been very bored. I decided to see how the rest of the game was going to turn out. I reached the end of the level where you fight Birdo. She looked as if someone had gotten to her before me. She was bruised and bloody, and had some flesh and bones showing. I was horrified, to say the least. A text pox popped up. Please. Mario stepped a little closer on his own. No, I don't. I'm not. He made another step. Why am I here? Another small step. I'm not who you think I... Mario pounced her. He began to ruthlessly beat her while she screamed. Realistic. Sounds that can't be made on an 8-bit console. Blood spewed and showered with each his Mario made. The last time he hit her, which he charged up for, her head rolled off. Mario threw off his toad head and replaced it with Birdo's. Another text box appeared. But you were one of us. You've angered us. You will rue this, Mario. The sky turned red. I heard what sounded like distant crying of a woman in the background, accompanied by what sounded like multiple evil laughs, play backwards all at once. A demonic deep voice was heard behind it all. Chills weren't just up my spine, they were everywhere. My whole room got colder. It seemed I had goosebumps all over. The sound were growing louder before suddenly stopping. Mario's Birdo head flew off. He still lived, headless. He turned to the screen and began to softly sob. I wanted to turn off the NES so badly, but something compelled me to leave it on. His cry grew louder. As he cried, an army of toes began to march in from the left of the screen. The noises from earlier resumed. This time they were loud and the woman was screaming instead of crying. I was sure my TV speakers were about to bust, only it sounded almost like the sounds weren't coming from the speakers. It's like they were coming from all around me. The laughter and deep voice stopped. However, the woman's screams began to strobe. It was almost as if she was being violently tortured. It strobed more and more and went on for a good minute and a half before suddenly stopping. The deep voice came back. I listened slowly to hear what he was saying. The uh, M P R W R I S. The Empire will rise. The picture blackened out. It was replaced with an artist-like peacure of a headless Mario. His clothers were bloody, and some parts were torn off. The picture stayed on the screen for about 30 seconds before the screen began to blink white repeatedly. The woman's scream came back along with the laughter. The laughter was mixed with people chanting, THE EMPIRE! THE EMPIRE! I fainted from fear. I then had a very strange dream. I was laying on the ground in a puddle of my own blood. I saw Mario coming. He was walking towards me with an angry looking toad head, like before. I kept trying to tell him I wasn't his enemy, but I was too weak to talk. I told his he wasn't who I thought I was. Then I realized I was Birdo! He jumped on me, just like in the game. I woke up before he started to attack. Mario was carved in my arm. I ejected the game from the AAS, grabbed it, and threw it in the street. 
I ran over it with my car multiple times until it was nothing but little pieces of plastic. I now understand why my brother committed the exit game of life thing. Unless he didn't do it. Whatever was in that game, but have done it. What? Whatever was in that game, but have done it itself. Okay. I hope I'll be alright, although I think I messed up running over that game. Unquote. So, um. That was so much worse. So much more fucking stupid. I, I don't even know what to say other than. How much worse can this pasta possibly get? Like seriously, we went from a cliche, bad but ultimately basic bitch video game creepypasta to this grammar mistake ridden, nonsensical, complete wash of a pasta. So, bearing all that in mind, how will this epic trilogy come to its end? <sighs> well... Mario 3, quote, My best friend was taken to a psychiatric ward a few weeks ago. Nobody has a clue what is wrong with her. It has been really hard watching her, especially in the few month time span before. Her family was slowly falling apart piece by piece. Ever since her father passed away, I still don't know how he died but it was causing wreckage in the mental states of his children. It seemed his son committed exit the game of life on himself, and his daughter has been hospitalized. I grew up with both of them, so it has been hard for me. It is hard to watch a family fall apart like that. I visited my friend at the ward yesterday to see if she had recovered any. To my dismay, she hadn't. Her state of mind was only declining. She kept talking about these games, these Mario games. Her father gave them to her brother, and her brother gave them to her. I was never much of a gamer myself. But they loved to play all these old school games, especially the three Mario games. Ha! Huh, pardon me. I got off track. No, you didn't. That was literally on track with the rest of the... Okay, whatever, never mind. Anyways, when I walked into her room, a smile came across her face. That was good to see, I guess. But it was the only happy moment of a short visit. Oh, it's you, I said as I walked in. Just wanted to drop by and check on you, I told her. There's nothing for you to check on, she said. I'm fine, I just need to go and finish it. Finish? Finish what? I asked, a bit confused. Super Mario Bros. 3. I finished 2. Now you go see what's on 3, so I can finally find out what is happening to me. Well, I didn't want to argue. I thought she was simply just losing her mind. Yeah, just simply losing her mind. No big deal. This brought tears to my eyes. But I was going to do what she asked. I was going to lie and told her I played it. And nothing happened. Or tell her, no. I was gonna pl- Wait, what? Okay. I was gonna go play the game and had come back and tell her what happened. After exchanging a few more words, I left for her apartment. When I arrived there, you could definitely tell the place had been poorly kept. There were pieces of paper everywhere, game controllers strolled out in chaos, and the TV had been left on and was on static. I looked at the pieces of paper on the ground. I found one that read Mario at least a hundred times. It couldn't have been any less than a hundred. Other pieces were scribbled on and I could hardly read them, and I didn't want to get a headache trying. But anyway, I sat down and checked out the NES that was lying on the floor. Super Mario Bros. 3 was already in, which for some reason read Super Mario Bros. 3 on the label, with a controller ready. I guess she was already about to play it before she was taken in. I pressed the power button to play a few levels before I headed back to the ward and gave her whatever news she wanted to hear. However, there was something wrong with the game. There was no title screen and I didn't get an overworld map. I was simply placed in a level with a few things that were definitely off. Mario didn't have his head, but instead it was Birdo's head. Why was that? I'd assume that they had hacked it or whatever. The sky was read and I was greeted with a text that read, 
Once one of us, and always one of us. We warned you that you would rue this, Mario, and your final step is about to be taken. The Empire will rise. This shook me up a little. What a grim message. What Empire? Was I playing Star Wars or Mario? And why was Mario's name spelt like that? I pressed A and moved on. There wasn't much in this level. All I had to do was move forward. Didn't have to jump or fight any enemies. Just held down the button and kept Mario moving forward until I reached the end and grabbed the card to finish the level. I got a mushroom, which is the lowest of the three cards you could get out of the Fire Flower and Star. I thought she said that she wasn't much of a gamer. I guess maybe she'd play Mario or something before now, but it seems weird that she'd know this information. Expecting to jump onto an overworld map, I was thrown into another level. The same thing as before. I even got a mushroom card at the end like before. This a third time and it was beginning to bore me. I didn't know how my friend was going to take what I was going to tell her because I was about to turn the NES off before something happened. The screen froze for a few seconds on the three cards I had gotten, which were all mushrooms. Then the screen went to black. After a few seconds of black, I was greeted with an enlarged Mario sprite who still had Birdo's head. The three cards from before came back onto the screen, and Mario held them in his hand. He stared at them with a look of terror, fear, sadness. Mario turned towards the screen, and the screen flashed. It did so continuously until it stopped with a picture of Mario, with his new head. It was one of Toad's heads, and one of the cards in his hand was now blank. The screen immediately switched to a new picture, four toads, one bigger than the rest. To the right of them was a tree, with two bodies hanging from it by a rope around their necks. A new text appeared. And now, what he began shall finish. He told us he would give us his children, if he could become one of us. May the last step be taken. Come forth. Mario. Mario still, with a toad's head, came in from the right of the screen. He pulled out the two cars from earlier that still had mushrooms on them, and he walked over to the the bodies hanging from the tree. That old sound that plays when you grab a mushroom or firefly are played, and the cards turned into toads. No! We will be slaves instead! Please don't! Another text that read, Mario then proceeded to crack the necks of the two toads. He then ripped their heads off and forced them onto the heads of the bodies hanging from the tree. The bodies jumped down, suddenly alive. Then I saw a new body fading in. This one looked like it was a girl. In fact, it looked very familiar. The largest toad then ripped his own head off and threw it to Mario. Mario, just like before with the other two, forced the toad's heads onto the girl's head. Fuck it, what is going on? What the fuck am I reading? All I could think as I watched was, is it, is it even possible to do a hack like this? My phone began to ring. I looked at the number. It was the ward that my friend was staying at. They informed me that my friend had just exited the game of life. I threw my phone at the wall, angry and afraid. I looked at the screen and they were all staring at me. Every sprite, their eyes were following me. A new text popped up. The Empire has now been created. It would be a shame if you didn't join us. At that moment, I received a text message from a number that I had not saved in my phone. The text read, I asked them to take my children. They should both be dead now. I know for sure. I have done what they wanted, and now they want more. I told them that I would oblige them with one more. Don't you want to be happy forever? I threw my phone back to where I threw it before. I looked at the screen again and, oh god, I will never forget it. I still see it, that angry soul-piercing stare of that toad 
The screen flickered furiously, and I heard merciless screams and chants, all of them chanting, The Empire has risen! The Empire! The Empire! Mario has fallen! The Empire! The chants faded, and all I heard was screaming. I furiously ran out of the- she- well, furious. I furiously ran out the door and ran to my car. I was going to go back to the ward to give one last goodbye to my friend. When I arrived and walked in, everything began to fall apart. I walked to the front desk. Hey, I know she just passed away, but could I go see my friend's room and see her? What are you talking about? Nobody has died today. And what are you doing out here? The desk clerk asked. What do you mean? After I asked this, two big men in scrubs grabbed my arms and began to drag me away. I was screaming and wondering what was going on. I had never been so scared in my life. They took me to a room, undressed me, and put me in a hospital robes that all of the patients were. A nurse walked in. Thank you, gentlemen. I don't know what has gotten into her recently. What? What was she talking about, ma'am? What's going on? Shush! Play with your cards, she said as she handed me three cards with a mushroom on each one. I fell to the ground and wailed violently. This isn't happening! I screamed. I screamed this many times before two men came back in, placed me on a bed, and held me down until I stopped screaming. That night I had dreams of armies of toads marching towards me, with Mario leading the charge. I write this while lying on my bed here in this ward. Is this what my friend went through? Was she fine the whole time, but everyone saw her as a patient? Maybe her state of mind was fine the whole time and we just kept seeing her as crazy. Thoughts of that text message I received still rang in my head. Was I... was I going to be in this empire too? No. No, that won't happen! Maybe I'm not actually writing this. Maybe I'll wake up soon and everything will be alright. Unquote. Wow. What a fucking awful end to an awful trilogy. That became completely incoherent by story's end. I guess some answers about what the fuck the Empire and what the dad's reasoning for having these haunted games were sort of kind of implied to be given. Like I guess his dad sacrificed his children to become part of the Toad army, but why would he want to become part of the Toad army and... Like, to, to what end is all this? Uh, but, as a whole, this Pasta Trilogy has managed to tell so little actual coherent plot in between its ellipses-filled, dumbass Mario-related creepy game descriptions that really does feel like the author was coming up with it actively while he was writing it, with little to no idea of where any of it was going. Which, I suppose was sort of fine in a contained package, but across three fucking stories? My goodness, what a torture to get through. But hey, now you know the whole terrible tale of Mario. Which, by the way, they never actually say why it is written as Mario either. Guess just, just one of the mysteries we'll never get the answer to. But with that punishment out of the way, let's... Please, for the love of God, move on. How Jeff Killed Christmas. Yes. Yes, this is real. So, uh, let's have a read of the whole thing, shall we? Well, hello there, readers young and old. You're in for quite a treat, a true tale to behold. As you can see with a title such as this, I will tell you a tale of how Jeff killed Christmas. It all started late on a silent Christmas Eve, and our favorite killer, Jeff, at something up his sleeve. Seeing that it was Christmas, Jeff wanted to do something new, something extra, but what was he to do? Just then he heard something, his feet made him pause. He slowly turned to see a fake drunken Santa Claus. The wheels started turning and Jeff had a plan. He clutched the knife in his pocket and that's when he began. Old Saint Nick saw Jeff heading straight his way Maybe he could get a dollar from Mr. Jeff today. Hey buddy, wanna help out? Now don't go being cheap. Jeff lunged at the man saying, Go to sleep. He slit Santa's throat while he squirmed and thrashed. But there was no escaping. 
being cut and being slashed. The drunk fell to the ground with a noticeable thud. His pupils started to widen as he choked on his blood. Jeff grabbed Santa's suit, soaked with crimson water. That's when he knew he could start his Christmas slaughter. When he achieved his look, he was on his way, but not before he hijacked Santa's car, or I mean his sleigh. He drove through a small neighborhood, rather quiet and kind, the perfect setting for what Jeff was planning in his mind. His plan was to sneak into each home, all of the parents he'd kill, murdering almost the whole neighborhood to get his holiday thrill. Jeff chuckled maniacally, stopping at the first house on the block, at how upset this town would be. Boy, would they be in for a shock. He could just imagine it, all the children on Christmas Day, to see that Mommy and Daddy were some twisted psycho's prey. He got out of the car and trudged through the snow, then scaled the side of a house, up to somebody's window. Through the window, he saw the parents, dreaming their Christmas dreams. It's a little too quiet in here. Let's see if I can't get him to scream. He snuck through the window and crouched by the bed. He withdrew his knife and balanced it on Daddy's head. He poked at Daddy Dearest, who awoke to the face of evil. The man let out a gasp of fear. Yeah, I have that effect on people. Jeff slammed the knife through his skull. The mother screamed and tried to run, but Jeff caught up and gutted her. He seemed to be having a lot of fun. When he was done with the mother, he wrote his slogan on the wall, but then he heard the little footsteps making their way down the hall. He shot out of the room, then slammed the door. He couldn't let the child see his masterpiece of gore. In the hallway, he met a young little girl with eyes of bright blue and hair of blonde curl. The girl looked at Jeff, all dressed in Santa's gear. Her eyes lit up with excitement and her voice filled with cheer. Santa! I can't believe it's you! This was the best moment of her life. And then she looked to his side and asked, What are you doing with that knife? It's, uh, for cutting the turkey. I'm making sure it's fresh for tomorrow. She glared at the knife again and said, I've got a better one for you to borrow. She led him to the kitchen and opened up the drawer. His eyes were fixated on the knife that he just couldn't ignore. The monstrous knife with a serrated edge put his bloody weapon to shame. He pulled it from the drawer thinking, this will be better for my reindeer game. Will this work for you, Santa? Did I help you out? Jeff patted the girl's head with praise and said, without a doubt. He sent the girl back to bed and made his way out the door. He hopped in his car and continued with his night of unspeakable horror. From home to home he went, having a ball with his slaughter, leaving behind a special present for every son and every daughter. He decorated the trees with intestines and filled their stockings with eyes. He made quick work of the parents, making sure the kids couldn't hear their cries. He propped up his victims on the couch in the living room, placing their heads in their laps making a rather picturesque tomb. By the time he had finished, he could see the early light of day. He dished the costume, got in the car, and ended his night of horrid play. His first annual Christmas killing was very brutal, I must confess, but we all know that in his eyes, he saw it as his greatest success. That small town won't be the same. They will forever live in fear because in the back of their minds they know that he'll do the same thing every year. So for those of you who live in a town of small population, be warned and prepare for a night of gore and devastation. Sleep with a gun, lock everything up, and don't forget this little thriller if you don't want to be the next victim of the infamous Jeff the Killer. And that is the tale of how Jeff killed Christmas I hope you all enjoyed that. I'm gonna be honest, I actually had a lot more fun reading that than I expected. Camerahead. So this entry is far different from everything else that we've covered, primarily because it's a lost creepypasta. According to the super epic failpedia wiki, look, just go with it, quotes, Camerahead, alternatively, Camerahead's or I killed a Camerahead, 
is a lost creepypasta that revolved around a character's descent into madness after discovering the existence of entities known as camera heads. The story and associated characters supposedly predate other creepypasta characters such as Slenderman, The Rake, Small Dog, and Jeff the Killer." Unquote. The supposed synopsis of this tale goes like this, quote, An anonymous 4chan user discovers a backpack with items in it, whether it be scattered books and a note or tape, broken camera and a letter. He finds the written message, I killed a camera head. The user then finds himself being stalked by the camera heads, posting photos of them as they hunt him. Unquote. So yeah, that's the basic rundown. Obviously, I can't read you the story as it's, well, lost, but judging by the description, it certainly feels like something that would have existed around that time. If you happen to know or remember reading this tale or something similar to it, feel free to comment down below. But until then, this is a rare case of lost media in the creepypasta scene, or possibly an urban legend about an urban legend, or a creepypasta about a creepypasta. Update. Okay, so as it turns out, Camera Heads was in fact found. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest, I should have done more research on this one. This was actually found a fair bit ago by this point, so thank you to everyone who made sure to let me know in the original upload of this finale part. That being said, let's go ahead and read it, shall we? Quote, slash X, what's a camera head? I was walking home through a nearby gully and came across a weird stack of rocks and a torn envelope with some writing on it. It appeared to have been written in charcoal or ash. It said, I killed a camera head. On the next line, it took Trevor. And the last line, get help if I don't come back and there was a mini DV nearby. This was all that was on it besides static, though I had to watch it a few times before I found this clip. Who took this video? A camera head sounds really silly if it's a monster with a camera for a head." Unquote. And that's pretty much it. That's camera heads. It's a pretty decent little creepy post. Almost feels like the start of an ARG or a larger story of some sort. But from what I've researched and what many, many others have researched, it has been determined that there was no other material made around the story. Just this one simple post. Kind of funny that anyone remembered it to begin with, to be honest. Still, it's still kind of cool. Uh, especially that being with, like lost media that so many people were desperate to search for and find was actually fully found. But that being said, it is a little bit anticlimactic, isn't it? That it's literally just a paragraph and nothing more. But, oh well. What's next? The Pancake Family. So this one was highly, highly requested by several people. And I think it is a fairly fitting choice for the bottom of this iceberg. Considering that it is a relatively obscure story as well as being one of the more disturbing and imaginative tales that I've come across. This creepypasta starts out in an interrogation room, with the interviewer asking questions, a going over introductions with a retired detective by the name of Hobson Milgate, who is reporting his information regarding a crime scene, one that is connected with a 20 year long mystery surrounding the murder case of the Driscoll family, and what he saw was apparently so terrible, so shocking, so absolutely horrifying, that he is having a hard time fully articulating himself. His hands shake at the very thought of what he saw. Quote, Interviewer, are you ready to begin? No, but I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Interviewer, what led you to the crime scene on the night in question? Would you believe me if I was planning a fishing trip before all of this started? Never mind. It was a reporter, name of Stacy Bomber. She contacted me a week ago by email and claimed she had new information on the Driscoll murders. I was the lead investigator and I'm sure you know the case had gone unresolved for 20 years. Case as cold as ice. I thought it was a gag at first. You know how that can be. 
Most of the time, it's not even on purpose. Everyone thinks they know something that will crack the case wide open. The Driscoll murders were a big story around these parts. Over the years, I must have gotten a couple hundred fake leads. I handed the investigation over to Detective Warren Carroll when I retired, but I didn't want him to be bothered with any fake bullshit. I know he's busy with all that new gang activity that's going on. Since she contacted me, I figured I'd check it out for him as a courtesy. I wasn't expecting it to go anywhere. I met her for lunch at Per Year's Cafe. She was a good looking blonde gal, so she didn't fit the typical profile of a hoaxer. Not that I put too much faith in the profiles after 40 years. She also might have been one of those creepy gals that gets off on death. God knows I've dealt with enough of those. She seemed normal though, but I still thought she might be pulling my leg, or maybe she had been fooled too, but she had a file with her. It contained what appeared to be a confession by the Driscoll. Well, he wasn't a murderer, was he? I really do wish he had been, you know. It would have been so much better for everyone, unquote. The interviewer then asked Hobbs questions about what he knew about the Driscoll case to begin with. Quote, the Driscolls were a family of six out in the suburbs, upper middle class. Father was an attorney. Mother ran her own business selling pottery out of the house, even had her own kiln. Four children, all high school age and below. Good kids, honor roll, no criminal records to speak of. The oldest son was caught smoking dope at his high school once, but nothing much besides that. Just the typical stuff you find when you look at people too closely. They disappeared October 13th, 1994. No trace was found of the bodies. That's why it made the press go crazy. You'll still see it show up on some of those unsolved mystery shows. A whole family disappeared and no one saw a thing. No one knew where they went. A neighbor lodged a sound complaint, which is how we found the scene. There was an alarm going off and the neighbor called it in, figured it might have been a fire. When no one answered the door, the patrolman went in to investigate. There were obvious signs of a struggle in the youngest daughter's bedroom. The bed had been flipped over and the sheets were torn. We found elevated concentrations of carbon monoxide in the fabric of all the bed sheets except the youngest daughter's. The alarm was a carbon monoxide detector, which is how we knew to look. The neighbor indicated the sound had been going on for over a day, and he'd been unable to get anyone to answer the door during that time. We also found several aluminum canisters and some hoses in a dumpster a few blocks away. At the time, we assumed the Driscolls had been gassed and disposed of at a different location, excepting, of course, the daughter who woke up at the end and put up a struggle. The investigation gave no leads. Of course, our first thought was that the father did it. We checked it out, but he didn't have motive. No leads to check out. Same with the mother. Surviving family checked out clean too. The father had a few clients who might have had motive, but the means weren't there. He was a divorce lawyer, but not for anybody who could have taken out an entire family without leaving evidence. There was a chemistry teacher who lived three blocks away, and we investigated him for a while because of the canisters, but he alibied out. Same with a dentist who lived nearby. The wife had an online flirtation with some kids out in England, but nothing adulterous, and he wasn't even in the country at the time of the murder. We settled unhappily on the idea of a random killing, hardest pieces of shit to catch. We must have sunk tens of thousands of man-hours into this case, cracking down leads. The canisters had been stolen from the laboratory ten miles away. There was no security footage. We couldn't find any leads on the thief. After more than six months, the investigation went cold. The Driscolls had been knocked out and abducted. Like I said, no one ever found the bodies. Who was to say they hadn't just run off? Until, well, you know the rest of that. I'd rather only talk about that once." Unquote. They then asked him about the contents of the supposed confession letter. Quote, As to the confession letter, well, it was brief. It gave an address, 
that's the first thing I noticed. I couldn't locate the address online, which meant it had to be old. The confession letter said, Stop printing lies. I never killed anyone. It just took a while to get them ready for breakfast. There was no signature included. Interviewer, why did you decide to personally investigate the location mentioned in the letter? I wanted to make sure it wasn't a hoax. I still wasn't convinced. I've had 20 years of people sending me fake evidence. I guess maybe the case captured my imagination too. I always imagined one day I'd think of something I'd overlooked and solved the whole thing. It felt unbelievable to have someone dump the whole thing in my lap. I needed to see with my own two eyes. Miss Bomber had pinpointed the location with city records, but neither of us was sure if it was still there. It was an abandoned industrial building. The last time it had a valid mailing address was 50 years ago. It might have caved in for all we knew. I think I also wanted to be the one to crack it, whether or not it was dumped in my lap. That case has hung over my head for 20 years. Miss Bomber and I agreed to meet there the following morning. Interviewer, can you describe the crime scene? Yes, unquote. What follows is a detailed account of what exactly Hobbs found at that address. What has shaken him to his very core. Quote, it was an industrial building, as I stated, approximately 120 feet long by maybe 45 feet wide. It was a wooden structure, and at first the conditions seemed to match the neighboring buildings. However, I noticed the facade had been recently patched in a few locations. Further investigation also revealed that the entrance had been chained and locked. My understanding was that it used to be a sheet metal shop. I could smell something from the inside of the building, very faintly. I figured that would count as probable cause, not that I needed it as a civilian, but you never forget the way a corpse smells. They were bad enough they had the same smell. I hadn't forgotten how to pick a lock, so I let myself inside. You know, I I really do wish they had been corpses. I I really do wish he had been a serial killer. I, I really do. Do you believe me? Please say you believe me, interviewer. I do. Can you describe the interior of the building? <sighs> the warehouse had not been as abandoned as we were previously led to believe. The interior had a hallway of six rooms. The construction was old, but visibly newer than the rest of the building. The walls between each room had been soundproofed. There were no windows to the outside or doorways between the rooms themselves. The only access was through the hallway. I tried to make Miss Balmer leave at that point. The smell was stronger inside. The rooms, the, the rooms contain presses. Hydraulic presses, four, four foot by eight foot custom presses. I couldn't figure out what they were at first because they were hovering over what looked like hospital beds. There were IV bags in each room, as well as other medical equipment. That's how he kept them alive for so long, of course. Uh, the, the building was obviously an active crime scene. I had no doubt at this point. I was in the lair of what I believed to be a serial killer. I tried to tell Miss Balmer to leave several times. She refused on the ground that it would not be right to leave me on my own. There wasn't much time to make an issue out of it. My opinion of her was that she was a bit nosy but basically alright, and I didn't think she'd be a liability if she stayed out of my way. I had to make a judgement call as to whether or not I should proceed on my own in case the family was somehow impossibly still alive and perhaps in danger, or if I should leave and call for backup. I had told my wife where I was going previously, so I knew my absence would be noted and reported if the worst happened. Neither of us could get cell phone reception. S -s Sorry, I I'm rambling. It was then I heard not even a gasp. It was like a gasp, but not really. I don't want to describe it any more than that. There was a sound. It drew my attention further on. I had to act. 
And that's all that matters. There are some stairs at the very far end of the warehouse descending into the basement. I told Miss Bomber to remain behind and pulled my service revolver. I had a flashlight on my person as well and turned it on as I descended into the basement. The basement had been hand dug, maybe even over the course of the entire 20 year disappearance. I don't know. The floor was dirt and there was a tunnel that retreated back far enough that it had been supported by struts at regular intervals. When my flashlight first illuminated the, the stack, I, I wish they'd been dead. I wish he'd been a serial killer, interviewer. Please take a moment. After I, after I recovered, my, my first thought was, thank God, they're all dead. <coughs> How am I supposed to go on with my life after this? I'm 64 years old, for Christ's sake. I'm not a young man who can forget things anymore. When you're young, you have the sense that you're invincible, that you're never going to die. I don't have that to protect me anymore. Look at me whining. When they had that done to them, it's my fault. I should have found them. Save them somehow. Interviewer. I'm sorry, Hob. I've got to ask. Can you describe the scene? Yeah. <clears throat> I can. I didn't know what I was looking at at, at first. Hell, I, I, st I still don't. It was... Well, it was a stack. Maybe two feet thick. From the stink, the coloring, it was obviously made of flesh. I thought maybe he'd stacked them up and stack them up in pieces that would have been bad enough the first thing that alerted me to the truth was the eyeball on top of the stack was a perfectly round eyeball in the middle of a socket that had been distorted to the size of a saucer that's when i realized what i was looking at 20 goddamn years of torture basically he had the entire Driscoll family under those presses for 20 years, keeping them alive on an IV drip, increasing the pressure on them very slowly that their bodies had time to adapt until they'd been flattened like, well, like pancakes. He squished them about a quarter inch every year for 20 years, then he pulled them out when they were too broken and wrecked to move without any chance of recovery and stacked them up on top of each other. I've got no idea what for. I'd, I don't want to know. And I was still thinking, thank god they're all dead, when one on top started gasping again. Interviewer. What did they say? Nothing at first. It couldn't speak without help. Uh, I think it it would have been Avery Driscoll. Not that I could tell much about the gender or the age, but the hair was blonde, where there was hair. The head was a mess of scars. I think the son of a bitch who did this must have removed parts of their skull. I've got no idea how he got their heads so flat otherwise. Not as flat as the rest of their bodies, but flat. Who the hell knows? How their brains handled that. Their lips were punctured, their teeth everywhere. After the presses had flattened out their noses, I guess. Avery was 14 when he disappeared. There was a machine, a sort of pump. I followed the hose with my flashlight and realized everyone in the stack was hooked up to the pump. I don't think they could breathe on their own. You see, not after a while. There simply wasn't enough volume in their lungs to inflate. There was some sort of cut right into their chests. There was a switch on the pump. I, I don't know why I pressed it. I was in a panic. I wanted to do something. Maybe some stupid part of me thought that if I switched it on, they would inflate and be okay. I switched it. It increased the volume of air to the topmost hose. I could hear the pump working harder, which is when Avery Driscoll started to scream. He begged me to kill him. He said other things too. It didn't make much sense. He was in pain, and I would hope 
He had gone insane several years previously. Interviewer. Oh my god. M my thoughts exactly. I didn't know what to do. He wouldn't stop screaming. I, I believe he was convinced I was his torturer. A closer look at his eye revealed that he was mostly a mess of white scar tissue. He was as blind as a bat. You know, I spoke with some burn victims once. They told me that they managed to find meaning and purpose again after a while. Uh, I don't know how anyone in the Driscoll family could have done that. I stated my name. I told them I was a detective. I told them I was there to help. I repeated it over and over again. No, of course, there was nothing that anyone, anywhere, could do to help. Miss Balmer arrived, drawn by the sound. Before she saw the stack, she told me that I had screamed and she had come to help. But I do not remember having done so. Nevertheless, she arrived. Then she saw the stack and screamed, but I was intent on Avery Driscoll. He was able to hear. He became lucid for a few moments. It was a strain to understand what he said, but I will never be able to forget it. Please, kill me. It hurts. I don't want to be a monster. Please kill me and tell my family I died a long time ago. I don't know if they're still looking for me. Don't let them know what happened to me. Please kill me. He could still cry, and he did, although his tear ducts were too deformed for it to be noticeable. I should have forced Miss Bomber to leave. That is the only action in the matter which I regret, more than failing to solve the case 20 years ago. Not just for her own sake, but for what she did next. I don't think she could have wounded them any more deeply if she tried. She took away the last comfort any of them in the stack had. You see, th they had not been able to speak to one another for 20 years. She said, that's all of them, isn't it? That's the entire Driscoll family. They're all alive in there. The whole family. For 20 years. Each member of the Driscoll family had been unaware their fellow inmates were the other members of their family. They had all been holding out hope their family was okay. All been dreaming someone out there loved them and was free from suffering. Do you know what the screams of six people tortured over two decades smashed down to a width of four inches sounds like? When they're all stacked up on top of one another? It sounds like the gates of hell swinging open. Interviewer. I, I think that's enough, Detective Milkate. Not yet! I shot them. Mercy is hard, but I owed it to them. I am the one that failed to save them. It only took one bullet to go all the way through. I empty my revolver, though, to make sure they didn't linger. To give them that final peace. It was the only kindness I had to give them. We left and called for backup after that. Neither Miss Balmer nor I wished to remain with the bodies. I elected not to follow the crime scene investigators back to the basement. I asked if I could make my statement and leave, and after one of them saw what I had seen, they agreed. May I have my, uh, sedative now? Interviewer. Yes. Yes, of course. Thank you. Please show in the paramedic. I'll roll up my sleeve. My wife has diabetes, so I'm well aware of the routine. Oh, and please make sure you have the same courtesy available for Miss Balmer. She seemed to have it worse than me after. Poor woman c couldn't even throw up or cry. Interviewer. Of course. Do you know where she is now? She told the lead that the crime scene that she had been going home but we hadn't been able to reach her. Did you try to paper? Interviewer. Which paper? The Daily World. Interviewer. Are you sure? There is no Stacy Balmer on staff with the Daily World. Unquote. And that's the story. Stacy Balmer obviously being the person who caused this poor family all this pain. Even in the end, as the investigator is at the crime scene, she found a way to enact one last moment of pain for them 
after 20 years of non-stop suffering. It's truly a gruesome image imagining a family squashed together into a giant pancake of flesh on one another, all barely alive but not knowing that the others, all their loved ones, were all right there suffering alongside them. This one's for sure gonna stick with me. The image is just so haunting. But with that said, what's next? Lost Tapes. So, funnily enough, I'd actually meant to include this one in the final tier of the Creepypasta Iceberg, since it's one that sticks out in my mind, it's made by the famous Slime Beast, and it ties together an entire genre of Creepypasta on a metatextual level. Too bad I kind of just forgot to add it in. Good thing I have this director's cut to amend that. So, let's get to it. Lost Tapes follows our narrator and his friend, Sid. Sid, like many kids from a young age, had his childhood innocence taken away from him and learned the cold hard truth about death by none other than a sad scene in a Disney film. And that sad scene in a Disney film, for Sid's case, just so happens to be Old Yeller. You know, where the dog gets rabies and has to be put down by his owner who is a child. Well, this ending disturbed and upset Sid so greatly that he, with his father's help, spliced the tape together to change the ending to have it end out on an earlier scene which Sid would watch over and over and over again, both proud that he had changed the ending to something that was more agreeable to his sensibilities, and in his mind he had actually fixed a flaw. After all, the sad ending made him feel sad. And now when he watches Old Yeller, he's just happy. Our protag would later ask Sid though if he thinks he could change the ending or add scenes into other films and stuff like that. Which Sid eventually does. It started with the usual with him changing and taking violent or bad things out of films, essentially fixing them, along with other interesting editing tricks such as editing the ghosts out of Ghostbusters and still making it seem like the film is coherent. Until our protag started encouraging him to do just the opposite, which the story notes, quote, As time went by, I encouraged Sid to edit more movies, but with different purposes. Instead of whitewashing all the scary stuff like he'd wanted to, I got him to see the light on how awesome he could make things. Somewhere out there, this chubby Star Wars nerd from our high school has all three original films, flawlessly cut together, with edited in effects that would have made George Lucas himself cry out, ENOUGH MEDDLING! We charged them like $20 for the only copy, because we were idiots. Anyway, this went on for a while before I lost most of my interest in it. It was more of a goof for me than it was for him. This is the point where I started working, started driving, started taking bases with local girls, well, he just got more and more involved in cutting those tapes. I think his favorites were cartoons. When The Simpsons came around, he went apeshit with those. Now his edits weren't so much fixing things as much as breaking them in interesting ways. Another thing that sticks out in my mind is when he recorded an episode of M.A.S.H. and cut it with a gory old war flick. Halfway through his version, the camp gets bombed. Soldiers invaded. Everyone dies. At the end, he specifically worked in freeze frames of each cast member's face, eyes closed. He had completely reversed his interest and embraced what had once terrified him, scary endings. He seemed to love things like long, drawn-out sequences of terrifying silence. He'd make me be quiet while they played, too. You may have heard about this mysterious fellow named Banksy, who goes around creating interesting graffiti and whatnot. At one point, he went into a music store and replaced some Paris Hilton CDs with his own fakes. Banksy had nothing on Sid. Every other week, he'd tell me about some store or video rental place he'd snuck some of his tapes into. He swapped out the real ones for his versions, and then he started all over by cutting the ones he had stolen. At one point, when I hadn't heard from him in a long while, I stopped by his parents' house and found him in the garage. He set up his own little movie studio there, complete with a drawing board. He was actually animating entirely new content, 
All at once, I was both blown away by his artistic skill I'd never seen before, and very concerned about when this guy was going to come out of the dark and start acting normal, like me. He barely looked up from his drawings as we spoke. I asked him what any kid, now in his late teens, would ask. What the fuck is wrong with you? Hmm? Seriously, dude, this is some crazy shit. It's work. I'm working. My work is just as important as anyone else's. Are you even selling these anymore? Or are you just sneaking them into places? How much is all of this costing your dad? I don't care. I looked at what he was so fervently illustrating. Is that the headless boy dancing? Yeah, that's pretty dark, man. I know, that's the point. I don't get it. Those tapes, I thought they were wrong. But over time, I figured out the truth, which is the scary stuff is right. The happy endings are a lie. He just kept drawing as I stood there. The silence was disturbing, and in that moment, I could smell the B.O. coming off of him. It wasn't just sweat, either. It was a mingling of that and the foul ass and piss-soaked cloth. I hate to say it, but I gave up on him right then. It's that moment when you look at someone, someone you thought you knew, and all that you can think is, holy shit, I never realized they were this far gone, unquote. The story then notes that our protag hadn't really thought about Sid again until he was in his 30s, because of things he was seeing online. Quote, I was pursuing the internet, just aimlessly wandering the web, when I came across a series of urban legends about strange VHS tapes, recut movies, and lost episodes. Some of these I recognized. I watched them with Sid, or I'd actually seen him in the middle of working on them. Every disturbing scene, every unbelievable antidote, I believed it because I had been there. Others, Spongebob cartoons, episodes of iCarly or whatever, those shows came long after I'd made my break with Sid, but the style was all too familiar. Even the ones that didn't sound like his work seemed like they could have been broken copies or attempts at mimicking his work. He was still doing it. My god, it boggled my mind. Unquote. So our protag decides to try and call up Sid's number, but no dice. While he was sure him and his family probably still didn't live in the same house after all these years, something compels him to give it a try and go visit the old place just to make sure. Quote, Pulling into the driveway, my headlights illuminated the garage door. It was windowless and vandalized with the gangster tags of some traveling band of assholes. The note on the door, as one might expect, spoke of a certain bank now owning the property. It noted that trespassing was heavily discouraged, and that at a certain point someone would be out to make sure the house was winterized, whatever the hell that is. As I walked back to the car defeated, something was nagging at me. I knew that Sid's parents kept a spare key under a false rock by the back stairs basically by virtue of Sid locking us both out on several occasions. When I found the key, a sense of cold, gnawing dread swirled in my stomach. Who would move out and leave everything in place like this? The key was the most obvious thing, but flower pots and lawn decorations were still there. Sid's old, rusted, huffy bike was leaning against the house, and it created thick, rusty streaks along the aluminum siding. I don't know what I expected to find, but using the key I entered the house. The smell was overwhelming. Not a putrid smell, nothing rotten or decaying, just the smell of... I don't know if this would make any sense to you, but the smell of electricity. Like burning dust on a light bulb, or a heater giving off a peculiar warmed metal odor. That was the least of my concerns, however as I saw everything just as I had left it. Everything Sid's family owned was frozen in time. The dining room table we'd all sat at, on many occasions, was dust-covered and supported an emaciated dead rat, which had all but turned to dust. The television, that bulky, oversized television set we'd all sat around to watch Sid's tapes and laud his creativity, it sat where it always had been silently displaying a violent bombardment of black and white static. 
As I moved through the rooms, the sense of panic and discomfort within me only grew. Every fiber of my being was shouting, RUN! RUN, YOU FUCKING IDIOT! Still, I pressed on into Sid's bedroom. It was now empty and in disrepair. His prized action figures and blank videotapes, hundreds of videotapes, stale and water damaged. I almost wanted to call out, shout, SID, and wait for him to appear as if nothing was out of the ordinary. I went into his parents' bedroom. There, lying in bed, were two motionless bodies, gaunt, gray, half turned to dust like the rat in the dining room. I could scarcely believe what I was seeing with my own eyes. Not only were two dead bodies slowly dissipating within the confines of this once idyllic suburban household, but nobody had even checked on them. Nobody had discovered this until now. My mind raced. My heart raced. The only thing that wouldn't move were my feet, which remained glued to the spot. Sid, I thought, must have done this. There was no way the two of them would just lie down at night and simultaneously die of natural causes. Sid has said he didn't care about his parents, and when was the last time I had seen them? God, I hadn't seen them for days, maybe weeks before the last time I talked to Sid. When I finally left the room, I took out my cell phone and began dialing 911. However, as soon as I lifted it to my head, an ear-splitting shriek of interference nearly caused me to fling the object across the room. I rushed to the kitchen phone, squealing static. I tried the living room phone, just to be thorough, static. It wasn't until I put the receiver back down that I heard it. Music. Faint, barely audible music that I hadn't noticed before. It seemed to be some repeating melody, happy and light. Some flutes, maybe a whole horn section. I followed the peppy tune to the in-house door to the garage, pressing my ear to the door's dirty surface. I determined that the music was indeed coming from just beyond. Sid? I called out, barely managing to form the name with cold, bloodless lips. Sid? Are you in there? Are you alright? I tried the door only to find it somehow locked from the other side. It was no matter. Since one wild kick nearly knocked the rotting wolf off his hinges. Sid! I shouted as the dust slowly cleared. Through the haze, I could only see the light of a television screen. Vibrant colors, blue, green, yellow. Soon, I could make out a cartoon playing on the screen. Then the silver wires running from the set itself into some dark mass. Then, the dark mass took shape. As my eyes adjusted to the odd lighting, it was Sid. Or rather, his body, not dead nearly as long as his parents, seated in an old office chair. The wires from the television set led directly to his body, eventually disappearing into several old, crusted over holes in his leathery flesh. Through a small, worm-eaten opening in his ribs, I thought I could see more metal inside him. I walked to Sid's side, holding my hand over my mouth, for fear of vomiting. His face was twisted into a hideous wide grin. His empty eye sockets almost seemed happy, hooded by a pleased brow line. Hi there, I heard a jarring voice. The voice was upbeat, high-pitched. It sounded almost like Sid, but different, bubbly, cartoony. I turned to the screen, the green grass, the blue sky, the yellow flowers, and Sid, a perfect caricature of him. It strolled along the infinite loop of that utopian cartoon background. It waved to me. Sid, I whispered. Oh, God, Sid. He, the cartoon version of him, turned his attention away from me and continued to merrily stroll across that unending cycle of the same backdrop. He passed a shrub, then passed it again and again. The same blue bird chirping happily flew through the sky in a figure eight. Sid. I shook my head, unable to comprehend the scenario. I never could have let you leave reality. I thought about what Sid had done to his mom and dad. I thought about how the bank would come by soon and this would all come to light. I watched Sid walk along for nearly half an hour. Then I unplugged the set, unquote. And that's the story of Lost Tapes, and I really, really like this one. I love the idea of the pasta actually being about a weirdo 
or THE weirdo making these lost tapes and DVDs rather than the tapes themselves. I like that there is a parallel between the lesson of Old Yeller being that of a coming-of-age story about losing the innocence of childhood, something which not only scares Sid but he refuses to do and seems to want to deny a great bit until he gets old enough for he suddenly wants to inflict the same pain that loss of innocence did for him. Because it was a lie, the ending, that he made for Old Yeller. He knew how the movie really ended, and so now his reality was warped into believing that all happy endings are in fact the false ones. Something that may or may not have also been echoed in his family life, though the story never really gets into that. And so then he passes on this pain by distorting the images of things that others love, specifically children's media most often. While the ending is a bit over the top, I do think it adds to the overall theme of never letting go, never growing up, never facing reality in any sense of the word. Even the reality of fiction works. Until Sid finally rejects all of reality becoming what he loves most, dark or innocent fiction. It's a pretty damn good creepypasta, and is a pretty funny way of looking at all the other Lost Episode creepypastas as well, imagining that they were all actually made by this Sid guy, or people inspired by Sid. My family has been stalked for the last four years. I'll front load this by saying this is one of my personal favorites, mainly because it plays out like a really good stalker slash slasher film, and it's just generally a very creepy and fun time. The story itself starts off like this. Quote, This whole thing started on a road trip around four years ago. We left to go from Northern California to the East Coast, traveling through the Midwest. It was me, my wife Kimmy, and our seven-year-old daughter Katie, and five-year-old son Alex. Everything went fine for the first few days. We took our time on the trip because we really weren't on a constraint in that regard. We stopped at pretty much every landmark one can see whilst making a cross-country trip. But there was one night in a state in the Midwest I won't name that would lead to a series of events that still hasn't ended. It was around 9pm on a Wednesday night. We had collectively decided to stop at the next place we saw to eat. We saw a sign to exit at the next ramp for a place called Daisy's Diner. We get there and nothing seems amiss. It was just about dark and we decided that after we'd eaten, we would find a hotel for the night. Daisy's Diner was a classic small town eatery with road signs on the wall and a waitress that called everyone hun. It had a very classic small town USA feel to it. The food had a home cooked taste to it as well. I could certainly imagine this place being at its capacity on any given day. However, at the time we were there, there were only four other people in the restaurant. A man and a woman ate together at a booth, while two men separately sat at the counter. All four of the other patrons left before we did, and were replaced with two more men who came in at separate times. It was the last man to come in to bring what had happened to our attention. He informed me that if I was the one with the Hyundai truck outside, it had been ransacked." Unquote. And so he calls the police and they can't seem to find anything major that was stolen. And so after some questioning, he decides to let the police handle it and he is advised to go to a local motel for the night. So they rested in the motel, only for something strange to find itself inside the motel room right beside the front door. Quote, After a shower, I sat on the bed to watch TV while my wife inevitably took four times longer than me to get ready. It was then that I decided to take a look at the checkout receipt. I picked up the one-sided piece of paper and opened it. My heart sank when it turned out to be a drawing from my daughter's backpack, but with a slight change. It was a picture of our family, but the thief had added a cruelly drawn version of himself to it, with the words, Nice to meet you, being that the addition to the drawing was done in crayon just like the original artwork had been, there was nothing about the man I could discern. All I knew was that whoever had broken into our car had followed us to the motel and slid this drawing under our door, or at least that's what I thought. My son, the ever-questioning, observant young man that he is, was playing on the ground with some toy cars near the door, asked me what the rubber piece lining the bottom of the door to the outside was for. I explained that it was likely to keep things such as leaves and snow from 
blowing under the door and keeping either heat or cold air in. It was then that I realized that the rubber strip would have prevented a piece of paper from being slid under the door. The revelation hit me like a ton of bricks. Whoever had set this drawing on the floor had done so from the inside. I checked the locks on the connecting door and found one of them to be unlocked. In an effort to spare my wife and children the horror that I was currently experiencing, I rushed them out under the guise that we'd slept late and I wanted to cover a lot of ground that day. I considered talking to the motel clerk, but by that time a younger girl was working the counter and I wasn't going to stay there a second longer than I had to. We got back to the highway without interruption and continued our trip. My wife asked me what was wrong, but I shrugged it off as being still tired. We made the rest of our journey with nothing out of the ordinary happening. Aside from the alarming incidents at Daisy's Diner and the Galleria Motel, our road trip was actually pretty fun. Our activities proved to be a good distraction from the uneasy feeling I had in the pit of my stomach. I made sure to take a different route home so as not to pass through the small town where the incidents had happened. We finally returned home about three weeks later. All of our mail was piled up on our front porch. So I grabbed it as I walked back into our house for the first time in nearly a month. Unpacking and getting situated took precedent over looking through the mail, but I eventually got to it and things began again. Towards the middle of the pile of mail, there was an envelope with no return address. I opened it and found a single handwritten note and a folded piece of paper. The girl is very good at pictures. I unfolded the paper and it was yet another drawing of my daughter's. This one was of a black and brown dog. I figured whoever was doing this had gotten our address from our vehicle's registration or some kind of other document after going through the car. I informed the police, who did a pretty shitty job of making me feel safe. I kept what had happened from my wife, as I knew that she would just worry, and I wanted to keep my family as stress-free as possible. I wondered how many pictures my daughter had in her backpack, but in reality, I knew it was quite a few. I'll get to that later." Unquote. Well, about a week later, they hear barking outside, and the whole family run out, only to find a German Shepherd tied up in their backyard. The kids, of course, wanted to keep it, as did the wife after some convincing, and so the father does end up letting them keep him, even though he knew this dog came from, well, from their stalker. They would come to name the dog Roscoe. Other strange things start happening, though, like their own lawn being cut and clean, and strangely nice things. But nonetheless, it all very much unnerved our protagonist. Our protagonist who, by the way, should have totally told his wife by this point. That's one of the few flaws in the story, but whatever. Since he knew some unseen person in the shadows was orchestrating all of this. For what goal, though, he couldn't be sure. This all comes to a head while at their summer cabin, Roscoe would be found dead, murdered, out in the front yard. Quote, As tears streamed down my face at the horror I was currently taking care of, I dug a hole for Roscoe. I gently placed him in the hole and pet his soft back one last time. I truly had come to care for the dog, no matter where it had come from. I filled the hole with dirt and went to put the shovel back in the shed. I don't know how I hadn't noticed it when I went to retrieve the shovel the first time, but on the siding of the cabin was a message, written in what I assumed was Roscoe's blood. It simply said, Good Doggy. I washed the message off before returning to my family. The entire time I had been dreading explaining to them what had happened. I sat my kids down and told them that while we were inside another animal, probably much larger than Roscoe, had gotten into a fight with Roscoe and hurt him to the point where he had to go to doggy heaven. My wife and children cried and I joined them. None of us could believe that we had just lost the newest member of our family. With this though, I told everyone to pack up because it wasn't safe to stay in the area with such a large animal on the loose. They abided, and we were on the road within an hour." Unquote. Skipping ahead a bit, our protagonist would continue to get creepy letters and later would receive a box with a letter and a VHS tape. What that tape contained was footage of a little girl being beaten and told what to say by some unseen figure. The message being clear though, the mysterious shadow that had been haunting them all this time wanted to be friends with his daughter. He wanted her, period. Once again, skipping ahead, this is a rather long story after all, the family eventually find out what's been going on 
and the wife is rather furious, and rightfully so, so they contact the police and they investigate as far as they could, but there was just no lease to speak of with this. The family lived in constant fear and would eventually come to move to a new town, hoping that this would stop this madness. And it did, for a while, before the letters started coming in again. And then the father received a box, this time with the hand of a little girl inside it, which once again had no DNA or evidence that could lead to the stalker's identity. It's then that the father decides to head back to the town where it all started in search of answers. He heads to that same little diner from before. And after questioning a few people and getting mostly nowhere, he eventually finds a hooded figure messing with his car, just like before, and he gives chase, but is then promptly knocked out from the back of his head. Quote, When I woke up, I was in the dark. I wasn't bound or gagged in any way, but I couldn't discern my surroundings. I found myself able to stand up straight. And when I did, about 25 televisions all turned on at once. They were all showing static, with the volume on full blast. I yelled, HELLO? at the top of my lungs, but the sound of my voice was drowned out by the static. Then, so suddenly that it made me jump, each of the screens changed to a picture. It was the same room I'd seen in the video of the murder of that little girl. The same white sheet was hanging up, draping onto the floor, though this time, blood stained the bottom portion of the sheet. I assumed it was the little girl's blood, but I had no way of knowing if that was the only victim. Somehow, I doubted it. A man came into the frame, but kept his back to me for the entirety of the video. He spoke to me in a high-pitched, yet gravelly voice. The best way I could describe his tone is that it was childlike. He spoke like an excited child. Hi, Katie's daddy. I'm glad you got my present. I, I don't want to do no harm to your daughter. The great artist. I just want her to be my friend and draw me pictures. I sent them back the ones that weren't my favorite, but I kept the ones that are my favorites, and those are mine now. All I want is a friendship with Katie. Katie, Katie, Katie. She's such a very good artist, but you won't let her be friends with me. You're making me get you out of the way. And I don't want to do that because friends don't hurt friends, daddies. <clears throat> I want to be a good friend and not a bad friend. So I'm going to make this simple. Simple, 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 easy peasy. If you promise to let your daughter, the artist, be friends with me, I'll leave you alone. But if you still won't be nice, I I I'm gonna get really angry. Do, do, do you promise to be nice? I muttered out, yes, unsure as to if this was a video or a live feed, or if I was being watched or not. There were moments of silence, and then he spoke again, this time calmed down. Good, but since you were such a meanie pants, I'm not gonna tell you how to get out. Then he let out this sickening, childlike laughter. Then the video simply cut off. Unquote. Now, our protagonist eventually finds his way out of this place that seems to be in the middle of the woods and gets back home, only for eventually his own daughter to be found missing. They all knew what had happened, and for two months the police and everyone else tried to find her, but no luck. It could be assumed that she met with a terrible fate at the hands of that man-child. But by the fourth month of her kidnapping, the broken shell of a man who was her father ended up getting a new letter, one that was a brand new drawing by his daughter, of a farmhouse of an ex over it, alongside a letter that told him he wants daddy to come over to play with them. He promises not to hurt his daughter. He he only wants more pictures from her, but if he catches wind, he is bringing anyone else with him, he'll skin her alive. This eventually leads to a suspenseful conclusion with the father eventually finding the exact farmhouse that the drawing crudely depicted, and facing off with the masked man. He does eventually fight and kill the masked man, save his daughter, and also find that, in a twist, 
The man who started all this to begin with was the very man who warned them about their car being ransacked all those years ago, alongside with the diner owner and the motel owner being related and in on this whole affair, as the stalker was their son. The story ends with all the bad parties either being killed or arrested, though there is one more letter the family would receive a year later about how now he was really mad implying that the masked man had somehow survived a gunshot to his neck, but yeah, almost seems like a sequel hook to a sequel that, to my knowledge, never came. Overall though, this is a pretty well put together little story. It's not amongst the very, very best, and it does have some flaws, like, I don't really know why after he kidnapped the daughter that he decided to, like, give hints about where he's at. I mean, he basically won, so it seems kind of counterintuitive and frankly just stupid, but that objective plot hole aside, it is still a pretty decent little creepy pasta about a pretty creepy situation. The House That Death Forgot So this one is pretty simple. Basically this girl gets a phone call from her dad who she doesn't have a good relationship with, and ends up taking a drive to his place. Along the way, she ends up at an abandoned road with no clear stop in sight up until she reaches a house that seems to advertise itself as a place to stay. Well, she ends up staying there for the night, only to find out that the house is holding a terrible secret. There are various people in the house with awful slashes, scars, and limbs absolutely destroyed and torn asunder. They all look as though they should be dead, but they aren't because for some strange reason, they cannot die. The one that gave them these scars is a man in a dark coat that stalks the house, his marks made forever upon them, still searing with the same pain from the very same day they received them. Thus, they are the house that death forgot. They have no idea who the man outside is, or why he has condemned them to such a fate. But they all warn the new girl that she cannot leave this place right now, that she'll have to wait, and that if she tries to escape this place, the man will surely strike her and leave her in the same starry state as them. But she of course doesn't listen because um, she's fucking stupid, I guess. And yeah, she becomes one of them with one of her eyes gouged out and now she permanently has the pain of one of her eyes being gouged out. It's a decent concept for a story, but our main protagonist is kind of, um, how do I put this? Fucking brain dead. And, uh, yeah, the whole thing sort of ends on a bit of a, really? You went out there after they all told you what was going to happen? And it ended exactly the way you expected it would. It also kind of feels like the beginning of what would be a bigger story, maybe? But to my knowledge, there is no other story to it. But hey, for what it is, it's not too bad. Memory card. So this one has got to be one of the weirdest fucking stories that I have ever read. And that's definitely saying something. Not weird in like the dogscape sort of weird, that sort of is its own category, but just weird generally speaking. A good friend of mine on Discord actually recommended this one to me, telling me that whatever I think this story is about, I'm wrong. And boy oh boy, was he ever right. So the story starts like this. Quote, A few weeks ago, my parents were driving up to see my cousins. We always visit them during the summer. On the way there, we drove through a little village. Some church by the road was having a car boot sale. A massive banner told us that it was in aid of charity. My dad parked the car and got out, eager to have a little sniff around. He always had a thing for raking through people's old stuff and finding hidden treasures. While he was off treasure hunting, I decided to go off on my own little wander. Most of the stuff on sale was the usual crap. Cakes, ugly crockery, junk, etc. Someone was holding a raffle. An old woman was painting kids' faces, but only seemed to know how to do one animal. There were zebra-faced kids everywhere. I remember a couple standing out over all the happiness and sense of community. It was just a man and a woman with dead eyes taking no interest in their customers at all. All they did was just stare into the distance. Their tables full of kids junk, you know, toys, magazines, crap, PlayStation games, the usual. There were a lot of those army men games, a few sports games as well. I reckon I missed the good stuff. I was losing interest when I spotted an old PS1 memory card out of the corner of my eye. 
Written on the front in chipped tip X was the name Sam. Now this was a real hidden treasure. I bought it from the couple and tucked it into my wallet. Neither said a word or looked at me when they took my money. After that I found my parents once more. Eventually we got back to the car and were once again on our way to my cousin's house. We stayed there for a few days. I enjoyed hanging out with my cousins. So I was quick to forget about my purchase. In addition, neither had a PlayStation, so it didn't matter anyway. When I got back home, I retrieved my old PlayStation from the attic and set it up. I had kept quite a few games too. I had all the classics. Resident Evil, Final Fantasy, Tomb Raider, Metal Gear Solid, Future Cop, etc. Bro, who the fuck is considering Future Cop one of the PS1 classics? However, before I played any of them, I turned on the console without a disc in. I remembered I could do this to check out the contents of your memory card. I stuck Sam's into the slot and selected it. There were a few save files on it. Some of them were corrupt. Just strange symbols hanging there that displayed a strange series of characters instead of details. Others were games I had never heard of. However, there was one I recognized. Metal Gear Solid. It was the VR missions disc, to be precise. It said it had been completed 100%. I had both Metal Gear Solid and the VR missions, so I decided to check it out. I could remember quite a bit about the VR missions disc, but the parts that stuck out for me the most were the giant soldiers, the murder mysteries, and the photo shoot mode. I remember they were actually a lot of fun. I booted up the game, unquote. So that's the opening, the setup if you will. A fairly typical one for a video game based creepypasta at that. So what's the rest of this story going to contain? Well, let's read it, shall we? Oh, when I load the save, something odd happened. The title music stopped. This sounded especially weird because I had turned up the volume on my TV so I could get right into the game. There I was, suddenly plunged into silence. On top of that, there was no sound effects as I scrolled through the menu options. It was a little eerie, but I chalked it up to the game or the console being old and worn out. I remembered you could wait for Naomi's legs to uncross to take a photo in photo shoot mode, and there was nothing except a black space where a pussy should have been. It was a little empty void left by the creators to disappoint a million pubescent kids. Amused, I loaded up photo shoot mode and selected Naomi as my model. When the level loaded, I remember thinking the music sounded a little strange. It was nothing eerie, just a little odd. Maybe it was slightly slowed down or something. Again, I chalked it up to either the game or the console's age. I made Snake duck down and look through the viewfinder, staring at Naomi's crotch and waiting for her to uncross her legs. I was determined to get that snap that had destroyed my perverted hopes and dreams all those years ago. It took longer than I had thought, and the first time it happened, I missed it. Waiting again, I almost missed a second time. Luckily, my reflexes have been sharpened by generations of gaming. Click. Gotcha. A perfect snap of the little black zone where her piece should have been. I smiled to myself and shook my head. It was funny that I had gotten so excited over something all those years ago. I was getting a little hungry, so I decided to take a break. I was just about to head downstairs for some food when I noticed something. I could hear crying. There were little sniffles and short intakes of breath. At first I had no idea where it was coming from. For a moment I noticed it was from behind me. Then I realized it was coming from the game. I remember getting confused, sitting there to listen to some voice from the TV speakers. I just couldn't work out why it was happening. It started getting louder and a little more hysterical. I figured out it was coming from Naomi. I tilted the camera upwards, wondering what the fuck was going on. Just as I got to her face, a horrible wail tore from my speakers and scared the shit out of me. Naomi was screaming at me. I just had time to register her twisted mouth and horrible eyes when I gasped and dropped the controller. It landed on the ground on a button and the game came out of viewfinder mode. Snake was just kneeling there in front of her. I stood there, shaking, watching the characters seem to stare at one another. I could no longer see Naomi's face. I couldn't tell if 
she still had that horrible look across it. There was no one in my house. My parents were both still at work. I jumped forward and turned the console off." Unquote. I love how this guy just assumes this activity of his was something everyone did. A weird, obscure activity in a relatively speaking obscure sort of bonus discs of sorts that you had to buy separately for Metal Gear Solid. It really could not be more random and does, funnily enough, feel like the author projecting something he clearly did do onto the audience of readers. Yeah, you guys all remember, you know, that weird perverted thing that you could do in this game. Yeah, we all did that, right? It wasn't just me. We all clearly did the exact same thing. I mean, like, wouldn't it be like, wait, fucking weird if I, like, like did it? right now what if i just did it right fucking now what if what if i what if i did the weird ps1 thing right now because we're all it's, it's like so relatable right we could we all we all fucking did it yes simply marvelous but that of course isn't the end of the story and believe it or not that's just the beginning as the story gets a fair bit weirder see eventually the guy turns the game back on and finds that the photo shoot thing is, well, not working and generally acting like a typical creepypasta video game that the author, of course, assumes is but more glitches from the age of the game or the console or some shit. Why, I mean, that's, again, so relatable. Just the other day, I saw my video game shut off and turn into a red and black screen that showed my IP address with text right underneath that said the CCP is going to have a fucking grape time with my household tonight. Ha! <laughs> Silly glitches. I've got nothing to worry about. Besides, everyone knows the coalition of creepypastas would never be competent enough to write such a coherent sentence. Well, anyway, our narrator takes some pictures using the photo mode in the complete darkness of the game and then goes on to check out his in-game photos. And it's here where some pretty messed up jumping of the shark stuff happens. Quote, Eventually I gave up. I scrolled across to the next image, the first shot of where Naomi should have been standing. What I was faced with was something completely different. It was a picture of a little boy tied up against a bed. It wasn't an in-game photo, but a real one. It was a real boy on a real bed with real ropes. The picture was slightly pixelated, but nothing compared to the low resolution of the game. Just at the edge of the picture, I could make out a leg. Someone was standing by the bedside. Something told me to turn the game off. Something darker told me to scroll to the next photo. I listened to the latter. The next photo made my stomach jump. Gloved hands were holding the boy's eyes open. They were forcing him to look at something off camera. The boy's expression was of absolute horror. A part of me was glad I couldn't see what he saw. I continued scrolling. They were torturing him now, cutting open his skin and mutilating him in ways I won't describe. The photos only became more and more disturbing, never letting up. Each one was worse than the last. They violated him and tortured his young body. I'd never seen anything like it. I never knew humans were capable of such acts. My body was shaking and my hands could barely hold on to the controller, but I kept scrolling through the pictures. I was unable to stop myself." Unquote. Ah yeah, the gold standard for those who can't come up with a way to make the scary story scary. You know, just have some fucking pictures of children being not a fucking live, you know? That's that's how you do it. And in a strange way, this story actually goes far harder than the any other one, because like usually they're like flash images that for some reason the guy watching the video or whatever just happens to remember like really well. Whereas this one, he's able to pause and really look at the image for a long time and not only does he do that he keeps fucking going in a strange way the story almost implies that the dude or some side of him is enjoying seeing this shit that's uh that's pretty fucked up i'll give you that but ladies and gentlemen what if i told you 
That wasn't the strangest set of words, of ideas, surrounding this story. Quote, I came to another image. I was relieved to see it was no longer of a boy. This relief, however, was short-lived. I squinted at the screen, wondering what exactly I was looking at. Then it hit me. My insides did a little wet flip, and I froze. I dropped the controller again, no buttons being pressed when it hit the floor this time. I was staring at an image, mouthing what the fuck to myself over and over again. I stayed like that for a while, my body completely functionless as I gaped at the screen. It was a shot of Naomi with her legs uncrossed. It was the very first photo I had taken after switching on the game. It was the photo that had started this horrible journey. Now, however, I could actually see her pussy. It was the real image of a pussy, not pixelated or anything. It was just sitting right there in front of me in incredible detail. If I was still a teenager, I'm sure I would have been delighted that all my hard work had paid off. I'm pretty sure every kid who tried getting a photo of her snatched back then would have felt the same, especially when compared to the black void that too many of us actually faced. However, I was far from aroused in this situation. I noticed that the pussy was moving, pulsating with every breath, as though I was watching a movie instead of an image. It was like some voyeur spy cam or something, and it was squelching. As I sat there, Speechless, blood slowly seeped from the inside, dribbling over her lips and legs and spreading fast. When her pussy was completely caked in red, Naomi finally began to move her body. She was slowly leaning down towards the camera. I really didn't want to see her face, but I couldn't look away. Then she was screaming and staring at me with those horrible eyes and twisted mouth. She wasn't looking at the camera but at me. I screamed back before she lunged. Out of nowhere, I found the strength. I watched as my arm shot out from my body and hit the power button. Her screen cut short. The screen went black. I tore the memory card from its slot and held it as though it was some potent drug. I realized I was breathing heavily. I kept staring at the name Sam in white tip X as my lungs gradually relaxed. I never plugged it back in. That was the last time I ever played VR missions. I still have the memory card in my drawer, but I daren't open it. A part of me wants to bind the damn thing, but the other part won't let me. Maybe one day I'll give it another go, just to see how messed up the rest of the game is. Perhaps I'll buy some of the other games and see how fucked up Sam saves for them are. Maybe I'll try and figure out what games those other corrupt save files are for. Maybe. But for now, well, the memory card can stay in that drawer until I'm ready. The end. And that's the story of Memory Card. A terrible, extremely weird, but oddly amusing creepypasta. And truly fit for the bottom of the iceberg, I'd say. Oh, and in case you're wondering about the whole sequel hook at the end of this creepypasta, as far as I'm aware, there was never any other sequels written by this author to find out what the other games were, or why there was, like, like the child experimentation thing going on. That's just all left up in the air. I'm sure all of it would have been thoroughly stupid, and perhaps thoroughly weird at that, but also probably would have been some top-quality cringe as well, so... It's a shame. The Stray It was a sunny summer afternoon when I had finally crammed the last box into our new house. This house was a lot closer to my mother's work, so I guess it was just a lot more convenient. It was a very nice neighborhood with nice people, unlike the neighborhood we moved from. Our old neighbors would file noise complaints when there was nothing going on. That was because they just hated us. Even though the new neighborhood was nice, there was one thing about it that seemed off. Everything was just a little too nice. I don't know how to put it into words, but everyone seemed a little too excited than they should have been getting new neighbors. I guess that was because so many people were suddenly moving out. I asked the neighbors why they were moving out, and, and they said it was because one of the neighbors recently went missing, and there was no trace. When winter was just starting to roll in, we noticed that there was a male stray dog 
roaming around in the three foot deep snow. We did not think much of it because we had seen stray dogs in the city. We thought if we just ignored it and did not feed it, maybe it would leave us alone. The day after we first saw the stray, it was on our porch. It was just lying there, panting. It was a rather thin dog. We think it was malnourished. We called the local pound to take the dog in and nurse it back to health. Before they arrived, the dog ran away, leaving a trail of footprints through the snow. The dog catchers followed the dog's footprints in the snow, but they seemed to stop in an open field. The next day, we saw the dog again. This time, it had a bloodied squirrel in its mouth. He was quite proud of the catch, carrying it around everywhere he went. We once again called the dog catcher, but that dog was too smart to be caught. That is when we gave up trying to catch that dog. If those incompetent dog catchers could not catch a big skinny dog. Are they even qualified to catch any dog? A few days later, we went on a vacation. It was only an overnight trip, but I don't want to give any details. When we came back, a few things in the house were knocked over. We looked around and nothing was missing. Someone had broken into our house and we were kind of worried. Someone knew we were gone, even though we had our car outside and did everything we could to make it look like we were still there. We called the police, we told them everything we knew, and while detectives dusted for prints, there were none, we saw that dog again, but this time, he was a little thinner than last time. My parents went to work and took me to school like normal. There was not anything else that was necessarily different about that day until we got home. There was a bloodied squirrel in the front porch. We knew it was that dog. However, we could not do anything about it for now. We disposed of the squirrel and life went on. It was a very cold morning, colder than most. We found that dog lying on our porch, but this time he was quite fat and his teeth had a reddish tint. He was sitting there, licking his chops. There were some dog paw prints in the snow behind him. We decided to follow the footprints to see where they were coming from. They led to a small cave. Inside of that cave, we saw a dead body lying face down with a hiking backpack nearby. We immediately called the police. The police followed us to the cave and did an autopsy. The man died of a heart condition. The man was named Jeremy Jensen. We did not know him, but we still felt sorry for him. He appeared to have been dead for a while. He had a rather large hole in his stomach when he was found. I froze. It was then that I realized why the dog was suddenly so fat. We started keeping a rifle in the house in case the stray dog showed up. We did not want to be the next victims. We did not see the dog for the next week or two. We thought that the dog catchers finally caught him. Or maybe animal control put him down. But we still kept the rifle just in case. Things were slowly going back to normal. At this point, I had not seen the dog in a month. We all agreed to put the rifle in the closet. In case we invited someone over, they would not feel threatened. Bro, I just gotta stop right here and say two things. Number one, this story is written in such a way, like such a matter-of-fact way of writing a sentence. It's one of the most boring and then this and then this and then this and then this happened type of stories. I hate this type of writing. Fucking awful. But also, what do you mean? Where were you having the fucking gun beforehand? Like, in your hands at all times? What, you, why do you, 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 did you have on the couch? Where are you putting it normally if not in the closet? But back to the story. More time passed and we thought we were all safe. However, one cold night in January, colder than most, I was in bed when I suddenly woke up. There, standing over me, was the stray. He knew we put the gun away. I shoved it. I shoved the dog out of the way and darted for the closet with the gun inside. I took it out and aimed. I looked away and pulled the trigger. Click. Nothing happened. I pulled the trigger again. Click. It wasn't loaded. The dog was getting closer. So I grabbed the gun by the barrel and swung with all my might. Crack! The handle broke over the dog's head. It fell to the floor unconscious. The crack woke up my parents who were absolutely shocked. We called the dog catcher to take away the dog and dispose of his body. We still don't know how the dog possibly managed to break into our house. Twice for that matter. But now the stray is dead. We have not had a break in since then. And that was at least five years ago. One day I saw a dog that looked rather similar roaming through the street. It reminded me of the stray. I asked my neighbors if they remember it, and they asked me what it looked like. I told them what it looked like, and they explained how they had always seen a dog 
like that a few years back in the graveyard, lying beside a tombstone, presumably of its owner. I asked who the owner was. They took me to an open field and showed me the gravestone. It said Jeremy Jensen, 1982-2009. The dog knew he was there. So far, this is what I have pieced together. Jeremy Jensen and the dog were on a hike, and then he died in a cave of a heart attack. The dog ran around looking for help, but to no avail. The dog became more and more thin, and eventually started stealing food from people's houses. The dog eventually gave up and got desperate for food. He then resorted to eating a large area around the owner's stomach to survive. Nobody in my family will ever forget this disturbing story as its memories still come back to haunt us on a day-to-day -day basis. The end. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I have no fucking idea why this pasta of all pastas was at the bottom of this iceberg. I mean, I guess it is really bad, but it's kind of bad in like one of those, okay, <laughs> like that's the story. It's like really matter of fact and not really interestingly written at all. There's not any real hook. There's no twist. It's very straightforward and just kind of exists overall. In fact, it kind of reminds me just a little bit of Eyeless Jack in that writing style. I mean, Eyeless Jack is way worse than this, I'd say, but also probably more entertaining than this one. So yeah, what's next? I investigate disturbing cases. Here are my stories. Written by Brian Young, this is one of those series that started out on the No Sleep subreddit and follows a paranormal investigator and in what cases he ends up getting himself into and needing to solve. Although I guess technically he's just a normal detective, but all the stories within this series are paranormal in nature. There are five episodes to this series, uh, being titled The Tall Woman, The Watchers, The Hermit, Hammerhead, and Voices from Nature. The series follows a no-nonsense detective who is very much aware of the a dark reality of his job, with the first chapter opening with, quote, They say that everyone has a case that haunts them. Personally, if it's just one case, then clearly whoever they are isn't doing very good police work. Being a detective is gritty and bleak. You aren't dealing with happy endings. You're dealing with the cold hard truth. Sure, every now and again you get an easy case. The missing kid who just so happens to be at a friend's house. Or the argument turned bad where the bullet just so happens to miss every vital organ. Open and shut, everyone goes home with a smile on their face or at least the life they were given. But that's not the norm. Something you learn quickly from this job is how different we are. Each person taking you down a wholly unique path filled with their own challenges. Each time you try and understand the person you're dealing with, but most of the time, you never really do. Even if you solve a case, you've opened doors that can never be shut. And just like that, you're now involved in the lives of people that extend beyond the court date. Someone doesn't stop being dead after a guilty verdict. A woman doesn't stop crying after her abuser has been sentenced. And a person doesn't stop being missing just because you moved on to another case. At the end of the day, if you can't cope with being haunted by what will eventually amount to a hell of a lot more than one case, then this isn't the job for you. That being said, when the case of a missing girl was casually dropped on my desk one rainy August afternoon, I was less than reluctant to make it a priority." Unquote. I'm not going to go into hyper detail about these stories, mainly because, uh, well, I want to finish this video sometime soon, and these are all rather long stories. But the point is, is it doesn't start off as a paranormal investigation, but a simple missing persons report. One that leads our detective to realize that there are things beyond the police's ability to stop. Creatures, anomalies, things that go bump in the night, such as a tall woman that crawls on all fours like a spider, kidnapping children in the area, or a strange old man who enjoys watching people from windows, appearing late in the night in the reflection, and is then gone just as quickly. There is an overall sense of real danger as this isn't one of those stories where the police investigators take out the evil presence but rather confirm that it is one of those things, hide it from the public, and get whoever it is they are targeting out of the area. 
find convenient excuses for them moving to a new home. The whole thing is pretty immersive and deals with themes of the truth, conspiracy, and where it all lies and how ultimately powerless we are to these forces beyond our known world, and whether or not these things should be known to the wider public. It's a pretty damn good set of stories that I highly recommend. Oh shit, this is it, the center. We're so close. All sense of perception is starting to break down. I'm starting to break down, but we must reach the core, the end, the finale, or all of this will have been for nothing. You hear them? They know we're here. Entities born from the imagination of others. Demons created from the subconscious. Protectors of the dream machine. We must be swift. Even the most corny of creepypasta characters are uniquely powerful in this space. But you see, they aren't the actual characters here anymore, but rather the idea, the fandom's perception of these characters. I guess what I'm saying is, if you don't want to get fucked raw in the ass by Jeff the Killer, We need to hurry. Rouge.exe Yes, you heard that right. Rouge.exe If you're somebody that is already in the know, you understand we're about to read one of the most atrociously put together things that's ever been passed off as a creepypasta. Um... If you don't know, well, I guess I just told you, didn't I? You know, sadly enough, I did want to look into this one to see if I could find the author, or more information about Rouge.exe, but I couldn't find any information about it, sadly enough. That being said, it is super short, so why don't we go ahead and give it a read, eh? Quote, Hey, my name is Christopher Williams. I am a big fan of Rouge the Bat and I about to made Rouge call her. Dark Rouge EXE. E made by Gmod. I find a perfect picture to crit. I got scare of her right now in way she eat people. In shock, people blood out. She was white in Gary old picture. In her sister is White Rouge. She is powerful lady. She hurt people. I kill to her line is I am Dark Rouge and I go take your heart out and white one. I am White Rouge. I will suck your soul out. She found Knuckles in Knuckles turn head in she got a creepy smile. Her face in her sister to Venny about our powerful of Tur Darkness. I think I made her in Gmod in my computer. Start bring picture of Rouge EXE. The one in Shmai Rose head got cut off by Dark Rouge. And two is Amy Rose was walking with Sally Akron. 
and they saw Dark Rouge and White Rouge, they were start walking to them. Amy and Sally run and screaming loud. They stop running. They saw Sonic EXE and I s said, Sonic, what he doing there? And he said to them, you're too slow and you cannot escape from them in Dark Rouge and White Rouge attacking them and eat them to in Sonic laughing. I said, go by Amy and Sally start laughing again. So me, I got to s race how to kill Amy and Sally that are good people. I said, why, why, why? Start cry. I tur off my computer. I see a dark and white outside my windows. In then he start a creepy smiley and bleed teeth and bloody pick black eye, one dark rouge eye in pitch black in red. They bout disappearing in I don't believe it ever. I never, never start making horror stuff no more. I start dreaming about them me. Dream is dark black and I was in there with Sonic in two sister and they said we are God now and we are going to eat you in creepy Ben drowned behind me. I said Ben what are you doing here? They all eat me. I work up. I tur saw a dark rouge in my bed, never she her, in her sister again. The end. Do I, uh, do we need to say anything about this? Do we need to be snarky internet owl man for this one? Hmm? I mean, what the fuck, do you, do you even know what I just read? Do you have any fucking idea what was just told to you? How many minutes did I just spout off random fucking nonsense to you? How long did you listen to that? Did you catch any of that? Well, I'll tell you one thing. If you noticed the background footage right now, you, you might you might have caught. That didn't stop people from making Rouge.exe fan art and Rouge.exe fan games. Yes, the bar was apparently exceedingly low. You know, because like Sonic.exe, I mean, it's you know, it's kind of a bad story, but hey, I mean, it's. It's fucking Shakespeare compared to this. Sally.exe, pretty bad, pretty, pretty fucking weird, dumb, lazy ass story. Mmm, don't know. It's looking pretty fucking good compared to what I just read. Now, this is also why I wanted to try to figure out who the author of this story was. Not to shame them necessarily, but maybe to get some insight as to if this was a troll pasta, which kind of makes sense given what it is or if this is just one of the worst things anyone has ever written and attempted to put on like the wiki it's probably made by some child probably but i guess we'll never know unless someone out there happens to know but moving on hell.exe hell.exe no no really hell.exe this is where we have found ourselves Though, funnily enough, this EXE story uh, doesn't really have a lot in common with other EXE stories. It's actually a lot more like a ritual creepypasta. In fact, it just basically is one, but with like an EXE thrown in there as a little bit of a, a twist of lime. And it is, of course, based on a ritual on how to see hell and, um, you know, see what hell looks like, I guess. That's the ritual. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, well, to put it blunt, it's pretty fucking stupid. Quote, Have you ever wondered if it is possible to visit the afterlife without actually dying? The saying goes that if you can only go to heaven or hell if you're dead, but this is not entirely true. You can indeed have a brief visit to the afterlife and meet your dead friends, relatives, and even meet God. Sounds good, right? But there is one catch. It's not exactly easy. Many who have returned changed as individuals. Some even chose to take their own lives afterwards. Many lost their sanity and only a small percentage remained what you'd call sane after their journey. Even though all refused to describe what they saw, I'm different. 
I have been to both heaven and hell several times, and in this article I'm going to describe how to visit hell and meet some of your dead relatives that have sinned throughout their mortal lives. For the journey, you will need to be a well-rounded individual with a strong mentality, otherwise you will not be able to cope with what you see. Most importantly, you will need to have killed somebody at least once in your life before you try this." Unquote. Wait, 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 wait. So, okay, if all this is real, why would you kill someone? I mean, doesn't that kind of defeat the point? You might imagine that if you want to see hell from a semi-safe position, or in such a way that you don't end up there for eternity, you wouldn't do something that would make you end up going there for eternity. If you have to kill someone, then won't you end up going to hell when you die anyway? Especially if you kill someone with the express purpose of going to hell? Also remember that uh, this guy said that he's been to heaven and hell several times, um, and that he's able to describe what he saw. Remember this specifically because it's, uh, it's, it's gonna be a bit of a sticking point later on. But moving on, here are the instructions. Quote, First, you head to your nearest church from 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. on a Sunday night. If the door is locked, gain entry somehow. If impossible, then try the second closest church. Once inside, approach the altar and kneel down in praying position. Then in a monotone voice, repeat this following scripture clearly. Volo viseri tarum ubi cruciabitior igni et sulfa quad I'm gonna fucking stop, okay? I don't know how to fucking read these words. Let's move on. If done correctly, you should fall asleep instantly and wake up in your room. On the edge of your bed should be a piece of paper. On the piece of paper, there should be a link to a website. This link varies from person to person. Find an old computer with no fucking internet connections or any means of communication to the outside world, as you do not want the most horrifying demons imaginable to know your location. Boot up the computer and load up an internet browser and enter the link. Despite the lack of internet connections, you should be directed to a blank page with a hyperlink in the middle stating your name and date of death. Whatever you do, do not click on the hyperlink. Instead, save the page and view the HTML file in Notepad. Scroll to the bottom of the document, and there should be an address. Make sure you write this down. Once you've finished with the computer, take it as far away as you can, destroy it, and never return to the church you visited again. A week later, visit the address you wrote down, and it should be an old abandoned warehouse that was never there before. Do not enter this building yet, but instead knock on the door exactly six times. If any more or less, you will be greeted by the devil himself, and you will be damned to a place far worse than hell. If all is well, an old man should open the door and hand you a blank CD with the words hell.exe written onto it. Run this on another PC if you're willing to sacrifice with no inward or outward communication. On the CD should be two files, Diablo.jpg and Hell.exe. Do not fucking view Diablo.jpg. It will cause you to rip your own eyes out. Don't worry, it does not have a thumbnail. Just run Hell.exe. Instantly, your monitor should start flickering and gruesome pictures of the mutilated corpses of your dead relatives should flash quickly on and off your screen. Then a window should pop up with two buttons. One saying come, and one saying leave. Now is your last chance to turn back. If you want to visit hell, then click come. If not, click leave, and you will fall unconscious and wake up in your bedroom with no memory. Hell.exe even existed, and all evidence of its existence will be lost. If you chose come, the window will close, and the computer will spontaneously combust along the CD. Do not leave the room you're in. Just let the flames spread until the heat knocks you unconscious. You should wake up on a hospital bed in a dark room with no clothes on. Do not get out of the bed. Just lay there. After about five minutes, two P 
people should enter the room. I cannot be any clearer on this. Just keep your eyes tight shut when they approach your bed. If you look at them even once, they will rip you to pieces. They will discuss in familiar voices how unfortunate your death was and describe it in complete detail. This applies to the date of death you found on the website. Cover your ears if you do not want to hear your own fate. Afterwards, they should leave the room hastily. Wait about 10 minutes, then exit the room. Once you have exited the room, you should be in a very long corridor with the lights out. Start walking down the corridor. Once you have walked about 3 kilometers, all the lights should turn on. When this happens, run. Run as fast as you can down the corridor until you reach a fire escape door. Throw yourself through the door at full force and then slam the door shut behind you as soon as you burst through. You are now in limbo." Unquote. From here, limbo is described in detail as well as hell, and how you apparently need to cut out your own eyes because you shouldn't be able to see anything here or else you'll go mad. But um, that sort of feels like it defeats the point, right? I thought you did all this to see hell. Now you just get in there to hear and feel and smell it, I guess. I mean, why not just close your eyes and jump into a fucking garbage can in the hot summer day or something? Same fucking difference. I guess what I'm asking is, is why the fuck would anyone do this? Usually with these rituals, there's something to be gained. And even knowledge is at least something, and this doesn't even really seem like knowledge. It just really seems like a really crazy dream that you can't see anything with. You're not allowed to look at any of the creepy shit. So what's the point? Well, at any rate, the guy does go on to describe hell and at one point forgets that he cut his own eyes out because he then describes what it fucking looks like. And then the devil speaks to him and he ends up believing that his soul belongs to the devil himself and goes on to do bad things in the world, etc. It's nothing special, though it is really sudden and just completely nonsense because at the beginning of the story, he said that he's been to heaven and hell several times but I guess he's an agent of the devil now randomly at the end. We also never get to hear a description of heaven either. That's just something they just bring up at the beginning and then it's never addressed again. Even though you, he went to limbo, you figure he'd like take a look at both. I don't fucking know. Anomaly. So this one is a classic in my books. One of those creepypastas that perfectly tap into that dark reality while leaving the reader ever curious as to what comes next. The story starts off with a production editor at a small independent publisher in the US relaying his or her story of how they came upon a set of eerie photos with unsettling backstories. They had all come from an old man who had a set of rare archival photos, all of which were anomalies, as noted before, and he wanted to have them published though he would only have one photo sent to them at a time as he was very protective and paranoid of the pictures getting out to the public until he was ready to get some money from it all. Which became a rather grueling task to play the same song and dance with the guy with each individual photo. And after all that work, a private buyer ended up offering a far higher price for the photo collection than they could provide as a publishing company. And while they tried to appeal to him as a historian, in the end money won out, and they were forced to legally delete all their copies of the photos. However, our author always secretly stows away pictures and the like on their own personal computer whenever they're working on these sorts of projects, mostly for messing with colors, fonts, and the like with the pictures. But now, after months of hard work all going down the drain in an instant, they decide it was best to share these photos and their stories online for all to see, as a bit of a fuck you and revenge to the guy that made them waste all their time over the last several months, but also because they are rather interesting and historically significant. They then go on to describe the photos, which you'll be able to see on screen here, as the stories are relayed. Quote, Photo 1 of 14, The Collinwood Fire. This is the last known photo taken inside the Lakeview School in Collingwood, Ohio, before it was consumed by fire on March 4th, 1908, killing 172 students. 
two teachers, and one rescuer. The fire started when a ceiling joist ignited from a nearby steam pipe. Flames blocked escape routes, leading to panic and a stampede that trapped a large number of victims in a stairwell where they were cooked alive. Additional casualties were incurred when burning students jumped from second and third story windows. Everyone in this photo perished, except for Mr. Olson, seated at the far right in the back row. These spectral artifacts in the photo remain unexplained. Photo 2 of 14, Charlie Noonan's last interview. Charlie Noonan was an amateur folklorist who traveled through the South and southwestern United States during the early years of the 20th century, collecting tall tales and stories of the supernatural. According to his wife, Ellie, Charlie was told a story one day by an Oklahoma farmer about a strange woman who lived alone on an isolated property in the Panhandle. The farmer claimed the woman was not a woman at all, but something else. Something that hid its true nature beneath a headscarf and was never seen without a large dog by its side. Noonan was apparently intrigued enough to try searching for the woman during one of his research road trips, he was never seen again. Ellie Noonan was later contacted by a Tulsa pawnbroker who remembered reading about her husband's disappearance in the papers after finding his name engraved on a camera sold to him by an itinerant. The pawnbroker returned the camera and Mrs. Noonan had the film inside developed in the hopes of finding a clue as to his whereabouts. This was the only photo on the roll. Unfortunately, neither the location of the property nor the name of the farmer who told him the story was recorded in Noonan's notes. Photo 3 of 14, The Death of John Olstead. This prophetically torn photograph depicts a regimental color guard of the Union Army one month before they marched into battle at Antietam, September 1862. The gentleman on the far right, John Olstead, had the right side of his face and right arm blown off by cannon fire at the start of those hostilities. It is unknown exactly when the damage to the photo occurred. Photo 414, The Axeman of New Orleans, Edward Martel, was an unsuccessful French photographer and inventor who traveled throughout the U.S. during the first two decades of the 20th century, trying to drum up interest and investors for a device that added timer and automatic exposure features to Kodak's popular line of folding brownie cameras. During his travels, he took thousands of automated photos to test and refine his invention. Often, he would wake up early, set up a hidden camera in an inconspicuous spot on the streets of whatever city he happened to be in, and then walk to a nearby cafe or bar so that he could capture candid scenes of daily life to remember his travels by. The best of these photos were selected for Martel's one and only gallery show in Paris 1924. Unfortunately, Martel died penniless and unknown in 1955, and it was left to his daughter Jean to sort through the boxes and boxes of photos he left behind to see what should be kept and what could be discarded. During this process, she came across this photo, taken in New Orleans on the morning of October 28, 1919, a few hours before Martel boarded a steamer ship and returned to France. It turns out that Martel hated motion blurs in his photographs because he thought they would reflect badly on the speed and accuracy of his lens mechanism. This prejudice made him cast aside and overlook what was probably the most important photo he ever took. What makes this photo so special? The night before this was taken, the notorious and still unidentified serial killer known only as the Axeman of New Orleans, had committed his last murder, hacking Mike Pepitone to death in his bedroom, and then fleeing the scene just as Pepitone's wife was discovering the body. Could this be him returning to his residence? It's impossible to say, but if it is, the image appears to beguile the legend, based on the shaky testimony of Pauline and Mary Bruno, and prevailing prejudice at the time. 
that only a black man was capable of such savagery. Photo 5 of 14, The Grand Caverns Cryptids. This photo was taken in 1895 by an amateur spelunker slash photographer named Oren Jeffries while exploring an unmapped section of Grand Caverns in southwestern Virginia. At the time it was taken, Jeffries was conducting photographic experiments using super long exposures to see if anything at all could be captured in the total absence of light, otherwise known as cave darkness. He would situate himself on level ground, extinguish his lantern, and then open the lens of his homemade box camera. For as long as he could stand in the darkness, during one of these experiments, he heard something approach from the deeper recesses of the cave. Frightened, Jeffries abandoned his experiment and set off one of the blitzleech flashes he used for taking traditional photos underground. According to the report he later gave at a local newspaper, Jeffries saw three humanoid creatures staring at him from the shadows and took off running in the other direction and didn't stop running until he was topside. Several days later, he returned with three other men to retrieve his box camera. This is the image that was recorded on the film inside. Photo 6 of 14, The Harlow Twins. 1938, Evergreen Park, Illinois, outside of Chicago. Billy and Stevie Harlow were riding in the front seat with their mother Tammy when their Ford sedan collided head-on the Chrysler. During the collision, the car spun in such a way as to impact two additional vehicles. Tammy Harlow survived, but the boys were ejected through the windshield and killed instantly. The crime scene photographer from the local paper took this shot as the crew of volunteers worked frantically to free John Downing, the driver of the Chrysler. It appears that little Billy and Stevie stuck around to watch. Photo 714, The Sorensen Tragedy. The Sorensons were a Danish family who immigrated to the United States sometime between 1905 and 1906. They arrived with their eldest son, Anders, seen on the donkey, and settled on a farmstead in Missouri. Three more children, Simone, Frick, and Matheline, center, right, and in the wagon respectively, soon followed. This photo, taken in 1916, captures all four of the children a few weeks before the tragedy. The three eldest kids were apparently playing fort in the hay barn and must have fallen asleep. Their father, Nicholas, drove the wooden hay sweep into the pile and dismembered all three, and locations accurately suggested by the flaw in the photo. Madeline, the youngest, was inside the house with her mother at the time and not hurt. According to the son of a neighbor later interviewed by the author, the donkey later died in equally hideous fashion by getting its head caught in a barbed wire fence and nearly decapitating itself in the frenzy to get free. This final detail could not be corroborated. But O.A. of 14, The Specter of Viola Peters. Viola Peters was a well-born spinster who lived alone in the small rural town of McKaysville, Georgia. She was loved in her community for her charitable contributions to the Baptist church the soup kitchen, and the local orphanage, especially during the Depression. When those institutions subsisted almost entirely on her largesse. In July 1935, Viola was brutally mm, and murdered by a drifter named Tom Cullen, who had worked briefly at the nearby copper refinery. Cullen proceeded to stay on in Viola's house and savage her corpse for an additional 17 days before he was caught and captured. A posse of enraged locals stormed the county jail, took Cullen and lynched him from the old bridge over the Tacoa River. This photo was taken by Garrett Killian, a witness to the lynching, and caused quite a stir when it was published a few days later in the Atlanta Constitution. To most, it suggested that Viola's spirit achieved some measure of peace by attending her killer's execution. But some twisted minds saw in her forlorn countenance 
a longing to get one last look at her one and only lover. Photo 9 of 14, the ghost of Sarah Eustace, Danvers State Hospital, formerly Danvers State Lunatic Asylum, was a Kirkbride-style psychiatric hospital built in 1874 on what was then an isolated site in rural Massachusetts. Like all Kirkbridge asylums, it was famous for its gothic architecture and its use of now outdated medical techniques to treat insanity. Danvers is often cited as the birthplace of the prefrontal lobotomy. Danvers has several other claims to fame. It was the inspiration for the fictional Arkham Sanatorium that appeared in several stories by H.P. Lovecraft and which in turn inspired the Arkham Asylum in the fictional Batman universe. It was also where the cult horror film Session 9 was filmed. That film put the vast network of tunnels beneath Danvers to good cinematic effect. It's no accident the filmmakers chose to use the tunnels, as rumors of their haunting had dogged Danvers for over a hundred years. The most famous story concerns Sarah Eustace, a patient who escaped her ward in 1955 and snuck into the tunnel system. Despite multiple searches and a week-long lockdown of the asylum, Sarah was never seen again. It was assumed she died down there, lost, thirsty, and alone. A nurse at Danvers named Gail Mallory became obsessed with Sarah's story and spent many of her off hours searching the tunnels for her remains. Though she never found a body, she did snap this photo in late 1966, which suggests Sarah Eustace walks the Danvers tunnels to this very day. Photo 10 of 14, the Stevenson family portrait. Who says ghosts don't have a sense of humor? The Stevensons were a wealthy Boston family, proud of the industry and longevity with which most of the clan was blessed. This portrait, taken in 1945, was an effort to gather the oldest Stevensons together in one of the youngest. Emilia Center, aged 102, was granted the honor of matriarch, while little Ophelia was the token child at 18 months. What the Stevensons did not realize until this photo was developed was that they had been joined that day by one of their deceased, James Palman Stevenson, 1835 to 1932, seated at left between his niece Jenny and his cousin Alfred, was easily identified by several of those present and remembered fondly as a rascally uncle known for pranks and dirty jokes. Photo 11 of 14, the disappearances of Mrs. Yerno. During her later years, Josephine Yerno would take a walk every evening at dusk around her beloved neighborhood of Norwich, Connecticut. On November 12, 1935, she set out as usual and never returned. Extensive searches were conducted by a large team of volunteers and the Norwich police force, but no sign of her was ever found. Three years later, Mrs. Yerno was found squatting in front of a neighbor's house without a mark on her body and in perfect health. When asked where she had been, Mrs. Yerno was unable to understand the question. From her point of view, no time had passed at all. Against the advice of her neighbors and her doctor, she refused all medical treatment and resumed her life as if nothing had ever happened, including her nightly strolls. Another neighbor snapped this shot of her in the fall of 1938, Clouds of smoke from piles of burning leaves give it an appropriately eerie feel. On the same date, in November 1940, five years after her initial disappearance, Mrs. Yerno vanished again. This time, she was never seen again. Photo 12 of 14, The Fate of Sally York. In 1912, Threshing of Little Sally York, aged nine in the cotton loom of the North Fork textile mill, was one of a handful of such accidents that helped legislators push through the Keating Ownings Act of 1916, the first child labor law in American history. From the time of the accident until the mill's closing four decades later, workers consistently complained of cold spots, strange noises, and sudden taps on the shoulder when nobody was near. The mill's foreman never paid these complaints any mind until their photograph surfaced 
in 1932. It was taken by a traveling photographer named Benny Johnson, who promptly sold it to the North Fork Gazette for an unprecedented $10. The mill has shut down for the Christmas holidays and was empty at the time. The photo was later blamed for the closing of the mill, though the Great Depression was the more likely cause of that. Photo 13 of 14, Lily Palmer's Eyes. Lily Palmer was not quite four when she experienced what doctors would later call an acute onset of sensory hallucinations. This photo taken by Lily's mother, Annette, on Halloween night, 1952, purportedly captured the arrival of her disorder. Lily and her Filipino nanny were setting out for a round of trick or treating when the child suddenly screamed and began to claw at her eyes. It was some time before she was calm enough to speak, but when asked what she saw, Lily repeatedly spoke about things crawling in her eyes. Several days later, while unsupervised in her bedroom, Lily punctured both of her eyes with one of her mother's knitting needles. After receiving medical treatment, she was evaluated and committed and remained institutionalized for the rest of her life. First at Bellevue on the east side of Manhattan and later at the Rockland Psychiatric Center in Orangeburg, where she remained until she died of a heart attack in March 2001. A call to one of her former caregivers at Rockland confirmed that Lily's episodes were most traumatic on and around Halloween night. But for the majority of her life, she could be heard begging and pleading for the staff to help her get these things out of her eyes. Photo 14 of 14, The Trinity Deception. This is one of several famous photographs taken of the first ever nuclear detonation. Conducted by the US Army on July 16, 1945 in the White Sands Proving Ground located in the Giornata del Morto Desert, about 35 miles southeast of Socorro, New Mexico. The setting off of this implosion design plutonium device the same method used in the Fat Man device dropped on Nagasaki ushered in the atomic age and the eventual arms race between the United States and Russia. Only a handful of people were aware that this photo was cropped before it was ever released to the public, and they are all now dead. One of them was the original photographer, who gave the author a copy of the original on the condition that it be kept out of the public eye until such a time that the citizens of the world could handle the ramifications of what it depicts. The author remains uncertain whether this criteria has been met, but given that he is likely to own the last existent copy, he has decided his responsibility rests with the truth. The end. In case you're wondering, the last photo on crop shows some UFOs, though it is a bit hard to see. I really like this creepypasta because it's kind of a collection and anthology of smaller urban legend-like creepypastas with some pretty eerie photos to go along with the tales. Stairs. In 1984, there lived an old widowed lady by herself in a two-story house who was completely immobile and bound to her wheelchair. Ever since the mysterious death of her husband, she required the aid of a carer who would visit her daily to help her with her everyday tasks. What made it even more difficult was the fact that there are two floors of the house which were only connected by an old staircase inside. When the old lady needed to move between the two, the carer would have to carry her frail body like an infant, up and down the stairs. One day, the police received a call from the widow. There had been a murder. Since police units were scarce at the time, and the murderer had already fled the scene, only one detective was sent out to conduct the initial crime scene report. He arrived to see the Kara's body splayed out on the floor, with her vocal cords ripped out in a pool of blood on the first level of the house. With the old lady atop the staircase, in her wheelchair watching him, still and silently, seemingly in shock. He could immediately rule her out as a suspect due to her inability to move up and down the stairs, and because she was trapped up there the time the murder took place. 
It was similar to the death of her husband many years ago, who had suffocated in his sleep on the couch downstairs. The detective put on his gloves, took photos, swabbed for evidence, and covered the body until the coroner arrived later. All routine business. He scoped the house downstairs for any clues, then asked the old lady if he could look upstairs. She insisted that she was upstairs the whole time, and that no one apart from her had been up there that day. But regardless of this, the detective ascended the staircase to which she hesitantly moved aside. Beyond the staircase was a narrow corridor with three closed doors along it. He checked behind each of the doors. The empty bedroom, nothing. The bathroom, nothing. He became anxious as he slowly made his way to the final bedroom where the old lady slept. He opened it and everything seemed normal, a bed, a wardrobe, and a bedside table with a lamp. He checked every wall of the room in horror. It was not what he discovered, but what he didn't discover that made him stop dead in his tracks and slowly reach for the gun in his holster. It was a detail so minor they had completely overlooked it on the last investigation of the husband's death. There was no phone upstairs. He suddenly heard a noise as he withdrew his gun and rushed out of the room, only to find an empty wheelchair atop the stairs. Voice Box A Ticky Toby Love Story Welp, this is it ladies and gentlemen. This is the most cringe, weird, unironically disturbing, Worst creepypasta I have ever fucking read. Every single Jeff the Killer type story that we have read across this iceberg has been leading up to this very moment. And you wanna know what's the best fucking part? It's 12 chapters long. Now I will say grammar wise, there are definitely creepypastas that we have read that are worse in that regard. But as far as just the pure content, like the fucking meat and cheese of the story, this is particularly bad on a multitude of levels. But it's hard to do it justice without at least getting into it. So why don't we read a little bit of the first chapter? Quote, the day my life changed forever started out like every other day. It was the same routine for the last seven years. Ever since I had turned 10, I woke up at 6 a.m., took a quick shower, tossed on my favorite black skinny jeans, my black Hollywood undead t-shirt, my crimson hoodie, and my red and black running shoes. I pulled my long brown hair up into a ponytail, covered the bruises on my pale face with some makeup, grabbed my backpack for school, and woke up my six-year-old little sister, Benna. I quickly got her dressed and ready for school, feed her breakfast, and took her over to her babysitter. Luckily, her babysitter only lives a few houses down, so I had time to drop her off and rush back home to make breakfast for my parents. Just like every day, I hoped to have breakfast cooked and be out the door before my parents woke up. But once again, I was just a little too slow. As I finished cooking, my mother walked in and gave me her usual greeting, a punch to the stomach that dropped me to my knees and a swift kick to the ribs. Get your lazy ass up and clean the mess you made in the kitchen, Shayla, you useless bitch, she said as she calmly sat down to eat the breakfast I had cooked. I nodded quickly and got to work on the kitchen, still hoping to get out of there before my father came down. I'm just glad that I'm able to protect Benna from our parents. As much as my mother's continual physical and emotional abuse hurt, it was nowhere near as bad as my father's punishments. I just had a punishment last night since mother had to work late and I didn't want to get another one after mother left for work so I cleaned up as fast as I could. Luckily that day, I was able to get out before he came down. So for me, it started out a better day than most. After catching the bus to school, I hurried to my locker. Once again, I hoped that I could avoid Jeannie and her group. Jeannie, her boyfriend Biff and Biff's friend Joel, and Joel's girlfriend Roxanne were the biggest bullies in the school. They were also the head cheerleaders and the captain and quarterback of the football team. So of course, in the teacher's eyes, 
they could do no wrong. They had bullied me ever since third grade, and the abuse from them got worse every year. I quickly grabbed my books for the first half of the day and started walking as quickly as I could without running the English class. Luckily, I made it to class without being caught. Unfortunately, I knew there would be no hiding from them after school. They had made sure of that the day before when they caused me to get detention. Jeannie had been beating me in the girls' locker room after gym class, and when she heard someone come in, she rammed her head into the locker and screamed. So of course everyone believed that I had been attacking her. I had tried for years to tell the teachers and the principal what really happens between Jeannie, her friends, and me. But of course they never believed me. No one ever believed me. Probably because I have a couple disorders to make people think I'm a freak. It's not my fault that my eyes are two different colors. My right eye is a piercing light blue, like the color of the Siberian Husky's eyes. My left is a bright emerald green. I also can't help that I was diagnosed with Tourette's Syndrome when I was 10, shortly after my older sister Rebecca and I were in a car accident. I survived without any physical damage, but my sister didn't, and my parents always blame me for that. I can't help the twitching that happens or the spontaneous low-pitched sinister sounding giggles that freak people out. Anyway, the day went on like usual. People either ignored me or made fun of me. At lunch, I sat at the library by myself. I never ate lunch at school. My parents wouldn't let me take a lunch, nor give me money to buy lunch. After school, I went to detention. No one else was there today, so I had plenty of time to do my homework. I knew that I wouldn't be able to do it tonight. Mother and father would be waiting for me to come home from detention, so that they could beat me again. I knew that Benna would already be in bed by that time I got home. I hoped that mother and father didn't hurt her while I wasn't there. I just hoped that mother didn't leave me alone with father again, like the last time I got detention. I didn't think I could tank father's punishment two days in a row. I was still sore from the night before. I really hated my life." Unquote. So, uh, have you picked up what kind of story this is yet? Yes, indeed. We have yet another one of those creepypastas where it deals with sexual assault, child abuse, and probably one of the most over-the-top, terrible life stories someone could possibly have. All as justification for the Jeff the Killer style murderer that Shayla is going to become. It's kind of similar to clockwork in that sense, I suppose, but it goes a fair bit farther than that story. See, those bullies she was talking about earlier do end up getting her during or after her detention, and they decide that today's the day that they're going to kill her, but not before brutally mmm-ing her. Yes, indeed, this story has one of the most fucked up starts to nearly any creepypasta I have ever read. Now, I'm not sure if I've ever actually expressed this before in this iceberg. I mean, this series has been going on for like over a year, so I can't remember everything I've said across these many hours. Uh, but I do want to note that I don't think that things like child abuse and sexual assault should be off limits in creepypastas or anything for that matter. And as a matter of fact, some of my favorite creepypastas ever created focus around these topics in particular. But for me personally, when all of this heavy shit is just used as a cheap justification for this edgy teenager to then become a serial killer, and now we're meant to feel sorry for them when they start, you know, killing innocent people for no fucking reason. It all feels kind of tasteless, I suppose. It'd be one thing if the story acknowledged for like once in a while that the character, even though they went through all these terrible things, is clearly a bad person because now they're hurting normal people, but you will find in almost all these cases uh, with these creepypastas that they will not do that. I suppose sometimes it could be implied, but with this one in particular, it pretty much just does the fucking opposite. I feel bad for Shayla because it sounds like she's living the worst life someone could possibly live at that age. But all that sympathy is going to go immediately out the window 
as soon as she starts killing people that aren't directly hurting her. Because I could at least see, you know, if it was just a straight up revenge story, killing all the people who harmed her. Yes, maybe it's not the most ideal or moral thing to do, but if these people are literal murderers slash mmm, then, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna be on the side of the person who, you know, was just defending themselves and getting themselves out of a bad situation. But as soon, as soon as she starts killing people that are just innocent people, that sympathy is gone. And, as expected, as soon as this event with the bullies starts going on, something in Shayla snaps in that moment. A voice in her head tells her she needs to stand up and fight back. And so she does, and she ends up killing both the bullies, and tearing out their throats, or voice boxes, and then eating them, I guess. Now the voice in her head goes on about how she should have listened to her, sooner. Quote, you can call me voice box. You know, you really should have listened to me years ago when your father started punishing us. I'm sorry, voice box. I couldn't hear you clearly until just now with Joel. I understand, Shayla, my dear. But you hear me now, and that is what is important. I will never let anyone hurt you ever again. Whenever you need me, I will be here. Thank you, voice box. We will have to run after we kill mother and father, but what should we do about Benna? We will take her to Grandmama and Grandpapa. They are the only ones who can trust keep Benna safe. They would be appalled at what our parents have done to us if they knew. We finished the walk in silence. I decided to wait for mother and father to go to bed before killing them. As much as I want to make them suffer for everything they have done, I also just wanted to get rid of them. Get Benna to our grandparents and get out of here. Besides, there was always the chance that they could scream and alert the neighbors or wake up Benna, and that was a risk I wasn't willing to take." Unquote. Ending of chapter one. Now, from here, the next chapter is about Shayla doing what else but a quickly killing her parents eating their voice boxes because that's just what she does now, and then, well, perhaps I ought to just read. Quote, Oh, how I love the taste. Once I finished my treat, I went and took a quick shower since the killing had been so silent, I didn't need to worry about leaving quickly. I loved the feel of the warm water caressing my skin. I felt something wet and furry brush against my calves, and quickly looked over my shoulder to see what it was. I felt my eyes widen and my mouth dropped open when I saw that I now had a very beautiful red tail. I concentrated on moving it and it moved. I ran my hands through the fur and shivered in pleasure as I stroked my new tail. I noticed that the tip of the, my tail was black. It looked like a fox tail. I felt my ears twitch but they were no longer at the size of my head. I reached up and found large furry ears on top of my head. I would have screamed, but I knew I couldn't draw attention to the house, or I would be in deep trouble. I quickly turned the water off and wrung the water out of my hair, which I now noticed was blood red and out of my tail. I had to see what I looked like. I stepped out of the shower, dried off, and used the towel to wipe the steam off the mirror. I was shocked when I saw my new looks. I had two red fox ears with black tips on top of my head, a healed scar on my right cheek from where Joel had cut me, but the most striking difference was my left eye. Instead of the brilliant emerald green I had since birth, it was black with a slit blood red, purple, and there was black oozing from it, like I was crying black tears. The way it was slitted, reminding me of a cat's eye. I tilted my head and smiled my big toothy grin, and noticed that my canine teeth were longer and sharper than they had been. I loved my new look." Unquote. So yeah, she transforms into a creepypasta anime cat girl. And you know what's even more interesting than that? After Shayla, or Voice Box, brings Benna to her grandmama and grandpapa's house, she goes to kill the girl bullies from earlier by killing their parents and then torturing them until who else but Jeff the fucking killer walks up behind her and we have the biggest tonal shift in any story ever. Quote, Who are you and what do you want? I growled. 
Name's Jeff. Jeff the Killer. What I wanted, Sweet Cheeks, was to kill these idiots. Unfortunately, it looks like I got here too late. Well, not too late to watch the show you put on with those girls. I gotta say I'm impressed with how you handle those Skinners. He chuckled. Don't give him your real name, Shayla. Tell him that you are Voicebox. We will share that name from now on. All right, Voicebox. The name is Voicebox, not Sweet Cheeks, I replied. I wasn't about to let my guard down around Jeff. He is, after all, <laughs> a killer. <laughs> nice name, Sweet Cheeks. You know, I have some friends that would find you as interesting as I do. You ever heard of the creepy pastas? No. What are the creepy pastas? Well, to humans, we're urban legends and scary stories. But what we really are is practically immortal killers. Most of us live in Slender Mansion with Slender Man. You do realize that you are a new creepy pasta, right? Really? So that's what I am? Yep. And that means you can live with us in Slender Mansion. I don't know. Shayla, go with him. I know that everything will be alright. We can trust Slender Man. Are you sure we can trust him? I'm sure. Slender Man may be a killer, but he would never harm us. Alright. Okay, let me grab my backpack and we can head out. No problem, sweet cheeks. He grinned bigger as I growled at him. My name is Voicebox! Don't call me Sweet Cheeks! I sheathed my Skinners and left the room. Jeff followed behind me and we left the house. I grabbed my backpack and motioned for Jeff to take the lead. He smirked as he led me deeper into the wood. We soon reached a large cherry tree in the clearing. I was confused as to why Jeff had led me here, until he walked up to the tree and shoved the key into a small knot hole in the trunk. There was a slight rumbling sound as the doorway appeared in the trunk of the tree. Jeff motioned for me to follow him as he walked through the doorway. The first thing I saw after I passed through the doorway was a huge mansion. It looked slightly creepy and possibly abandoned. Jeff grabbed my wrist and tugged me towards the mansion. Well, this is Slender Mansion. Don't worry, sweet cheeks. It looks much better on the inside. Jeff, quit calling me sweet cheeks, I said as he opened the door. Hey, Slendy, I'm back. And I brought a friend, he yelled. Child, do not call me Slendy. And you know you are not supposed to. I heard the deep voice trail off. I looked away from Jeff and saw an eight or nine foot tall man in a black business suit and no face standing in the foyer. Daughter, you are alive. The man Jeff called Slendy said as he scooped me up into a tight hug. I thought you both your sister and you died with your mother. Ha! <laughs> Slendy. What do you mean, daughter? Since when do you got kids? Jeff looked as confused as I was. I'm sorry, but I think you might be confused. I just killed my parents yesterday. Shayla. You would not remember since you were very young when your mother died. But did your aunt never tell you? What about your sister, Rebecca? Is she still alive too? Who's Shayla? She said her name is Voicebox. Shayla, Slenderman is telling you the truth. He is our father. The people you called your parents were actually our mother's sister and her husband. Bennett is our cousin. Our aunt should have told you about our mother years ago. But she never knew who our father was. Now answer our father. Tell him what happened to Rebecca. He deserves to know everything. And I mean everything. He needs to know what our uncle did to us. I'll tell him about Rebecca, but I don't want to tell him everything until we are alone. It is no one else's business. Very well. Father, I do go by voice box now. As for Rebecca, she died 10 years ago in a car accident. I'm sorry. No one ever told me that I was adopted. That is all right, my dear. I have mourned for your mother and sister for 17 years. I am just happy that I have you back. Come, daughter. Let me introduce you to the rest of the household. Then later tonight we shall sit down and get to know each other. Father finally put me down and led me into the living room. There were six guys sitting around playing games. 
talking or reading. Everyone, I have someone I would like to introduce to you. With that, six pairs of eyes looked over to me. Everyone, this is my daughter, Voicebox, unquote. Yes, the rest of the story takes place at the Creepy Pasta Mansion, owned by Slenderman, where all the creepy pastas go to live and hang out, I suppose. Oh, and our sweet little voice box is actually the daughter of Slenderman and is super powerful. And as the story goes on, she ends up getting into a relationship with Tiki Toby. But Jeff the Killer also kind of wants a piece of that furry tailed ass. But also, also, the voice inside her head is actually the voice of her dead older sister, who Slenderman later is able to cast a spell on, later for her to be her own being again. And so now there are two voice box killer girls, but also, 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 clockwork, yes, that clockwork, comes in and kisses Tiki Toby, which starts this whole teen drama between voice box, Tiki Toby, and clockwork, and also Jeff the Killer, and so Voicebox has to deal with that, but also, 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 fucking also, Voicebox and her sister at one point get captured by fucking Zalgo, yes, that Zalgo, so they can both be his wives because everybody wants to fuck Voicebox. And there's a whole chapter about them being groomed by him until they finally escape his place. And then, that plot point is then never brought up ever again. So, you have this story featuring the most Mary Sue of Mary Sue characters ever to exist, and a mansion full of other insufferable, evil emo teenagers that all whine and joke and fuck about how they have issues, but they all also actively, day by day, go out and kill innocent people for literally no fucking reason. Including, might I add, children. Something that you might think would be a sore spot for some of them, in particular voice box, but apparently not. How am I supposed to care about these characters, let alone root for them in any regard when they are so unbelievably unlikable? The story really acts like we should care about Voice Box and her relationship drama, or her new relationship with her father Slenderman, or her past trauma which is brought up a ton in this story. All seemingly as ways to make us sympathize and empathize with her as a character, Yet, all along, she also will kill people for no fucking reason, children included several times throughout the story in extremely brutal ways, which throws away any sympathy for their traumatic past you might have for them, or at least it does me. It's such a strange experience seeing the author try so desperately to get me to care about a character and then they keep making the character do things that makes me not want to fucking care about them. I mean, it would be one thing if it was something like The Devil's Rejects, where it's clearly following a bunch of terrible, awful, vicious, piece-of-shit serial killers, and, you know, they're at least fun to see do things, but voice box and stories like these really have a cognitive dissonance for me personally, and I'm sure many others as well. It also doesn't help that normally this type of story ends after about the first act that would be in this story, but this one goes on for much, much, much longer. In fact, it goes on forever, with the story aimlessly jumping from one plot point to the next, with absolutely no narrative cohesion to speak of. It's 12 chapters, but it really feels like nothing fucking happened of significance. And what makes it all the more funny and worthless is after the story is done aimlessly jumping from one plot point to the next, it randomly ends the whole story on a and that's how I met your mother ending, with the whole story secretly being voice box telling her and Tiki Toby's children the story of how they met each other. And while I haven't really mentioned it a whole lot here, some of the killings in this, I will say, are pretty unique, but also seem exceptionally cruel. 
like, at one point, her and her sister are angry at, like, these people because they're, like, upset about their relationships not working out or something. And so what they do is they kill these two guys, tear off their schlongs, and use them to mmm their girlfriends to death. Yeah. So in between all the creepypasta teenage drama, you have some pretty fucked up shit that's going on on the background. It is like totally everywhere. Shout out to YouTuber Hoodoo Hoodlum's Revenge, by the way, for managing to read through this whole thing. Which if you want a detailed reading of the whole thing, I'd highly recommend you go and give his video series a watch. I can't cover every single thing that this story does wrong and every single cringy, weird, and fucked up thing it covers. So I really would recommend going and listening to it if you're a fan of the more a cringe type of shit that I cover on this iceberg. But for now, I think it's time we freshen our palate with something genuinely good. Better than good, actually. A fucking fantastic story that I have been waiting up until now to tell you about. Some of you already know what it is. Some of you have been requesting it for quite a while, since this iceberg's inception, in fact. And to the rest of you, that story is... Baroska. Well, it seems like it's finally time to talk about one of, if not the greatest creepypastas ever written. You all thought I wasn't gonna include this one, you silly billies. I just wanted to save this one, one of the best, for near last. Written by C.K. Walker, a Baroska follows Sam Walker and his family as they move into the small town of Drisking, Missouri, one summer, and while his sister Whitney is beside herself upset over losing her friends and new boyfriend from the town they used to live in, Sam is younger and quickly adapts to his new environment, and soon befriends two other kids, Kyle and Kimber. The three of them make for a great little group of friends, and the two of them eventually bring Sam to their secret treehouse in the woods, called the Triple Tree, where they make him do a little ritual before heading up on into it. He must carve his name into the tree and then say the following, Under the Triple Tree, there is a man who waits for me, and should I go or should I stay, my face the same, Either way. Once they head into the treehouse, it's there that Sam first hears the sound of something metallic. A buzzing sound that seemed to echo through the woods, making Kyle and Kimber go silent before they tell him the urban legend of Baroska. Quote, Kimber was in the middle of reciting the alphabet backwards when a loud metallic grinding suddenly pierced the calm mountain air like a gunshot. Kimber stopped talking and we spent a few minutes staring at each other, waiting for the noise to end. Parker curled into Kimber and put his hands over his ears. After what seemed like ten whole minutes, the sound ended as suddenly as it had begun. What was that? I asked and Parker mumbled something into Kimber's sweatshirt. Do you guys know? I tried again. Kimber stared at her feet. She crossed and uncrossed them. Well? It's nothing, Kyle finally answered. We hear it sometimes in town. It's not a big deal. It's just louder up here. But what makes that sound? Waraska, Kimber whispered, without taking her eyes off her feet. Who's that, I asked. Not who, where, Kyle answered. It's a place. Another town? No, it's just a place in the woods. Oh. Bad things happen there, Kimber said more to herself than me. Like what? Bad things, Kimper repeated. Yeah, don't ever try to find it, dude, Cal said behind me. Or bad things will happen to you, too. But like, what bad things? I turned around. Cal shrugged and Kimper stood up and walked over to the rope ladder. We'd better go. I have to get home to my mom, she said. We climbed down the ladder one by one and then started to walk back to the trailhead in an unfamiliar silence. I was dying of curiosity about Baroska, but couldn't decide if and what to ask about. So who lives there? Where? Kyle asked. Baroska. The skinned man, Parker answered. Pfft. Kyle laughed. Only babies believe that. Like men who are skinned? Like their skin is gone? I asked excitingly. Yeah, that's what some kids say. Most of us stop believing that, though, when we turn double digits, Kyle said, unquote. Now, I'm tempted to not say anything else story-wise about this tale here, 
But I will say one spoiler that happens at the end of part one, that being that suddenly Sam's older sister Whitney goes missing. And Sam's father is a cop and so obviously everyone tries to find her, but no luck. The next bulk of the story takes place five years after her disappearance, and I'm going to leave it at that. Normally, I would go through almost all or most of the story in this series, but once again, I must pull that card. I want you to go and read or listen to a reading of this story yourself. Take it as the highest source of praise from me that I can possibly give a story that I truly believe that you owe it to yourself to experience Baraska for yourself. And Mr. Creepypasta in particular has a really good reading of it, so I'd recommend that, though I'm sure there are other good readings of it on here as well. Baraska is a story full of rich and complex characters, all who go through several character arcs and are subjected to terrible trauma. There is a ton of twists and turns, mysteries to be solved, and payoffs that left me sitting in shock that the story went to those sorts of places. I know I'm speaking vaguely here, but this creepypasta is so good, I hesitate to even call it a creepypasta. I hold it right up there with tales like Pen Pal, The Showers, and Psychosis. So, do yourself a favor and give it a read or a listen sometime soon. And only through that will you find out what secrets the town of Drisking holds, what happened to Sam's older sister, and what is the truth about Boroska. The shortest scary story ever told. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock on the door. That's it! We've reached it! And not a second too soon, I can hear the island dwellers' fast approach. It's time we made that wish. But first, let me ask you something. Did you ever wonder what it means to dream in the first place? We all do it, but it's sort of like a strange state of being, where all our fantasies come true, the good and the bad. I suppose it's like our brain can't help but tell stories to itself, even as we sleep. Perhaps that is truly what makes us so special. That good, bad, scary, or sweet, we all enjoy a good story, whether we're hearing it or telling it to one another. But they all must come to an end. Even the most fanciful of dreams must abruptly stop with one's awakening. So then tell me, how would you have our story end? What's your dream? To what message shall you awaken? Comment down below. Tell me, what is your one single wish? No matter how big or small, cool or cringe, tell me, O oh traveler, my faithful companion. And if you need time to think upon it, please do, and let me know. And in the meantime, I, shall be granting my wish, the reason we came here to begin with. After all, how else was I going to get a giant mecha owl to escape the island and rain terror on all of my enemies? <laughs> yeah, fuck you, creepypasta island! I pulled this one out of my fucking ass, just like the rest of ya. Until next time, traveler. This has been Dylan the fucking Night Owl flying off into the stratosphere! Wow. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen. That was finally the grand finale to the Creepypasta Iceberg. I hope you all enjoyed it. It's been a year long process getting this whole thing done. To be fair, this whole ice book could have been done a lot faster had I just, well, only read the stuff that was just on the iceberg, but as you can tell, 
Around halfway through this iceberg, I just started adding in new creepypastas each time, more and more and more and more, because what can I say? I'm really passionate about creepypastas, and I was just having too much fun with this series to just let it all go so quickly. And for this finale, I tried to include as many stories as I possibly could, so I hope that the wait was well worth it. I made sure to include some of the very best and some of the very worst, as I'm sure you just saw. I know a lot of you found my channel through this series, so I want to thank you so very, very much if you have uh, been watching through this whole time. I know many of you watch this series over and over again, and you marathon it, or you listen to it while you're at work, or you're drawing, or or even to go to sleep to, and I just want to let you know that, well, I'm very thankful to you all, and I'm glad that you've enjoyed this series. And also, you might be wondering, what comes next? Well, obviously I still have my other series I've got going on on my uh, channel, such as my internet fables, and, well, I'm going to be doing a couple more video game based stuff as well. But as far as icebergs go, I actually have a super big, super detailed new iceberg series that I cannot wait to share with you very, very soon. I'm not sure I want to reveal what the iceberg is about just yet. You're going to have to subscribe and wait for later for me to fully reveal that. But as a hint, it will be very similar to my a YouTube iceberg series as far as its variety in content. <laughs> of course, if you want to know what the next Iceberg series is right away, you can always follow me on Patreon or become a member here on YouTube to get some behind the scenes exclusive uh, news and updates for the upcoming months. Which, speaking of, I want to take this opportunity to make sure and thank all of my loyal and very helpful and supportive members on Patreon and here on YouTube, including all of my Night Eggs and Night Owlets, as well as a special thank you to all my great Night Owls, including Star Punch Gaming, Forgotten Ace, Macabre Kaiju, Ho Hot, Medusa's Hex, and Tony Teramaya, as well as a super duper special thank you to all of the real OGs out there known as the Arch Owls, including the Jammin' Justice, the Spooky's House of Jump Scares Lore Master, Doggy NGT, the Chi Vibe Zen Garden Party, and the Super Saiyan Sword. Thank you all so very, very much for watching and supporting this channel. I also want to take this time to thank artist Mr. Megido over on Twitter.com for making this commemorative wonderful piece of uh, me entering the creepypasta island all the way back on part one as well as these awesome pieces and their variations by the legendary mcdowell devon over on twitter once again being quite commemorative of the creepypasta iceberg and island though this one it seems uh I'm quite well off. I've uh, I've f f quite thoroughly destroyed Sonic.exe, as you can see, as well as the other creepy pastas. Oh, and also they made this cute little one of me uh, drinking some coffee or tea with this cute little owl next to me. Additionally, I also want to thank my good friend and artist Philemon for making this wonderful piece of me in a cape and cool gothic attire with my skull cane and a little owl and an owl belt and just just overall a super cool drawing uh, as a celebration for me reaching 50k subscribers very recently and lastly thank you to a band world for making me this cool little a poster-esque little drawing of me in a owl form and uh you know, looking off the side, it's, it's quite cool. You guys can expect more updates over on Patreon as well as on my memberships and uh, Discord and what have you. And if you want uh, some other updates outside of like the more secret details, you can also follow me over on Twitter.com where I'm trying to be a little bit more active over there when I can. But all that said, thank you all so, so very much for watching hopefully enjoying this series as it finally comes to a close. But 
as I said, everything must come to an end. But the nice thing about endings is it's just the last page in one book. And let me tell you, friend, we have a lot of fucking books around here. So I hope to see you next time in whatever book we open up next. But until then, this has been Dylan the Night Owl flying off. Thank <laughs> you.